Haruchika Miyagi was a son, entrepreneur, and brother. Haruchika, often referred to as Haru, was deeply involved in the world of social media since his time in high school. But just before 9pm on December 3rd, he shared a cryptic message on his public Facebook account. The power of giving is important. Want to give as much as possible. It's called karma. Little did anyone know that this would be the last communication from Haru. His online presence provided a glimpse into his life leading up to December 5th, 2015. He was associated with several companies and created a diverse range of YouTube videos covering topics from casual bowling with friends to practical tips for saving on utility bills. He also introduced the world to his global trading software, Tensei. He utilized several different platforms to advertise his business and share his personal thoughts. The story of his disappearance begins in Dewey, Arizona, which was about 560 miles away from his home in Utah. What brought Haru to Arizona remains as an intriguing mystery. He had not shared any travel plans and there were no known connections or ties that would explain his presence in this unfamiliar state. Even stranger were the winding dirt roads he navigated and the unlikely turns he took on the way to the location where he was last seen. His last known location was Medbar Ranch, a property nestled amidst the Arizona landscape. On this evening, he approached a resident asking if he could stay at her home or on her property. And obviously she turned him down, you'd be crazy to let some random stranger into your house all alone. Afterwards, he calmly left the premises. Instead of retracing his steps, he headed north on the property's private drive, crashing through a closed but unlocked gate before vanishing from sight. Approximately one hour after the encounter with the resident, the Yavapai County Sheriff's Office received a trespassing report, identifying the man as Haru. Police arrived at the scene and around 7pm, they discovered Haru's damaged vehicle wedged between some stony wash and a barbed wire fence. Police immediately issued a search involving extra personnel and dogs, but the search yielded no clues regarding Haru's whereabouts. When Haru's parents were notified of his disappearance, they were left utterly speechless. As the news settled in, they started asking questions. Why was he in Arizona? And why Dewey? Where the heck was he even going and why? Whenever someone goes missing, possibilities such as an accident, murder, suicide, or voluntary disappearance come to mind. Haru's actions appeared to be chaotic and out of character, raising questions about his mental state. If he was indeed experiencing a mental health crisis, what happened to him after his vehicle crashed? Did he wander into the wilderness, or did he take cover somewhere in order to hide from a potential killer? Haru has remained missing for nearly a decade at this point. Despite having a stable life, a home, and a strong online presence, he decided to go on a journey that left all of those things behind. At the time of his disappearance, Haru stood at 5 foot 8 inches tall and weighed around 180 pounds. He had brown hair and brown eyes, and he was last seen wearing a blue jacket, blue pants, and van style shoes. Floyd Collins was a man born on June 20th, 1887 in Logan County, Kentucky. He had a natural affinity for caves, nurtured by his upbringing near the famed Mammoth Cave. This early connection to caves ignited a lifelong passion for exploration within Floyd. In 1917, he went on an adventure in the Crystal Cave hidden beneath his family's property. With his unique formations, Floyd saw the potential to turn the Crystal Cave into a tourist attraction. However, the 1920s brought along what was called the Cave Wars in Kentucky. Rival businesses began offering guided cave tours, intensifying the competition. Disappointed by the Crystal Cave's financial struggle, Floyd set his sights on a different cave nearby, one that would ultimately seal his tragic fate. This one was called the Sand Cave, located on Farmer Beasley Doyle's property. And from an initial inspection, it seemed promising for Floyd's entrepreneurial ambitions. He agreed to collaborate with Beasley to turn it into a destination everyone would want to visit. On January 30th, 1925, Floyd entered Sand Cave with only a kerosene lamp, embarking on a perilous journey through tight and treacherous passageways. Inside, he made a remarkable discovery. He found a subterranean coliseum standing roughly 80 feet high. Excitement gave way to desperation when Floyd's lamp flickered and he accidentally dislodged a 17 pound rock, pinning his leg and trapping him. It wasn't until a day later that Beasley's son, Jewel, stumbled upon the trapped Floyd. 
quickly droves of people gathered at the cave's mouth. The situation garnered national attention with engineers, geologists, fellow cavers, and miners attempting various methods to free Floyd. However, their efforts proved futile, as they could only reach him but not extract him. Floyd's well-being took a turn for the worse on February 4th when part of the cave ceiling collapsed, further isolating him from everyone else. Then on the 16th of the same month, rescuers traversing the newly excavated shaft discovered Floyd's lifeless body. Examination of his remains revealed that he had died from exhaustion and starvation. Ironically, this event revolving around Floyd's death turned Crystal Cave into a popular attraction. Now you may be asking where the mystery is. Well, in 1929, there was a thief who attempted to steal Floyd's body. Police were ultimately able to find and recover his corpse with the help of bloodhounds. However, the corpse was missing a leg, and this was actually the second attempt made to steal Floyd's body. Whether or not these two attempts were made by the same person is unknown, and we have no idea why someone even wanted his body. Floyd Collins was given a quote-unquote proper burial in 1989 at the Mammoth Cave Baptist Church. This entry examines a case from 1936 in Pavlodar, Kazakhstan, shedding light on one of the first documented reports of a so-called high-tech humanoid, or in other words, a human with technology that wasn't consistent with the time period. Reports of flying humanoid entities have a long and varied history, with the earliest depictions centering on beings like angels or creatures like man-bats. But in 1936, there were reports of a technologically oriented flying human in Pavlodar, Kazakhstan. 15-year-old E.E. Laznaya was on her way to school one winter morning when she found herself face to face with a peculiar sight. As she crossed onto an isolated path, she spotted a medium-sized man in black overalls hovering in the sky. Additionally, he was wearing a black helmet that obscured his face. Strapped to the person's back was an oval-shaped rucksack, which emitted a distinctive low rumbling noise. What began as a fascination quickly turned into sheer terror as the jetpack man and abruptly changed directions, heading straight towards Lasnaya. In a panic, she frantically swung her head in every direction, seeking refuge, but she was stranded in the middle of a snowbank with nowhere to run. Fortunately, the jetpack man vanished from her sight, leaving her in a state of confusion and shock. This encounter challenges conventional explanations as jetpack technology was far from existence in the 1930s. So what exactly did she see that day? On January 6th, 1991, in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, the missing persons case of Terry Slagenhaupt began to unfold. Terry was a 28-year-old woman with a tumultuous past. She decided to set out one day, leaving behind her roommate in their North St. Clair Street apartment. Terry returned home that evening after her date, with plans to be picked up for a job interview the following day. Her roommate recalls Terry mentioning a quick trip to a nearby convenience store, which was a routine occurrence due to the lack of a phone inside of their apartment. However, on that fateful night, Terry never returned. Her abrupt disappearance raised immediate concerns, and her loved ones grew increasingly worried as days without word from Terry turned into weeks. Terry's backstory paints a picture of struggle. She hailed from Aspenwall, Pennsylvania, and her history was marred by alcohol abuse, which began as early as the 10th grade. Despite multiple stints in rehabilitation, she continued to battle her demons, often relapsing. Her relationship with her mother bore the scars of her addiction, but they still maintained contact, with Terry reaching out on holidays and birthdays. Her mother's last memory of Terry was during Christmas in 1990, when she visited with a mysterious man. Terry had plans to reunite with her brother on January 8th, but her absence was glaring. Her roommate informed her brother that Terry had not been seen for days. Investigators did suspect foul play, however, with the lack of evidence, it was hard to get the investigation going. Additionally, there were no witnesses who came forward saying that they saw Terry before her disappearance. Terry's mother believes her daughter is still alive, harboring hope that she would never vanish without a trace. Yet, further investigation has only deepened the mystery surrounding Terry's disappearance. In 
In the spring of 1920, a serene North Dakota community was jolted awake by a gruesome discovery that would go down in history as one of the most chilling murder cases that the state has ever seen. The Wolf family farm, once a picture of rural tranquility, became the epicenter of a horrifying crime scene, leaving the town of Turtle Lake in shock. John Kraft, a passing neighbor, stumbled upon the oddly unsettling sight of a laundry flapping endlessly on the Wolf family's clotheslines. It was a windy, soggy April day when Kraft decided to investigate, never suspecting the sinister secrets that awaited him. What he uncovered was a scarring scene. The lifeless bodies of Jacob Wolf, two of his young daughters, and five others lay strewn about the farm bearing the hallmarks of a gruesome massacre. The only survivor was a frail eight-month-old baby, the lone witness to the tragedy that had unfolded here. This set off a manhunt that gripped North Dakota in fear and fascination. Jacob Wolf, a respected and prosperous farmer, had seemed an unlikely target for such violence. While some friction with a neighbor had been noted, it was far from a motive for the heinous crime that had taken place. Sheriff Ol Steferud and McClellan County State's Attorney John E. Williams led the charge in solving the case. There was a prevailing belief among investigators that murderers often returned to the scene of their crimes, prompting a vigilant watch over the Wolf Farm. Suspicion soon fell on a man named Henry Lair, a neighbor who appeared during the surveillance. Layer's odd behavior, which included bizarre suggestions during the investigation, raised eyebrows. He claimed to have found shotgun shells in the barn, among other things. As the investigation continued, a growing crowd of investigators and onlookers descended upon the farm. Panic had gripped the community, and the pressure on law enforcement to apprehend the culprit was immense. Henry Lair's arrest came about through a cunning ruse, as officers staged a fake fugitive scenario. Under relentless questioning, Lair ultimately confessed to the murders, offering a harrowing account of an argument that escalated into violence. He claimed that the initial shotgun discharge had been accidental, and he lost control of his actions afterward. However, many aspects of Lair's confession left investigators and theorists puzzled. Inconsistencies with the crime scene and details from Lair that didn't quite add up raised doubts about the authenticity of his confession. Was Lair truly the cold-blooded killer he admitted to being, or had he been coerced into a confession under duress? Authorities were facing major backlash from the community for not yet finding a killer, so it's not exactly out of the realm of possibility for authorities to arrest the first viable suspect. Lair's apparent hazy memory of the events leading up to the murders fueled speculation. Some argued that the crime scene suggested a different narrative, one that didn't align with the confession. The Wolf family murders remain shrouded in mystery to this day. While Henry Lair was sentenced to life imprisonment at hard labor and eventually passed away, questions persist about what truly happened on that April day in 1920. Many people are of the opinion that Henry was wrongfully convicted, leaving room for debate and further inquiry into this chilling chapter of North Dakota's history. Alberto Gordoni's disappearance and reappearance is truly baffling. Residing in Catania, Sicily in the mid-18th century, Alberto was not a man of extraordinary fame, but a respected artisan and gardener in his community, living a modest life. Little did he know that one day in May of 1753, his life would be changed forever. Our story begins in the bustling town square of Catania. Alberto was strolling through the square when, in a bewildering turn of events, he simply vanished into thin air. This perplexing occurrence unfolded before the eyes of numerous stunned witnesses, leaving them in a state of disbelief. Immediate efforts were launched to locate Alberto, with concerned townsfolk meticulously scouring the area and examining nearby houses. Their extensive search efforts yielded no trace of Alberto. Equally baffling was the absence of any discernible ditches or voids into which he could have fallen into. It appeared as though this unassuming man had existed one moment and, in the next, had vanished from the earthly realm entirely. Days turned into weeks, weeks to months, months to years, with no sign of Alberto. As time went on, the memory of him gradually faded from the collective consciousness of the town residents. 
Yet, after a staggering 22 years had passed, Alberto suddenly reappeared at the very spot where he had vanished. To the amazement of those who remembered him, he appeared virtually unchanged in age. However, the most perplexing aspect of his return was his adamant assertion that he had never disappeared and that those 22 years had not elapsed for him. It took several additional years before Alberto would confide in a local priest named Mario, finally shedding light on the baffling events that had transpired. According to Alberto, on the day he vanished, he had encountered a shimmering tunnel. With an otherworldly curiosity, he ventured into it and was transported into a surreal and incomprehensible world. Inside this unknown realm, Alberto found himself surrounded by inexplicable objects and peculiarities. He described a canvas-like surface adorned with stars and pulsating dots, with a singular ethereal figure with long hair standing right in front of him. This figure revealed that Alberto had unwittingly stumbled into a crack of time and space, making his return a tough challenge. The long-haired entity also spoke of souls existing without flesh and cities that floated among the skies, inhabited by eternally youthful beings. Priest Mario was convinced of the authenticity of Alberto's incredible story. Together, they revisited the location of Alberto's initial disappearance, and to their astonishment, Alberto vanished once more. This time, however, he never returned. There was no reappearance after years and even decades. Witnessed by Mario himself, this event prompted him to make the sign of the cross and designate the location as the Devil's Trap. If you're like the millions of people around the world that has caffeine in their daily life, check out partner of the channel, Gamersups. They have a wide array of amazing flavors, and each serving is less than 40 cents with my code DLAM, which gives you 10% off your order. Some of my personal favorites are Titty Milk and Guacamole Gamer Farts. It also supports the channel, so if you're interested, check out the first link in the description. Now, back to the video. A story that blurs the line between the supernatural and the natural is that of Christopher Case's strange death. Chris was a 35-year-old man living in Seattle, Washington, whose encounter with a mysterious woman took a chilling turn in 1991. Chris's story began during a business trip to San Francisco. There, he crossed paths with a woman who shared his deep passion for ancient music. However, what was initially an evening of conversations quickly morphed into something far more sinister. The woman whose identity remains unknown made unwanted romantic advances towards Christopher. Unperturbed by his rejection, she took an unnerving turn. She revealed herself as a witch and cast a curse upon him, foretelling his death within a week. Chris understandably was a little rattled from this encounter. He sought solace and advice from a close friend named Sammy Soder, who supposedly possessed psychic abilities. After receiving a disturbing vision, Sammy chose not to share the details, deepening this mystery. Over the following days, Christopher's life took a harrowing turn. He began hearing whispers and the sounds of footsteps in his apartment. He confided in his friends about nighttime attacks, waking up with unexplained cuts and blood. The situation escalated rapidly, with Christopher leaving a desperate message, hinting that his days were numbered. As he counted down to the seventh day, his friends grew increasingly alarmed by his accounts of unexplained phenomena. It was on the ominous seventh day that a concerned friend finally contacted the authorities for a wellness check on Christopher. When officers arrived at Chris's apartment in April of 1991, they were met with a scene that defied rational explanation. Crucifixes adorned the walls, burned down candles littered the apartment, and lines of salt had been meticulously poured along the base of the walls. In the dry bathtub, they discovered Chris's lifeless body. In a turn that seemed to defy the supernatural narrative, medical examiners concluded that Christopher's cause of death was acute myocarditis, a condition marked by inflammation of the heart muscle. The official verdict was heart failure, a far cry from the ominous curses and paranormal encounters that had been recounted. Accounts from Chris's his friends shed further light on his descent into darkness. A woman from Fayetteville, North Carolina, whose identity was not disclosed, revealed that Christopher had confided in her about the witch's curse. According to her, the curse was cast because Chris had rejected the witch's advances. Despite her concern, she stated that there was no sign of a crime, violence, robbery, or foul play involved. That psychic and friend we mentioned earlier named Sammy disclosed that Chris had shared his fears with her in several phone calls leading up to his demise. She emphasized that Chris had been stable and healthy and he had not previously exhibited any belief in witchcraft. 
she had advised him to seek help for his escalating fears. And it should go without saying, Chris didn't have any issues in his medical history. So was his death all a coincidence or was this lady actually a witch? And who even was she? For over six decades, the Bachness Eck Marine Observatory has been a cornerstone of oceanic research in the Baltic Sea. However, in a surprising turn of events, the observatory's data transmissions abruptly ceased. Upon dispatching divers to investigate, researchers were met with an unsettling discovery. The remote sensors responsible for data measurements had been forcibly removed. Herman Bonge, the coordinator of Bachness Eck from Geomar, recounted the incident, stating, on August 21st at 8.15 p.m., it stopped the data transmission. Initially, the team suspected a mere transmission error, but the diver's findings on the seabed painted a much grimmer picture. When they reached the observatory's location, they discovered only the torn off land cable utterly shredded. The missing equipment includes two large racks, one weighing 550 pounds meant to supply power to the monitoring station via a land cable, and the other weighing 220 pounds housing critical sensors. Due to their substantial size and weight, experts find it unlikely that storms, currents, or large marine mammals could have dislodged them. Law enforcement agencies have initiated an investigation into the disappearance of this equipment, estimated to be valued at over 300,000 USD. But researchers emphasize that the data it provides is priceless. Herman expressed, at first we tried to find the devices with our own research and other diving applications, so far without success. That's why we would be very happy about any hints. He further suggested that someone may have observed something unusual at a nearby campsite on August 21st or found parts of the equipment frames on the beach. The story of Huan Yan Chu's three mysterious disappearances would captivate the nation and become one of China's most famous unsolved mysteries. On the evening of July 27th, 1977, Huang had just completed his daily farm work and retired to his unfinished home. He was 21 years old, recently engaged, and planned for a quiet and simple future with his fiance. However, the morning of July 28th brought along a startling change. The young farmer had vanished without a trace. The village was thrown into turmoil as they initiated a massive search operation, scouring the countryside, contacting hospitals and police, all to no avail. Then a little over a week later, on August 6th, an unexpected telegram arrived in Dongbei Gao, which is the name of the small village that Huang lived in. The telegram was from Shanghai and revealed that Huang was held at a deportation center awaiting pickup. The astounding part was that the telegram dated July 28th at 9am, meaning it was issued shortly after Huang's disappearance. He was eventually returned to the village by Shanghai police. The villagers eagerly asked Huang what had happened and his account had them utterly confused. He claimed to have gone to bed only to wake up amidst the hustle and bustle of Nanjing, which was over 485 miles from his village. The time frame of his journey, less than half a day, defied the limits of available transportation. Then on September 8th, during the harvest season, Huang disappeared yet again. His home was found empty with a cryptic message carved into his bedroom wall. Shan Dong Gao Dan Min Gao Yanjin Relax. Just as before, Huang was found in Shanghai, and this time, witnesses from both Shanghai and his village could testify to his presence in both locations. Yet Huang remained unable to explain how he traversed such vast distances in impossibly short durations. But somehow, Huang's story just continues, with a third disappearance commencing on September 20th. After a day of labor, Huang collapsed in his yard. After being returned home, he would not be seen again until the 28th with yet another story that defied reason. According to Huang, after losing consciousness, he awoke in a luxury hotel room. Two men, the same individuals from his prior disappearances, introduced themselves as Gao Dingmin and Gao Yanjin. And if you remember, these are also the same names that were carved into Huang's wall. They claimed responsibility for his vanishing acts and revealed their plan to take him to nine major Chinese cities over the course of nine days. Huang claimed that they possessed the ability to fly at astonishing speeds, taking him to cities such as Beijing, Tianjin, Nanjing, and many more, all within an hour. 
Over the years, various theories and accusations have been thrown around. Some suggested sleepwalking, but the logistics of this theory face significant challenges. Multiple personality disorder was also considered but ultimately dismissed for a lack of evidence. And of course, UFO involvement and military experimentation were also proposed, but they lacked any sort of concrete proof. And obviously, there's a possibility that Huang simply lied about the entire thing. In the realm of cryptids, sea serpents have long captured the imagination of sailors and scientists alike. Among the various classifications of sea serpents, one remains shrouded in mystery, the giant invertebrates. This unique category, first conceptualized by Bernard Uvalims and expanded upon by Michael Woodley, encompasses an assortment of bizarre marine organisms. Unlike their better known sea serpent counterparts, giant invertebrates have largely escaped the spotlight, despite intriguing and perplexing encounters in our oceans. Perhaps the most intriguing encounter with a giant invertebrate occurred around 1961 to 1962 when the Shell Oil Company's underwater robot captured footage of an unidentified marine entity dubbed Marvin off the coast of Santa Barbara. This creature, estimated to be 15 feet in length and 6 inches in diameter, exhibited a unique corkscrew or spiral motion. Witnesses aboard the drilling ship were captivated over the live feed. The mysterious creature graced the crew with its presence for over an hour. Marine biologists in Los Angeles grappled with identifying Marvin. Speculations ran rampant, but the limited footage offered no conclusive answers. To this day, Marvin remains an unclassified marine creature, adding yet another layer to the mysterious world of underwater sea creatures. In 2015, John Lang embarked on a mission to expose what he believed was harassment and intimidation orchestrated by powerful authorities in Fresno, California. His journey unfolded on his YouTube channel, Lang Marine, where he documented his allegations of being targeted due to comments he made in a local newspaper regarding corruption and alleged illegal activities. Among the issues he highlighted was a license plate scanning scam motivated by profit and primarily affecting the city's less fortunate residents. Lang's quest for transparency and accountability led him to install multiple CCTV cameras around his property. He regularly uploaded footage to his channel, revealing instances where individuals, including Fresno police personnel, were caught lurking outside his home at odd hours. Lang also reported instances of tampering with his door locks and computer devices, which he perceived as part of a prolonged campaign of harassment and intimidation. These experiences persisted for nearly six months. Initially, some dismissed Link's claims as ramblings of a paranoid or mentally unwell individual. However, the situation took a tragic turn when, just four days after his last video upload, John Lang was discovered dead in his burning home. A local newspaper reported his death as a result of a fire, but the official police reports offered a starkly different narrative. According to law enforcement, Lang had three self-inflicted stab wounds to his chest and had also set the fire himself. The discrepancy between the initial reports and the official police findings raised eyebrows, prompting speculation about the true nature of Lang's demise. Comment sections on Lang's YouTube channel became a breeding ground for discussions that challenged the official account, with some commenters suggesting that he may have been murdered rather than having taken his own life. The mysterious means surrounding John's death have fueled ongoing controversy and debates about the case. The Osset murder case of 1974 is an incident that stands out for not only its brutality, but also for the creepy circumstances that surrounded it. Michael Taylor, an unassuming butcher from Osset, West Yorkshire, became the central figure in a harrowing tale of alleged demonic possession, an exorcism gone awry, and a gruesome murder. Michael and his wife Christine led a simple life in Osset. The couple was not particularly religious, but a sense of community drew them to the Gobber Christian Fellowship group. Trouble started brewing when Christine, with a concerned look in her eyes, revealed to the group that she believed her husband was having an inappropriate relationship with the group's leader, Mary Robinson. 
She alleged that there was a quote-unquote carnal dimension to it, setting the stage for an ominous chain of events. Deep inside of him, Michael felt an evil presence growing stronger. As tensions escalated, he confronted Mary in a heated exchange that left everyone in the fellowship group on edge. Little did they know that this confrontation was just the beginning. With Michael's behavior spiraling out of control, the local vicar felt compelled to take action. He summoned Father Peter Vincent, an Anglican priest from the St. Thomas Church, and enlisted the assistance of Reverend Raymond Smith. Together, they embarked on an arduous journey to rid Michael of his apparent demonic possession. In early October of 1974, the old stone walls of St. Thomas's Church witnessed an otherworldly battle. In an all-night ceremony, the ministers invoked and cast out an astonishing 40 demons, including those associated with the darkest of sins. Exhausted but resolute, they believed they had purged the malevolence, yet they still feared that three demons lingered within Michael, insanity, murder, and violence. The next day, as Michael and Christine returned home, an unspeakable transformation overcame him. The sinister forces that had haunted him had influenced Michael to commit a horrific act of brutality. Michael turned on his wife with savagery. Using only his bare hands, he tore out Christine's eyes and tongue and proceeded to take the life of their pet poodle in a similar manner. A concerned passerby discovered a blood-soaked and nude Michael Taylor in the streets of Osset. The gruesome scene prompted a swift response from the authorities. The courtroom drama that followed was as surreal as the events themselves. Michael faced trial and was acquitted on the grounds of insanity. He was committed to the grim confines of Broadmoor Hospital for two long years before spending an additional two years in a secure ward in Bradford. This unsettling murder case with its blend of alleged demonic possession and a heinous murder became a legend that continued to intrigue and perplex. Was Michael Taylor truly possessed by evil demons, or is there a much more grounded explanation? Michael was described as never having any ill will towards anyone, so what made him brutally attack his dog and his beloved wife? There are many stories that defy explanation, leaving behind more questions than answers the deeper the investigators get. Such is the case with the vanishing of Mary Ann Adams and her son Jack in the desolate reaches of Cockle Creek, Tasmania back in 1908. This strange tale has remained largely obscured, but its unusual circumstances and lingering mysteries continue to intrigue those who stumble upon it. Mary Ann Adams was a widow who had spent the majority of her life along the rugged coastline of southern Tasmania. Her son, aged 22, had both physical and mental disabilities, necessitating her almost constant attention. On May 5th, 1908, accompanied by their faithful dog, they embarked on what seemed to be a routine chore, fetching a missing cow. Little did they know that this would be the last time anyone saw them. Despite an extensive search effort involving approximately 100 individuals, no trace of Mary, her son, or any clue to their fate was ever uncovered. The wilderness seemed to have swallowed them whole, leaving behind an eerie silence that only deepened the mystery. A breakthrough of sorts occurred when a grandson of Mary's unearthed a box containing the remains of a dog. The dog's striking resemblance to the one that had accompanied Mary and her son on the day they went missing raised hopes that this discovery might finally provide some closure to the decades-old mystery. This finding prompted the Metropolitan Superintendent of Police to launch a fresh investigation, focusing on how the dog met its end and whether it was indeed the same companion of the missing pair. If it was the same dog, how exactly did it perish after its owners vanished? Several aspects of this case have confused investigators and continue to intrigue those who delve into its history. Firstly, the idea that Mary and her son might have fallen into a creek was considered but ultimately dismissed due to the shallow waters and the presence of logs. Moreover, Mary's son had significant physical limitations and was prone to epileptic fits. A doctor believed it was unlikely for him to venture far of his own free will. He was also known to be greatly fond of the dog, and they had a very close relationship. Another puzzling element was the family surroundings. Mary had lived in the area for most of her life and was thus very familiar with the terrain. Additionally, there were neighbors nearby, so if she was in trouble, she could have just screamed out to them. It is challenging to comprehend how she and her son could have become disoriented in an area they knew well. Because of this, many investigators think foul play was involved. 
William Adams, one of Mary's other sons, joined the search efforts as soon as he learned of his mother and brother's disappearance. William and another man continued to return to Mary's cottage regularly, hoping to attract the dog back with a fire's glow, but to no avail. Mary's home was also left in perfect order with no signs of disarray or disturbance. Years later, the house was destroyed by fire and then that's when William's son, by some odd twist of fate, unearthed the remains of that dog. The disappearance of Mary and Jack remains an obscure and confusing event. Despite the numerous search efforts and the discovery of the dog's remains, the fate of the missing pair remains unknown. The Zaragoza Goblin is a case that captivated the imagination of 1930 Spain. In September of 1934, the tranquil streets of Zaragoza bore witness to an inexplicable phenomenon that brought together police, the military, and international press all summoned to confront the strange voice of a goblin dwelling within a residential stove. This odd occurrence continues to baffle historians and paranormal enthusiasts alike. It all began on an ordinary day on September 27th, 1934 within the Palazin family's second floor apartment. The Palazins found themselves confronted by an odd presence, a voice that emanated from the walls of their kitchen, specifically from their stove and its chimney. The strangeness of the voice stemmed from the fact that it seemed to belong to a male figure and was not confined solely to that single family's kitchen. Intriguingly, when the Palazins sought help from their neighbors, the voice continued to manifest itself, compelling a growth number of witnesses to acknowledge its existence. Word rapidly spread about the haunting in the neighborhood, and while some dismissed it as a prank, others perceived the presence as that of a duende or elf slash goblin. Local interest in the peculiar attraction reached a fever pitch and curious onlookers crowded around the Palazin's home in a bid to catch a snippet of the entity speaking. Eventually, the family turned to authorities for help. The police were hesitant at first, but took them up on the request after local hysteria mounted to unreasonable heights. The investigation started at the stove, but police were shocked when they were met with a resilient and uncanny voice that answered their questions with eerie accuracy. In December of 1934, the governor issued a statement that shocked Zaragoza. He accused the Palazon family's young maid, Pasquala, of being the culprit. The governor stated that the voice was a result of unconscious ventriloquism. The maid vehemently denied any involvement in this event. With no evidence to warrant an arrest and a lack of interest in pursuing one, the maid was allowed to return home. The building was demolished in 1977 and the new structure that stands in its place bears the name Goblin Building. While some believe the goblin to be a hoax, others believe there was truly something supernatural occurring in the home. One evening around 6pm, a widow's 8 year old daughter named Elizabeth was busy playing around in the cotton fields. Her mother's name was Patsy Reeves. Their home was not that far from the prominent landmark known as Chimney Rock. It was during this seemingly ordinary moment that Elizabeth made a startling discovery that she shared with her older brother Morgan. She claimed that she had spotted a man on Chimney Rock. At first, Morgan did not believe her, but Elizabeth just kept on insisting that she was sure there was someone up there. In fact, they were gathering what seemed like sticks and rolling rocks downhill. She also stated that there were actually a multitude of people up there. Morgan was now overcome with curiosity and decided to venture out to the cotton fields to investigate. Morgan didn't see any people, but the sight that he found was probably even stranger. There were thousands, perhaps tens of thousands of objects soaring through the air. But the strange events and sightings did not end there. All of this commotion attracted the attention of Patsy's four-year-old as well as another resident in the area. All of Patsy's kids as well as that resident visited the fields which also made Patsy curious and they were graced with the presence of a vast assembly of beings. Patsy said that they resembled humans and donned radiant white attire. There were no discernible indications of gender and their forms lacked any distinct features. They ranged drastically in size with some resembling a male in height and build while another was as small as an infant. For over an hour, these beings moved in a particular pattern which captivated the onlookers. When Patsy finally realized the gravity of the situation, she urgently went to send a message to a local resident named Robert Searcy as well as other neighbors. When they all arrived, they too were shocked at what they were seeing. Many are skeptical that this even happened while others look to this event as proof that extraterrestrial life has visited Earth. 
Julie Doe was the name of a transgender woman found dead in 1988 in Claremont, Florida. For decades, her true identity remained unknown as investigators initially believed she was a cisgender woman. It wasn't until 2015 that DNA testing revealed her biological male origin. One day in September of 1988, a resident of Claremont stumbled upon a shocking sight in the woods near Highway 474. There lay Julie Doe, a victim who had met a mysterious end. Her body, naturally mummified over time, had been concealed in the underbrush for approximately eight months. Julie's appearance added complexity to her story. Standing between 5 feet 9 inches and 5 feet 11 inches tall, she was estimated to be in her early 20s to mid 30s. Investigators initially believed Julie to be a cisgender woman, but Julie's origins took an unexpected turn in 2015. DNA testing revealed that the pelvic trauma she had endured was not from childbirth, as previously assumed, but from genital reassignment surgery. Julie's death bore haunting clues. It appeared as though she had been dragged off the highway and concealed in the woods. Her skirt was found partially removed, suggesting a possible sexual assault. The circumstances surrounding her death raised suspicions of foul play, yet the cause of it remained elusive. Isotope testing added another layer to Julie's story. The results indicated a strong connection to Southern Florida, suggesting that she had spent a significant portion of her life in that region. In 2018, the DNA Doe Project took up Julie's case, driven by a determination to unravel the mystery once and for all. Despite numerous challenges, including multiple unsuccessful attempts to extract her DNA, the organization continues to raise funds and explore every avenue to bring justice to Julie's existence. The case of the 2014 disappearance of 43 students in southern Mexico continues to be a haunting and unresolved tragedy. Developments have brought new attention to the case, shedding light on the complexities and challenges surrounding this deeply troubling incident. On September 26, 2014, security forces intercepted a group of students in Iguala, abducting them from buses and turning them over to a local gang. The motive behind this shocking act remains unclear, but evidence has emerged suggesting possible collusion between police, military, and traffickers. Over the years, investigations into the case have faced numerous setbacks and controversies. At the heart of these challenges lies the lack of cooperation and transparency from key actors, including the Mexican Armed Forces. International panels of experts appointed to probe the case have repeatedly voiced frustration at the military's unwillingness to cooperate, with accusations of false information and evidence concealment. The narrative surrounding the disappearance has undergone significant changes. An earlier version of events, known as the historical truth, laid blame solely on local police officials and organized crime. However, this version was discredited by the international panel's work, emphasizing the importance of impartial investigations. President Obrador pledged to solve the case and provide closure to the victims' families during his 2018 campaign. While some arrests have been made, convictions have been tough, leaving the families in search of justice and answers. Reports indicated the detention of eight soldiers linked to the case. At one point, the Attorney General's office faced criticism for canceling arrest orders for various suspects, including members of the military. The reasons behind these cancellations were not explained, raising concerns about the handling of the case. So this entry is kind of more like a conspiracy theory slash Mandela effect. The story of the 2006 volleyball incident is a captivating riddle. Before we actually dive into this one, it's important to acknowledge the obscurity surrounding it. References to this event stretch back several years, but given its alleged occurrence in 2006, many skeptics dismissed it as a fabrication. However, as we'll soon discover, outright dismissal may not be warranted. The narrative itself is surprisingly straightforward yet disturbing. According to accounts, a shooting or bombing occurred during a school volleyball event held in one of several U.S. states including Nebraska, South Dakota, North Dakota, Utah, Oregon, or Montana. 
Shockingly, it's reported that approximately 17 to 24 lives were lost during this event. Now, there are people who believe that there was a comprehensive cover-up where any mention of the shooting slash bombing vanished from public records, and the victims seem to have faded from the collective memory of their families and friends. The methods employed to achieve this astonishing feat vary depending on whom you ask. Some contend that hush money was distributed to the families and friends to ensure their silence. Those who dared to speak about the event allegedly faced dire consequences. Others propose a more psychological explanation, suggesting that anyone with any connection to the victims endured repeated abuse, leading to a sort of enforced amnesia or quote-unquote programming. Again, the identities of those involved have been completely wiped, which makes some believe that this is a possible Mandela effect, where many people believed something occurred when in reality it didn't, or at least not in the way that they remember it. Now, while we could just shut down this mystery right here, there are many internet sleuths that believe there is a wealth of information on this topic available on places like the dark web. And just to save you guys some time, there really isn't much information out there on this no matter where you look. Some people were able to find occasional discussions where investigators try and find out who were the culprits. One theory suggests that this entire thing was a social experiment staged by the government and everyone involved was just an actor. Another theory proposes that this was just mixed up with the Platte Canyon High School hostage crisis in 2006 in Bailey, Colorado. It was September 27th when 53-year-old Dwayne Morrison took six high school girls hostage and assaulted them. All of the hostages were able to escape except for one. Emily Keyes was tragically shot in the head, leading to her death. Dwayne then shot himself in the head. Nestled on the picturesque west coast of Washington State, a quiet town near Coppolis Beach was the backdrop for a series of events that unfolded in the mid-1960s, leaving a family shaken and their home in shambles. This entry revolves around a man named John, his wife Sue, and their two young boys, John Jr. and Timothy. John Sr., a responsible foreman at a roofing products mill, was renowned for his seriousness and commitment to his job. His reputation for being level-headed made the events that transpired all the more bewildering. It all began when Timothy claimed to have encountered a bizarre figure he referred to as the Cowman. His initial description puzzled John as he assumed it was merely a neighbor or a passerby wearing cowboy attire. However, Timothy's vivid recount of the encounter, describing a creature covered in fur and emanating a pungent odor, raised eyebrows and triggered concern within the family. Suspicion grew when John Jr. or JJ expressed feeling like he was being trailed through the woods. The family's collective apprehension and curiosity led them to explore the area near their home. They stumbled upon a tangled clump of reddish-brown coarse hair caught in the barbed wire fence, along with a small piece of flesh. The hair bore a striking resemblance to that of a horse's tail. Their investigation ultimately led them to the nearby woods where they encountered a massive seven foot tall creature with piercing red eyes standing upright on two legs emitting a snarling human-like expression. A tense standoff followed, concluding with the creature vanishing into the wilderness. The family locked themselves indoors that night. However, they swore they heard siren-like cries coming from the woods. John Sr. enlisted the help of his colleague, Patrick. Together, they discovered unsettling clues, including a large footprint and strange markings around their home. The barn on their property held an air of foreboding, and John couldn't shake the feeling that he was being watched. Despite their extensive search, no answers emerged. The climax of the story came when the beast decided to confront the family inside of their home. The wife and mother, Sue, was forced to fire off her shotgun to protect her kids. The creature attempted to reach through a window, but retreated after being wounded. This encounter unfortunately destroyed their home, and the family's life was irrevocably altered. Now, many are skeptical that there is a Bigfoot-like creature out there, obviously, but the mystery of this cryptid's existence has intrigued the public for many years. Zygmunt Ademski, aka Ziggy, was a 56-year-old coal miner who disappeared under mysterious circumstances from his home in Tingley, Yorkshire in June 1980. The subsequent discovery of his body on a coal pile in Todd Morden, 20 miles from his residence, sent shockwaves through the tight-knit community and sparked a flurry of speculation. 
Ziggy was a Polish immigrant who made England his home after fleeing post-World War II Poland. His life was typical of many immigrants who sought refuge and built new lives in foreign lands. He worked diligently as a coal miner and was married to Leocadia aka Lottie. However, Ziggy's health had deteriorated over the years due to lung deformities caused by coal dust exposure. One Friday afternoon, June 6, 1980, Ziggy embarked on what should have been a routine trip to the local shops. But this time would be his last. At around 3.30pm, he left his home on Hornfield Crescent and was never seen alive again. His wife was left with grave concerns during his initial disappearance. His colleagues at the coal mine were equally baffled at his vanishing. Five days after his disappearance, the eerie mystery took a chilling turn. A coal yard worker named Trevor Parker stumbled upon Ziggy's lifeless body atop a 10-foot high coal pile in Todd Morden. Ziggy was found wearing a suit but was missing his shirt, watch, and wallet. Even more puzzling, his clothes appeared to be fastened improperly and his hair had been roughly cropped. There were several details that stumped investigators. Firstly, despite being found on a coal pile, there was no trace of coal dust on his body or clothes. This raised questions about how he ended up there and whether he had been placed there. Additionally, Ziggy had mysterious burns on the back of his head, neck, and shoulders. A green substance was also found on his body that could not be identified despite exhaustive forensic scrutiny. The coroner, James Turnbull, recorded an open verdict, citing a heart attack as the cause of death. However, the conditions leading to this heart attack and the events leading up to his murder are unknown. Over the years, various theories emerged to explain Ziggy's bizarre death. Some suggested alien abduction, positing that extraterrestrials had experimented on him before discarding his body. Some even believed that the Soviet Union's KGB kidnapped him for experimenting. So I was going back and forth on whether or not I wanted to include this one, and in the end I decided why not as a sort of extra topic at the very end. So this mystery is probably one of the most famous ones in history, and I think the general consensus is that it's solved? Question mark. But then again, it's one of those events with an explanation that some are probably not satisfied with, but you guys can be the judge at the very end. 1587 marked a pivotal year when a band of English colonizers led by the intrepid explorer John White made their landfall on Roanoke Island. Their arrival represented the second attempt to establish a permanent English colony in this new world. With the colony's prospects teetering on the brink, John White embarked on a fateful journey back to England, leaving behind his family on Roanoke Island. However, disaster struck when the escalating conflict with Spain rendered him unable to secure a return voyage. Three long years later, White's return to the island unveiled an unsettling scene. The settlement, once teeming with life, now lay deserted, devoid of any inhabitants. His wife, daughter, and the rest of his family had all vanished without a trace. White and his crew launched a frantic search for any clues to their whereabouts, but found only the cryptic marking, Croatoan, etched into trees at the colony's border. No graves or bodies hinted at a calamity. Amidst impending storms, their investigation was abruptly halted, and they were compelled to depart the island for Plymouth. The Roanoke colony would never again be glimpsed by White or any other English voyagers. But the thing is, the mystery of the Roanoke colony was effectively solved as early as 1605 from the colonizers' perspective and even earlier by neighboring Native Americans. When John White and his crew stumbled upon the abandoned settlement, their initial hypothesis was that the colonists had integrated with the indigenous population, a group better adapted to the region's challenges. In 1701, explorer John Lawson's observations confirmed this theory, revealing that several of the Native American descendants shared Caucasian traits. These revelations further validated the early suppositions that the English settlers had indeed merged with a local tribe. But again, this has been a long-standing quote-unquote answer to the mystery, yet many people still look at the Roanoke event as unsolved. So let me know what you think in the comments. The Belmez faces refers to these odd stains that appeared in a home in Belmez de la Moraleda, which was a village tucked away in Andalusia, Spain. 
What made these stains so interesting was that they appeared to take the forms of human faces, hence the name. This all began in August of 1971 when a woman named Maria Camara was in her kitchen and saw a stain taking shape out of the corner of her eye. The stain gradually spread through the concrete kitchen floor and once it was complete, the stain resembled a scary looking face. A little creeped out, Maria tried to clean the stain. Using a towel didn't seem to work, so she tried other unconventional ways. Maria yelled for her husband and son, and they proposed the idea that they'll destroy the face with an axe and then re-cement the floor. And you would probably think such extreme measures would get rid of the stain, and it did, but only for a brief amount of time. Not even a week later, the face in the kitchen reappeared, and this time there was more than just one. Word quickly spread and the home eventually earned the name The House of Faces. Neighbors and experts in parapsychology began to flood the house wanting to see the phenomenon with their own eyes. There was a rumor that the house had skeletons inside. Apparently, some people offered to excavate the floor to remove the faces. And once they dug it up, they discovered that there were indeed skeletons underneath the house. That same group then casted a new floor, but again, the faces showed up. This time, it took about two weeks for a fresh face to spawn in. The family ultimately gave up on removing the stains as it was clear that they weren't going to go away. There are many people who believe that the entire incident was a hoax and that the family simply painted the stains with special material that couldn't be washed away. If true, they obviously did this to try and make a profit. On December 27, 1991, four-year-old Nikki Campbell went missing after leaving a friend's house. Nikki was accompanied by her five-year-old brother, Matthew. They decided to leave at 4.30pm on their bikes to another friend's place, but Matthew said that he was tired and wanted to go back home to bed. Nikki said, okay, that's fine, and went to visit this other friend all alone. Nikki and Matthew's mother, Anne, got home about an hour later and noticed that Nikki was missing. She asked Matthew where his sister was and he told her that Nikki went to play with a friend. But at 7pm, there was still no sign of Nikki. Anne began to worry, so she went out to search for her. Matthew took his mother to the house that Nikki was supposed to be at, and once they arrived, they learned that Nikki was never there. Anne called the police and reported Nikki missing at 8pm, and police were able to find her bike in a small area covered with grass. This particular spot was just a couple of blocks from the Campbell family home. Then on the street nearby the bike was a pair of blue socks that appeared to belong to a child, but it was never confirmed whether or not these belonged to Nikki. Using Nikki's scents from the bike, dogs were able to lead investigators to a nearby McDonald's which then led to Interstate 80, and briefly after entering the highway, the scent was lost. Authorities announced to the public that four-year-old Nikki Campbell was likely abducted, and not long after this announcement, tips started to flood in. One witness said that they saw a screaming child inside of a vehicle that looked just like Nikki. Police scoured the area where the car was seen, but found no trace of the girl. While there wasn't much evidence to work with in Nikki's case, investigators suspected that it may have been tied to other missing children's incidents. You see, Nikki was the fourth girl to disappear in the San Francisco Bay Area in the last four years. Before her were Amber Swartz, Michaela Garrett, and Eileen Michaloff. They were 7, 9, and 13 years old respectively, and they all went missing between 1988 and 1989. And if you take a look further back in time, in 1983 in Antioch, California, a 5-year-old girl named Angela Bouguet, who was found murdered. And here is the interesting part. One of the bloodhounds led investigators to Angela's grave when they were trying to track down Nikki. There was this man named Tim Bidner who visited the grave over 90 times a year. The scent then led from the grave to Tim's car. After further investigation into Tim, police discovered that he was sending weird letters to a 12-year-old that lived in the same neighborhood as Nikki. Additionally, he sent a Christmas card to an FBI profiler that had an image of a girl holding up four fingers, possibly hinting at the age of his next victim. Tim was named the prime suspect a year after Dickie's disappearance. His home was subsequently searched and he chose to remain silent throughout the entire procedure. However, officers took note of his violent shaking. Investigators discovered dog tags with the names of the missing girls etched onto them. And although this is very suspicious, there wasn't any evidence that would 100% without a doubt tie him to the actual disappearances. 
Tim later filed a defamation lawsuit against the city of Fairfield, where he settled for $90,000 out of court. While Tim was the most likely suspect, he was never charged for Nikki's disappearance and maintains his innocence. Nikki's kidnapper and her whereabouts are still unknown. During the 1990s in Japan, there was a trend where shows based on mysteries surged in popularity. The show that we'll be looking at today was called Tante Night Scoop, or Detective Night Scoop. This show in particular didn't niche down to a particular subset of mysteries, but instead, they encouraged their viewers to send in requests of pretty much any mystery that they would like to see get covered. These mysteries could be about ghosts, murders, or even scams. One of the strangest requests was for the group to investigate a lost Colonel Sanders statue that was apparently dumped in some river. One episode that aired in March of 1992 was focused on a seemingly uneventful topic. A comedian named Masa was selected to be the host of this episode. The request took them to Osaka and described a creepy arrangement of packing ropes tied to guardrails and telephone poles. At first, there were only a few, but as the weeks went by, more and more of these ropes just appeared. The residents began to speak amongst themselves, asking each other who left these ropes and for what reason. But it seemed that nobody knew the answer to either of those questions. Which is very odd since this particular area in Osaka was known to be pretty dense and busy, so how exactly was the culprit avoiding detection? Masa gets the idea to ask some hardware stores in the area if they had any packing ropes left. However, the shop owners had no idea who the person was. When examining the ropes, Masa noticed that they seemed to be grouped in one general area. But then he realized that they almost acted as a trail which, when followed, took Masa to a dark alleyway where thousands and thousands of ropes covered every inch of visible surface. If he had to guess, he thought that there were 300,000 or more ropes in that spot alone. This really shook Masa and he turned to leave immediately. Afterwards, he said that he did not want to continue the investigation and on screen right before the video ended, the following statement was issued. We will not be reporting on any further information regarding this case. Thank you for your understanding. This entry sort of doubles as a lost media subject as the original footage of the episode is missing. There are only limited transcripts and a few screen grabs available. According to some, the entire video found its way on YouTube a number of times, but was shortly deleted after uploading. Some viewers of the original episode claimed that when Masa entered the alleyway, the cameraman turned away from the ropes for a brief moment, and when they turned back around, at least a few hundred more ropes spawned in. There were a few posts made on some Japanese websites that said an elderly woman was roaming the area and tying the ropes. This idea was further supported when another host of the show claimed that they attempted to interview a woman in the area about the ropes but were unable to since she seemed to be delusional and out of her mind. She mumbled stuff like, I have to tie the ropes, couldn't stop tying them. But to my understanding, the identity of this woman was never revealed. This entry refers to one of the most notorious series of murders that were committed in Belgium from the early 1980s to the mid-1980s. The Brabant killers were responsible for the deaths of 28 people and injuring 22 others. These casualties occurred in the midst of various robberies that typically involved low-value items such as groceries. Another strange aspect of these killings is that the people responsible seemed to go out of their way to incite a fight with the police instead of focusing on their escape. But their proficiency proved that they didn't need to allocate all of their focus on evading authorities. The robbers displayed high levels of skill and investigators suspected that they had military backgrounds. The vehicles that the killers used were modified with high-powered automatic and military-grade weapons as well. It is believed that there were three main figures within the group who were nicknamed the Giant, the Killer, and the Old Man. Then there was a roster of support characters. There was never concise evidence to prove this, but many believe that one if not several of the killers worked in the police force. In 1982, there were five incidents that focused on the Brabant killers. On March 13th, two men stole a 10-gauge fouling shotgun, then on May 10th, an Austin Allegro was stolen at gunpoint and later ditched in the same day. 
On August 14th, there was an armed robbery on a grocery store where food and wine were stolen. In this particular confrontation, two French police were wounded. On September 30th, there was another armed robbery, this time on a weapons dealer. Fifteen guns were stolen and a police officer was killed and three others severely wounded. In late December, another robbery was done on a restaurant where the sole employee at the time was tortured and killed. In 1983, there were a total of 12 crimes committed by this group two of which were in January, three in February, one in March, one in May, two in September, two in October, and one on December 1st. There were several more robberies in the following years, but in November of 1986, investigators made an important discovery. Tucked inside of a canal were tons of weapons and tools that the gang used for their crimes. But there was intense drama as a result of this discovery. Apparently, this location was already searched in the past with nothing to show for it. So, some officials believed that the ones that led the search that did result in the weapons were manipulating the investigations. The identities of the giant, the killer, and the old man have never been revealed and the fact that this group was able to get away with killing and robbing repeatedly continues to baffle people to this day. On April 11th 12th, 1981, in Keddy, California, there was a gruesome quadruple homicide involving Glenna Sharp, her son John, her daughter Tina, and John's friend Dana Wingate. And Glenna was often just called Sue, so that's what I will be referring to her as for this entry. The group was staying at a place known as the Keddy Resort in cabin number 28, which is now just an empty lot. Sue had recently gone through a messy breakup with her husband, where the couple agreed that Sue would take the kids. She was also a mother of five. Money was tight, so she decided to rent one of the cabins in Keddy. On the morning of the 12th, Sue's 14-year-old daughter, Sheila, returned to the cabin after spending the night at a friend's. When the girl stepped inside, she discovered the lifeless bodies of her mother Sue, John, and Dana. And don't worry, I have not forgotten about Tina. She will be brought up later on. Two of the younger kids, Rick and Greg, as well as their friend, were also inside the cabin when the three were murdered. But they were unharmed. As for Tina, she couldn't be found anywhere. It actually took about three years before authorities found her remains around Feather Falls. The killer or killers were never identified. In the past, Keddy Resort was a popular destination, but in the late 1970s, the resort had taken a turn for the worse financially. Most of the cabins were run down and were rented out to low-income households. Sue and her kids were moving to the area from Connecticut in July 1979. Initially, Sue was staying with her brother named Don. From there, Sue moved her family into a tiny trailer in Quincy, before moving yet again to cabin 28 in Keddy. It was 11.30 a.m. on April 11th, 1981, when Sue, Sheila, and Greg drove to Quincy to pick up Rick, who was at baseball tryouts. And it just so happened that on this drive, they would encounter John and Dana, who were hitchhiking their way back to Keddy. Sue went ahead and dropped them off at their destination, where they later hitchhiked back to Quincy to meet up with some friends in the downtown area. After picking up Rick, Sue drove the kids back home, where Sheila left at 8 p.m. to stay the night with her friend. Now, Tina was actually at that same house Sheila was headed towards, so when Sheila got there, she told Tina that their mom wanted her back home by 10 p.m., and it wasn't until 7 a.m when Sheila got back to cabin 28 to find her mother, brother, and Dana dead. Sheila immediately sprinted back to her friend's house and told the adults what had happened. She added that two of her brothers and one of their friends were still at the house, so one of the adults rushed over to that cabin and grabbed them. When authorities arrived at the crime scene, they discovered two knives and a hammer covered in blood. One of the two knives had been bent at a 30 degree angle. Sue's body was left partially clothed and a blue bandana as well as her underwear were used as a gag on her. Sue and John were determined to have died from knife wounds while Dana was strangled. Investigators were able to come up with a variety of suspects over the years, one of which was Sue's husband, James. James was known to have a bad temper and lash out in rage when he didn't get his way. There was also a man named Martin Smart who was friends with Sue's husband and also stayed in one of the Keddy cabins on the night of April 11th. He too had a history of being violent, and he later failed a polygraph test in regards to these 
these murders. But before he could be charged with anything, he died of cancer in the year 2000. There were several key issues when it came to investigating the case, one of which was the compromised crime scene and evidence. It took authorities too long to adequately secure the area, and thus many aspects of the crime scene may have been altered. Authorities went door to door questioning the other residents of the resort, and the couple inside of cabin 16 stated that they heard what sounded like muffled screaming around 1am. When they first heard it, they didn't know what it was, but after being told that three people were murdered, they said that it had to have been the victims screaming for help. The phone of cabin 28 had been ripped off of its hook and the cord was torn apart. Police couldn't detect any signs of forced entry, and if you recall, one of the suspects I mentioned was named Martin Smart. When police questioned him, he said that one of his hammers had gone missing. The family that Sheila was staying with said that they noticed a green van parked nearby cabin 28 just before 9pm. They have never seen this vehicle in the area before. As for the three boys who survived, they had inconsistent accounts of the events. At first, Justin said that he only dreamed up his account of the murder, which he later admitted was a lie, and in reality, he actually witnessed the entire thing. It was only when Justin was hypnotized when he started to provide some vital information. He said he was sleeping in the same room as Rick and Greg and began to hear noises in the living room. When he opened up the door just a bit to take a peek, he said he saw Sue with two unknown men. One had short hair while the other had long hair. Both wore glasses and the one with the short hair had a mustache. John and Dana then stepped into the living room not knowing what was going on, and that's when everyone started yelling at each other. A brawl followed and one of the men grabbed Tina and took off with her from the back door of the cabin. With the details Justin provided, composite sketches were released to the public. The culprits were believed to be in their 20s to 30s. One of them was about 6 feet tall with dark blonde hair, while the other was about 5 foot 6 to 5 foot 9 inches tall with black hair. And on the night of the murders, they were both wearing glasses. One rumor that began to spread was that the murders may have been a result of Dana stealing LSD. However, there really wasn't any evidence to support this, and despite obtaining blood, footprints, and hair samples from the crime scene, investigators were unable to put together a conclusive identity to the suspects. In regards to Tina, the FBI issued a public statement that she was abducted. But on April 29th, 1981, the FBI halted their search efforts, saying that the California State Department of Justice was doing an adequate job and the FBI wasn't necessary. It took another three years before Tina was found. On April 22nd, 1984, a bottle collector called police saying that he found fragments of what he believed was a skull, as well as part of a jaw near Feather Falls. This location was about 100 miles from Keddie. The Butt County Sheriff's Office issued a state regarding this discovery and at the time they didn't identify who the skull belonged to. Not long after this discovery, an anonymous caller contacted the police and told them that it was Tina. It took two additional months before forensic pathologists confirmed that the skull fragments and the jaw did indeed belong to her. In that same area, police also found a blue jacket, a pair of Levi jeans, a blanket, and a medical tape dispenser. There was a documentary regarding the murders released in 2008. In this documentary, the wife of Martin Smart claimed that her husband and a friend of his known as John Bobadet were the killers. According to her, the three were at a bar, but she decided to go home early. Instead of going with her, Martin and John stayed at the bar. Then at 2am on the 12th, she said that she saw the two burning stuff on the stove. In the same documentary, a police officer who interviewed both men stated that both Martin and John were innocent. But there was a lot of criticism about how the investigation was being conducted. Furthermore, there were confession letters and a therapist that claimed that the men confessed to the murders. But nevertheless, the two men were never charged. The Wednesday Strangler is the name given to an unidentified serial killer from Japan whose reign lasted from 1975 to 1989. Six of the seven victims went missing on Wednesday, hence the name. All of them were women and none of them were found alive. The bodies of the 5th, 6th, and 7th victims were found a group together in Kitagata in 1989. The identity of the murderer remains unknown and the statute of limitations expired for 4 out of the 7 murders. The murders took place in Kitagata, Shiroishi, and Kita Shigayasu in the Saga Prefecture. The first victim was a 12-year-old middle schooler who was all alone at home on August 27, 1975. Her body would remain undiscovered for nearly half a decade. In June of 19. 
1980, some workers opened up the septic tank of a toilet at an elementary school in Shiroishi to reveal the lifeless body of the victim. The second victim was 20 years old and lived in Shiroishi as well. She disappeared on April 12th, 1980, and was also found in a septic tank on June 24th of the same year. Now, I do want to be clear, I am not sure if this is the same location as the previous victim that we went over. The text that I read was translated, and as you all probably know, a lot of times the translations can be skewed and provide inaccurate or vague information. But anyways, this second victim was the only one who was not abducted on a Wednesday. The third woman to disappear was also a resident of Shiroishi and worked in a factory. They went missing on October 27th, 1981 at the age of 27. Just two weeks after her disappearance, she was found strangled to death at a vacant lot in Nakabara. The fourth victim was abducted on February 17th, 1982 and was just 11 years old. Her body was found the very next day, strangled to death. On July 8th, 1987, another woman was killed. She was a 48-year-old restaurant employee and was found at the base of a cliff in Kitagata on January 27th, 1989. And if you recall, at the beginning, I mentioned that the 5th, 6th, and 7th victims were all found together. At that exact cliff location were also the bodies of a 50-year-old housewife and a 37-year-old office worker, both of whom were from Kitagawa. In November of 1989, there was a 26-year-old man held in prison who wrote a letter confessing to these murders. But not long after issuing that letter, he took it all back, saying that it wasn't actually true. But regardless, he was taken to court and charged just six hours before the statute of limitations expired for one of the murders. However, the man was deemed not guilty due to a lack of evidence. The judge also claimed that the police had influenced the prisoner to write a letter confessing to the crimes, just for the sake of charging someone. From August 2020 to April 2021 in Little Rock, Arkansas, there were four gruesome knife attacks which resulted in three deaths. This series of killings is quite recent relative to most of the cases we cover which adds an extra layer of intrigue and creepiness to this case. On Monday, August 24th, 2020, someone called police on the 2200 block of South Gaines Street. The caller was breathing heavily and urged police to hurry. When they arrived, they were greeted with the body of a 64-year-old man named Larry McChristian, who went missing just a couple of days ago. Little is known about Larry, but he was born on October 23rd, 1955 and lived about two and a half hours from Little Rock. The person who discovered Larry's body was walking through the neighborhood at 2 a.m. and just noticed what looked like a person lying in the yard. They called out to him and gave them a little nudge, but the body didn't respond. Larry's body was taken by medical officials in order to perform an autopsy, but investigators were already confident that his death was a result of foul play. Police went to every house in the neighborhood in hopes that someone may have heard or seen something. And luckily for them, there was a home that had security cameras set up that overlooked a portion of the yard where Larry was found. One woman living in the neighborhood said, It seems the person who stabbed Mr. McChristian came north. The person stabbed him on Gaines Street and walked away and came back and stabbed him again and stood there while he died. The thing that's so scary is that it seems to be so random and there doesn't seem to be any relationship to normal activity on this street. So now we know that Larry wasn't killed prior and then dumped off in the neighborhood. But that begs the question, why was he even there? Remember, Larry lived over two hours away. In just a few weeks, another murder took place. It was September 23rd, 2020. A man named Jeff Welch was preparing for his friend's arrival at his home. The friend arrived at Jeff's a little past 3 a.m. He made his way up the driveway and prepared to knock on the door. When out of the corner of his eye, he noticed his friend slouching on the front porch. He shook Jeff and quickly realized that he wasn't breathing. Police arrived on the scene quickly and noticed that Jeff had a number of puncture wounds along his neck. Initially, there was some debate on whether these wounds were a result of a killer or if they were some strange phenomenon. Authorities soon came to an agreement that Jeff was indeed killed by a person around 2 a.m. on September 23rd, and at the time, investigators didn't immediately connect the death of Jeff with Larry. It was only after the murder of Marion Franklin when authorities finally suspected that perhaps all of the knife attacks were connected. In April, there were two knife attacks where a woman named Deborah Walker survived and the other, Marion, was not as fortunate. Along with the announcement that the killings may have been linked, police issued some camera footage of the killer. 
It is believed that the released footage was from 2020 with Larry's death and 2021 with Deborah's attack. Not long after this news, police received well over 50 different phone calls with tips regarding the case in less than 24 hours. The community then dubbed the serial killer as the Little Rock Slasher, but he is also commonly known as the River City Ripper or Jack the Knife. In the footage, he was seen with a dark hoodie and dark pants and gloves. Police are relatively confident that the killer is a resident of the area or, at the very least, frequents the Little Rock neighborhood. When you zoom out and take a look at the locations of all the attacks, you will notice that they all happened within a 3 mile radius of each other. Another commonality between all of the killings is that they took place early in the morning between 1 and 4 am. Most likely, he is an opportunity killer as the victims didn't share anything in common, but but perhaps he is only after people that are a bit older since his youngest victim was 40 years old. Investigators aren't exactly sure when he will strike again as it seems that the killer does take breaks, which can be observed in the second and third attacks. The killer is still at large and authorities are actively searching for the man now labeled as the Little Rock Slasher. The Gebeline Man refers to a mummy that was buried around 3500 BC or possibly earlier in Gebeline. And he is by most accounts one of the most well-preserved people from ancient Egypt. He was stored at the British Museum's collection for over a century, but in 2012, he was removed in order to be CAT scanned. The results determined that the man died quite young at about 18 to 22 years old. But the most shocking discovery was the fact that he died of a stab wound in his back. There was even damage to his shoulder blade and ribs. It's going to be nearly impossible to determine this mummy's identity or the reason why he was murdered. All the way back in January of 1322, a man named Philip Ashenden met his doom in a very peculiar fashion. Allegedly, what happened was Philip and a friend had visited a restroom and the friend had accidentally peed on an unknown boy's shoes. And for whatever reason, this kid was holding a pole axe. It's unclear how old this boy was, but people guess that it can be anywhere from 8 to 16 years in age. The boy yelled at the man for the mess, but he didn't care and he actually punched the kid. Philip then shoved his friend and said, what is wrong with you? William, in a fit of rage, grabbed the poleaxe from the boy and struck Philip in the head. He was rushed to the hospital, but unfortunately, the strike was strong enough to actually hit his brain. This entry is pretty obscure and thus doesn't have a very large following, but there is a strange fixation on the identity of the boy carrying the poleaxe. The monster with 21 faces was the moniker given to a group that blackmailed several Japanese companies during the mid-1980s. One of these companies is Izaki Glico, which was an international food company in Osaka, who produced various products including famous candies such as Pocky. The story begins in the middle of March 1984 with the president of Izaki Glico, Katsuhisa Izaki, resting at home. Izaki decided that he wanted to take a bath before going to bed. Just next door was Izaki's mother who lived by herself. Right as she was preparing to head to bed, two unidentified men in ski masks broke into her home at 9pm brandishing guns. Fearing for her life, Izaki's mother listened to all of their requests. She was tied up and left in a location where the two men knew she couldn't escape. Izaki's mother suspected that the men just wanted money, but no. Instead, they had no intentions to harm the woman or take her money. All they wanted was a key to the house next door, her son's house where he lived with his wife and three kids. Using the key, the men burst into the home and tied up Izaki's wife and daughter before scouring the home in search of Izaki himself. As for the other two children, they were fast asleep and the two men did not bother subduing them. Izaki was found in the bathroom and he immediately tried to fight the men off, but he quickly calmed down after being told that his family wouldn't be harmed as long as he listened to them. They led Izaki outside and into a vehicle nearby where they raced off into the night. The next day, a ransom note was found in a phone booth near the Izaki household that demanded a payment of 1 billion yen or over 6.5 million US dollars today. Additionally, the abductors demanded over a million USD worth of gold bullion. Then, just a few days after Izaki's abduction, Izaki found his way back to his home. He was able to escape from a warehouse in the Osaka city of Ibaraki where Izaki claimed he was being held. Police questioned Izaki, but he didn't really have much information to provide. 
he was able to lead authorities back to where he came from, and after searching the warehouse, there weren't any clues leading to the identity of the culprits. Izaki informed police that a cover was placed over his head for the majority of the time and that the kidnappers told him his 8 year old daughter was with them, which was a lie. Over the course of hours, Izaki was able to loosen the rope bindings around his wrists and ultimately break free. Furthermore, he said that he believed the culprits were only using toy guns. After his escape, the mysterious group made their next move on April 10, 1984. The group set fire to a number of vehicles in the Izaki Glico Company parking lot which was later followed by a second fire. And less than a week after that first fire, the group sent a package with a container of hydrochloric acid to the company. Inside that same package was a letter which said, To the stupid police, are you idiots? If you are pros, you would catch us. Because you guys have such a high handicap, we're going to give you some hints. The letter then stated the color of the vehicle that carried away Izaki. It was gray. They also said that they shopped at a well-known supermarket franchise near the area before threatening to kidnap the head of police. This was the first time the group acknowledged themselves as the Monster with 21 Faces. After sending out this letter, the group known as the Monster with 21 Faces began threatening several other companies with similar letters. Not only that, they stated that they had laced several Glico products with potassium cyanide. The food company was forced to recall all of its products which totaled to well over $20 million. The group continued issuing letters to the companies and police, one of which said, Dear dumb police officers, don't tell a lie. All crimes begin with a lie as we say in Japan. Don't you know that? You thought you could fool us, dressed in your nice businessmen's blue suits, acting like salary men, but those shifty eyes gave you away. Another letter also addressed to the police read, Why don't you keep it to yourself? You seem to be at a loss. So why not let us help you? We'll give you a clue. We entered the factory by the front gate. The typewriter we used is Panwriter. The plastic container used was a piece of street garbage. This was referencing the package containing the acid. There was one moment where authorities believed that they had identified one of the members of the group. A camera had captured a man wearing a Yomi Uri Giants baseball hat in a convenience store. He was seen stocking shelves with Glico candy, but after releasing this footage to the public and urging people to come forward with info, the man was never identified. In a shocking turn of events, the monster with 21 faces seemed to have called off their attacks. On June 26, 1984, a new letter was received by the press which was addressed to our fans throughout Japan. The letter said, The president of Glico has already gone around with his head hanging down long enough. We would like to forgive him. Japan has gotten terribly hot and humid. So when our work is done, we want to go to Europe. Geneva, Paris, London. We'll be in one of those places. Let's bring Pocky, the traveler's friend. Delicious Glico products, we're eating them too. See you in January of next year. While this letter made it seem as though the group was ready to retire, they were simply shifting their focus from Glico elsewhere. The other companies that they began targeting included Morinaga, House Foods, and Marudai Ham. Around the same time when they announced that they would stop harassing Glico, they told Marudai that they'd also leave them alone if they paid a $250,000 ransom. The police came up with a plan where an officer would meet up with a member of the Monster with 21 Faces to exchange the cash. On January 28, 1984, an officer disguised as a Marudai employee took a train to Kyoto. He was told to look for a white flag and as soon as he saw it, he was supposed to toss the cash outside. On the train, this officer recalled a suspicious looking man watching him the entire time. This mysterious figure was large with short hair, glasses, and eyes that resembled a fox. The officer continued to keep his eyes focused on the outside in order to catch the white flag, but it never popped up. When the train reached Kyoto, the officer got off and took the next train back to Osaka. The fox-eyed man did the same. On the way back to Osaka, the officer informed his peers that there was a man tailing him and to keep track of him when they got off at Osaka. But when they got there, the fox-eyed man was lost. They couldn't identify him, but at the very least, police now had someone that they could call their primary suspect. The group continued to harass various companies, and one botched operation led to the firing of Shoji Yamamoto, who was a 59-year-old police superintendent in the Shiga Prefecture. He felt immense shame due to this, so on August 7th, 1985, he lit himself on fire, ultimately ending his own life. 
Then on August 12th, 1985, the group sent what seemed to be their final letter. Yamamoto of Shiga Prefecture Police died. How stupid of him. We've got no friends or secret hiding place in Shiga. It's Yoshino or Shikata who should have died. What have they been doing for as long as one year and five months? Don't let the bad guys like us get away with it. There are many more fools who want to copy us. No career Yamamoto died like a man, so we decided to give our condolences. We decided to forget about torturing food making companies. If anyone blackmails any of these companies, it's not us, but someone copying us. We are bad guys. That means we've got more to do other than bullying companies. It's fun to lead a bad man's life. From that point on, the group was never heard from again. Throughout the entirety of the investigation, authorities have only ever released the name of one suspect. That being Manabu Miyazaki. Manabu was believed to be the fox-eyed man. About a decade prior to the harassment caused by the monster with 21 faces, Miyazaki was at odds with the Glico company. He was involved in various whistleblowing events within Glico and even supported a labor dispute there as well. But he did provide a solid alibi which virtually cleared him of any accusations. The group did mention that they had other things to do besides bullying these companies, so that made many investigators believe that perhaps Perhaps this organization was much larger than they had originally thought. Warminster is a small town in western Wiltshire, England and lies about two hours west of London. Despite its unassuming facade, Warminster gained international fame in the 1960s due to a series of bizarre events related to UFOs. The first event was reported in the 1930s, which more or less predated the UFO craze. Residents mentioned unusual sounds resembling crackling or branches being dragged over gravel. Around the 1960s, local journalist Arthur Shuttlewood published an article in the Warminster Journal recounting a resident's experience of strange noises on Christmas morning. This event marked the beginning of a wave of similar reports. Letters from dozens of residents poured into the Warminster Journal, describing encounters with unusual sounds and sights in the region, fueling the UFO craze. Sightings ranged from bright lights and unconventional shapes in the night sky to bizarre figures and unexplained animal behavior. One resident, Gordon Faulkner, even captured a blurry photograph of a saucer-like craft, which added substance to the growing narrative. The town hall meeting held in August 1965 turned into a platform for residents to share their experiences. As the sightings continued, rumors spread, including reports of mass bird deaths and mutilated animals. Despite skepticism, these rumors added to the town's intrigue. By August 1965, Warminster's population had nearly doubled, with enthusiasts and skeptics flocking to the town. Even Arthur Shuttlewood, the initial skeptic, claimed to have experienced a close encounter. The British UFO Research Association, or BUFORA, became involved, investigating the sightings. The frenzy gradually waned, but Warminster's reputation as the British UFO capital endured. In 2015, a conference marked the 50th anniversary of the original sightings, drawing enthusiasts and experts worldwide. To this day, Warminster remains a place of mystery, with occasional sightings renewing interest in the town's extraordinary history. This entry takes us to 2016, where a mysterious group or possibly single person made it clear how dangerous cybercrime had the potential to be. This group called themselves the Shadow Brokers, and they released over a gigabyte worth of highly sensitive information that belonged to entities such as the NSA. This event marked the first of its kind on such a scale and immediately plastered the group all over the headlines across the world. As far as the public knows, the Shadow Brokers never utilized the information they obtained in any sort of cyber attack, but instead they just auctioned the information off and even created a subscription service for it. No one has any idea who they are or why they decided to offload the information the way they did. Pretty much every nation was suspected of possibly being responsible. One of the prime suspects was China as they were regarded as one of the largest threats to the US. Other nations included Russia and North Korea. Then there was the possibility that it was an American citizen that stole this information. One detail investigators pointed towards was the broken English in the messages sent by the shadow brokers. The words used were spelled correctly, however, the sentences were structured incorrectly. Linguistic analysts stated that even though there were grammatical errors, a low-level English speaker wouldn't even know how to make said errors. What this could mean is that the errors were intentionally made in an attempt to sound like a foreigner. 
The combination of perfect spelling and extremely incorrect sentence structure just didn't make much sense. The Shadow Brokers have in large part remained silent. Some speculate that this is because they have sold off all of the information that they have obtained, while others believe that the group is simply waiting for the right opportunity to make another move. Then there's the theory that the NSA had already captured the hacker or hackers, but chose not to release that info to the public. Israel Keyes was born on January 7, 1978 in Richmond, Utah. The town is quite small with about 3,000 people living there today. Keyes has gone down as one of the most infamous serial killers in US history. He was born into a large Mormon family where he was one of 10 kids. The parents were very protective and sheltered their children to the extreme, which may have played a role in shaping Keyes' personality. Later into his life, the family moved to Washington State, specifically Colville. Immediately after moving to the area, the family started visiting a church called The Ark, which was well known in the area for having racist ideologies and is believed to have greatly affected Keyes' impressionable mind. One of their neighbors had a son named Chevy Kehoe, who grew up to be a violent white supremacist and criminal. The man was truly disgusting and just to oversimplify things and keep things short, he murdered his wife and 8 year old daughter. Other members of Chevy's family were very similar and actually there were many people in town that were rather unstable. Keyes essentially followed in these guys footsteps as he got older. He adored violence and let out his harmful pent up habits on animals. There was a 12 year old girl named Julie Harris who lived in Colville at the same time as Keyes. Julie was a double amputee and a special olympics champion. In 1996 she went missing. Initially people thought that it was Julie's mother's boyfriend who was responsible for her disappearance. She was later found dead next to a river. Later on Keyes would become the primary suspect. However, he never admitted or denied being the culprit. He was about 18 years old at the time and this is around when he started to visibly show an interest in serial killers like Ted Bundy. It was also around this age when Keyes moved out but it's a bit unclear whether he did this alone or with family. He found himself in New York where he was able to get a hold of a large chunk of land. It is unknown how exactly he acquired it. One summer in the late 1990s, there was a group of teens intertubing near the Deschutes River. Keyes just so happened to be in the area and was keeping a close eye on the group, waiting for one of them to be alone. Eventually, a girl around 14 to 17 years old isolated herself. And the details from here are essentially unknown, but Keyes was able to kidnap this girl. He admitted to her before letting her go. Now, the thing is, the identity of this girl is unknown, reason being is that she never reported the incident. The story could very well be entirely made up by Keyes, but according to him, it was the first time he committed a crime. Keyes would later join the US Army, but he never admitted to committing any crimes during his service. In 2001, he was honorably discharged and he decided to move back to Washington. He found himself in a small fishing town known as Nia Bay, which had a predominantly Native American population. Keyes eventually met a woman there who he had a daughter with, and according to most people, he seemed to be a normal person contributing to society. However, this was far from the truth. After the birth of his daughter, Keyes sort of switched up his targets and no longer attacked children. Instead, he focused on adults, specifically without any children. He admitted to killing one person after July of 2001, but Keyes refused to say who or where. And between 2001 and 2005, he also admitted to killing a couple. Keyes implied that he had buried the couple in a valley and had used their own car to leave their burial location. Then in the years 2005 and 2006, Keyes killed again. But once more, he was stingy with the details and didn't reveal his victims' names. Keyes shared that he used his boat to get rid of the bodies. He said that he dumped them somewhere around Crescent Lake. But after extensive searching, nothing was found. In 2007, Keyes left Nia Bay and moved towards Alaska where he made several stops along the way. When he arrived in Alaska, he built a reputation as a normal person using his skills as a tradesman. Then he moved yet again in 2008 and it was at this time when Keyes prepared what he called murder kits. These kits carried cash, weapons, and other tools to assist with killing and disposing of his victims. He had them buried all over the locations that he frequented. It wasn't until the early 2010s when Keyes was finally subdued. His final target was a woman named Samantha Koenig, who was 18 years old. A security camera recorded her working and cleaning up in a coffee stand on the night of February 1st. 
a man in a ski mask pulled up to the coffee stand asking for a drink. When Samantha was done, Keyes pointed a gun at her. From there, he zip dyed her and told her that he was planning for the town to come up with a large sum of money in order to get Samantha back. Keyes made several stops before bringing Samantha back to his house where he raped her before taking her life. Authorities were quick to spread the word about Samantha's disappearance and eventually, some Texas Highway Patrolmen pulled over Keyes since he looked like their suspect. Inside of Keyes' vehicle was Samantha's phone and debit card. And remember, at this time, nobody knew of Keyes and his actions. It was only after he was arrested and police started questioning him when they began to realize just what exactly they had stumbled upon. Investigators have no idea just how many people Keyes has killed. Some investigators believe it could go into the hundreds. He ultimately took his own life on December 2nd, 2012. With this act of cowardice, he took all of his secrets with him. Keyes went down as one of the most intelligent and strategic serial killers in history, and before his death, he left behind a note. The note said the following, and just an FYI, there were a number of spelling mistakes and illegible words in the note, so if there are any instances where the sentence doesn't really make any sense, that's why. Where will you go, you clever little worm, if you bleed your host dry? Back in your ride, the night is still young. Streetlights push back the black I neat rows. Off to the right, a graveyard appears. Lines of stones, bodies molder below. Turn away quick, bob your head to the seat. As straight through that stop sign, you roll a loaded truck with lights off slams into you broadside. Your flesh smashed as metal explodes. You may have been free, you loved living your lie. Fate had its own scheme, crushed like a bug, you still die. Soon, now, you'll join those ranks of dead or your ashes the wind will soon blow. Family and friends will shed a few tears, pretend it's off to heaven you go. But the reality is, you were just bones and meat and with your brain died also your soul. Send the dying to wait for their death in the comfort of retirement homes. Quietly, quickly, say, it's for the best. It's best for you, so their fate you'll not know. Turn a blind eye, back to the screen, soak in your reality shows. Stand in front of your mirror and you preen, in a plastic castle you call home. Land of the free, land of the lie, land of scheme Americanize. Consume what you don't need, stars you idolize. Pursue what you admit is a dream, then it's American die. Get in your big car so you can get to work fast on roads made of dinosaur bones. Punch in on the clock and sit on your ass, playing stupid ass games on your phone. Paper on your wall says you got smarts. The test you took told you so, but you would still crawl like the vermin you are once your precious power grid's blown. Land of the free, land of the lie, land of the scheme Americanize. Now that I have you held tight, I will tell you a story. Speak soft in your ear so you know that it's true. You're my love at first sight, and though you're scared to be near me, my words penetrate your thoughts now in an intimate prelude. I looked into your eyes, they were so dark, warm, and trusting, as though you had not a worry or care. The more the game, the better potential to fill up those pools with your fear, your face framed in dark curls like a portrait. The sun shone through highlights of red. What color, I wonder, and how straight will it turn, plastered back with the sweat of your blood. There will be no more laughter here. I feel your body tense up, my hand now on your shoulder, your eyes. Forget the lady called Luck. She does not abide near me, for her powers don't extend to those who are dead. Let you be the master of your own fate, knowing full well what's at stake. My pretty captive butterfly, colorful wings, my hand smears. I somehow repaint them with punishment and tears. Violent metamorphosis, emerge my dark moth princess. I will come often and worship on the altar of your flesh. You shudder with revulsion and try to shrink far from me. I'll have you tied down and begging to become my Stockholm sweetie. Okay, talk is over, words are placid and weak. Back it with action or it all comes off cheap. Watch close while I work now. Feel the electric shock of my touch. Open my trembling flower or your petals I'll crush. Near the Ohio River is a small town called Point Pleasant that was originally created as a military base in the 1770s. The town was well known for the battles that have taken place there, but in November of 1966, the town gradually developed a new reputation. A traveling salesman named Woodrow Derenberger was driving on Interstate 77 back home. He lived in a town called Mineral Wells, which was about an hour from Point Pleasant. During that drive home, Woodrow claimed that he was stopped by this hovering vehicle that resembled a car but was not one. The vehicle had super bright lights and cut him off abruptly, causing Woodrow to slam on his brakes. 
That's when this humanoid being stepped out and communicated with Woodrow telepathically. It told Woodrow that his name was Cold, and through the entire exchange, the quote-unquote alien kept this creepy smile which later earned him the name The Grinning Man. Now, most would discount Woodrow's words as fantasy, but when more and more people claim that they saw similar strange anomalies, it gets you thinking. On November 12th, a group of gravediggers in Clendenin said they saw a huge winged creature take off from a bundle of trees. This creature almost looked like a man, but it had wings. It gained speed fast and fled the area. This particular creature would go on to be known as the Mothman. Just three days after that encounter, a married couple named Roger and Linda were visiting a portion of woods located outside of Point Pleasant that was previously used to stockpile explosives for the military. This location became known as the TNT area. As Roger and Linda were headed towards the woods in their car, they noticed a being with massive wings, almost like a bat's, flying around a power plant. Out of fear, the couple turned around and drove away, but the creature flew towards them. Roger claimed that it flew right above the car for a few minutes before leaving. Then just a few hours before that, a man named Newell Partridge was at home watching TV when his dog started barking at the barn. It was getting late and Newell decided to investigate the area to see just what was bothering his dog so much. He exited the home with a flashlight and his German Shepherd. Once he got close to the barn, Newell lifted up his flashlight to reveal a pair of big red eyes hiding inside. This freaked him out and he ran back inside to get his gun, but when he returned to the barn, the creature was missing and so was his dog. It is believed that Newell and the couple saw the exact same beast as they both reported that it had what appeared to be wings as well as radiant red eyes. Another strange occurrence in the area happened on December 15th, 1967. Around 5pm, the silver bridge which loomed over the Ohio River collapsed. This just so happened to be rush hour. All of the vehicles stuck on the bridge dropped into the freezing river. In the end, 46 people died, two of whom were never found. Now, this may be an over-romanticized narrative that news outlets drummed up, but all of the strange sightings along with the collapse of this bridge led people to believe that something sinister was occurring in the town. Grave robbing for morons is an obscure piece of media that has an aura of mystery surrounding it. It was originally discovered as part of a box set of home movies, which included four different films that all carry a sense of mystery. One of the films was later debunked as a parody film created by Huck Botko, who was one of the writers for The Last Exorcism. Because of this, some people have proposed the idea that perhaps a grave robbing for morons is also just a dark parody movie and nothing more. So first things first, we don't know if this film is genuine or not. It follows a young man as he returns from digging up a graveyard, and according to some experts, the details found in the film are shockingly accurate. For example, the skull that he is seen holding more or less resembles the real thing. The man in the film states that his name is Anthony, which eventually led internet sleuths to a man named Anthony Kasamasima who confessed to a 15 year long run of grave robbing. However, he was 40 years old when he accidentally confessed, which would mean that he started grave robbing in his mid-twenties. The person in the film looks nothing close to that. At most, he would be in his late teens. So most people do not believe that these two men are the same. In the film, Anthony is accompanied by a man named Pushi. Investigators later deduced that this was likely a mispronunciation and Anthony meant to call him Bushi. Now, there is an indie film director named Christopher Bushi who is known to use hyper-realistic skeletons in his movies. However, we have no idea if he really was a director of Grave Robbing for Morons. At the end of the film, Anthony said that he would be back, but we never got our hands on a second installment. Or if he did truly make a sequel film slash video, it hasn't been found yet. In the mid-1980s, dozens of residents of New Jersey requested that an investigation be conducted in Tom's River as there was an alarming number of children dying from cancer in that area, but all of the requests were either ignored or denied. But in 1986, a detective named Michael Berry finally took up the case. There were suspicions that the water supply in Tom's River was chemically contaminated. However, once the investigation was completed, he deemed his results inconclusive. Then in 1994, there was a terrifying discovery made by the NJDOH. Relative to the rest of New Jersey, the cases of brain tumors within children were over 70% higher. 
A year later in 1995, Barry was asked to investigate the same case once more. He reluctantly accepted as he didn't think the results would be much different. However, he would soon find out that he was very wrong. Children under 5 years old were dying from neurological cancer 7 times more than the state average and the kids slash young adults under 20 were dying at 3 times the rate. Looking at the data, there was a significant spike around the late 1980s. At first, the information was not released to the public, but in March of 1996, investigative journalists at the Star-Ledger exposed the news. And as you could imagine, the public reacted with extreme anger. Immediately, protesters began to flood the streets surrounding the local health department's office. One of the victims was a young man named Michael Gillick. He was diagnosed with neuroblastoma at three months old. His arduous fight against this has left him disfigured and blind in one eye and deaf in one ear. Another victim was named Gabrielle Pascarella, who was diagnosed with CNS lymphoma at under a year old and tragically passed away at 14 months old. From 1990 to 2010, U.S. health agencies looked into over 420 cancer clusters, and out of all of those investigations, only one of them was able to end with an identified cause. There are many theories regarding what may have been the root cause of these clusters, such as irradiated drinking water or illegal dumping of plastic manufacturing waste. Back in March of 2020, the painting known as the Parsonage Garden at Noonan, or the Parsonage Garden at Noonan in Spring, was stolen. This happened at an exhibition at the Singer Loren Museum, but it was recovered in September of this year. The exact date when the painting was stolen was on March 30th, which just so happened to be Van Gogh's birthday. At the time, the painting was being loaned out to the Groninger Museum. Due to the pandemic, the public was not able to access the building. According to police, the thieves or thief broke a pair of glass doors with a sledgehammer at 3.15 a.m. to steal the painting. Then in June of the same year, Detective Arthur Brand received a photo of the Parsonage Garden with a newspaper that dated May 30th. After careful examination by experts, they believe that this photo was of the genuine painting. This was not the first time that one of Van Gogh's works has been stolen. Since 1988, there have been about 30 recorded incidents where Van Gogh paintings have been stolen in the Netherlands, all of which were eventually recovered. In September of 2023, Detective Arthur Brand caught his big break. He claimed that after intense negotiation with a man, he was able to get his hands on the stolen painting from 2020. However, he never named him and said that he was not involved in the theft. The painting did resurface with slight damage, but overall it was still considered to be in good condition. Fingerprints found on the painting led to a man only known as Nils M. He was sentenced to 8 years in prison and had to pay approximately $9 million. But where the mystery lies is why he stole the painting in the first place. Of course, it was valuable, but there are rumors that a man named Peter Roy K. commissioned the job in hopes of using the painting as leverage to reduce his prison sentence. Peter was a Dutch shipping mogul who had his hands in illegal businesses such as substance smuggling, but Nils himself said that he did it just for the sake of highlighting how poorly secured the facility was. This entry refers to a Reddit post detailing a piece of potential lost media. OP states that they saw an ad on TV in the UK around 2009 to 2010 in the midst of a swine flu breakout. They also say that it was possibly banned due to how frightening it was to kids. The ad itself is said to have included several toddlers and baby swings up against a white backdrop. All of the kids were coughing and sneezing, but the way OP describes it, it seems that they were doing all of this in the same rhythm as Frere Jocks. Additionally, OP stated that a friend of theirs who also remembers this ad thought that some of the babies were actually choking. OP thinks that the ad was for cold medicine, but due to the creepiness of it, it may have been a PSA for a certain disease. And it does seem that this was a real ad, as several others claim to have also seen it before. This entry takes us back to 1908 where two brothers, Willie and Frank McLeod, visited the Nahani Valley with the goal of hitting it rich with gold. However, not only did they not find any gold, but they also never returned home. 
Then, two years after their departure, some hikers discovered their bodies next to the Nahani River. And the scariest part was that both men's heads were missing. Then, about seven years after the discovery of their bodies, a man named Martin Jorgensen also ventured into the Nahani Valley in hopes of finding gold. Not long after arriving, he sent letters back home claiming to have stumbled upon a massive supply of it. But in a shocking turn of events, his cabin was burned down and inside was the lifeless body of Martin. Martin, like the McLeod brothers, was also found headless. And then, in 1945, a miner was also found decapitated in his sleeping bag. The Nahani Valley is considered a very sacred place, with most parts of it not accessible to the public. It is surrounded with folklore and mystery ever since it was first inhabited. Many early tribes warned that the location is evil and haunted by demons, which is why most tribes avoided settling there. One tribe that did decide to live in this valley were the Dene people who spoke of bloodthirsty creatures roaming the forests at night. Additionally, living in the mountains were the battle-hardened Naha warriors. This particular tribe was only able to live here due to their fierce warrior instincts. They were also known for decapitating their enemies. The Naha tribe is another mystery in itself as they just suddenly and inexplicably vanished. The area already terrified other tribes, so this sudden disappearance of the Naha was all the more reason for them to avoid this location. Along with the eerie deaths of the visitors in the valley, there have also been reports of enigmatic lights, UFOs, cryptids, and living fossils. To this day, no one has any idea what is causing the decapitations, or if there is any truth to the existence of unique creatures in the woods. During the American Indian Wars, there was a chief named Sitting Bull who was shot and killed by Lieutenant Bullhead. In the past, Bullhead fought side by side with Chief Sitting Bull against the Americans, but one day Bullhead was commanded to arrest Sitting Bull. So on December 15th, 1890, Bullhead rushed Sitting Bull's cabin with over 40 men in Grand River, South Dakota. At the time, Sitting Bull and his family were still asleep, so Bullhead's men busted inside and dragged him out. His family began to scream, which awoke Sitting Bull's men that were resting nearby. Initially, Sitting Bull was cooperative and listened to orders. However, it all fell apart after his favorite child yelled, They are making a fool out of you. Sitting Bull was enraged and yelled, I will not go. Attack. Attack. Lieutenant Bullhead was then shot by one of Sitting Bull's men, and right as he was about to hit the ground, he lifted his gun and dealt a fatal shot to Sitting Bull. This rapidly sparked a brief firefight where 13 people were killed, including Sitting Bull's child Crawfoot. It is said that Sitting Bull was buried in an unassuming location by prisoners at Fort Yates. Apparently, his grave was frequently vandalized, but nobody really knows where it is. In the early 1900s, a couple of drunk soldiers said that they dug up Sitting Bull's remains and took two bones, one of which they donated to the North Dakota State Historical Society. Most people seem to believe that his grave is somewhere at Fort Yates, but others seem to believe that it's somewhere else entirely, possibly even Canada. In May of 2023, someone dumped over 500 pounds of assorted pasta in the woods. The pasta was fully cooked and dumped alongside a creek in Veterans Park. Allegedly, there are a number of people who know who is responsible for dumping all of this, but they choose not to reveal his identity. Two Public Works employees arrived on the scene to clean up the mess and were able to get rid of all of the pasta in less than an hour. There are a number of community advocates who said that the person who dumped the pasta is a man with a history of mental health issues and believe is best for everyone if his name remained private. Duck Song 63 is the name given to a Jane Doe who was found inside a block of concrete in 2016 in South Korea. It was April 28, 2016, when a group of construction workers were in the process of destroying an outhouse in Incheon. This particular outhouse was constructed as part of a three-story building and rested right underneath an emergency staircase. And right between the staircase and the outhouse, there was this small box structure. There were cinder blocks all around it and in the middle it was filled with concrete. For years, people passed this area and took a note of the box but never really cared what it was. Since it wasn't essential in supporting any of the nearby structures, the construction workers decided to just break it. It took several tries to access as the construction workers 
workers said it was oddly strong, and they even thought that it was unbreakable at first. But eventually, they were able to get it open by dislodging one of the cinder blocks with a crowbar. As soon as they opened it up, something hard rolled out. It was a human skull. In addition to the skull, there was also a small pillow, ramen packet, and a box of cigarettes. Investigators noted that the building was constructed before the 80s and they were possibly looking at a decades-old case here. Medical officials determined that the remains were of a female and she was in her early 20s at the time of her death. Officials were not able to determine her cause of death as there were no clear signs of trauma. With no way to advance the investigation with the body itself, investigators set their sights on the various items that were found alongside the woman. They also carefully inspect the concrete tomb itself. A sample of that concrete was inspected and determined to be newer, specifically from around 2006 to 2008. Another detail that police found odd was that the culprit had poured cement over the body and then poured water on top of the dry cement instead of just pouring concrete over the victim from the start. Because of the method used, there were several distinct layers within the concrete. Furthermore, there was no running water in the outhouse. Authorities believed it would have taken about 3-5 to five minutes to get water and come back to this location. It just seemed like an immense amount of effort. Two of the earliest suspects were the former owners of the building. Investigators assumed that around the time the body was buried, the two owners were named Lee and So. Lee turned down a police interview while So accepted, but as soon as So's wife learned what the interview was about, she yelled that they were innocent. So denied knowing anything about the box next to the outhouse, but after police searched his phone, there was a picture of it on there which was taken in December of 2013. He was later asked to participate in a second interview, but he was much less welcoming this time. At one point, he blew up with rage and refused to talk. When the interviewers left his home, they noticed a peculiar stick at the top of his doorway. It was made out of Kalapinax, which some people use to ward off dead spirits. But investigators and the public believe that he is at the very least involved, if not outright the sole person responsible. We never got any information out of Lee, so it's very much possible that he may have played a role. On August 11th, 1994, a fisherman named Mark Peterson was venturing around the Hawkesbury River in Sydney. All of a sudden, he felt a distinct heavy tug on his fishing rod. Mark thought that he had just snagged a massive fish or squid, but once he reeled up the mass, he recoiled out of shock. It was a man wrapped in plastic, tied to a steel cross. Additionally, there was a noose wrapped around the man's neck. Mark called police and medical officials determined that the man had died from blunt force trauma and they estimated he died in 1993, but they weren't entirely sure whether he died on the cross or if he was placed onto it afterwards. The rope and wire that was wrapped around the victim's neck and torso would have made it impossible for him to escape if he was still alive on it. The man had been underwater for over a year which eroded his fingerprints. The steel cross to which he was binded to seemed to be custom made just for him. The clothes that he had on were just the run of the mill clothing that you could find at any store in Australia. News outlets gave this person the name Rackman. He was essentially unidentifiable, so investigators set their efforts on trying to find the culprit instead, but they didn't accomplish much in that avenue either. Over two decades later, the Rackman was finally identified. In August of 2018, NSW Deputy State Coroner Paul McMahon publicly announced that the victim was 37-year-old Max Tanchevsky. He was last seen by his significant other, leaving home on January 11th, 1993. Max was known amongst his family and friends for having a gambling addiction, and on this particular night, he was yet again out to gamble. Because of his nasty gambling tendencies, his family didn't think it was strange when he failed to return home the following day. It is unknown how much money he lost or owed due to his gambling habits, but before he disappeared, he had made a $1,800 withdrawal, which was not a standard amount for him. So now that the victim has been identified, investigators still need to find out who was responsible for his death. This method of killing was definitely unusual. Authorities thought that the manner in which Max was killed was similar to how a gang would kill someone just to send a threat to someone else. It was possible that Max's death was just meant to be a warning. Then there's the obvious reference to Jesus with the manner in which Max was displayed. It may have been possible that some sort of religious group or individual was responsible. And of course there's the obvious theory where Max owed someone money for his rampant gambling. 
Overall, the entire thing must have taken an immense effort for the culprit, so police believe that whoever the killer was may have had a personal vendetta against Max. The Alcacer Girls was a group of Spanish teenagers who were kidnapped and raped before being murdered in the town of Picasent in 1992. Their names were Miriam Garcia Ibora, Antonio Rodriguez, who was often called Tony, and Desiree Hernandez Fulch. It was mid-November 1992 when the three girls were on their way to a school party held at a nightclub called Culor. It was on this trip that Miriam, Tony, and Desiree disappeared. They were traveling about two and a half miles out from their home. The girls planned for Miriam's father, Fernando, to give him a ride to Kalur. However, he had recently developed influenza and was bedridden. The girls really wanted to go to this party, so they resorted to hitchhiking, which they have done a number of times in the past. One couple was able to drive them from Alcacer to a petrol station located just outside of Picasent. From there, they got another ride, and a resident later reported that the girls got into a sedan which contained several men inside. But they couldn't tell the exact number. This was the final time the girls were reported alive. Over two months later, on January 27th, 1993, a couple of beekeepers were near the La Romana Ravine when they noticed the bodies of three girls in a ditch. It seemed as though the girls were buried, but the recent heavy rain washed all of the dirt and mud away. Investigators were actually able to arrest and convict one man for these murders. His name was Miguel Ricart. Miguel shared that he and a friend of his named Antonio Anglais gave the girls a ride, but once they passed the nightclub, the girl started to scream and flail around. That's when Antonio grabbed his pistol and whipped the girls in their faces. Miguel drove the group to a rundown house near La Ramona, which was located in an isolated area in the mountains. Two of the girls were raped. The two men then left for food, which took about two hours. When they returned, they the third girl as well. In the morning, the men dug a large pit and led the girls to it. They were assaulted once more and two of the girls were shot while the third was stabbed twice in the back. Tony, Miriam, and Desiree were then left in the pit before being discovered by those beekeepers. Authorities raided Antonio's home, but they couldn't find him. It is said that he snuck onto a container ship which he jumped off of when it reached the coast of Ireland. And this is where details are a bit unclear, as some believe that he drowned while others say that Antonio is currently in Brazil since he is a native there. There was also a theory that suggested the two men worked for an underground crime ring that sold minors. About four years before the deaths of the Alcacer girls, there were two other girls and a boy who were murdered in a nearby town. No one was charged for those murders, but many suggest that it may have been the same culprits. On August 19, 1981, in Crawford Township, Pennsylvania, an employee of the state's Bureau of Forestry was examining a heavily wooded area about six miles from Interstate 80. Eventually, he stepped on something slightly squishy. When he looked down, he froze for a few seconds at the sight of a body. The employee jumped backwards and ran off to contact 911. Investigators determined that the male victim died from a 38 caliber handgun, possibly a revolver. Medical officials added that the man had sustained two wounds to his head as well. Due to the lack of blood at the location the body was found, police believe that he was killed elsewhere and dropped off in the woods. And based on the name of this entry, you probably already suspected that this victim also had his privates mutilated, which will be a consistent in detail in all of these murders. About a month after finding this man, authorities received a phone call from an anonymous male caller. This man claimed that he knew the victim and even had a number of his belongings. It is unclear if police ever met up with this individual to gather information or not. Through the use of fingerprint records, investigators were eventually able to identify the first victim as a Wayne Lee Riffendifer. Before being discovered in the woods, he had recently taken up a cross-country journey as a hitchhiker. And I probably don't need to say this, but that is likely how he met his end. At first, police didn't connect Wayne's murder to any other cases, but years down the line, they realized that there were about two to five, possibly more, victims who also shared the same mutilation characteristics as Wayne. All of these killings were likely done by the same individual. On June 14th, 1982, another body was found in Daniels Canyon in Utah near Route 40. A fisherman named 
Lee Valdez was headed towards a river when he noticed what appeared to be a person lying near some trees about 30 feet from the road. Just like with Wayne, this man, estimated to be in his mid-twenties, was also shot by a 38 caliber firearm. But unlike Wayne, the location of this newly discovered victim was covered in blood. Wasatch County Sheriff Mike Spanos said, We found drag marks and blood splatters leading from the highway to the trees. It looks like someone just drove up, dragged the body out of the car, dumped it, and then drove away. The body was completely nude except for his socks and the victim's male organs were absent. Medical officials stated that the castration was done post-mortem with a hunting type knife. After scouring the area, authorities couldn't locate any of the man's belongings or clothing. However, there were several witnesses who came forward and said that they saw what appeared to be a woman near the body the same day the discovery was made. She had blonde hair and was hitchhiking before she was picked up by two men. Mike Spano said, Evidently, the woman saw something happen in that canyon, and we would like to find her and talk with her. We are having a composite drawing made of her now, and we will begin looking for her as soon as that's done. Most people look at this woman as a primary suspect, but due to the lack of evidence available, that's tough to justify. Police failed at locating or identifying the woman and also struggled at tying any identity to the new victim. But luckily, the news of this young man's body reached Truckee, California and police discovered that the identity of the man was a 21-year-old named Marty James Shook, who was last seen about two days before his body was found in Utah. Marty left his family on June 12th, 1982 in Sparks, Nevada, and planned to visit Colorado. And just like Wayne, Marty was hitchhiking his way there. His case was later linked to the murder of Willard Edward Judd, who was a 27-year-old oil field worker who went missing and was later found on August 10th, 1980. Just like the previous two victims, he also hitched hike and shared the same bodily wounds when found. The investigation later led to a man named Dirk Pace who was convicted for a murder. Dirk claimed that two of his acquaintances were responsible for Judd's death. However, after further investigation, those two were deemed innocent. In July of 1983, there was another victim, who was never identified, found in Georgia who only had on a swimsuit. Then in November of 1986, another man aged 26 named Jack Franklin Andrews was discovered dead in Litchfield, Connecticut. Both of these events were suspected of being tied to Judd, Marty, and Wayne. There are several other names that sometimes find their way into the list of victims of this particular serial killer, but the ones listed above are more or less commonly agreed upon to be related. There were a number of potential suspects that may have committed these crimes. However, one of the names that stands out is Harry Christ Manos. In November of 1991, he was acquitted on several child molestation charges, and the details regarding his investigation are very graphic, but let's just say he was an avid pedophile that enjoyed torturing young men. He also worked as a high school teacher, and police found a jar with severed male organs inside of a locked cabinet. Investigators state that Harry got away with committing numerous crimes. In a case that's unrelated to the one that we just went over, the evidence stacked against Harry was pretty insane. But shockingly, he got off with no prison time. The majority of the victims of these castration murders died in the summer, which would have lined up perfectly with Harry's work schedule. There were also some rumors that mentioned Harry was in the same locations of those bodies, but these claims aren't exactly the most credible. Harry was never charged with any of the crimes regarding those murders, as investigators had inadequate evidence against him. Mel's Hole refers to a legend about a supposed bottomless pit somewhere around Ellensburg, Washington. However, this pit was never discovered, nor could anyone find a person named Mel. This legend first sprung up on February 21st, 1997, when a man named Mel Waters got on a radio show called Coast to Coast AM. Mel said that he owned private land, which was about 9 miles west of Ellensburg. On this land, there was a strange hole with an unknown depth. He claimed that he tied a weight to the end of a fishing line to try and see how deep it was. He ended up using over 80,000 feet of line and even then it had not reached the bottom. Another eerie detail is that there was supposedly a dead dog thrown into the hole which later appeared alive several days later. Some people actually believed Mel at first but after hearing that story about the dog, that's sort of where they became a little bit skeptical. 
It was later mentioned that the US government claimed the land and forced Mel to move to Australia. Mel never revealed the exact location of the hole and several explorers funded expeditions to find it, but none of them resulted in definitive answers. And so, many people grew skeptical and called the story a hoax. Several researchers suggested that such a hole would collapse into itself under all of that pressure. This is going to be a pretty short one, but I'm sure we've all seen those little signs stuck into the ground or pinned onto a wooden post telling you to vote for a particular mayor or governor. But there are a number of signs that have residents a bit confused, those being the ones that simply ask Barber School. The sign has no contact information or an address, so people are just left scratching their heads, wondering what the point of the sign is. Was it all just a joke? Well, if you look up Barber School in Pittsburgh, which is where the signs were found, you'd find a barber school in that city. More than likely, it's from someone who attended that place and is now just trying to help the school get new students. This isn't a heavy or serious case by any means, but it sort of just makes you chuckle. And no one has any idea who actually placed those signs. Madeline McCann is the name of a missing child who disappeared at the age of three on May 3rd, 2007. Madeline and her family were on vacation at the Ocean Club in Praia de Luz, Portugal. The parents decided to go out for dinner with some friends at a restaurant nearby while Madeline and her two younger siblings remained in the apartment. The couple came up with a particular supervising strategy where they would rotate who checks on the kids. When it was Kate McCann's turn, she noticed that Madeline was missing. Police were immediately contacted and searched the vicinity. It wasn't until May 26th when police were able to complete all of the tips and details they received and released a description of a potential suspect. Apparently, on the same night of the disappearance, there was a man carrying what looked to be a child. This may have very well been Madeline. Then in June through August, police publicly announced that they possibly had destroyed forensic evidence as a result of not properly securing and protecting the crime scene. It was also at this time where they believed that the possibility of locating Madeline and retrieving her alive were very slim. It was in January 2008 when police released a sketch of who they believed may be responsible. A British holidaymaker described the man as creepy and acting strange. He was seen about 600 yards from the resort where the McCanns were staying at. It was also mentioned that this man was seen at least three times in the month before Madeline's abduction. This man has never been identified. Then in 2013, detectives from the UK released additional computer-generated images of a number of potential suspects. By late 2015, the British government had spent well over £10 million on the investigation. Madeline has yet to be found, and there is debate on whether or not she is still alive. There have been a number of reported sightings of her around the world, however, these were never really heavily investigated, so they may have just been false reports. On December 31st, 2000, the Setagaya family was tragically massacred by an unknown assailant who subsequently lived inside of their home for an extended period. The mother and wife of the household, Yazuko Miyazawa's mother, visited the home on December 31st to discover the family dead. Amongst the victims were father and husband Mikio Miyazawa, wife and mother Yasuko, 8-year-old Nina, and 6-year-old Rei. Medical officials stated that Mikio, Yasuko, and Nina all died from several stab wounds, while Rei died of asphyxiation. It was estimated that the family was killed the night before around 11.30pm. But how exactly did the killer access the home? Well, the police believe that the killer climbed a tree next to Ray's room, which had an open window at the time, and jumped in. Ray was in his room at the time and was the first to die. But while he was being strangled, Ray was able to let out a scream that awoke his father, Mikio, who sprinted upstairs to his son's room. Mikio tackled the assailant and inflicted several wounds onto him, but the killer had a knife which he used to fatally wound Mikio. This fatal strike broke the knife, but despite this, he used it to take the lives of Yasuko and Nina. What followed was one of the strangest things investigators have seen. The killer decided to live inside of the Miyazawa home instead of escaping. Authorities believe that he stayed there for several hours at the very least. 
He went on the family computer and browsed the internet before drinking some tea from the fridge and eating some melon and ice cream. Afterwards, he used the toilet and did not flush. He also used the family's first aid kit to tend to his injuries. Typically, when a home is broken into, police believe that money is the driving factor. However, this was not the case here as the killer left behind a lot of cash. He did go through all of the drawers and cabinets and take some money, but not enough for authorities to deem this as a monetarily fueled attack. Before leaving, the killer left behind his broken knife, a scarf, hip bag, sweater, jacket, hat, gloves, shoes, and two handkerchiefs. The killer did not seem to care at all about what he did or if he was potentially caught. Along with what was just listed, he left behind a plethora of evidence. There was his fingerprints, feces, and blood available throughout the home. After investigation, police realized that the computer recorded activity at 1.18am and 10am, with the latter being right about when Yasuka's mother arrived at the home. But it is debated whether or not the second login was the killer or if it was Yasuko's mother who triggered it by bumping into the mouse. The sweater that the murderer left behind was able to be traced to a store in the Kanagawa prefecture and it turned out that it was pretty rare with only 130 ever being sold. 12 of those buyers were found but all of them were deemed innocent. And despite all of the DNA left behind, officials really couldn't figure out much in terms of the culprit's identity. They did figure out that the killer was male and possibly mixed race. He was also right-handed and aged between 15 and 35 years. Yeah, not exactly a great starting point for finding the identity of this killer. It has since been decades and no one has been charged with the murder of the Miyazawa family. There is a reward currently of about 140,000 USD for anyone who can provide information that leads to the arrest of the culprit. Donald Rindall was a 22-year-old man who was found buried in 2003 near Cambridge in Asante County. He was buried three feet underground on private property. Officials estimated that he was buried sometime between the late 1970s or early 1971. One detective was quoted saying, based off information from the family as well as a scene in 2003, it is believed that Donald was a victim of homicide, but his death has been classified as undetermined. It is further believed that there may still be people alive today who know what happened to Donald in 1970. The family also believes that Donald was killed, as he had no reason to just take off and never tell anyone why. Donald's remains were discovered near Highway 47 and County Road 5 in two different locations. They were found by a man who was doing some work on a driveway with his bobcat. At the time, no one knew that the remains belonged to Donald. At first, medical officials could only determine that they belonged to a white male in his 20s. If Donald was indeed a victim of foul play, investigators don't have the slightest clue as to who is responsible. But even if he didn't die by the hands of another, we still have no idea why he was buried. There was one rumor that involved illegal substances, but there isn't much information out there to build on this claim. Jennifer Kessie was a woman who went missing on January 23rd, 2006 in Orlando, Florida. A suspicious individual was seen on security footage driving and exiting Jennifer's car after she disappeared. But due to the poor quality on the camera and just bad luck, the person could not be identified. Jennifer had just moved into a new condo in Orlando and had recently accepted a promotion as a project manager for a timeshare company. At the time, she was in a happy relationship with her boyfriend, Rob Allen. Just a week before Jennifer's disappearance, she and Rob both went on a vacation. After returning home, she went to work on Monday, January 23rd, 2006. Everything was proceeding as normal, but around 10pm after Jennifer got off work, she spoke with Rob on the phone. Apparently, the couple got into an argument. It wasn't revealed just what the two were talking about, but it had something to do with their relationship. The two lived three hours apart, which may have taken a bit of a toll on both of them. The next morning, January 24th, Jennifer's employer took note that she had not arrived yet. They waited a little longer, but still, Jennifer was nowhere to be seen. They decided to call Jennifer's parents and tell them about her absence. This greatly worried her parents, and they immediately tried calling her, but she didn't pick up. 
Her mother was quoted saying her cell phone that she had since she was 16 years old went to voicemail for the first time. That is how we knew something horrendous has happened. Jennifer's parents and their son Logan immediately took off to check Jennifer's home. The drive took about two hours and when they took a look inside the house, everything appeared normal. Jennifer's mother Joyce said there was makeup all over her counter. The t-shirt she had worn to bed was on the floor. The shower was wet in the corners. It looked as though Jennifer had left not too long ago. Although the one strange thing was that nobody could locate Jennifer's phone, keys, or purse. It didn't take long for Jennifer's friends and family to flock near her home and begin their search. After an entire day of searching, Jennifer was officially declared missing. Just two days after her disappearance, Jennifer's car, a black Chevy Malibu, was discovered in a parking lot about one mile from her home. It was at this same time when investigators caught their first big break in the case. The security cameras in the facility where the car was parked had recorded a man parking Jennifer's car at about 12 p.m. But unfortunately, the camera took photos every few seconds and it literally just so happened that each photo had an object blocking out the man's face. After half a year, a new lead detective was put on the case. His name was Joel Wright and this was what he said when asked what he believed happened. I believe Jennifer got ready for work. She showered, got dressed, went outside of her condo, locked the door on the way out, and made it as far as her car. After that, I believe she was abducted. Jennifer's family continuously searched for her. On the second anniversary of her disappearance, they grouped up on a street corner where they held up signs spreading awareness of Jennifer. Detective Wright came up with the idea of showing the photos of the unidentified man to the employees of the complex parking lot. One of the women working there said that the man pictured kind of looked like a guy named Chino. Turned out that Chino lived near Jennifer. In fact, he lived in the same condo complex but in a different building, and he even worked there as a maintenance worker in the past. Chino had visited Jennifer's condo about a week before she went missing to do some repairs. On March 18th, 2009, Detective Wright got an opportunity to interview Chino in prison where he was serving a sentence for a rape charge. But Chino claimed to have no idea what happened to Jennifer. He was subjected to a polygraph test, which he passed. In December of 2018, Jennifer's family grew frustrated with how the Orlando Police Department was handling the case, and so they sued them. In 2019, the OPD was required to hand over 16,000 pages of documents and 67 hours of camera footage over to Jennifer's family. Additionally, the OPD was not allowed to investigate Jennifer's case any further. They later hired a private investigator named Michael Toretta, who developed the following theory. Allegedly, there were about 8 to 10 construction workers staying in an empty apartment near Jennifer. Michael believes that one or several of those men were responsible for her abduction. He added that just under a year after Jennifer's death, someone was seen tossing a rolled up piece of carpet into a nearby lake. The reason this is relevant is because on the day that Jennifer went missing, there were several construction workers laying down a similar carpet in that apartment we mentioned. A dive team was deployed to search the lake, but they couldn't find anything. Despite this, Michael believes it's the most valuable piece of info that they have. It has been nearly two decades since Jennifer Cassie's disappearance and no one has ever been charged. But now, with all the documents and videos in the hands of the Cassie family, they are hopeful that they can figure out just what happened to Jennifer. It was July 24th, 2009 when the 5th grade girl Manami Shinomura disappeared from her class field trip and was never seen again. 10 year old Manami had been telling her family all about the upcoming field trip to the Hiragano Kogen camping grounds saying things like, I can't wait for the camp. Monami was described as a heartwarming girl who had a bubbly personality. She loved to sing and dance and led a tough life from the very start. She was taken care of by her single mother and older sister and she was even born with a peculiar heart condition that required surgery not long after she was born. Additionally, Monami had Down syndrome and was smaller than all the other kids. And the strange thing was, Monami's mother said she wasn't much of a wanderer. While she was outgoing, she was also cautious about her whereabouts and she was well aware of her disability and knew better to venture off alone. On the day of the field trip, over 80 students and several chaperones from the Toko Namanishi school visited the Hirogano campsite. 
The group was supposed to stay there for three days, and in that time, they were the only ones camping there. There were no other visitors. The first night was filled with fun for the children, as for many of them, this was their first experience camping. Then the next morning, at about 7.30am, Monami and four other students headed out to explore. One of the chaperones remembers the exact moment when they passed him. He took note of Monami trailing behind the rest of the kids by a decent margin, but he just thought that she'd catch up eventually. However, the group later returned, but without Monami. One of the girls yelled, Monami has vanished. The last confirmed sighting of her was at 8am by the principal. One of the campground supervisors said, The forest road is a course that returns to the same starting point if you walk along the road. The area around the last site is a forest road paved with asphalt. On the eastern slope, there are cliffs that even adults cannot climb. Although there is a stream on the west side, the water was not deep enough to drown in at that time. The comment alluding to drowning would be if the person was an adult, so you could imagine if a child were to fall into that stream, it had the potential to be very dangerous. Immediately, all of the adults got together and split up roots in search of Monami. They made absolutely sure to tell the other students to stay put and not wander off, but after searching for a couple of hours, the adults called the police. Along with the officers, there were hundreds of volunteers on the site. Upon arrival, police sealed off the entire area, but after sweeping through the vicinity, they too failed at locating Monami. They couldn't even find a footprint from her. When Monami's mother learned of her daughter's disappearance, she searched for her every single day for hours over the course of two months, and she eventually stumbled upon a pair of shoes that looked just like the ones her daughter wore. She was confident that they were indeed her daughter's, but police thought otherwise and concluded that they did not belong to Monami. It seems that the most commonly agreed upon outcome was that Monami may have been attacked and consumed by an animal after getting lost. However, someone should have found something that belonged to her, and due to the lack of remains found at the campsite, some think that she was actually kidnapped. But as of now, there isn't quite enough evidence to support any of these theories. And just in case you are wondering why the adults allow children to go exploring the wilderness all alone, well, that's because they organized various tests that involved going out in groups. The intent was to increase the children's level of independence, but more often than you'd think, a child actually does go missing during one of these tests. Chip Chan refers to a Korean woman who documents her life online and claims that she is the victim of a mind control weapon. Additionally, she frequently says that she is being held captive by a dishonest police officer, who she refers to as P. Over the course of a decade plus, Chip Chan has been livestreaming her apartment on an almost daily basis. She was initially discovered on a 4chan webcam thread in 2008. Immediately, visitors of the site took an interest in Chip Chan. She was found sleeping in a peculiar position and many thought that she was actually deceased at that moment. As Internet Sleuths did more investigating into Chip Chan, they found her WordPress blog. This discovery then spiraled into a rabbit hole of other blogs created by her where she spoke of this mysterious mind control device that was implanted 3 centimeters into her ankle bone. Throughout her apartment, there are several webcams which were likely placed by Chip Chan herself. For the majority of the time, Chip Chan just visits the internet and sleeps. And oftentimes, she sleeps upwards of 12 hours a day. Viewers say that she appears to be in rather poor health with lower levels of energy. She also occasionally develops rashes and wounds, wounds which she never revealed the origins of. Chip Chan claimed that she had been living in her apartment since 1996 and hasn't been able to leave since due to her chip which can knock her unconscious. However, this seems to be a lie as she has left her apartment several times and she has even changed her place of residence before. Instead of calling the police, Chip Chan asks the viewers for help. She wants people to spread the word about her situation and often mentions a man named Park Sung Man. Apparently, this guy can help her. Park was actually her former landlord as well. There are many theories in regards to Chip Chan, but it seems that the most commonly believed one is that she is simply mentally ill. Viewers have stated that she exhibits symptoms that often parallel paranoid schizophrenia. However, skeptics of this theory like to point to the trend where paranoid schizophrenics typically don't like being watched and often go into hiding, which in the case of Chip Chan is the complete opposite.
There is also the possibility that Chip Chan is a dedicated artist and this is all an elaborate art project, but to keep this up for nearly three decades is just insane. So for now, no one knows what is truly going on with Chip Chan. In 1840, a 22-year-old man named William N. Crump built his farmhouse near Oneonta, Alabama. Then in 1858, William purchased 246 acres of land from the U.S. government. And on this land, there were five caves. Crump Cave, Second Cave, Horseshoe Cave, Bishopella Cave, and Sewer Cave. The focus of this entry will be on Crump Cave, which had a super tiny entrance that could barely fit in one man at a time. One day, William William entered said cave and discovered Native American artifacts inside. There were beads, arrows, spears, copper, and stone axes. Additionally, there was well over 200 pounds of galena, which was an ore used in lead and silver. But along with those items were also wooden coffins and skulls. Over time, Crump and his friends took everything that was inside except for those wooden coffins. William served during the Civil War with the 49th Alabama Infantry, and it was during this time when Crump's cave was mined for saltpeter, which was used in gunpowder. After the war in 1892, a geologist named Frank Burns visited the cave with William by his side and said the following in his report. A short distance from the entrance was a room, which proved to be a burial cave of the Aborigines. They found eight or ten wooden coffins of black and white walnut, hollowed or cut of wood, after the fashion of the dugout canoe. The coffins are about seven and a half feet long, 14 to 18 inches wide, and two and a half inches thick, and six or seven inches deep. By this time, the coffins had deteriorated a great deal. Frank had them shipped off to the Smithsonian Institution, however, they they went lost shortly after their arrival. They have been lost ever since amongst all of the artifacts stored at the museum. Within Tokyo on January 26th, 1948, an unassuming middle-aged man visited the Tegan Bank. This man identified himself as Dr. Jiro Yamaguchi and even provided a business card to prove his identity. Dr. Jiro spent about one hour in that bank, but the events that occurred in this building for that relatively short amount of time was shocking. Jiro was wearing an armband that said Metropolitan Office City Hall of Tokyo, and he brought along a bag with medical supplies. He asked for the manager and informed them that there was a recent breakout of dysentery in the area and that he was tasked with vaccinating the staff at the bank. The staff thought that this was legitimate as Japan had recently faced the destructive force of a nuclear attack from World War II. Nobody suspected that perhaps this man was a fraud. Dr. Jiro stated that he would be exhibiting the vaccination in two doses. They would be swallowed one after the other. In total, 15 staff members and a child received this. There was about another two dozen staff members who refused the vaccination. The group waited a few minutes for it to take effect and shortly after, they all collapsed onto the floor. It was now clear that what they received was not really supposed to help them. Medical officials later determined that what was administered was potassium cyanide. Only four of the 16 people survived, 10 of whom died on the scene, including the child, and another two who passed away in the hospital. The false doctor stole about 160,000 yen, which is about 1400 USD. The strange thing was that he left behind nearly 200,000 yen. It took until August 21st of the same year for authorities to finally bring in a suspect to be questioned. This man was named Sadamichi Hirasawa. At the time, there was an illegal business of people swapping business cards. The business card belonging to the fake doctor had an entirely fake identity. Dr. Jiro Yamaguchi did not exist. And after the incident at the Tegan Bank, this killer went on to commit similar crimes two more times, but on smaller scales. One of the other identities he used was Shigeru Matsui. Authorities were able to find the real Shigeru who said that he swapped nearly 600 business cards and one of the people he swapped with was Sadamichi Hirasawa. Two of the surviving bank staff later stated that they believed the doctor was Hirasawa. Furthermore, police discovered a large sum of cash hidden away in Hirasawa was home. He was a painter and he claimed that the money was from illegal sales of adult artwork. 
Hirasawa later confessed to the killings after three weeks of constant interrogation. However, he did later retract his confession and said he only confessed to get out of the inhumane torture that he was being subjected to. Hirasawa's lawyers urged him to take a deal where he claimed to be partially insane since he suffered from Korsakoff psychosis. This is commonly associated with chronic alcoholism, but he was quickly found guilty and charged solely based on his confession. Hirasawa was later sentenced to death, which was upheld in 1950. In total, Hirasawa lived on death row for over three decades while his lawyers filed over 18 appeals over that time. The vast majority of people seemed to believe that Hirasawa was innocent. Aside from the money and his potentially false confession, there really wasn't much to convict Hirasawa. In total, there were nearly 40 employees at the bank and only two of them positively ID'd Hirasawa as the doctor. Even 33 different ministers of justice didn't think Hirasawa was responsible and they refused to sign off on his death warrant over those three decades where he was on death row. One of the more notorious ministers was known to frequently sign off on death warrants, signing a high of two dozen in a single day. Even he refused to sign off on Hirasawa's. There are many people who believe that Hirasawa was used as a sort of scapegoat for Unit 731, who specialized in the development of various chemical and biological weapons for the Japanese military. The group is said to have caused the deaths of well over 250,000 Chinese as well as massive populations of British, American, and Australian POWs. There were rumors that one of the members of Unit 731 was responsible for the Tagen Bank murders. To support this, during the war, it was normal for Unit 731 to actually administer poison to prisoners but tell them that it was actually medicine. Another aspect investigators like to point to is that not much money was stolen from the bank. This may have been because the true goal of this incident wasn't monetary, but simply to test out a new substance, and stealing the money was just an attempt to leave a red herring. If you recall, towards the beginning I mentioned that the lethal substance was potassium cyanide. Well, after additional extensive research, medical officials believe that it was more likely hydrogen cyanide. In most cases, the actual type of cyanide may not be an important factor as in the end the victim still died. However, in this particular event, the type is quite important. Unit 731 was known to be developing a new and highly lethal toxin named acetone cyanohydrin. The effects that this would have had are very similar to hydrogen cyanide. Now, investigators aren't 100% sure that the substance was actually hydrogen cyanide, but the victims exhibited signs similar to what that substance would have caused. Ultimately, Hirasawa died of pneumonia on May 10, 1987 while still condemned to the mass murder at the Tagen Bank. Around 6 a.m. at Lake Bodum, a group of boys noticed a tent in the distance collapse in on itself as a tall blonde man walked away. This is the case of the gruesome murders of Lake Bodum. A group consisting of two girls aged 15 and two young men aged 18 sat out on a camping trip on June 4th, 1960. The girls' names were Anya Maki and Amela Bjorklund. The boys were named as Seppo Boysman and Niels Gustagsen. Anya, Mela, and Seppo were all stabbed through their tent early in the morning. Investigators estimated that it was between 4 and 6 a.m. As for Nils, he sustained a shattered jaw and a concussion as well as a number of other facial injuries and was found outside of the tent. Seppo had several stab wounds, the lethal one being on his lung, but his skull had also been crushed from a blunt object. Mela had three injuries on her head that were also from a blunt object as well as 15 stab wounds. She was also found lying underneath Nils. There was also a pillowcase with semen which was later tested against all of the suspects. However, it is unknown whether this pillowcase belonged to the campers or not. As mentioned earlier, there was a group of boys who noticed a blonde haired man leaving the tent, but the actual bodies were reported by a carpenter named Esko Johansson. He discovered the remains at 11am and immediately called police, who didn't arrive until midday. Niels and Mela were discovered outside of the tent and Niels was fortunate enough to be the sole survivor of this gruesome attack. Police promptly hauled him off to a Red Cross station before starting their investigation. The crime scene was an absolute mess and there wasn't much to go off of at the location itself. 
Investigators noticed that the killer had left behind some items, such as the keys to the victim's motorcycles. Neil's shoes were later found buried about 500 meters from the tent. The crime scene was further ruined after soldiers were called in to assist in the search for missing items. The site was trampled over and any evidence that police may have had were being handled before they were even recorded. After a few weeks, investigators decided to hypnotize Nils in an attempt to dig up valuable information that could lead to the culprit. They were able to obtain a description from Nils which led to various drawings, but they didn't lead to an arrest. The culprit was aged anywhere from his 20s to 30s with an average if not slightly heavier build. His face was round, he had long blonde hair, red cheeks, a short neck, long forehead, dark beard, and was wearing a checkered shirt and a multicolored sweater which included the colors black and green. The killer was initially believed to be a man named Pauli Custa Luoma, who was a labor camp escapee, however he was later proven innocent. One of the more interesting suspects was a man named Hans Asman, who lived nearby Lake Bodum. He was found smack dab in the middle of various murder cases, but to sum things up quickly, it seemed like he was just a liar that liked to get involved in various unsolved cases. Hans also had a family, which made some people think that he didn't have it in him to brutally stab a girl 15 times. Another suspect was Nils himself. Authorities thought that it may have been possible that Nils got into a heated argument with Seppo while they were drunk. Remember Nils' shoes which were found buried? Well, the blood of the other three campers were found on them, but Nils' DNA wasn't. Nils was even put on trial in 2005 where the prosecution requested a life sentence for Nils, but he was later acquitted and granted monetary compensation for false accusations. This next entry takes place in Ibadan, Nigeria in March of 2014. A group of motorcycle taxi drivers set out in search of one of their colleagues after receiving concerning text messages from him. The man sending the text messages was named Kazim and in one of his texts, he stated that he had been lured into a rundown building in the forest of Soka. He along with dozens of other people were being held captive. Kazim had somehow snuck his phone into the building, hence how he was able to contact his friends. Kazim described the place as a long abandoned construction site, but the most disturbing things about his messages were the evils being committed in the forest. It has been known by locals for a while that the forest was dangerous, but no one really knew why. Kazim's friends eventually found the forest using clues given by him and they will never forget what they saw. Immediately upon stepping into the wilderness, the stench of rot filled their noses. All around the abandoned construction site were decomposing bodies. There were rows and rows of unmarked graves and trails of blood. Inside the dilapidated structure, there were dozens of starved men and women. However, the people responsible for running the site were nowhere to be seen. Just what was going on here? Investigators believed that it was an illegal organ farm where organs were being sold off on the black market, or they were being used as items in black magic. Within Nigerian culture, there is something called Nigerian juju. This is where practitioners sacrifice various offerings as part of a ritual for whatever their heart desires. Almost anything can be offered, including hair, nail clippings, etc. But for the darker spells, much more valuable items must be sacrificed. Caucasian people were even more valuable as it was said that their body parts could bring extra amounts of fortune and good luck to the caster. Rumors spread that the people running the business were backed by wealthy Nigerians, some of which may have even been government officials. Immediately after the discovery of this forest, riots began to stir. Authorities and various security forces then stepped in to protect the site, and they even utilized tear gas and guns to hold off the angry protesters. And this obviously just pissed off the residents even more as many of them had missing loved ones that were likely killed in that forest. They asked officials why was the security just now stepping in when it had been known that something was happening in the forest for years. No one was ever charged for the crimes committed in the Ibadan House of Horror and after being demolished, a school was built on top of it. And to my knowledge, there was never an investigation done for this crime, or at least no serious official ones anyway. This entry focuses on a boy named Shinya Matsuoka who was 4 years old in 1989. 
The family consisted of two kids and a mother and father. Previously, it also included a grandmother, but she passed away on March 5, 1989. The family visited Tokushima to attend her funeral and stayed over at a relative's house for the night. At 8 a.m. on March 7th, the father took Shinya and his sister out for a stroll. They were out for about 10 minutes before they headed back home. But Shinya wanted to stay outside, so they decided to drop off his sibling, then Shinya and his dad would continue to walk around. When they return to the house, Shinya's father walks up some stairs carrying a toddler. Shinya was trailing behind his father by just a little bit, but his dad could see that Shinya had made it to the top of the stairs out of the corner of his eye. His father knocks on the door and takes two steps into the house to hand his other child to his wife. And in just a matter of seconds, when he turned around, Shinya was gone. He ran around the house looking for Shinya and yelling his name, but he just couldn't seem to find him. He rushes back inside of the house to let everyone know that Shinya was missing, and then they all put on their jackets and began to search. There were some mountains nearby, so the adults began to worry that Shinya may have wandered into the woods. Eventually, Shinya's father called the police and they had a massive search party searching for his son. There were 15 officers, 100 riot officers, firefighters, and volunteers which totaled to over 200 people. The search continued for several months, but not a single lead was obtained. It is so baffling that Shinya somehow disappeared in just a matter of seconds. The area where the family was residing in at the time was said to be pretty remote, located at the end of a road, which meant that the only people who would be there actually lived in the exact area. There were a couple of field workers about 100 meters away who did not report seeing anything strange. Then on March 16th, something equally as strange as the disappearance occurs. One day before the family planned to go back home, they received a phone call. Shinya's dad picked it up and a female voice asked, Is your wife there? He hands the phone to his wife and the caller says, I am Mariko Nakahara's mother. My child is in group Moon of the Seikai Kindergarten. We have put together some money to support you. Where should we send it to? Are you returning home soon? The mother replied, we'll be back sometime tomorrow. After a couple of days, the family didn't hear anything about this fund. Shinya's mother didn't want to come across as rude, so she waited a bit longer before getting in touch with the caller. She contacted the school and asked about the parents of Maruko Nakahara, but the school said they didn't have a student under that name. This got Shinya's mother thinking. She recalled that the caller had a Tokushima accent which in hindsight was strange as they lived in Ibaraki. Furthermore, how did this alleged parent of a student know the phone number to the house of one of the family's relatives? How did this person know which kindergarten the kids were attending? This call had the potential to solve the entire case, however, it led nowhere. From 1989 to 1998, there were about 7 to 9 alleged sightings of Shinya. Then in 2018, a man named Ryoto Wada actually claimed to be Shinya Matsuoka. Ryoto did appear similar to Shinya, but after DNA testing, it was determined that Ryoto was not him. It has now been over three decades since the boy disappeared, and both the family and investigators are just as confused with this event as ever. There are some theorists that believe that Shinya's father was actually the person responsible. From what I could understand, his wife never actually saw Shinya at the top of the stairs. This led some to believe that the father had actually taken care of Shinya sometime before returning to the home, because he was the only one who claimed to have seen Shinya right behind him. But again, decades passed and there hasn't been any serious progression in the case. Zeb Quinn was 18 years old and lived in Asheville, North Carolina when he went missing on January 2nd, 2000. It was about 9pm when Zeb had finished his shift at Walmart. Zeb made plans to visit Lester with one of his co-workers named Robert Jason Owens in order to purchase a new car. After his shift, the two met up in the Walmart parking lot and talked for a little while before heading out in separate vehicles. Security cameras captured the two leaving a gas station around 9.15pm after purchasing some sodas. Robert later claimed that Zeb was flashing his headlights behind him signaling 
for him to pull over. Zeb said that he had received a page and needed to find a phone to return the calls. He went off to look for a payphone and when he returned, Robert said that he was acting frantic and randomly blurted out that he needed to cancel their plans. Zeb then took off in his car and rear-ended Robert's truck in the process. Then a few hours after that incident, Robert visited a hospital where he was treated for his fractured ribs and a head injury. According to Robert, he has sustained these injuries from a car accident right after Zeb left him, but there was no report ever made to police about said accident. The next day, Zeb's mother, Denise, filed a missing persons report for Zeb. Then just a couple of days after this report was filed, an unknown man claiming to be Zeb called Walmart to say that he wouldn't be in for work because he was sick. The employee that answered the call said that the guy on the other end did not sound like Zeb. The first person to be questioned was, of course, Robert Owens, who later admitted that he was the one who made that call to Walmart impersonating Zeb. Robert stated that Zeb had asked him to call in sick for him. Another person of interest was a woman named Misty Taylor. Misty was a love interest of Zeb's. Apparently, Zeb had developed a friendship with her not long before his disappearance, but Misty's abusive boyfriend, Wesley Smith, learned about this and threatened Zeb to leave Misty alone. Investigators later discovered that the page Zeb received came from the home of his aunt, Ina, but Ina denied ever making a call and said that she was having dinner at a friend's house. This friend just so happened to be Misty's mom. Both Misty and her boyfriend, Wesley, were also there. Ina did bring up the fact that she filed a report with police saying that her home was broken into that same evening, but nothing was taken from her. Fast forward to January 6th, Zeb's Mazda protege was located in a parking lot at a barbecue restaurant. The vehicle's headlights were left on and there was a pair of lips and an exclamation mark drawn on the back windshield and lipstick. Furthermore, there was a black Labrador puppy left inside the car. There was also a plastic hotel key card, several drink bottles, and a jacket. Police couldn't locate the hotel the key card belonged to. Zeb's mother, grandmother, and sister all worked nearby that restaurant, so it is widely believed that whoever left it there intentionally selected this location in hopes that one of the three would find it. A couple soon contacted police informing them that they saw the person who drove the car. They were brought in to provide details for a composite sketch which turned out to look strikingly similar to Misty Taylor. On March 17th, 2015, over a decade since Zeb's disappearance, Robert was arrested for a different incident which involved the murders and disappearances of a woman named Christy Schoen, her husband, and their child. Robert pleaded guilty for these crimes but claimed that he had accidentally run them over. He also pleaded guilty to two counts of dismembering. And this is where investigators made a major discovery in Zeb's case. When authorities went to investigate Robert's home, they found fabric and leather materials as well as bone fragments under a layer of concrete on Robert's property. Then in July of 2022, authorities publicly revealed that a while back, Robert had told them that a family member had killed Zeb. Then they burned his remains and left them somewhere in the Bent Creek Experimental Forest. Robert later accused his uncle, Walter Owens, of taking Zeb's life. However, investigators cannot confirm this as Walter died in 2017. According to Robert, what had happened was Misty's boyfriend hired Walter to kill Zeb. Walter lured Zeb into meeting Misty into the Pisgah National Forest. But instead of meeting up with Misty, Zeb encountered Walter. He then shot Zeb with a 22 caliber rifle, then proceeded to dismember him. Robert added that he helped him cover everything up. But as of now, police can't say for certain that this is what actually had happened. Robert was ultimately sentenced to 12 and a half to 16 years in prison for the previous crimes he committed. While some do believe Walter was the one responsible, some think that it was actually Robert and he's only making up this lie knowing that Walter isn't there to actually argue against him. It's possible that he's forking off this crime in an attempt to lessen his sentence. The case of Robert Wohn is one that is filled with holes that just don't really add up and involves several suspicious individuals. The case frustrates many people and they believe that there was some sort of pact of silence made that is keeping this case from being solved. 
Robert was a 32-year-old lawyer who worked in Washington, D.C. He was murdered in August of 2006 in the home of his college friend, Joseph Price. Robert was working as general counsel for Radio Free Asia and decided to stay the night at Joseph's home, which was less than a mile from his office. This decision cost Robert his life. The three men lived as a polyamorous family. Robert arrived at the residence around 10.30 p.m. Then around 11.50 p.m., Victor called the police asking for an ambulance. When officials arrived, they discovered Robert's body clinging to life, but unfortunately, he later passed away at the George Washington University Hospital at 12.24 a.m. August 3rd. Again, the three men present with Robert were Joseph, Victor, and Dylan. Investigators were immediately suspicious of them, but they claimed that an intruder had broken in and killed Robert. They all denied any involvement in his death, and they all attended Robert's funeral. Paramedics later stated that they found it eerily unusual that the three men didn't exhibit much emotion when they arrived. They didn't even bother pointing medical officials in the direction of Robert's body. Police later publicly claimed that the crime scene had been tampered with. There were accusations that the area around Robert's body had been extensively cleaned. Authorities swept the entirety of the building, removing pieces of floor and walls in order to gather evidence. At first, the case didn't make much progress as the police only really had those three men as their suspects. But all three of them kept insisting that they were not responsible. Then in October of 2008, Dylan Ward was charged with obstruction of justice. Then the next month, Joseph and Zaborski were also charged with obstruction of justice and arrested. Not long after, charges of conspiracy were also filed against the trio. This is where we find out that police were building a case against these three ever since Robert's death. Their report said the following, The evidence demonstrates that Robert Wone was restrained, incapacitated, sexually assaulted, and murdered inside 1509 Swan Street. There exists overwhelming evidence, far in excess of probable cause. They obstructed justice by altering and orchestrating the crime scene, planning evidence, delaying the reporting of the murder to authorities, and lying to the police about the true circumstances of the murder. Investigators went on to say that the knife they found near Robert's body had been planted there after someone covered it with blood. Police believe that the real knife was hidden or disposed of. Apparently, the wounds that Robert sustained did not match up with the knife that was found either. There was also evidence alluding to some amount of suffocation and puncture marks along Robert's neck, chest, foot, and hand. But medical officials couldn't detect any toxins in Robert's blood. Cadaver dogs also hinted at the likelihood that someone washed themselves on the back patio, then dried their clothing in the dryer. But on June 29, 2010, Judge Lynn Leibovitz found all three men not guilty of any of the charges. However, the judge did later say that she did believe that those three knew exactly who killed Robert, but it was definitely none of them. Robert's wife filed a wrongful death lawsuit against the three men in 2008, which was settled in August of 2011 out of court. To this day, we still don't know who killed Robert Wohn. Danny Philippidis is the name of a man who went missing on a mountain in New York during a ski trip before reappearing in Sacramento, California not even a week later with no memory of what happened to him. It was February 7th, 2018 when 49-year-old Toronto firefighter Danny Philippidis was skiing down the Whiteface Mountain in Wilmington, New York. Danny was a married father of two kids who loved to visit various mountains for skiing. This event was an annual trip that Danny went on with his colleagues and retired firefighters. On the very last day of the trip, around 2.30pm, one of the men in the group said that he was feeling a bit nauseous and needed to head back. Danny, on the other hand, was having the time of his life and wanted to stay behind. So instead of heading back, Danny went down the mountain one more time all alone. Just as Danny's friends reached the lodge, a massive snowstorm began to hit the mountain, making it incredibly difficult to see. At about 4pm, ski lifts began to close, yet Danny still hasn't returned back to the group yet. Given that the weather was turning really bad, they grew worried about Danny. About half an hour later, they reported Danny missing. They 
rushed back to the resort where they were all staying, just on the off chance that Danny went straight there. But yet again, there was no sign of him. In his room was his passport, phone, and ID. His car was also exactly where he left it. Forest rangers, ski patrol, and a group of volunteers trekked up the mountain in an attempt to locate the now missing Danny. Unfortunately for them, the weather kept getting worse and by the end of their search, they couldn't find Danny or any sign of him. By the next day, police, homeland security, and US border officials got involved. Additionally, when the news of a missing firefighter made its rounds, over 100 firefighters traveled to New York in order to help with the search, while an equal amount agreed to take up their shifts back home. There were a staggering 6,000 plus people searching for Danny. Helicopters, drones, and dogs were also used. Danny was last seen in a green jacket, black helmet, goggles, and he had red skis. As the one week mark drew closer, people began to lose hope that they'd be able to find the missing firefighter alive. But that's when a shocking discovery was made. Danny was found all the way in California. It was about 9 to 10 a.m. on February 13th when Danny's wife received a phone call from a caller that she did not recognize. Upon answering, the caller called her by her nickname, and that's when it clicked. The caller was her husband, Danny. He said that he was at the Sacramento airport and he needed help immediately. Danny's wife then called police who notified officials in Sacramento. Danny was found in the exact clothing that he went missing in. However, while he appeared normal on the surface, mentally it seemed as though he had suffered from something. When asked what a blue sign looked like, he said that it was green. In his possession was a brand new iPhone, a credit card, and $1,000 in cash. His colleagues later stated that he had also gotten a haircut in the time that he was missing. Medical officials suspected that Danny may have sustained some sort of head injury. Danny couldn't seem to remember much during the time he was gone, but he did say that he was riding in some sort of a large truck. After being examined by doctors at a nearby hospital, they determined that he had no signs of any injuries. Furthermore, he had not consumed any substances or alcohol. Police tried finding the driver of the truck that Danny claimed he rode in, but the driver was never identified. About half a year after Danny resurfaced, he said in an interview that he may have taken an incorrect turn when attempting to locate his car back at the resort. Investigators think that he may have taken a fall and, in the storm, wandered to the kids' hub which was closed. From there, he tried to find his car but failed at locating it. Then he traveled to a nearby road where he hailed down a passing truck all while being dazed. All Danny could remember from the ride was that the driver had some sort of generic name, which obviously doesn't help. After being dropped off in downtown Sacramento, Danny said that his first thought was to call his wife, but he couldn't remember her number, nor did he have a phone on him. But he did have a credit card which he used the next day to purchase a phone after he remembered his wife's number. A brain surgeon in Toronto proposed the idea that Danny suffered from amnesia as a result of a concussion. It may have been possible that Danny hit his head when he was coming down the mountain and developed retrograde amnesia, but again, medical officials couldn't find any signs of injury on the man. Another strange aspect is that if he did have amnesia, the doctor stated that it shouldn't have lasted any longer than 48 hours. Although, there are some very rare cases where the loss of memory extends into several months. Danny was missing for nearly a week and couldn't remember a single thing. Then, when he accepted the interview six months later, he still couldn't recall much. Another doctor proposed the idea that Danny experienced a different form of amnesia called a dissociative fugue state. Fugue or fuga is the Latin term for flight and is a very rare condition where the person loses their sense of identity and impulsively travels around. They lose chunks of their memory and they have no idea who they are, and sometimes they even make up fake identities in an attempt to tie themselves to something. This can be caused by a head injury or even by traumatic events, but either way, no medical professionals are certain just what happened to Danny, nor does anyone know who the driver was that picked him up. The Soda Killer refers to an incident in Causet, Nebraska where a camera caught the gruesome murder of a woman named Leah Rollins. Leah was a 41-year-old mother who had recently divorced her abusive ex-husband. Following her divorce, she moved to the small town of Causet with her two sons. 
For the most part, Leah's life seemed to be on the up and up. She had received a promotion at a Moko station where she worked and was in a relationship with a new man that cared for her and her kids. But her life took a turn for the worse on March 10th, 1997. Leah was in the middle of her shift at the convenience store when a shaggy looking man with no shoes walked in. He had on sweats and a dark colored bomber jacket and was careful to wait for the customers in the store to exit before he commenced his disgusting plans. As soon as the mother and her child exited the store, the man grabbed a soda then headed to the counter where Leah was standing. He opens the soda and takes a look at the camera almost as if he was mocking whoever was going to see the footage later. With the use of a firearm, the man ordered Leah to empty the cash register and lie on the ground face down. He then proceeds to shoot her several times with his 9mm semi-automatic pistol. Afterwards, he nonchalantly exits the store and gets in his red 1993 Pontiac Grand Am. Eventually, a new customer entered the store and discovered the grisly scene. They reported the crime to police who didn't take long to arrive. And the most frustrating part of this entire event was that there was an abundance of evidence, but the killer was never caught. His face was well documented by the camera, his license plate was picked up, and he even left prints all over the store. One officer later said the man was very brazen, very confident in what he was doing. Most investigators are of the opinion that this was a random crime and Leah was simply a victim of the wrong place at the wrong time. Although, some have suggested that the man knew Leah and taking the money from the register was just a way to cover up the true motives of the crime. Cause it was a small town and nobody recognized the man's face, so this meant that more than likely he was not a local. Leah moved in from Arkansas, so could this man have come from there? Investigators attempted to try and find a reason in which the man could justify killing Leah, and all they could come up with was he either had a personal vendetta against her or he was a complete lunatic. But then again, the killer was eerily calm throughout the entire incident, making it seem like this was not his first time killing. This could support the idea that Leah was not some random victim. Leah's brother Roy believed that it was actually Leah's ex-husband who hired a hitman to take out Leah. Roy said the following in regards to the killer's clothing. This guy who killed my sister comes into that gas station with clam diggers on. That's when your pants are rolled up to your knees and that's what people in the bayous or in the southern hemisphere do. So this guy in Nebraska, which is not warm, comes in with his pants rolled up, which tells me I think he was from St. Thomas, the Virgin Islands, and I think my brother-in-law paid him to come up and shoot my sister. Leah and her ex actually owned a restaurant in St. Thomas before they broke up. It's been nearly three decades since Leah's death, making many people think that the killer will never be caught. It's not like investigators had no information on the killer at the very start and have been working at obtaining more evidence, no. Essentially, all one would need to solve the case was hand given to authorities, but they still have not been able to identify the man, leaving most people hopeless. During the mid-1940s in Mattoon, Illinois, there were a series of gas-based attacks by an unknown individual who has gone on to be called the Mad Gasser of Mattoon. Victims of these gas attacks reported symptoms such as paralysis in their lower limbs, coughing, and vomiting. Thankfully, nobody died as a result, but nevertheless, this entire series of events is very strange. The first attack happened on August 31st, 1944 in a suburban neighborhood where a man named Urban Reef awoke from his slumber after noticing a distinct odor. Shortly after noticing the smell, he began to feel nauseous and was not able to support his own weight on his two legs. Not long after, he began to violently vomit. Urban's wife suspected that there was some sort of gas leak and rushed to the kitchen to see if something had happened there. But before she could make it all the way to the kitchen, she collapsed to the floor, paralyzed from the waist down. That same day, a neighbor of Urban's reported similar events within her home. Her daughter was paralyzed in bed and also vomited several times. The very next day, September 1st, a third incident involving another odor was reported. This one occurred at around 11pm and the woman described it as sort of sweet, which made her think that the smell was actually her flowers. 
Quickly, she began to lose feeling in her legs and she yelled for her sister. She also noticed the odor and went to call the police, but by the time they arrived, the smell had faded. Then just one and a half hours later, the woman's husband returned home and noticed a masked man crouching near one of the windows of his home. He yelled at the man, which caused him to flee. Police thought that money was the sole purpose behind all of these attacks, as the residents in one of the homes stated that they were counting cash near a window and someone may have seen them. Nearly half a dozen additional gas attacks were reported in the following weeks. One of the victims found a handkerchief on their front porch and after holding it close to their face, they instantly collapsed to the floor. Police believed that this cloth was meant to incapacitate the family dog. And not too far away, police also found a skeleton key, which if you do not know is essentially a makeshift master key. With the key, there was also a tube of lipstick. After the police made a public announcement that there was someone trying to break into homes by the use of gas, residents began to grow paranoid, causing a massive influx of false reports to come in. In the end, no one was caught and the commissioner of public health had the following to say, There is no doubt that a gas maniac exists and has made a number of attacks, but many of the reported attacks are nothing more than hysteria. Fear of the gas man is entirely out of proportion to the menace of the relatively harmless gas he is spraying. The whole town is sick with hysteria. It was February 2nd, 2009, when a woman named Christine Ross was walking her dog in West Mesa in the Albuquerque area. As they were walking, her dog eventually started showing signs of agitation and barked in a certain direction. Christine allowed her dog to lead her and that's when it brought back a bone that looked almost like a human femur. That's because it was a human femur. Christine took a picture of it and sent it to her sister who was a nurse. She told Christine that she needed to call the police immediately. Police investigated the area and over the following month, they discovered additional remains. Initially, they thought that they had the remains of 13 different victims, but this was later reduced to 11. The victims were all women or girls, with the youngest two being 15 years and most if not all of them were of Hispanic descent. They all went missing around 2003 to 2004. Monica Candelaria went missing in May 2003, Doreen Marquez in October 2003, and the following victims went missing in 2004. Veronica Romero in February, 15-year-old Jamie Barella and cousin Evelyn Salazar in March, Solania Edwards in May, Virginia Cloven in June, Cinnamon Elks in July, Julie Nito in August, pregnant Michelle Valdez in September, and then Victoria Chavez. However, it isn't exactly known when she went missing in 2004. In 2005, a detective investigating one of these cases named Ida Lopez began to notice similarities and linked several missing persons cases together. Apparently, when Cinnamon was still alive, she was telling people about a crooked cop that was killing and burying women on the West Mesa. Then, just weeks after she started spreading these rumors, she disappeared. Julie Nito's family said they heard similar rumors and they, along with two of Julie's friends, reported Julie missing. Julie was also talking about these supposed burials on the West Mesa. Detective Lopez began to group all of these names together and she ended up with over two dozen names. Some of the other victims whose remains were not found but were on Lopez's list were Darlene Trujillo, Christine Julian, Anna Vigil, Felipa Gonzalez, Nina Heron, Chantelle Waits, and Leah Pibles. No one has ever been convicted of these crimes, but there remains a list of notable suspects. One of these suspects was a man named Lorenzo Montoya who died in 2006. He was murdered by the boyfriend of a 19-year-old dancer that he killed. Montoya has been a person of interest for quite some time as they obtained an audio clip where it sounded as though Montoya was duct taping garbage bags. Furthermore, he was frequently in the middle of other assault cases involving women. Another suspect was Joseph Blea aka the McKinley Middle School most investigators paid Joseph no mind in regards to the case of the bones, but his DNA was discovered on some clothing found with them. He was also known for stalking escorts in the night and taking advantage of them. He is currently in prison serving a 90 year sentence and refuses to speak on the West Mesa case. 
The Isdal Women refers to an unidentified female found dead at the Isdalen Valley, aka the Ice Valley, in Bergen, Norway on November 29th, 1970. Police believe that the woman died of suicide, however, there are various details that may suggest otherwise. It was November 29, 1970 when a man took his two daughters on a hiking trip to the Ice Valley. Unfortunately, the location is also often referred to as the Death Valley by locals due to the vast amount of suicides and accidents in the area. The girls noticed a smell that they did not recognize, but it did seem like something was burning. The group ventured closer to the source until they discovered the charred body of a woman. Immediately, they headed back from where they came from and contacted police. The front of the woman's body was severely burned to the point where her face was unrecognizable. Nearby was an empty bottle of alcohol, two plastic water bottles, a passport holder, boots, some clothing, a purse, and a matchbox. Just a couple days later, by chance, police found two suitcases which actually belonged to the same woman. Although the contents weren't all that notable, there were no items inside that could lead to the identification of the woman. Medical officials determined that she had passed away from carbon monoxide poisoning and inside of her lungs was suit which suggested that she was still alive when her body was burning. Furthermore, her neck was bruised and after testing her blood, it was found that she had consumed anywhere between 50 and 70 sleeping pills. Authorities later located the hotel that she was staying at before she died. Hotel employees said that they last saw the woman on November 23rd. Police later discovered a notepad which had some obscure dates belonging to the woman. They were able to quickly decipher the dates as moments where the woman visited other locations in Europe. She also used about eight different fake passports and aliases during her travels. Another odd behavior was that the woman seemed to change rooms as soon as she checked into her various hotels. The employees described the woman as beautiful and was estimated to be about 5 foot 4 inches tall. The case leaves many questions unanswered. Due to her peculiar travel tendencies, many people believe that she was tied to some sort of secret crime ring. Some suggested that she may have even been a spy involved in the Cold War. There were some records that were declassified from the Norwegian Armed Forces that highlighted the parallels in the women's movements to the trial locations of the Penguin Missile. A fisherman in Stavanger even claimed that he saw the woman and then a shoe salesman believed that he sold her some rubber boots. In 1991, a taxi driver contacted police saying that he was the one that drove the woman after she checked out of her last hotel. He claimed that shortly after picking her up, an unknown man got in as well to join the trip to the train station. This man was never identified. Then about five days before her body was discovered, a hiker said he saw her with two other men on the hillside of Flayen. The hiker noticed that the woman seemed a bit withdrawn and worried that she was some sort of hostage. So he reported the sighting to police, but they said to just forget about it as it was probably nothing. Investigators later developed a theory that the woman may have been an escort based on her travel patterns. She always seemed to go back to the same point eventually. This could very well have been her home. She made an effort to remain anonymous and the sightings of her with different men were all points that could support this theory. There was some evidence at the site of the woman's body that made it seem as though someone else was there. So it seems that the two prevailing theories revolve around murder or assisted but due to details such as the bruises found around her neck, some people believe that it was the former. Mozart's decline in his health caught many people off guard and has since developed a certain mystique around itself. In order to talk about his actual death, we must first take a look at what happened from September to December of 1791. Mozart's condition was gradually getting worse since he arrived in Prague in August of the same year. As a result of his declining health, he had to return home to Vienna in September. When he arrived, he was still fighting off some ailments, but at the very least, he was able to work on his music to an extent. Another month passed and Mozart wasn't getting any better. He began telling his friends and family that he may have been poisoned. But just like that, his health abruptly got a bit better, only to get worse after a couple of weeks. From November 20th onwards, Mozart was bedridden. He was frequently vomiting and parts of his body began to swell. He kept exclaiming that he was in constant and immense pain. Ultimately, his body succumbed to the conditions and Mozart died on December 5th. 
Medical officials did not perform an autopsy, but one doctor named Edward Von Loebs stated that there were no signs of foul play or poisoning. Despite having a respected medical official saying that Mozart died of natural causes, the public couldn't help but speculate on the possibility that Mozart was actually poisoned. Some people thought that Mozart may have been poisoned with aqua tofana, which was a lethal substance created in Sicily in the 1630s and primarily consisted of arsenic and lead, but also included substances such as mercury and chlorine. It does have a distinct odor, however, if one were to mix it with something like wine, it would be tough to detect. But who would want to poison Mozart? He didn't exactly have any enemies, plus if he was poisoned by Aqua Tofana, he would have died in 3 days and not months. But this doesn't rule out the possibility that he may have ingested a different poison. Others proposed that Mozart was suffering from an extreme deficiency of vitamin D. There was also the possibility that he died from trichinosis after eating a dinner that had undercooked pork chops. All kinds of different theories were being thrown around. But one of the more mundane and commonly agreed upon theories suggests that Mozart had a chronic kidney disease that went untreated. If true, it would explain the signs of immense fatigue that Mozart displayed from his 20s and 30s. The disease could have resulted in uremia, which killed him over the course of several months. The case of Harry Horse and Mandy Horn is one that has sparked much debate since its inception. Harry Horse or Richard Horn was a cartoonist and author, with Harry Horse being his pen name. Richard's wife Amanda, or often referred to as Mandy, developed a terminal illness and for her last two years of life, Richard had been nursing her. Richard was given an extended leave of absence from his Sunday slot in the weekly newspaper in order to spend more time with his wife. On January 9th, 2007, two of Richard and Mandy's friends decided to go to their home, but they claimed that Richard was acting a bit strange. One of the things he said was, it's a wonderful night for a killing. His wife Mandy also asked the two several times to not leave. They told her that they couldn't stay, to which she kept insisting and begging. Ultimately, the two left. Then at 9.40am the next day, those two friends headed towards the airport to get on a flight to return home. But they had to stop by Richard and Mandy's again since one of them had forgotten their jacket. When they arrived, they knocked on the door expecting Richard to come out and greet them, but nobody came. They waited a bit longer and still they received no response. The door was not locked so they decided to just step inside and what they found sent waves of confusion and shock down their spines. The couple's two pets, one dog and one cat had been stabbed to death and not far away was Amanda with well over 30 stab wounds and Harry with nearly 50. But the most grotesque part was that Harry's male organs had been mutilated. Since Richard and Amanda were lying next to each other on their bed, many believed that this was some sort of twisted Romeo and Juliet pact. However, it didn't take long for discourse to brew. News outlets began to state that it was much more likely that Richard took a large volume of various substances before proceeding to stab Amanda to the point where the knife broke. He then took his own life in a crazed state of mind. It was known that Richard had issues with his mental well-being, but many people do not think that Richard was capable of such a thing. And even more baffling was during the autopsy, medical officials could not find any signs of drugs within Richard. Just how was he able to inflict nearly 50 wounds on himself, then proceed to mutilate his own member? Some suggested that the two friends may have played a role and are not being entirely truthful with police. The combination of Richard's already poor mental health as well as the tragic reality of losing his wife Nearing, Richard may have just snapped mentally. This could very well have been an episode of psychosis and nothing more, but let me know what you think. And oftentimes, whenever this incident is being discussed, the topic around a video game that Richard developed is also mentioned. The title of the video game is Drowned God Conspiracy of the Ages, which came out in 1996 and is a science fiction adventure game. But that is an entirely different rabbit hole that can be talked about for hours. 
Many members of the public and investigators have obsessed over the strange death of Josh Maddox. His daily struggles and liveliness were traits that many were able to relate to, making the case all the more intriguing. Josh grew up in Woodland Park, Colorado and lived nearby some woods and hiking trails. His sister Ruth described him as a friendly guy who loved the outdoors. He also enjoyed hiking, fishing, and camping with his friends. Ruth was quoted saying, He was my best friend and he always inspired me to strive for greatness. Josh would tell me that one should never say anything bad about anyone else, ever, and I tried to be more like him. Josh was one of the nicest people I have ever met, and I am very proud to be his sister. He loved to read and was a brilliant writer. Josh was a wonderful person with a bright light that enriched the lives of everyone around him. Josh's other sister, Kate, had similar words. His IQ was off the charts. He spent most of his time writing fictional stories and playing music. He had an interesting and unique sense of style. People in his high school class knew him for being that awesome kid who wore a top hat and brought a briefcase to school instead of a backpack. There was this subtle sophistication about him that made him interesting and a standout. Josh and his family also faced many hardships. For example, Josh's older brother Zach took his own life the same week he was supposed to graduate high school. Josh basically idolized his older brother and the loss was very hard on him. On May 8th, 2008, Josh left the family home in order to get some fresh air and go on a walk. While this wasn't a frequent occurrence with Josh, it also wasn't unusual of him to go out and venture around either. However, Josh never returned from this walk. His family was worried when he didn't return, but they thought that he was just hanging out with friends or found something interesting to occupy himself. But that's when Kate remembered something that Josh had told her. He always told us that he was going to have a great adventure and he may not talk to us for a while. When he said a while, we thought maybe a few years. Kate thought that this may have been Josh taking off for that adventure he spoke of. Everyone began to freak out and his father Mike said, I went to work one day and came home and he wasn't there. The next day, he still didn't come home. I called all of his friends. Nobody's seen him. Nobody knows where he is. I didn't know what to do so I called the police. It was five days after Josh's disappearance when police were contacted, which makes it May 13th. At the time, Josh was considered an adult and police suggested that perhaps he had just run away since there were no signs of foul play. They also proposed the idea that Josh may not have gotten over the death of Zach yet. Years gradually passed with no sign of Josh. While most were beginning to think that the worst had happened, Kate tried to stay optimistic. She said, Since Josh was 18, it has been reasonable to assume he may have decided to leave town to start a new life. As one of his two older sisters, I have always chosen to believe that this was the case. I have expected Josh to return home to my father's house at any time with a wife and small children so that they can meet their grandparents and two aunts. Josh had always been known for his musical and literary talent, so maybe we would find him playing music with a band on tour, or catch him writing successful novels under a pen name so that he could keep his preferred lifestyle of solitude in the woods. Josh's father Mike had different thoughts though. Mike searched the nearby campgrounds and wilderness in an attempt to locate his son. He even stopped by several homeless shelters and while he did hope that Josh simply ran away, he worried that Josh may have taken his own life. In addition to the distress that Josh's absence caused, Mike and his wife divorced shortly after their son went missing. In the summer of 2015, a construction crew was in the process of destroying a cabin near the old Thunderhead Ranch, which wasn't far from the Maddox home. The cabin had been abandoned since 2005. It was August 7th when construction workers entered the cabin to inspect the insides before they demolished the structure. Inside was a chimney with a large table set in front of it. A couple of men moved it and examined the chimney and that's when they saw it. There was an entire body shoved inside of the chimney. The body was upside down in the fetal position wearing only a sweater. 911 was called and investigators were able to extract the body. They contacted Mike and a woman named Pam White. Pam was the mother of another boy who went missing named Lucas. Authorities were confident that the body was either of Josh or Lucas. Mike would later confirm that the body was of Josh. This was obviously a major revelation, however, it just brought along more questions. And the fact that Josh was nearby the Maddox home for so long was greatly upsetting for the family. 
So why was Josh inside of that chimney? If you recall, Josh was only wearing a shirt, but the rest of his clothes were scattered around the fireplace. His pants, underwear, and socks were all there. This just makes things all the more stranger. It was tough to believe that Josh took everything off except for his shirt, walked outside, and then jumped into the chimney. Immediately, people began pointing their fingers at foul play or the use of substances to explain the peculiar position Josh was found in. Since Josh's body was so badly decomposed, medical officials struggled to test for substances, so investigators set their sights on locating any signs of trauma. There were no wounds or marks that indicated that there was a struggle. It may have been possible that Josh died of hypothermia, but that still doesn't explain why he took off his clothes in the first place. One other possibility proposed by an investigator named Al Bourne was that Josh may have been strangled. His bones would not be able to show any any signs of this if true. It didn't take very long for investigators to start forming a list of possible suspects. One of these suspects had his name hidden for quite a while, and it would have stayed that way if not for a Reddit post that was made in 2015. The true identity of the user is unknown, but their handle was Gentleman Gina. The original post is still available online if you would like to take a look at it yourself. And being that it is quite long, I will be cutting it down some. I went to high school with this skinny dorky hippie named Andy, who played guitar in a band. I was never good friends with him or anything, but a year or so after I graduated, one of my good friends, Josh, started hanging out with him, and then went missing. Last I heard, Andy was telling another friend, yeah, me and Josh have been spending a lot of time together, we're planning a trip to New Mexico. Turns out that in addition to becoming a lot scarier looking, Andy had indeed headed down to New Mexico, where he found himself shooting the shit with the caretaker of a disabled guy. One day, he got invited over to their apartment. The caretaker gets in the shower, and when he comes back out, the disabled guy is stabbed to death and Andy's gone. When Andy got arrested, he also claimed to have killed a woman in Taos and stuffed her body in a barrel. The cops had indeed found a woman stuffed in a barrel in Taos but already had somebody in custody for it and decided to stick with that guy instead. Years later, I found out that the caretaker had died in a bar fight, and without him, the cops didn't have much in the way of evidence somehow. So that case against Andy was dropped too. Andy, or Andrew Newman, had mental health issues since he was in school. At one point, he was in Houston hitchhiking and visiting various homes begging for food, water, and money. Eventually, he came upon a home that let him in and provided him with food. The two that had let Andrew into their home were just teens, so they called their dad, who then offered to drive Andrew to the next county over to get closer to his destination. But instead, he actually drove Andrew to the police station where he was arrested. Andrew was facing several charges not long after, and he attempted to escape jail on September 12th, 2009. Then in 2010, he was sent to the New Mexico Behavioral Health Institute located in Las Vegas. So Andrew himself is an entirely different rabbit hole with a lot of information, however most of it is unrelated to Josh. The reddit post continued and said, several of us went to the cops and said, yo, Josh who went missing was last seen with Andy who's a murderer, maybe you should check that out? Despite a fair amount of pestering, nothing ever really came of it. And by nothing, I mean that the police mostly didn't even return our calls, and once accidentally cancelled the bulletin on Josh because he's a alive and while well living in the next town over. Except for the fact that in addition to Josh having last been seen with Andy immediately before his stabbing spree, people called in to report having heard rumors that Andy was bragging about having quote unquote put Josh in a hole. Look, I get that they didn't find enough evidence to arrest Andy or anyone else, but they went ahead and demolished a cabin despite all this. Josh's body was cremated. As far as I can tell, nobody even bothered to call Andy to ask if he knew anything. It's not that I want somebody to blame, I'm not trying to throw a tantrum because give me answers. All I'm saying is, I wish they had done some police stuff, open an investigation, try to track down some leads, interview some of the folks who've been calling in tips for the last 7 years, maybe check for some DNA or something, I don't know, don't just say it was accidental, dust off your hands, and call it a day. Andrew Newman's charges were eventually dismissed and he was let off, but he continued to have run-ins with the law. As far as I know, he was never brought in with the focus of tying him to Josh's death. 
On June 13, 1977, at Camp Scott in Oklahoma, three Girl Scouts aged between 8 and 10 were murdered in cold blood. Lori Farmer, Michelle Goose, and Denise Milner were eager to get to the Girl Scout camp for two weeks of fun. One of the camp volunteers named Michelle Hoffman recalled the parking lot filled with excited girls on Sunday, June 12th. Hoffman vividly remembers Denise Milner arriving at the camp. Being one of the few African American girls on the trip, she was a little nervous. Hoffman went over to introduce herself to Denise and her mother before getting on the bus to go to the campsite. The camp was about 410 acres, with the vast majority of it being dense woods. Hoffman walked Denise to her tent, which was Kiowa number 8. Each of the tents were named after Native American tribes, and several girls were assigned to each one. Inside this tent, Denise met her campmates Lori and Michelle. All three girls bonded quite quickly, and before you knew it, they were laughing with each other. The first day was relatively mundane as the organizers just wanted the attendees to get used to their new tent mates and adjust to the new environment which they would be staying in for the next two weeks. Hoffman grew attached to cabin number 8 and went to say goodnight to the girls once it got dark, but they were already asleep. Now, on this particular night, there was a really bad thunderstorm. One of the campers wrote the following in her diary. It was the darkest dark I had ever known. I couldn't tell if my eyes were open or shut. The very next morning at 6 a.m., one of the counselors named Carla White got up to make the final preparations for the day's activities. After doing so, she decided to take a shower which was located down a trail. She briskly walked towards it, but saw something strange. At the base of a tree, just 100 yards from some tents were some sleeping bags. Carla got closer and realized that inside of these bags were the lifeless bodies of Lori, Michelle, and Denise. Lori and Michelle were completely tucked away inside of their sleeping bags while Denise was laying over the top of them. Carla frantically twisted around and ran for help. The director and nurse returned and confirmed that the girls were deceased. The two-week camp had been called off and police were there to investigate shortly after being contacted. Lori and Michelle had died by blunt force trauma while Denise was strangled. All three were also raped. Investigators determined that the actual attacks happened inside of the tent and the bodies were then moved to the tree. The situation was far too grave for the camp to continue, so the director ultimately sent all of the kids home. One of the girl's parents were in Dallas, so her grandmother had to come by to pick her up. Obviously, the girl didn't really understand what was going on and was disappointed that she couldn't stay at camp. She asked her grandmother what happened and she said, Oh honey, three girls were killed at your camp last night. When she returned home, she wrote in her diary, I came home from camp, three girls got killed. Once she grew up, she shared that she didn't even know what the word killed even meant at the time. Police spent the entire day sweeping the woods for any sign of the culprit, and as the weeks passed, they interviewed dozens of different people. It wasn't until June 23, 1977, when police publicly named a suspect. He was a 33-year-old convicted burglar and named Jean Leroy Hart. Jean escaped prison four years prior and had been on the run ever since. There was a cave that wasn't too far from the campgrounds where police found items left behind. It is believed that Jean used this location at some point before or after the murders. Ten months after Jean became the prime suspect, authorities were able to capture him. He was living in an old shack at an isolated home in the Cookson Hills. This was approximately 50 miles from the camp. Now, it's during the trial where things get very interesting, you could say. One of the very first things that Jean said in court was, I want you to know one thing, I didn't kill those Girl Scouts. And there was a surprisingly high amount of people who sided with him. The community even organized a hog fry dinner event where people could donate money to help pay for Jean's legal fees. There were also t-shirts made that said, Stop the Mays County Railroad, which was alluding to the possibility that Jean was used as a scapegoat by the police. Being that Jean was also of Native American descent, the Cherokee Tribal Council decided to donate $12,500 US dollars to help out as well. One particular aspect brought to the trial was the cave. There were a pair of glasses, some tape, and photographs that were believed to be owned by Gene as he worked in the photo lab when he was in prison. 
There were also various types of DNA found on the three girls. However, DNA testing wasn't introduced yet, so they were more or less useless. The offense attempted to use a footprint that was found to link Jean to the murders, but this print did not match Jean's shoe size. Then on March 20th, 1979, Jean was declared not guilty. But here's the thing. While Jean was not found guilty for these murders, he still had to serve 300 plus years in prison for his previous charges of rape and burglary. Just two years after Jean died, he suffered a heart attack while exercising in prison. The verdict is a hotly debated topic. After Jean was declared not guilty, police sort of just gave up on the case. They were 100% certain that Jean was the culprit and had put all of their resources into proving Jean was guilty and they failed. To them, they watched a killer get away. But there is one more detail that I haven't mentioned yet. If you recall, there was a volunteer named Hoffman. About two months before the murders, Hoffman was at the camp for a special event. When she stepped inside of her tent, it was an absolute mess. Someone had broken into it. Hoffman left behind a box of donuts which had been completely emptied, and on the floor, she noticed a few notes. There were about four pages, and on the first couple of them, the word kill was scribbled over and over. Then on the remaining pages, it said, we're on a mission to kill three girls. Hoffman reported this to the director, and apparently a group of girls came forward and admitted to writing the letters, but it seems like such an odd prank. And not to mention, it's a suspicious coincidence that a couple weeks later, three girls were indeed murdered. The DNA obtained at the campsite was later tested in 2008, but they were too degraded to be useful. But in 2022, with new advancements in DNA analysis, the sheriff's office urged the families to invest towards another test. The cost for such an analysis was over $30,000, which the family and sheriff's office did not have. Fortunately, the community came together and provided the money through a fundraiser. The test results said that there was a strong likelihood that Gene was involved. Typically, these kinds of tests are very accurate, and saying that there is a strong chance virtually means that it is a match. But since it isn't technically a 100% match, officials can't exactly go out and say, oh, it really was Gene. It does seem that the vast majority of investigators and the public are of the opinion that Gene was the true culprit. But let me know what you think in the comments. Private First Class Jerry Irwin worked as a missile technician at Fort Bliss in El Paso, Texas. It was February 28th, 1959 when he headed back to work after finishing a one-month leave in Idaho. Jerry was passing through southern Utah when a jarring flash of light zoomed across the sky. Jerry had to pull over and watch the light pass and disappear over a hill. What was thought to be an aircraft was traveling way too low and Jerry believed that it was going to crash. He quickly scribbled, have gone to investigate possible plane crash, please call law enforcement officers, onto a piece of paper which he left on his steering wheel. Before leaving, he also wrote stop on the side of his car with shoe polish in order to get people's attention to the note. After about 30 minutes, someone finally encountered Jerry's car and the note. And the person just so happened to be a fish and game inspector who promptly called Cedar City Sheriff's Office. Authorities searched the wilderness but failed to find any signs of a plane crash. But eventually, they did stumble upon an unconscious Jerry. He was unresponsive, so he was immediately sent to the nearest hospital. But the odd thing was that medical officials couldn't find anything wrong with Jerry, so why couldn't he wake up? He was left to rest and the very next morning, he woke up. Immediately, he started questioning the nurses if anyone survived the plane crash from last night. He was surprised to hear that there was no crash. Investigators and news outlets bombarded the man with questions, but Jerry claimed that he couldn't remember a single thing after leaving his car. He was eventually discharged and doctors said that there was absolutely nothing wrong with him and that he was completely healthy. While Jerry appeared fine on the surface, mentally he was fixated on returning to the location where he believed there was a plane accident. One day, he acted on these impulsive thoughts and returned to the road where he had left his car. Jerry said he noticed a note wrapped around a pencil within the jacket, but he never bothered to read it. Then, all of a sudden, Jerry realized that he had left base without informing anyone. He had more or less gone AWOL. He did eventually return to his superiors, and he told them everything that had happened. 
He was reassigned, but did not face any drastic disciplinary repercussions. But then, just a few weeks after this incident, Jerry completely disappeared, and to my knowledge, he was never seen again. As Jerry's story spread across the US, UFO enthusiasts began coming out of the woodworks and stating that what Jerry had experienced was an abduction, while skeptics believe that Jerry had simply lost his mind and ultimately succumbed to the wilderness. This entry takes place in New Zealand on June 30th, 1999. On the Great Barrier Island, a man named Colin Michael Good, aged 51, was found dead in his home. He was found decomposing in his bed along with his deceased dog. There were two rifles inside of the home, but they were not the cause of Good's death. Good was a known cannabis grower and led a reclusive life. He was last seen in April of the same year. Authorities recalled that Good had filed a complaint before his death about an assault on his property by mongrel mob members. The mongrel mob was a gang based in New Zealand. Good claimed that these gang members stole over 1200 USD worth of cannabis from him. Based on what I could find, it seemed that the police ignored this claim and did not bother investigating it. The strange part of this case is that it is unclear how Good died. Upon discovery, his right hand was missing, which was enough for authorities to declare his death as a homicide. The man who tipped police off to the possibility that Good may be dead died from an overdose in 2002. This man was interviewed before his death, but it didn't seem like he was involved. Detective Superintendent Andy Lovelock said, Our forces have worked extremely hard to get to the bottom of the matter, but unfortunately, due to a number of difficulties, we are unable to arrive at an outcome. Langville refers to an apparent ghost town that was not only unpopulated, but also disappeared overnight. The town was actually referenced in the 2016 remake of Ghostbusters, but being that this is such an obscure location, few people caught it. But nevertheless, it seemed that the film had sparked a renewed interest in the town. If you try and search for photos of Langville online, you won't find any. But according to local legends, Langville really did exist and for whatever reason, it just vanished as recently as the early 2000s. If you look for threads and discussions about the town online, it also seems that you are limited with what information is out there. This could very well be some sort of Mandela effect. Many locals are adamant that there was a town named Langville, but just as many if not more are skeptics who claim that Langville is only fictional. Snea Phillip was the name of a 31-year-old doctor working in Manhattan on September 10th, 2001. She has garnered internet attention for the peculiar conundrum around her death. You see, there is disagreement on whether Sneha is dead or still alive somewhere out in the world. She was initially part of the 9-11 victims list, but she was later retracted and her official date of death was changed. Additionally, the details of Sneha provided by friends and family compared to police are remarkably different. The last documented trace of Sneha was when she was talking with her mom over instant messenger in her Manhattan apartment on September 10th. It isn't exactly known where she went off to from there. People have claimed that she used the chaos of the 11th to escape her complicated life, while others believe she was simply another casualty. Sneha's husband Rond stated that she didn't return home after work on the 10th. Since it was normal for her to stay out overnight, he expected her to be back on the next morning. However, when the 11th rolled around and Ron heard the news of the World Trade Center, he began frantically calling Sneha's family to see if they knew of her whereabouts, but nobody had heard from her. While Sneha's friends and family believe that she died in the attack helping others get to safety, police have a different idea. Due to her increasingly complicated private life, police believed it may have been possible that she disappeared of her own free will that day. Sneha did not receive a contract renewal at the Cabrini Medical Center due to quote unquote alcohol related issues. She was also suspended from State Island St. Vincent's Medical Center, where she had recently obtained a new job at. Reason for the suspension was for substance abuse and not showing up to meetings. Furthermore, it was rumored that Snea and Ron were having issues with their marriage based on various court documents. If you recall, I mentioned that Snea often stayed out at night. 
Well, on several occasions, she also brought home women that she had met at lesbian bars. A police report from Sneha's brother mentioned that he walked in on her and his girlfriend having sex one month before her disappearance. Legally, Sneha was also in the thick of it. She had been arrested and had to spend one night in jail for filing a false complaint towards one of her co-workers. Sneha claimed that a woman had groped her when the two went out. And finally, before she disappeared, Sneha and Ron visited court so that she could plead not guilty to that false complaint. Afterwards, people reported seeing the couple having a massive argument. Ron denied having such a fight at court, and Sneha's family said that she did not have any romantic relationships with women. And the brother of Sneha, who I mentioned earlier, later came out and said that police made up the entire part where he saw his now wife sleeping with Sneha. Her friends added that Sneha did not have any issues with alcohol or substances, but they hinted at a low point in her life where she was very depressed. Ultimately, a surrogate court judge removed Sneha from the list of 9-11 victims in 2004. They said this particular lady was known to be missing the day before. They had no evidence to show that she was alive on September 11th. A different judge officially declared Sneha dead on September 10th, 2004. Sneha's family was both angry and confused as the only scenario that could have played out in their minds was that Sneha died trying to help others. But despite being removed from the list of victims, she was included on the memorial. Many people are of the opinion that Sneha did pass away at the World Trade Center since her passport and credit cards were left back in her apartment. She didn't leave with any items that would have indicated that she planned to disappear. Ron actually hired a private investigator to try and figure out just what happened to his wife. And here is the biggest revelation in this case. Around 2021 to 2022, the New York City Medical Examiner's Office was granted permission to use new DNA technology on various body parts from Ground Zero that may belong to unaccounted for victims, which is well over 1,000 people. Now, it should be mentioned that these body parts are mainly just tiny bone fragments. Medical officials have tens of thousands of these fragments, and possibly one of them could prove that Sneha did indeed lose her life that day. On June 11th, 2005, a man named Todd Guy, but who seemed to have everything going for him in life, mysteriously disappeared from a party only to be found dead in a lake weeks later. Todd was 22 years old at the time and worked for Hager Distribution Inc. in Wyoming. It was around 7.30 p.m. on Saturday, June 11th, when Todd left the apartment that he shared with his cousin. He went to visit the Half Moon Bar and Grill to hang out with some of his friends. The group stayed at the bar for about two hours before leaving for an all-night keg party, which was about two miles north of White Road in Casanova, Michigan. The party began to turn sour a little past midnight as various attendees began fighting each other. The thought of a potential all-out brawl made Todd decide to leave the party. He traveled on foot along alone and called one of his friends to let them know that he was on his way back home, which was about an hour or so away. People at the party who noticed Todd leave stated that he appeared totally fine and not impaired at all. But his sporadic phone calls that were made between 12.47 and 12.57 a.m. would suggest otherwise. In those phone calls, Todd said things such as, I've had enough, I'm in a field, I couldn't breathe. One of Todd's friends was worried when she received one of these cryptic calls, so she immediately called him back. The phone was answered, but all she could hear was what sounded like heavy breathing or loud gusts of wind. Those calls were the last trace of Todd as he never returned home that night. A search consisting of over 1,500 police officers and volunteers followed, but no matter where they searched, they couldn't find a single sign of where Todd may have gone. Fast forward three weeks to July 2nd, a couple was out by Ovid Hall Lake and noticed something bobbing around in the water. They were curious and wanted to find out just what it was. As they got closer, they realized that it was a body. Police were promptly notified and they later confirmed that this was Todd Geib. This was a truly baffling discovery. Several different people from the party stated with the utmost certainty that they saw Todd leave in the direction of his home when he left the party. Yet, he was found about two miles in the opposite direction. But this gets weirder. When Todd was found, he was floating upright in the water. Medical officials discovered two types of antidepressants in his body, those being amitriptyline and disipramine both of which Todd was not known to be taking. He was determined to have drowned to death, but his family is of the opinion that Todd was murdered. 
Four years later, there were new discoveries made in regards to Todd's death. Medical officials found that he died about two to five days before being found, despite being missing for several weeks. But the most vital piece of information was that Todd had no water in his lungs, ruling out the possibility that he drowned. However, Michigan State Police refused to reopen his case. A different group of investigators who worked for the NYPD in the past came up with the possibility that Todd was abducted, held captive, and murdered before being left in the lake. One of the more interesting parts of this case was that Todd consumed two different antidepressants which he was not prescribed. Additionally, the vast majority of doctors would not prescribe this particular combination of medicine since these two paired together could induce more frequent hallucinations and possibly even seizures, along with a plethora of other side effects. It was looking more and more like somebody had drugged Todd. When Todd was found, there was little to no buildup of biofilm or slime around his body. One of the detectives that was part of this new investigation team said, There should be insects in the clothing, even in the mouth, in and on the ears, in the folds of the skin. That's where flies will typically lay their eggs. They've evolved to be attracted to dead things within minutes to hours to a day. If a body was there, it would be colonized with some type of aquatic insect. The detectives recreated the environment in which Todd was found and used five different swine carcasses. In all five scenarios, there were aquatic insects within the first day, and within no more than three days, there were even insect eggs. By the time three weeks had passed, there was a thick layer of biofilm around the carcasses. The Utsurobune incident takes us back to the early 1800s, specifically 1803. A round, saucer-like object washed ashore on the coast of Japan. Locals began to gather around the vessel, and they claimed that a beautiful woman dressed in odd clothing stepped out with a box in hand. Nobody could understand what the woman was saying. The story took place in what is now Ibaraki Prefecture and even caught the attention of one professor named Tanaka Kazuo, who was experienced in the field of applied optics research. What sets this story apart is not only the date in which it was documented, but the amount of historical evidence that accompanies it. There is a trove of nearly a dozen documents, each providing valuable information on the Utsurobune incident. Professor Kazuo traced the Utsurobune all the way back to a shipwrecked Russian whaler which may have been the source of this legend. However, that isn't known for sure. The professor also found a trail of documents linking the ship to the Shofukuji Temple's legend of Princess Konjiki. However, as more details within the documents were uncovered, the legend becomes even more confusing. Some of the documents varied in their descriptions of the ship as well as the woman inside. Some claimed that it was 3.3 meters high and was made of rosewood and iron, complete with glass and crystal windows. And within the vessel was the discovery of inscriptions that were far too abstract for any researchers to decipher. Professor Kazuo remained skeptical about the documentation of the supposed alien aircraft, but nonetheless finds it immensely interesting. Whether it only serves as a decorative piece of history or possibly real documentation of extraterrestrials, the allure remains. One of the more interesting aspects of this particular case is that it predates American UFO sightings by well over 100 years. In a tragic incident on August 16, 1980, the life of 21-year-old Mary Carter came to a horrifying end. By her side were her two children. Waiting for a bus at the intersection of Madison Road and Erie Road in Cincinnati, Mary and her children were saddened to hear that the bus they were waiting for did not have their desired destination. Not long after, a seemingly kind-hearted man offered the trio a ride in his pickup truck. Accepting this ride would later turn out to be a grave mistake. At around 1.45pm, the distress of Mary's children caught the attention of a woman in Cincinnati's East End. The children exclaimed that they were unable to wake their mother. The woman then followed the kids to the lifeless body of Mary in a ditch. This particular area was known for its escorts. The woman immediately rushed the kids to a nearby fire station, where the firefighters then alerted police. Mary's autopsy revealed that she was strangled to death, but surprisingly, no signs of sexual assault were found. 
It's speculated that the murder took place in front of her two small children, sparking outrage among detectives who feared that the kids were now forever scarred psychologically. Desperate for leads, law enforcement turned to the public for assistance. Eyewitness accounts describe the truck the trio was seen in as a midnight blue 1976 or 1977 Ford pickup. It also had a 2-3 to three inch white stripe on each side, a black steering wheel, and a light blue interior. The suspect was a white male aged 25 to 35 with blonde or white hair and a dark mustache. He was wearing a white short sleeve shirt, white pants, and brown shoes. Despite releasing a composite sketch and photo of a similar truck, the investigation hit a dead end. Over 100 cases involving blue pickup trucks were investigated, with the hopes that Mary's killer would be exposed. But he was never found. One detail that raised suspicion was that Mary was in the middle of a divorce. Her ex-husband was questioned, but due to a rock-solid alibi, he was dismissed of all suspicions. Investigators later learned that the night before her murder, Mary sold a washer and dryer from her old house. This was a potential lead that could pinpoint the killer. However, efforts to identify the buyer yielded no results. Over the years, an age progression sketch was released, but Mary's assailant continues to evade arrest. In the town of Emelson, Poland in the year 1978, there was an event that would forever etch the name of an unassuming farmer named Jan Wolski into local history. On May 10th, 1978, Wolski was working through his daily farming duties. He was in the middle of manning a horse-drawn cart when he found himself in front of two quote-unquote short green-faced humanoid beings. These two so-called aliens then jumped into Wolski's cart and communicated in an unknown language. Wolski, initially mistaking them for foreigners, steered the cart towards a clearing where a jaw-dropping sight awaited him. An enormous pearly white UFO hovering about 16 feet above the ground. This is when Wolski started suspecting that these two were aliens. Wolski described the craft as a featureless vessel as long as a school bus. It just hovered in the sky, devoid of conventional lights or windows. The craft featured peculiar black drill-like protrusions which emitted a noticeable hum. Wolski claimed that he was actually taken aboard the UFO. Inside, he underwent an examination involving instruments that he had never seen before. Returning home with his unbelievable tale, Wolski eagerly shared the experience with his family. Obviously, his family was a bit skeptical and wanted to visit the location and see the so-called UFO for themselves. Their investigation revealed dew-covered grass which didn't exactly convince Wolski's family, but nevertheless they were slowly believing him. Wolski's son claimed that they discovered extraterrestrial footprints later on. Just like with most UFO reports, if we look at them critically, it's tough to believe that they're anything more than just far-fetched tales. The absence of concrete evidence coupled with the fantastical nature of the encounter invites skepticism but the Emelson abduction remains an intriguing mystery. There is even a memorial built in honor of Wolski's UFO sighting in Emelson. In Polish, there is text saying, On May 10th, 1978, in Emelson, a UFO object landed. The truth will astonish us in the future. In the 1998 World Cup Final, Brazil's collapse stunned the world and left such an indelible mark that the government had to step in and launch a formal investigation into the match. A mere five days before the game in St. Denis, the reigning world champions overcame the Netherlands in a penalty shootout, marking their most formidable challenge in an otherwise dominant tournament. Ronaldo, a two-time FIFA World Player of the Year, played a key role in securing their spot in the World Cup. The stage was set for what should have been one of the most captivating matches in football history as Brazil faced host nation France for the title. The South American juggernaut appeared unstoppable in his quest for a record-extending fifth trophy. However, their dreams unraveled just hours before the highly anticipated match. On the day of the World Cup final, the Brazilian squad had lunch in Lazini just outside of Paris. Upon returning to the team hotel, Ronaldo, sharing a room with Roberto Carlos, broke down in tears. Carlos later revealed that Ronaldo was overwhelmed by the pressure and couldn't stop crying. Around 4 o'clock that afternoon, Ronaldo began convulsing uncontrollably, foaming at the mouth. His doctors and teammates shortly came to his aid. They all assisted Ronaldo into falling asleep. 
One of the team doctors disclosed that Ronaldo had been taking a certain painkiller due to an aggravating knee injury on June 16th. Upon waking up, Ronaldo had tea and his teammate Leonardo informed him of his past convulsions. It was during this time at the clinic that manager Mario Zagallo removed Ronaldo's name from the starting lineup, replacing him with Edmundo. The situation then took a complicated turn when CBF president Ricardo Texiera entered the dressing room an hour before kickoff. What exactly was said in that dressing room is unknown, but Ronaldo arrived 20 minutes later and Zagallo reinstated him in the lineup, removing Edmundo. Zagallo later elaborated on his decision, stating that if he had benched Ronaldo and Brazil lost, he would be criticized for his stubbornness. The official explanation from CBF and players suggested Ronaldo, feeling immense pressure, fell ill but declared himself fit just 40 minutes before kickoff. Obviously, being such a high-profile event, there were many conspiracy theories, the first of which suggests that Ronaldo had a peculiar condition that he was trying to hide. This July 12th seizure appears to be an isolated event in his career, considering he has been playing at a high level for a very long time. It raises eyebrows to suggest that he had suddenly succumbed to pressure. One report from an ESPN employee recounted when the hotel director heard shouting from the doctors saying, he's dead, he's dead. So it's likely that some sort of medical emergency did in fact happen that day. Some seem to think that Ronaldo covered up a pre-existing condition, which worsened when doctors prescribed him certain medications. Another theory suggests that Brazil was actually bribed. Some sources believe that they were offered 15 million euros as well as the right to host a future World Cup if they threw the match against France. Ronaldo was the sole person who did not agree with the terms and thus sat out. However, he changed his mind after Nike informed him that his sponsorship was on the line if he did not play. One of the more prominent theories is that Nike added unjust pressure onto Ronaldo in the finals match. However, Nike later came out and said, with regards to rumors circulating about presumed pressures Nike put on the Brazilian national soccer team so that Ronaldo would play, Nike wants to emphasize that the report of such involvement is absolutely false. Peter Scott Ivers was born on September 20th, 1946, and from a young age, he was captivated with music. While mainstream fame eluded him, he has a sort of small, loyal community who loves his music. He was born in the state of Illinois, and his early days were shaped by his mother, Merle Rose, who was a devoted homemaker, and his father, Jordan, who was a physician that was battling lung cancer during Peter's infancy. Faced with the grim reality of Jordan's illness, the family made the decision to move to Arizona, hoping that a change of scenery may help with his recovery. Unfortunately, fate had a different plan, and Jordan succumbed to his illness in 1949. After Jordan's death, Merle Rose found a new partner in life with Paul Eisenstein, who was a businessman from Boston. Instead of taking Paul's last name, Merle opted for a fresh start and randomly selected Ivers from the phone book as her and Peter's new surname. But down the line, Paul also chose to adopt this new family name. Merle loved music and exposed Peter to it at a very young age, which had played a noticeable influence in shaping him. In 1969, Peter took the bold step into becoming a solo artist. His journey began with the debut of Night of the Blue Communion, which was an album with lyrics penned by Tim Mayer. Peter's musical discography grew as the years went by, with tracks that briefly entered the top 100 singles Billboard charts. Then in 1981, he got a taste of commercial success, after writing a song with John Lewis Parker that became widely popular amongst R&B listeners at the time. However, on March 3rd, 1983, Peter was found bludgeoned to death in his Los Angeles apartment. In the aftermath of Peter Ivers' untimely death, LAPD officers dispatched to his residence failed to secure the scene effectively. This lapse allowed a stream of Ivers' friends and acquaintances to walk around in Peter's apartment, leading to the contamination of crucial evidence. The oversight even extended to allowing one individual to depart with blood-stained blankets from Peter's bed. This person's name was David Jove. 
During the investigation, suspicions converged on David, as he had what could be described as a complex relationship with Peter. However, several of Peter's friends had doubts that David was involved. One detective made the following remark after examining the clues. I couldn't say with certainty that he had done anything, but of all the people we knew, he was the one person we couldn't rule out. Additionally, conflicting perspectives emerged within the Los Angeles punk and new wave community arguing for David's innocence. Complicating the case, at the time of his death, Peter had a long-standing romantic involvement with film executive Lucy Fisher. Approximately five weeks after the tragic event, Fisher took matters into her own hands and financed a private investigator, but despite the investigator's efforts, his search yielded minimal results. This was due to a number of reasons, such as the botched initial handling of the crime scene, a scarcity of evidence, and a lack of witnesses. The investigator was not convinced that this was a simple break-in. He said, I do not believe it was just someone off the street that Peter brought in because he was a nice guy. There's no way he brought in this unknown person and fell asleep trusting them. I'm not buying it. Room 1046 takes us to the Hotel President located in Kansas City, Missouri, where one of the guests was mysteriously found dead in his room. It was January 2nd, 1935, when a man named Roland T. Owen stepped inside of the Hotel President after 1pm. He specifically requested that he receive a room that was facing the hotel's inner courtyard. Other guests and employees described him as a man in his 20s or early 30s, and he looked sort of like a brawler. He had what appeared to be a cauliflower ear and a scar on the side of his head. Before heading towards his room, Roland complained to one of the guests about a different hotel he stayed at the previous night. He mentioned that they charged him $5, which was not worth his experience. Roland oddly carried no luggage, but it did appear that he was intending to partake in some sort of important meeting as he was neatly dressed with a black overcoat. Employees of the hotel immediately thought that Roland was a bit strange. Whenever a maid visited his room, it was extremely dark with only the desk lamp to provide light. One of the maids named Mary claimed that when she went inside room 1046, there was a man sitting in the dark which made her feel uncomfortable. She offered to leave and return later in the day, but the man told her to proceed with the cleaning. Mary took note that the man appeared to be rather agitated. He seemed extremely stressed over something and was careful to always stay in the dark. When Mary asked if she could turn on the main lights, the man yelled no. A different maid was in the middle of cleaning room 1046 when Roland commanded her to not lock the door as a friend was going to stop by in just a couple of minutes. That same maid returned later in the day to inspect the room once more. She noticed Roland lying on his bed fully clothed. She thought that he was sleeping so she didn't want to wake him, but she saw a note on the desk that said, Don, I will be back in 15 minutes. Wait. The next morning, she walked by Roland's room and overheard Roland having what seemed to be a phone conversation. He said, No, Don, I don't want to eat. I am not hungry. When the maid went to offer new towels later in the day, she noted that there were two men inside that room. After knocking and offering towels, one of the men bluntly told her that they didn't want them. This voice was not Roland's. The woman staying in room 1048 right next to Roland's room later informed police that she heard what sounded like several men and women arguing with each other. They were loud and were constantly cursing. She grew extremely frustrated over the commotion and was about to call the front desk, but in the end, she decided not to. Now, it may have been possible that what the woman heard was not actually coming from room 1046. There was a large party being held in room 1055 that same night, which may have been the true source of the noise. The elevator operator also reported some rather odd activities that same night. He remembered taking a woman that frequented the hotel with different men to a bunch of different floors in an attempt to locate a certain client that she described as very prompt. The operator spent over an hour taking the woman to different floors and rooms, but they never located her client. Fast forward to 11pm on January 3rd, a man named Robert Lane noticed someone in the street in front of Hotel President trying to flag down help. The description given by Robert matched up with Roland. Robert also stated that the man was seriously hurt. There was this large gash on his arm, and he suspected that Roland may have also been internally bleeding. The man asked Robert to help him get a cab before saying, I'll kill that guy tomorrow. 
The next day, the hotel phone operator noticed that the phone to room 1046 was not hooked, so she asked a bellhop to stop by the room and check on it. However, when the bellhop reached the room, there was a do not disturb sign outside and the door was locked. Regardless, the bellhop knocked several times on the door, but no one came out. Then suddenly, someone in the room said, come in and turn on the lights. But again, the door was locked, so the guy couldn't get inside. The bellhop eventually gave up and just yelled, hook up the phone, before returning to the lobby. But after an hour went by, the phone was still not hooked up. Another bellhop named Harold Pike was sent to the room to check on the guest again. Harold also received no answer after knocking repeatedly, so he ended up using his pass key to get through the door. When he stepped inside, his eyes immediately moved towards the nude man lying on the bed. Harold just rushed towards the phone and placed it on his hook before leaving and locking the door. Then, just a few hours later, the phone in room 1046 was yet again off its hook. The first bellhop, Randolph, was sent to fix the issue. Again, there was no response from knocking, so he used his passkey to get inside, and this time, he found Roland on his hands and knees just a couple of feet from the door. He went to flick on the lights, and that's when he noticed a massive amount of blood. Roland himself was also in terrible shape. Randolph rushed back to the lobby and called police. When officials arrived, Roland was clinging to life. It was clear that he had been tortured for a prolonged period of time. Investigators estimated that the bloodstains had been there for hours at the very least, meaning that Roland was being tortured well before Randolph's first visit to the room. Shortly after entering the hospital, Roland slipped into a coma. On the way there, he was also falling in and out of consciousness, and when questioned as to what had happened to him, Roland simply said, I fell against the tub. That same night, Roland died in the hospital. It was only after his death when the hotel employees learned that Roland T. Owen was not this man's real name. Police rushed to put out a sketch with the heading, Do You Recognize This Man? Police were able to find the hotel that Roland mentioned he stayed at previously that he complained about, but it turned out that the staff never encountered anyone under the name Roland Owen, but they did recognize the person in the sketch. They stated that this man checked in as Eugene K. Scott. He also shared that he was from Los Angeles. However, there was no information on any men named Roland Owen or Eugene Scott in LA. Within his room, police discovered that all of Roland's items and clothing had also been taken. Again, he didn't bring any luggage, he only had a brush, comb, and toothpaste. But nevertheless, they were all missing. Investigators did find a few items though, such as a hairpin, safety pin, unused cigarette, a bottle of diluted sulfuric acid, and a tie label. There were also fingerprints on the phone, which were initially thought to belong to a woman, but this was later ruled out. They also did not belong to the bellhop that touched the phone. The exact owner of the prints was never identified, and no matter how deep the investigation got, police just couldn't figure out who Roland really was. Then, all of a sudden, another strange occurrence took place. Preparations were being made for Roland's burial when an unknown man called police telling them to postpone the ceremony as he wanted to pay for a proper funeral. And shockingly, the funeral home responsible for Roland's burial did receive an unmarked envelope with cash inside. It was more than enough to cover all of the expenses. Additionally, 13 roses were sent to Roland's grave with a note that said, Love Forever, Luis. Then, one year later, a random woman encountered Roland's sketch in a magazine and claimed that he was her son. According to her, this guy's name was Artemis Ogletree. The woman said that Artemis left home at the age of 17 in 1934 in order to hitchhike to California, but the man appeared to be much older. Artemis's mother also stated that she received several letters from her son and a phone call from someone claiming to be his friend. All of the letters were from Roland, and the phone call claimed that Roland was in Egypt. The letters were also sent after his death, and down the line, the identity of Roland was confirmed to be Artemis. But even after this revelation, we still have no clue why he was killed or who did it. Rabies is such an interesting yet terrifying disease. 
the single-stranded RNA virus can be carried within a warm-blooded mammal and gradually creeps along the subject's nerves before reaching the brain, causing physical and behavioral irregularities. And next thing you know, you're dead. After symptoms begin to show, it has a fatality rate of over 99%. I think I want to talk about this medical mystery in a dedicated video later on, so for now, we'll just take a look at some of the outliers where people have actually survived this disease. If treated shortly after exposure, and before any symptoms begin to arise, the host can definitely be saved. One case of a survivor takes us to 1970 Ohio, where six-year-old Matthew Winkler woke up to the sensation of a bat biting his thumb on October 10th. And before we continue, I think it's important to state that the rabies vaccine is sort of strange in that it is administered after contracting the virus. Matthew was transported to the hospital where doctors began giving him this vaccination. About three weeks later, Matthew began to have pain in his neck. Then a heavy fever and dizziness followed. Then on November 4th, he slipped into a coma after he displayed a significant loss in strength and cardiac irregularities. But by the end of the month, he was out of the coma and he was actually able to walk again. However, Matthew did need to attend a variety of therapy sessions in order to retain his previous speech and intellect. There seems to only be about 20 to 30 documented cases of people overcoming the disease after displaying symptoms of the infection. About 30% of those people were able to make full recoveries. In 2004, there was a controversial treatment known as the Milwaukee Protocol, which involves chemically inducing the host into a coma before pumping them full of antiviral drugs as well as other substances. By 2012, 35 patients were treated with the Milwaukee Protocol, but only two of them made full recoveries. While some thought that the Milwaukee Protocol could be some sort of a godsend, it is far from it. Nevertheless, it still shows some promise in a disease that was previously known to be essentially 100% fatal. There is a lot of debate on whether the protocol should be improved upon or ditched entirely. Rabies itself is such a mysterious disease. If you examine the wound in which the virus enters the human body, you can see virions during a 10 day period. But once that window closes, they disappear and the incubation process begins. And this is where things just become really weird because this process can take anywhere from a couple of days to years to finish, and nobody knows why that is. Those virions make their way to the spinal cord and then eventually to the brain. The virus is somehow able to remain in a sort of stealth mode, you can call it, until it is prepared to unleash its attack on the brain, and by then it is already way too late. Your immune system's defenses become quickly overwhelmed. For now, there is no surefire cure to rabies after symptoms begin to arise. In front of several witnesses, double amputee and single father Doug Cleaves was shot dead by a masked shooter in 1985. Doug had recently gone through a divorce with his wife Charlotte. The ordeal became all the more toxic when the topic of who would keep their son was brought up. Very cruel words were exchanged, which included accusations that Doug was an abuser of cocaine. But despite these accusations, the court ultimately granted Doug with the custody of his son Robert. Doug was a construction worker, and shortly after closing the book on the custody proceedings, he found himself in an electrical accident at work. This accident forced Doug into a position where he needed to have his legs amputated. His wife Charlotte saw this as an opportunity to obtain custody of Robert, so she petitioned for a change in custody. In the end, the court denied Charlotte's motion. Since Doug had to remain in the hospital, caregivers were looking after his son. In September of 1985, Doug was allowed to leave the hospital. His sister Susan had recently quit her job in order to help Doug transition back into everyday life as well as help care for Robert. So after leaving, Doug and his son moved into an apartment with Susan in Anchorage. Doug was a very ambitious man and wanted to get as close to his normal life as he could and he didn't particularly enjoy the rehabilitation process. While he was frustrated, he was not going to let this life-altering injury define who he was. One of the nurses who assisted Doug said he was difficult to work with because he wanted to move forward so quickly, and he was angry, which is just a normal part of that sort of horrific life-changing injury. His life changed in split seconds so dramatically. Of course he was angry. 
He was grieving the loss of his limbs, the loss of a lifestyle. Nurses get that, we totally expect that and respect the process. But just as he was beginning to get into the swing of things, life had other plans. It was October 19th, 1985 when Doug was hanging out with his sister, girlfriend, and neighbor. Doug's son, Robert, had just been sent off to spend the weekend with his mother. The group had crab legs for dinner and watched some TV. They were having a great time until around midnight. That's when somebody approached Doug door and began knocking on it aggressively. Susan went to see who it was and after cracking the door open, she saw a masked man standing on the other side. In that split second of seeing the man with a hunting rifle in hand, she tried to slam the door shut, but the man had stuck his firearm through the crack and was now leveraging the door open. The man easily overpowered Susan and in seconds was rushing into Doug's home. And this is where things get interesting. The man straight lined it all the way to Doug as soon as they made eye contact. Doug was lying on the floor without his prosthetics. He immediately started begging for his life saying, hey, don't shoot. I understand what's going on. Don't shoot. We can work this out. But the man did not care. He shot Doug five times before fleeing the area. Police arrived on the scene at about 12.20 a.m. Susan told them that the man was wearing a ski mask, a tan-colored trench coat, and combat gloves. He was on the thinner side and between 5 foot 6 inches and 5 foot 8 inches tall. But because of the physical description of the shooter, investigators thought that there was a slim chance that they were actually female. In the month of October alone, there were over six shootings in the area, which took Doug's death out of the limelight, and thus this case quickly faded from the public's view. So it seemed as though Doug knew who the shooter was, or at the very least, why he was being attacked. One of the more prominent theories suggests that the incident was a result of a substance deal gone wrong. If you recall, Charlotte did accuse Doug of using cocaine. She also shared that Doug sold marijuana, although it doesn't seem like there is much evidence, if any, to support this. Doug was known to occasionally smoke marijuana, but he was never known to be a user of hard substances. Another commonly mentioned theory relates to money. That accident that Doug lost his legs in was on the premises of a construction site. So because his employer was liable, he was going to be receiving a very large payout. Doug had already begun talking to his sister about his plans with the money. He wanted to put it towards an air taxi business in Alaska. Doug planned to hand this business down to Robert when the time came. And if it wasn't clear by now, Charlotte really despised Doug. And some have proposed that Charlotte is responsible for hiring a hitman in order to obtain custody of Robert as well as the money that he was about to inherit from Doug post-death. Some people do think that accusing Charlotte is a sort of grasp of straws, which could be true, but it's always important to investigate those that could have something to gain when it comes to a murder case. Robert was ultimately placed under the care of his mother and she was not suspected of having any involvement in Doug's death. Then in 1989, an Anchorage homicide investigator informed the public that they had a very solid case built against a suspect that they believed was Doug's killer but they wanted the absolute best evidence to make sure that the case was foolproof so they did not want to press charges just yet. And to this day, they still have not charged anyone. There were rumors going around sometime in the 1990s about fake social workers abducting children. It is unclear how this story came to be, but it seems that similar events have occurred all around the world. One such event occurred in late February of 2018. In Queenbee in Australia, a mother of two reported a random encounter with a man and a woman. After contacting the police, they made the following statement to the public. The man and woman claimed to be FACS caseworkers and produced what appeared to be an identity card. They stated they were there to check on the welfare of the children. The mother stated the children were asleep and told the pair she could call them to return when they woke. However, the pair stated that they would wait. A short time later, the mother presented the children to the pair in the lounge room. After checking the children and their bedroom, the pair left the home. The woman became suspicious of the visit and contacted Queenbean FACS, who confirmed they had no record of the visit from any of their caseworkers and the matter was reported to police. The man was white, somewhere in his 30s, slim, 6 feet tall, dark hair, and had a large nose. As for the woman, she was also white, in her 20s. 20s, 5 feet tall, medium build with curly hair. Both of them were wearing formal clothing. Ever since this encounter, there has not been another like it in that specific area. 
We can take a look at an incident from 1990 where a woman named Elizabeth Coupland was in a similar situation. Many like to point to this as the beginning of these fake social worker reports. Two individuals approached Coupland's residence in Sheffield, England. Filled with concern for her children's safety, Elizabeth let the two visitors into her home. They proceeded to inspect her kids, one of which was two years old and the other an infant of less than six months. Following their examination, the two visitors departed, leaving Elizabeth with lingering concern. But then just a few days later, one of the women reappeared, accompanied by a male partner. And they had some distressing news. They said that the children had to be removed from Elizabeth's home and placed into foster care. And immediately, this sent waves of fear, confusion, and anger through Elizabeth. She was skeptical to say the least. She threatened to involve the police, which caused the pair to flee the area. Curiously, the NSPCC denied any knowledge of these visits, asserting that none of their representatives had visited Elizabeth on that specified day. This infuriated Elizabeth even more. A group of people had just attempted to walk off with their kids by impersonating people of authority. Police treated the incident with gravity, conducting a thorough investigation that failed to uncover any evidence of misconduct by government officials. Nevertheless, this incident marked the onset of a series of similar encounters during that time. In that same year, Operation Childcare was launched in South Yorkshire. The claims from Elizabeth and others sparked the need for investigations into those who were pretending to be social workers. It aimed to tackle reports of child abductions and abuse supposedly done by social workers or folks pretending to be them. Detective Superintendent David Foss was the man leading the show. He had 23 different police departments and agencies all teaming up for this massive project. Foss later said the trickiest part was people falling for the media drama, swallowing allegations without any real proof. He also mentioned later on that sure, some complaints might be legit, but most of them were just blown way out of proportion. This was a statement made by one of the officers investigating the issues. There have been no arrests. The bottom line is there is more than one team involved. There were a few reports that we felt were worth investigating, but a lot of the reports were malicious by attention-seeking people. Even with all the complaints from Elizabeth and other anxious parents, the police didn't really have the information to investigate particular people of interest. Ray Wire, the sexual crimes consultant with Operation Child Care, had his two cents about how these allegations played out. Pulling something like this is a seriously risky move. Plus, no babies actually got snatched, though some kids got checked out. What the heck was happening? There are way easier ways to get a hold of a baby. After poking around claims all over South Yorkshire and beyond for years, they wrapped up Operation Child Care in 1994. The cops rounded up over 250 reports of fake or bogus social workers, but they figured only 18 were worth a second look, and only two of them were actually Legit. But even with Operation Child Care throwing in the towel without any arrests, worried parents in the UK weren't letting up on the claims. Anne Wiley, another young mother, had a story similar to Elizabeth's. This time, it went down over 200 miles away in the Scottish town of Hamilton. Back in October 1994, a stranger showed up at Anne's door wanting to examine her toddler. Anne later told police, It struck me as odd right from the get-go because no one usually comes to my back door. This lady claimed she was my new health visitor and came to review his medical records. He had asthma. I asked her, you got any ID? And she said, oh, I must have left it in the car, which my regular health visitor never does. I peeked at the car and there was a guy in there smoking, which was weird because you wouldn't expect health visitors to do that. So I asked her my son's name and she hesitated. But then she whipped out this file, and I don't know if it was my son's, but she seemed to know all his medical history, how long he'd been in the hospital and such. She chatted with my son, but it was pouring rain. So I said we'd all better head inside. I took my son in and she was gone. Anne described this woman as being in her 20s, around 5 foot 4, with a slim build, light brown hair, and a small mark under her right eye. Another encounter involved 35-year-old mother Lenny Stewart from Edinburgh in April 1995. According to Stewart, a woman tried to snatch her 4-month-old baby. 
The intruder was a fake health visitor there to check on her baby. Lenny said the smartly dressed lady grabbed hold of her infant daughter and tried to make a run for it. Stewart had to put up a fight, claiming she threw a punch to get her baby back. The whole incident got reported to the cops and was initially tied to other attempted abductions in the area. However, the police later backed off this claim, saying there were sightings of a sketchy woman around but no actual kidnapping attempts. Neighbors stayed on high alert in the days and weeks that followed, but stayed skeptical about Stewart's story. Just a few days later, a spokesperson from Lothian and Borders Police said the following, We're not on the lookout for anyone related to the incident. Case closed. There were some people who accused Stewart of making up this story as a way to grab attention, but Stewart obviously wasn't having it. She had to put up a public fight against these rumors. She said, As far as I'm concerned, I'm sticking by my story. No hoax. It all went down just like I said. I'm not going to be hit with wasting police time. I've heard whispers about it. The investigation's done. And if you want more info, go ask the police. There was a moment when the cops seemed to be toying with the idea of slapping charges on Stewart for filing a false police report, but that eventually just fizzled out. Same goes for any of her own stories about a weirdo trying to snatch her kid. Many people think that the whole thing never actually happened, but that didn't stop it from being another headline-grabbing incident in the UK. There are dozens of additional incidents that are similar to the ones we just went over, but none have resulted in an arrest that has tied to any sort of underground organization or anything like that. On the morning of Monday, November 16th, 1987, two men were out hunting and wandering through the woods down south from Eureka, South Carolina. For those acquainted with this specific region of South Carolina, you'll know that there is a stream of water known as Shaw Creek. While navigating through the wilderness near the creek, the hunters made a shocking discovery. In contrast to the soil, there were white skeletal remains positioned face down with their legs crossed and arms outstretched. This individual was left undisturbed for years. There were no signs of any clothing or personal items. A police officer showed up about 30 minutes later and noticed that the remains seemed to be deliberately arranged. Upon investigation, it was found out that the remains had been there for quite some time, as roots had grown over the bones of the fingers. This was also supported by the absence of any insects around the body. It suggested that decomposition had finished quite a while ago. But exactly how long, officials weren't entirely sure. Their guess was anywhere from one to five years. The police quickly extracted the remains for further examination that morning, but realized some of the bones were missing. The South Carolina Law Enforcement Division, also known as SLED, assisted in searching the area and continued to help in the following weeks and months to identify the remains. Investigators brought along a heavy-duty metal detector to the creek hoping to find some clues, and they were able to unearth a single item, a brass shell casing, likely from a shotgun. The casing was actually buried further underneath the body, and interestingly, it was missing several characteristics that are seen in newer shotgun shells. And as time went on, officials uncovered more details. The victim had distinctively high cheekbones, suggesting a possible African background with potential influences from European, Indian, or Caribbean roots. She was on the taller side, ranging from 5 foot 8 to 5 foot 10 inches tall. She also weighed about 150 to 160 pounds. The victim also had a healed up broken nose, some patchwork on the right knee, and they even pulled out her first molar on the lower right when she was a kid. By the time she passed away, she was missing at least four other teeth and had a noticeable overbite. A big deal for investigators was finding cocaine in her hair. Initially, authorities thought that this was going to be a big breakthrough for identifying her, but as time went on, it mostly pointed towards missing escorts and people dealing with substance problems in both South Carolina and Northern Georgia. At first, the police thought she might be a migrant farmer who vanished from a nearby farm. In the area, there was this farm owner who had gotten fines for breaking rules about migrant workers before. Even though he didn't have any known workers around that time, the police kept an eye on him. Not as a suspect, but as a possible lead to figure out who this woman was. Maybe she worked there years ago and suddenly disappeared. 
In July 1989, a facial reconstruction was created, but to this day, she is still unidentified. However, investigators soon learned that they were slowly zooming out on a much larger picture as they would go on to find three more victims over the next six years. All of these cases were tied to each other due to their striking similarities. It is very likely that they all met their ends from the same culprit. On November 10th, 1986, a woman named Jacqueline Council, often referred to as Jackie, dropped off her youngest child at school. This was the last time she was ever seen alive. That same day, her family reported her missing, but it took a very long time for any real progress to be made. About one year later, the remains of a young black woman were found near Shaw Creek. However, authorities did not know at the time that this was actually Jackie. Then in January of 1993, a third body was found. And this is where we take an even darker turn. Unlike the previous two victims, this one was intentionally set on fire. Pretty much everything that could have possibly helped in IDing the victim was destroyed. Iken County Coroner Sue Townsend provided an estimate placing the presence of the body within the wooded area between two and five years. The fire was also determined to be a post-mortem burning, while the cause of death was a wound to the back of the neck. Authorities do believe that this was most likely a stab wound, however, there is a remote possibility of it being a gunshot. This third victim was also never identified. The fourth victim is a woman named Aristine Durden, who was born on February 6, 1960. Initially, police didn't think that she was actually tied to the Shaw Creek killer, but later on, this opinion changed. Ristine was last seen on March 13, 1989. Due to some geographical circumstances, some investigators didn't think that this fourth victim was related to the previous three, but Ristine was eventually linked to them due to her similar profile. Ristine was also a young black woman and was abandoned without any clothing near a body of water. While it is more or less 100% agreed upon that the previous three victims are all related, there is still some debate on whether or not Ristine was a victim of the same culture. Culprit. Fast forward to March 15th, 1994, the Iken County Sheriff's Office caught wind of a potential person of interest in what was evolving into a serial killer investigation. The man's name was Frank T. Potts. He was a migrant worker with a footprint across the southeast. He was known for adventuring and he has gone as far north as Illinois and Pennsylvania, making friends in every state along the way. In the eyes of his neighbors, Frank was a pretty nice guy, always ready to lend a hand to friends in a bind. He eventually acquired some land in northern Alabama where he built a cabin. And what Frank's friends didn't really know about him was that he harbored a dark side as well. In the early to mid 80s, he faced imprisonment for the egregious crime of an 11 year old girl in Florida. Remarkably, he was released after serving a mere six years of a 15 year sentence. Following his release, Potts resumed his occupation as a migrant worker, traversing the eastern regions of the U.S. A concerning incident in 1992 thrust him back into the eyes of law enforcement. While in Alabama, Potts was caught by a game warden for hunting without proper equipment or a permit. Rather than facing the consequences of these violations, Potts chose a more provocative course of action. He resorted to kidnapping the game warden, holding him at gunpoint. Furthermore, Potts, a convicted felon, was not allowed to possess a firearm, and the particular firearm that he had was an illegal one. It isn't exactly clear how this particular situation ended, but the game warden did survive. In 1994, Potts faced arrest in Florida for the conviction of yet another 11-year-old girl. Following a conviction on this charge, he was handed a life sentence, requiring a minimum of 25 years in confinement for the recurrent offense. However, this was not the end of his disgusting crimes. During a search of his 40-acre property in Alabama where he had constructed his cabin, law enforcement unearthed the remains of a young man who had disappeared in April of 1989. He was identified as Robert Earl Gines, who was a fellow migrant worker accompanying Potts. For the murder of Robert, Potts received a second life sentence. But this sentence would only be served if his previous sentence got vacated, which was highly unlikely. Before we end this entry, let's briefly go over the details once more because I did sort of hop around a lot. The initial Iken County Jane Doe was discovered in 1987 along Shaw Creek. They were undisturbed for a duration of one to five years, indicating a time of demise between 82 and 1986. The next victim is Jackie Council, who went missing on November 10th, 1986. 
her remains surfaced in 1991, followed with their identification in 1999. The third victim was Ristine Durden, who vanished on March 13, 1989, from Georgia. Then in 1993, the remains of the victim who was burned were discovered. Two of these murders took place in the mid-1980s, while two others just a few years down the line. To this day, investigators have not been able to identify the culprit. Duncan McPherson is a former professional hockey player whose remains were discovered on a mountain after he mysteriously disappeared years earlier. Known as the happy guy by his friends and family, Duncan's life revolved around hockey. Growing up in Saskatoon, Saskatchewan, he shared the typical Canadian kid's love for the game, but he was a bit more of a standout. He was tougher, more defensive, and way more skilled than the other kids in the neighborhood. As the years rolled on, his skills got even better, earning him the name McPherson. And before you knew it, Duncan had a real shot at going pro. By the time he hit 17, McPherson was already on his hometown team, the Blades. Even though the Blades didn't quite make the playoffs in 83, Duncan left the coaches seriously impressed. Fast forward to the 1984 draft, Duncan was selected in the first round as the 20th pick. And despite being offered this opportunity with the New York Islanders, Duncan decided to stick with his hometown team a little while longer. But he did eventually go pro when he joined a minor league team in Springfield. Unfortunately, his time with them was tough. Injuries kept him on the bench more than on the ice. He messed up both knees and tore his rotator cuff not long after joining. To make matters worse, he got the boot at the end of the 1988 season, leaving him unemployed. Facing career-threatening injuries at the young age of 23 was a daunting experience for McPherson. Realizing that he hadn't earned a college degree, he understood that his options were limited and turned his focus toward European leagues for a potential comeback. A few weeks into reaching out to them, he received a call from Ron Dixon, the owner of a British hockey league based in Dundee, Scotland. Dixon expressed interest in hiring McPherson as the head coach for the Tayside Tigers, with the added perk of playing hockey part-time. Uncertain about Dixon's credibility, McPherson cautiously agreed to meet in person to discuss the terms and finalize the contract. In the midst of these developments, McPherson shared with his parents and a few friends a somewhat perplexing claim that the CIA had approached him for recruitment. Whether or not this was a legitimate recruitment is unclear. However, this sparked various conspiracy theories among the public years down the line. McPherson agreed to meet Dixon on August 12th, 1989. Leaving on August 9th, he borrowed a vehicle from his friend and former teammate, George. McPherson mentioned to George that he planned to spend a day or two at a ski resort in Austria before the meeting with Dixon. He was always interested in snowboarding, so McPherson saw this as the perfect opportunity to hit the slopes. Heading to the Stubai Alps, McPherson spoke with an employee at a popular ski resort on August 9th. He informed the employee about his plans to go snowboarding on the mountain. Unfortunately, that marked the last time anyone saw McPherson alive. Despite the foggy weather which kept most skiers and snowboarders at their resorts, McPherson was undeterred. A bit of bad weather wasn't going to stop him from enjoying the slopes. When McPherson didn't show up for their scheduled meeting, Dixon grew concerned and reached out to Duncan's family to figure out what had happened. His parents immediately sensed that something was wrong. Duncan was eager to get back into hockey and finalize the details of the contract with Dixon. The problem was that they didn't initially know where Duncan was. Austrian police weren't very helpful initially, suggesting that as a grown man in Europe, he could change plans without informing anyone. About six weeks later, the McPhersons decided to head to the Stubai Alps themselves to search for Duncan. They learned that he had borrowed George's car, which was found in the resort parking lot with most of his belongings inside, including his passport. Now, taking the situation seriously, Austrian police initiated an extensive search for Duncan. Despite their efforts, neither the police nor the McPherson family could find any trace of Duncan. Over the next 14 years, the family made nine trips to the Alps, desperately searching for any sign of Duncan or clues about what might have happened to him all those years ago. Unfortunately, their efforts proved fruitless. However, everything changed in 2003 when an employee at the Stubai Glacier Resort spotted a glove protruding from the snow. Initially mistaking the glove for discarded trash, the employee soon realized that they couldn't be more wrong. Picking it up revealed McPherson's frozen body. 
Immediately contacting the authorities, they uncovered the 23-year-old's remains beneath the snow. The frozen ice had remarkably maintained his body and the clothing he wore years earlier. An ID card in his jacket pocket confirmed the body as that of Duncan McPherson, with his broken snowboard still strapped to his back. After retrieving McPherson's body from the frozen ice and snow, authorities found signs of trauma. His left femur was crushed, and his leg and forearm were severed from his body. Additionally, he had two broken bones. Officials concluded that these injuries were consistent with an encounter with machinery. The resort conducted an investigation into Duncan's death, determining it to be accidental. The prevailing theory was that he had veered off trail during his snowboarding adventure, fell into a crevasse, and met his demise. Various theories circulated about McPherson's death. Some speculated about a CIA involvement in a secret mission. However, the most plausible scenario suggested that a resort employee plowing snow on the glacier that evening accidentally ran over Duncan. It's conceivable that Duncan may have sustained an injury, leaving him immobile, possibly a broken leg or a fall into a small crevasse. The snow plowing machinery, unfortunately, broke McPherson's snowboard in the process. When the resort worker realized that they had accidentally run someone over, who possibly may have been alive at that point, they shifted Duncan's body into a much larger crevasse and covered it with snow. A Canadian pathologist later verified this account, stating that the injuries sustained by McPherson were likely a result of both a forceful fall and an encounter with a machine. So if this was indeed how Duncan met his end, who was responsible for it? Linda Gibson, described as a lively and easygoing 21-year-old by her younger brother, Clayton Gibson, was loved deeply by her family. Clayton said she was real shy, she loved her family, and we love her too. Linda was the best sister in the world. The Gibson family had deep roots in the Somerset, Kentucky area where Linda had spent her entire life. In 1994, Linda resided with her four-year-old daughter, Stephanie, in close proximity to the family. On July 3rd, 1994, according to Clayton, Linda was looking after her younger half-brother, Cody Garrett. Describing Cody as a sweet and innocent four-year-old, Clayton mentioned that Linda's daughter, Stephanie, was under the care of Linda's mother on that particular day. Clayton explained that together, the half-siblings went for a walk to the nearby grocery store. However, they never returned home. According to a press release from the Pulaski County Sheriff's Department, Linda and Cody were last seen walking along Bourne Avenue near the Dairy Mart. The following day on the 4th of July, their family reported them missing. It took four entire days for the Pulaski County Sheriff's Department with assistance from the Somerset Police Department to locate their bodies. The bodies were discovered in a remote area outside of Somerset, concealed by tall weeds. The investigation suggested that Linda and Cody had been murdered elsewhere and their bodies were then dumped in the field. The details surrounding any evidence left behind remained unclear. Clayton, however, believed that DNA was present as Linda was the kind of person who would have fought back against her attacker. In the weeks leading up to July 3rd, Clayton revealed that Linda had confided in him and their father about feeling threatened. Despite their father pleading for information to help Linda, she would only cry and not disclose details about the person she feared. Clayton said, The way we lost her was terrible. She was only 21 and she had been used and abused, and that little 4-year-old baby didn't do anything to nobody. It was tragic, the way we lost them. Cody was just in the wrong place at the wrong time. However, according to a press release by the Pulaski Sheriff's Department, the ongoing investigation has identified potential suspects and investigators are focusing on those leads. Lake Okeechobee resides in Florida and has been the site of various stories revolving around ghosts, treasures, and monsters. For example, one day in 1956, a pilot was flying over the lake and reported seeing some massive tracks in the mud. He thought that this could only have been made by a dinosaur. Tales like this one are abundant in the area, but most people discredit them as random babblings from the locals. But underneath all of those far-fetched stories lies one mystery that is relatively believable, that being the Lake Okeechobee skeletons. This story can be dated all the way back to the early 1900s where fishermen reported catching human skulls. Some even reported that during low water, the lake looked like a pumpkin patch with the amount of skulls that were there. In 1918, the water was said to have reached an all-time low, and those that witnessed it reported hundreds of skeletons from adults to children. 
children. How did all of these remains wind up in one location? Some people suggest that this may have been the result of a violent hurricane in the area. If this is to be believed, then the hurricane was likely pre-1900s as the 1926 and 1928 hurricane victims were all recovered and buried elsewhere. But then again, if it was a hurricane from that long ago, there weren't enough people living in the area where hundreds of remains would be left in the lake. Other suggestions revolved around battles held in the area such as the 1837 Battle of Okeechobee, but there were not enough casualties in that fight to match up with the amount of remains. According to a number of anthropologists, it may have been possible that the lake served as a burial site for an old civilization. There was also a legend that suggested over 200 Seminoles decided to commit mass suicide instead of being captured by an army, so in their final seconds of life, they flung themselves into the lake. But just like with all the other theories, that's all it is, a theory without much evidence to go off of. The exact date of this event is unknown, but sometime in 1987 in the Qinling Mountains in China, there was a small village with about 1,000 residents that mysteriously vanished. But along with all of the people, the cats, dogs, and livestock also disappeared. Being such an obscure location and event, sources and information are either unreliable or scarce. Some of the local news outlets were even known to fabricate stories in an attempt to get readers. One elderly man who lived just outside of the village said, A large number of troops were dispatched to the site. They moved the whole village somewhere else overnight and persuaded the people to come along. Locals began calling the event Operation Nightcat, claiming that the government had hauled off the entire population of the village in order to be tested. While some may think that the idea of the government being responsible for this is a slight bit far-fetched, others believe that it is the most viable explanation. There were several other events that were said to be covered up, or at least there were attempts at hiding, such as an incident in 1996 that involved a failed rocket launch that resulted in the deaths of approximately six people. The rocket had veered off course after liftoff and tragically crashed into a nearby village. Now, the articles that I used to research this topic were translated from Chinese, so there may be some inaccuracies. But apparently, the village that the rocket struck no longer exists, nor is there any sort of memorial for the victims. Along with the theories regarding a cover-up, there are almost an equal amount of UFO theories. There were rumored to be sightings of bright lights in the sky the night the village went missing. But aside from the words of a few locals, there really isn't any evidence to prove either of these theories so far. On one spring day in 1996, five junior high school students in Ichikai, Japan were heading home after a group activity. Their usual route led them down a town road bordered by a bamboo grove. On their walk, they noticed a peculiar looking blue futon bag sealed with a black cord. Now, this isn't their first encounter with this bag. they have seen it previously in March, but only now decided to investigate it. Just as a joke, the students had speculated about a body inside the bag due to an unusual smell. With a stick, they prodded at the bag, sensing that it was soft yet heavy. They noticed that the bag was torn in two places. With the stick, the students peeled back the openings, and that's when to their shock, a pale human hand emerged. A strong, unpleasant odor overwhelmed the students. They sprinted off to the nearest house and shared the discovery with the adults inside. After confirming the finding, the homeowners contacted the police. The bag was on a road that was frequently used and it was close to residential homes and, ironically, adjacent to one of Ichikai's garbage collection sites. Police estimated that the body was left there for about a month, and they were surprised that it wasn't disposed of in a nearby pond that was fairly deep. And because of this detail, police believed that the perpetrator was likely unfamiliar with the area and not a local resident. During the initial on-site investigation, the police had a hard time examining the body because it was severely decomposed. All they could confirm was that it was a male. Unfortunately, medical officials couldn't figure out the cause of death due to the advanced decomposition, but they did find bruises around the hip and lower back as well as missing front teeth. 
Due to the condition of the body, the police treated it as a homicide and made it a top priority case. The man was estimated to be between 40 and 50 years old. He was relatively tall for a Japanese man at 5 foot 11 inches, and weighed about 127 pounds. He had straight gray hair that almost touched his shoulders, and his blood type was O. The man was dressed in a dark blue jacket labeled Modern Sportsman Club. Underneath, he wore a large gray business shirt, a multicolor tie from Elaine Delon, and dark gray business pants. He didn't have any shoes, but his socks and underwear were from high-end luxury brands. In one of his pockets, there was a green and red handkerchief from Christian Dior as well. There were no items on him that could lead to his identification. Along with his missing teeth, the rest of them were in bad shape. Medical officials believe that he had periodontitis. In total, nine of his teeth were missing due to decay, and those that remained had cavities reaching the nerves. Medical staff noted that the man must have experienced significant pain in his life due to his dental issues. What struck investigators as peculiar was that despite his apparent wealth suggested by his clothing, he should have easily been able to afford necessary dental treatment. One of the items that police found a bit more intriguing was a clothing tag on his pants. It read, Tonari Yamamoto. When authorities approached the locals in an attempt to identify the man, none of them recognized him. After this, the case quickly went cold. The lack of DNA on the body and the absence of fingerprints on the bag contributed to the mystery, leaving investigators with very few leads. To spread awareness, various posters were distributed in the area and the case was covered in TV reports, all with the hope that someone might recognize the distinctive clothing. And at some point, authorities were more or less confident that the clothing tag Tonari Yamamoto was a fake. Yamamoto was a very common name in Japan, whereas Tonari was pretty rare. It's uncommon for adults to write their names on clothing tags except for dry cleaners and laundry services. So in an attempt to explore this lead, the police contacted thousands of dry cleaning services across Japan's Kanto and Tohoku regions. Despite the efforts, only one witness came forward after the posters were displayed. The witness recounted, I heard the sounds of fighting and screaming, followed by glass breaking. I saw someone suspicious with blood on his hands, clothes, and face. There was the sudden noise of a car taking off and then breaking. A car was parked in a spot where nobody usually parks. That person in the wanted poster with the blazer and necktie was probably the same individual. But this witness never provided exact details such as locations and admitted to not actually seeing anything later on. So police were basically back at square one. Police were able to track down the blue jacket that the man had to 73 stores across Japan. And at the time of the body's discovery, the store had only sold 33 of these jackets. The man's pants were also extremely rare. There were 53 stores in Japan that sold those particular pants, and they have only ever sold 93 pairs. Then the futon bag where the man was in was available in 126 stores, but no sales records could be found for it. Another very strange aspect about this case is that the victim appeared very affluent, but the police never received any missing persons reports that matched the man, and the absence of his shoes hinted at the possibility that he may have been killed at home. In April of 2006, the police collected the man's DNA and compared it against Japan's DNA database, but unfortunately, no matches were found. Seeking further clues, the police exhumed his remains to create a facial reconstruction. With this sketch, police put up new billboards and posters in the area, urging anyone who might recognize him to come forward. Then in 2017, the police successfully traced the clothing tag to a dry cleaning service in the Wakaba ward of the city of Chiba located in Chiba Prefecture. The owners of the dry cleaning business acknowledged writing the name on the clothing tag, but unfortunately, this revelation did not significantly aid the police in identifying the man. Chiba was situated two hours away from where the body was discovered. Another dry cleaning service in Ichihara, also in the Chiba prefecture, asserted that they had cleaned the pants in the past as well. Based on this information, the police strongly suspected that the man had ties to Chiba prefecture or had resided there at some point in his life. In a final effort, the police reinstated billboards and posters for the third time in the neighboring prefectures. And that's sort of where the case just left off.
Sergei or Corpse 21449 was a moniker and pseudonym for a homeless man in Moscow, Russia during the late 1980s. Sergei was well known and liked within Moscow's homeless community, yet none of the information that he shared with everyone proved helpful in narrowing down his actual identity. On October 2016, a bystander reported the discovery of a deceased person wrapped in a blanket within a structure at Arbatskaya Square in Moscow. When police arrived, they found that the body was stiff and beginning to freeze. The person was wearing a black fur hat, two sweaters, a red t-shirt, two different socks, and a single black shoe, and they were missing several teeth. During the autopsy, medical officials estimated that the man was between 50 and 60 years old. He also had several distinctive features, including a concave-shaped nose with a scar and protruding ears. He also stood at about 5 foot 7 inches tall with a round face, gray hair, a dark blonde mustache, a gray beard, and he also had light gray eyes. There were also additional scars on his right shoulder, forearm, left knee, and forehead. The coroner noted that one of his legs had developed gangrene from frostbite suffered earlier, determining his death as natural with the time of death being the day before. When authorities attempted to identify him, they realized that this man was kind of locally famous. After learning of his death, the homeless community held a small wake for Sergei, although no one knew his real name. It was revealed that Sergei often shared details about his past and background within the homeless community. According to her, Sergei was from Tajikistan. He also studied philosophy at a university, but he never named which school and he also dropped out after a few courses. From there, he started a business where he ran a kiosk selling various items. Sergei also got married and settled in an apartment on Arbit Street. He also served time in prison after getting into a fight. This was one of the first major clues that police received. They started sweeping through old records, but they found no evidence of anyone matching Sergei's description serving a prison sentence. Sergei also later divorced and his ex-wife remarried a police officer. The couple then evicted Sergei from the apartment, which forced him to live on the streets. The lead investigator in Sergei's case considered him to be transient and speculated that he may have suffered from dromomania, an uncontrollable urge to constantly change locations rather than settle in one place for an extended period. The case did eventually go cold and Sergei was buried in a special sector in the cemetery for unidentified or unclaimed bodies. Nearly four decades have passed since the discovery of a man's skeleton on the side of the highway. The remains were found in 1985 by an individual who had pulled over along I-195 West in Fairhaven. During the initial investigation, there were little clues about the identity of the skeleton. Now retired Massachusetts State Police Detective Ken Martin said, The biggest clue we found was a tax stamp on a pack of cigarettes, which indicated the person was from Rhode Island. In an effort to get the appearance of the victim when he was alive, investigators crafted a cast of the victim's face. Detective Martin said that the image did help with gathering a number of leads, but none of them were worthwhile. After exhausting everything, the case hit a dead end. Unbeknownst to investigators, four years before this discovery, a man from Cranston had disappeared without a trace. His name was Keith Olson. Keith Olson was reported missing by his family in April 1981. Investigating his disappearance, authorities discovered that Olson had been dating a woman whose ex-boyfriend had connections to the mafia. He was last seen leaving a residence with two unidentified men. As time passed, Olson's family reluctantly assumed that he was deceased and that his body would remain undiscovered. However, it wasn't until Bristol County District Attorney Thomas Quinn III initiated the Unidentified Bodies Project that the skeleton discovered on the side of the highway would be connected to Olson's disappearance. Detective Quinn stated that detectives opted to send the unidentified remains to a forensic genetic genealogy laboratory in Texas. This confirmed that the remains were of Keith Olson, and it also turned Keith's girlfriend's ex into the prime suspect. However, he died in 2019, and it may seem that all hope is lost, but police believe he had a partner. They are still actively trying to figure out the identity of this accomplice in order to get Keith and his family the justice that they deserve.
On September 12, 1992, hunters at Norway's Hardanger Vida National Park stumbled upon a skeleton. Following their discovery, the police initiated an investigation. The skeleton was estimated to be of a person that was aged between 22 and 27. The cause of death was unknown. However, law enforcement speculated that the deceased, likely an inexperienced hiker, had gone off course and ultimately died from the exposure. This conclusion was drawn from the lack of items an experienced hiker would carry. The police estimated the time of death to be in the summer of 1991. Despite inspecting the remains, officials had trouble determining the gender of the subject, as the hip bones resembled those of a woman while the skull looked like a male's. An anthropologist conducted a facial reconstruction and the image was circulated in Norwegian newspapers. The investigation found no evidence of homicide or suicide, which made the idea of the victim dying to the elements all the more believable. The person's possessions included a 1,000 Norwegian krone banknote from 1991, plastic bags containing items such as rye bread, baking powder, small wine bottles, and water bottles all of which originated from Germany. Additionally, a roadmap of southern Norway purchased in Oslo was found. Another item was a 14-inch tall makeshift bear, which was clearly very worn out and had been repaired several times. This bear led to the individual being named Teddy Bjorn Manin. Teddy Bjorn had on Levi jeans, a brown leather jacket, hiking boots, and a poncho from Germany. The police suspected, like many other foreigners in the area, that the person might have carried a backpack. However, no such item was recovered. It's possible that it was scavenged by local wildlife. Teddy Bjorn's DNA was later retested with modern technology in 2022, which did confirm that the person was male. Now, the interesting thing about Teddy Bjorn is that he actually potentially ties into a piece of lost media as well. So in 1998, there was a German talk show called Fliege, where a female guest appeared to talk about her son, who went missing when he went on vacation in Norway. The TV station where the show appeared on has no records of such an episode though, and the actual talk show host himself also cannot remember such a moment. To some, this may seem like a major stretch, but authorities Authorities think that this missing episode is the best shot they have at identifying this man. Now, assuming the episode is real, why hasn't the woman come forward to identify the man that is likely her son? She obviously cares very deeply for him, to the point where she's going to appear on a talk show, so it's probably safe to assume that she's keeping up with unidentified remains to some degree in Norway. All that being said, there's a high likelihood that she has passed away in the years after that episode went live. On April 30th, 2009, a scout leader was supervising various scouts and children aged 6 to 8. They were volunteering to pick up trash, which was a task organized by a nature conservation group. The cleanup took place in the Vestkoen Forest in Copenhagen, Denmark. During the activity, one of the boys discovered a bone protruding from the ground. Recognizing it as a human bone, the scout leader, Mads Anderson, decided to tell the kids that it was an animal bone to prevent causing alarm. Upon returning to their base, Anderson disclosed the true nature of the discovery to the parents, prompting them to contact the police for further investigation. The police excavated the body from the ground, and while it was partially a skeleton, there was enough decomposed flesh remaining for them to extract usable fingerprints and discern visible tattoos. The individual was identified as an Asian male, estimated to be between 40 and 60 years old. Medical officials could not determine an exact time of death, but they estimated that the man had been buried for several months. He had a rather thin build and he was about 5 foot 2 inches tall. He also had short dark hair, and police labeled his clothing as special, but they never elaborated on what they meant by this. The man was missing most of his teeth, and in fact, he only had one left, thus making the use of dental records for identification rather difficult. Authorities then proceeded to try and match up the man's fingerprints into someone in their database, but this yielded no results. Along with sharing the fingerprints with Interpol, Danish police released two photos of a tattoo that said LVE. Some Danish newspapers suggested that LVE might be the name of a city or town in Cambodia, leading authorities to consider the possibility that the man was actually Cambodian. Others, however, proposed that the tattoo likely intended to convey the word love. But despite the public's involvement in trying to figure out what the tattoo meant, no conclusive results emerged. 
On January 9th, 2015, two hikers contacted police after discovering a body outside the town of Puerto de Samido in Spain. The body, wrapped in a blanket, was left near a narrow creek. After unwrapping it, the police found the man to be naked with one leg missing, which was likely taken by animals. The man measured in at about 4 foot 4 inches tall. He sported a beard and was estimated to be between 45 and 60 years old. The man also appeared very skinny. One of the most notable aspects of the man were his disproportionately long limbs and fingers along with a small head. His chest protruded outward, possibly because of pectus carinatum. His autopsy revealed more interesting details. Despite his visible ribs, it was determined that he was not starved. Furthermore, his well-shaved beard, facial hair, and well-maintained skin indicated that he had been properly cared for during his life. DNA sequencing revealed that the man may have suffered from a mild case of cocaine syndrome. Individuals with these conditions typically experience intellectual disabilities and require assistance in daily living. Given the man's good hygiene and absence of signs of malnutrition, the police inferred that he likely had at least one caretaker throughout his life. No evidence of violence was found on his body and a medical examiner concluded that the cause of death was a heart attack. Given the rarity of the condition and the distinctive physical features of the man, the police initially believed that his identification wouldn't take very long. Authorities began questioning the residents in the area where the man was found, but they couldn't really find any details about him. It seemed as though none of the locals even recognized the man. This forced the police to broaden their search to neighboring towns. Despite the expanded efforts, no one could identify the man or recall anyone with similar features. Extensive searches through local hospital records and assisted living facilities yielded no matches. With no success, the police concluded that the man was either not a local or that his family had kept his birth and existence a secret. The man was buried in a local cemetery with a blank tombstone after authorities failed to obtain more information to build on the case. Chung Eun Kim was a woman whose body was discovered on February 14, 1988. Police immediately suspected that foul play was involved. There was a high likelihood that she had died of asphyxiation. During the initial stages of the investigation, a man who is now deceased reportedly confessed to her murder. Surprisingly, despite this confession, he was never formally charged. Kim was originally from Korea, where she then moved to Georgia less than a decade before her death. And she has only recently been identified. Before October of this year, her identity was still unknown. Kim was initially discovered by a man searching for cans. He jumped into a dumpster and found himself on top of a closed duffel bag. He opened it up and immediately jumped back and ran to his car to call police. He believed that he had just discovered a body. It was rumored that there was another person who smelled what seemed to be decomposition about a week before this man found the body. Kim was wrapped up in bedding and tape before being shoved into a duffel bag. The autopsy presented challenges due to the condition of her body. Her face was unrecognizable and it was difficult to determine her race at first. Her exact cause of death was unknown, but investigators believed that asphyxiation was most likely. It may have even involved the pillow found with her remains. However, there were no signs of trauma. Early forensic sketches were acknowledged by investigators as not entirely accurate. Despite this, they did prove helpful. Some people submitted information suggesting that the woman may have been from Korea. In 1991, investigators received a phone call from a man named Johnny Young who had been a person of interest in the case since 1988. In the call, he confessed to the murder. He added that the two were also acquaintances, but this was never verified. Johnny was tracked down in New Jersey, but he denied making the phone call in the first place, and he has since passed away. Unfortunately, the remains of the victim were reportedly cremated before samples could be retained for future DNA analysis. But nevertheless, she was still identified in October 2023 as Chongun Kim, who lived in Hinesville, Georgia. This was thanks to the blanket that she was found with, which was very very nicely preserved. Kim emigrated from Korea to the US in 1981. Investigators weren't able to find any evidence that proved Johnny was the killer, so they are actively looking for more leads to build on this case. 
This entry refers to an unsolved murder case that occurred in Inokashira Park, located between Mitaka City and Musashino City. The body was meticulously cut into 20 centimeter pieces with a level of skill that is only seen in medical professionals. Despite some key details surrounding the crime, the incident remains unresolved. On the morning of April 23rd, 1994, a Tokyo Park worker made a gruesome discovery in Inokashira Park. While emptying the trash cans, he came across plastic bags containing severed human body parts. Police arrived on the scene and carefully examined the contents of the bags. They counted 27 pieces in total. Along with being cut precisely, the parts were also drained of blood and the bottoms of the bags had small holes poked through. The knots tying the bags also had a very unusual technique used specifically by local fishermen. Most of the fingerprints were damaged but some partial prints did remain. Investigators eventually identified the victim as a 35-year-old male architect referred to publicly as S. The victim's torso, chest, and male organs were not among the body parts found, and they were never discovered down the line either. One theory is that the culprit had put those parts in different trash bags. If this is the case, janitorial staff may have already collected those bags and brought them to the waste disposal site the day before the rest of the body was found. S was known to be an active member of a local religious group and had last spoken to an acquaintance late at night on April 22nd. His movements and communications after that point are unknown. One unreliable witness claims seeing a man matching S's description being assaulted by two unknown men near his apartment. Aside from this already shady report, there really wasn't any really good evidence out there, and eventually the case went cold. Annalise Michelle was a young woman who lived in Germany and underwent nearly 70 exorcisms in the year prior to her death. Annalise was born in 1952 in Klingenberg, Germany in a devout Catholic family. At the age of 16, she experienced her first episode of unconsciousness, which was followed by a sensation of weight pressing down on her chest. Despite consulting with medical experts, no definitive cause for her episodes was found. In 1970, Annalise's symptoms persisted, leading to the prescription of anticonvulsant medication. Two years later, another seizure struck, which just led to new prescriptions for Annalise. But despite all of the medical assistance that Annalise was getting, her condition remained a mystery. Then in 1973, Annalise's life took a disturbing turn. She said that she began to hear eerie knocking sounds in her bedroom, which her sister also heard. There were also haunting whispers which really freaked Annalise out. Annalise's mother witnessed her terrifying transformation. Her eyes began to turn black and hands morphed into grotesque claws. She was also often seen staring menacingly at a statue of the Virgin Mary. In September 1973, Annalise Michelle visited Dr. Luthi, who was a neurologist, and described experiencing horrific visions of demon faces that were tormenting her. Annalise said that she felt as if there was a devil inside of her, and she reported smelling something that had the aroma of burnt feces, which was something that many around her would also report about later on. When the doctor noticed all of the medication that Annalise was taking and not being able to identify what was wrong with her, they advised the family to consult a religious official. However, Dr. Luthi later denied ever making this recommendation. Regardless, Annalise's family searched for a priest and eventually found one named Father Alt. In November, in November, Annalise met with a psychiatrist who diagnosed her as a neurotic with possible epilepsy. Another neurologist found that she had epileptic patterns and prescribed her with Tegretol. In July 1975, Annalise's behavior worsened. She barely slept and prayed feverishly all night. And this is where her spiral gets really, really bad. She began to eat insects and even consume her own waste. She destroyed rosaries, crucifixes, and holy pictures on the walls as well. Her strength was even described as being close to superhuman. Her family claimed that Annalise threw her sister as if she were a rag doll and effortlessly squeezed an apple with one hand until fragments exploded throughout the room. At this point, people were beginning to think that she was possessed, so Annalise's family sought help from an experienced exorcist. Her first exorcism happened on September 24th, 1975, and some of her sessions were even recorded. 
In total, there were a little over 42 sessions, and it was believed that Annalise was dealing with at least six demons. In May 1976, Annalise's condition worsened significantly. She started banging her head against the wall and biting herself and others, prompting her family to tie her up to prevent self-harm. Annalise, despite being very frail and likely weighing under 80 pounds at the time, showed surprising strength when restrained. The situation became more concerning when she refused to eat, describing it as not being permitted to eat. As June 1976 rolled around, Annalise's face appeared sunken, and she even declined a doctor visit despite having a high fever. On June 30th, Annalise underwent another exorcism where she said, please, absolution. The following morning, her family discovered her lifeless in her room. Despite initially seeking medical help, Annalise eventually declined any medical attention, placing all her faith and hope for recovery in the exorcisms. At the age of 23, after enduring 67 exorcisms, she passed away due to starvation, weighing only 68 pounds at the time of her death. After her death, her parents and the two priests faced charges of negligent homicide, leading to a trial in 1978. The defense presented eyewitness testimony and submitted recordings, an idea that the court may not have taken seriously. From a non-religious standpoint, Annalise had the legal right to refuse medical treatment. This treatment could have included tranquilizing, force feeding, and electroshock therapy, all potentially against her will. A family friend testified that in 1976, months before Annalise's death, Annalise begged on her knees for them not to suggest medical attention to anyone. One doctor that visited Annalise stated that she had no external injuries, while a religious official reported several bruises, a swollen cheek, and black eyes. An autopsy revealed that Annalise had a healthy brain with no damage that could cause epileptic seizures. The court seemed rather nonchalant about the unusual dilation of Annalise's pupils and the absence of ulcers on her body, which are typically found in starvation victims. Ultimately, the court sided with the prosecution, handing down a six-month prison sentence to the four defendants, which included Annalise's parents and two priests. The sentence was suspended for three years, and they were also required to cover all court costs. The court determined that Annalise was incapable of making decisions for herself and should have been compelled to undergo medical care. Let me know what you think in the comments. Was Annalise really possessed or was she suffering from some sort of mental illness or other condition? On the morning of January 14th, 1997, officials in the Tama City suburb of Tokyo responded to complaints of a manhole overflowing with sewage between two local stations. Upon arrival and removing the manhole cover, city workers encountered a sight that stopped them cold. What appeared to be a plastic mannequin figure bobbing in the bitter sludge was actually a real person. It was a woman estimated to be between 20 and 40 years of age. The overflow itself had been induced by dislodged flesh clogging drainage pipes below. An ensuing autopsy of the remains was regrettably unable to conclusively determine time or exact cause of death. However, there was clear damage to the body, including a broken nose and fractured skull, which were suffered at unknown points in time. Through dental records, investigators ultimately identified the body as 39-year-old Fukiko Yagihashi, a local kindergarten teacher who had mysteriously vanished on February 28, 1996. The night before she disappeared, Fukiko left work and went grocery shopping around 7pm at a Tama City store. It was unusual for her to miss work, so her family reported her as missing. Fukiko's house looked normal and tidy. Police also found her groceries, which included some strawberries and natto, untouched in her fridge. And there were two notable things that were missing, her purse and a diary from around 1990 to 1991. Before disappearing, Fukiko had over 7.5 million yen in savings, which is over $50,000. She had talked about visiting her hometown, but no money was withdrawn before or after she disappeared. This has been an extremely tough case to investigate. It's unclear if Fukiko had walked off alone or with someone, willingly or unwillingly. As for the old missing diary, if she was kidnapped, perhaps the culprit took it because it mentioned him. There's also the possibility that Fukiko wasn't killed the night she disappeared. While her body was found in the same clothes, her long hair had been cut short. 
Additionally, while her father stayed in her house from March 1st to April 6th, he got six strange silent calls. Since Fukiko lived about 200 meters from the manhole, some have suggested a local acquaintance killed her. Due to the location of the body, a city worker was also suspected since special tools were needed to open that manhole. The only suspect who was referred to as Mr. K fit this profile. He lived nearby, worked for the city, and knew Fukiko. Despite a weak alibi, he was eventually ruled out. Nearly three decades later, Fukiko's killer's identity is still unknown. This next entry takes us to Japan during the 1990s. One Tuesday morning, a 52-year-old fisherman named Haruo Otsu fell severely ill after drinking a few small bottles of vitamin juice when he was headed towards his local fishing spot. The beverages were purchased from a vending machine and, tragically, he passed away in a hospital the following night. Authorities soon determined the man's sudden decline in health was due to toxins added to his drinks by an unknown individual. Otsu was just one of over 40 citizens across Japan who were either killed or harmed after ingesting spiked drinks over recent months alone. This spread an immense amount of hysteria amongst locals as there was no observable pattern to see which drinks were poisoned. The most common poison used was Paraquat, which is a powerful weed killer. Many of the victims, like Otsu, drank beverages that had been laced with Paraquat. In almost all cases, the poisoned drinks were placed near or inside vending machines. And just in case you aren't aware, these vending machines are extremely common in Japan. There will be streets and neighborhoods that even have these machines. The random nature of the killings and the police's failure to catch the culprit or culprits have spread fear across the country. This also led to a wave of copycat crimes. Psychologists have identified a new type of criminal known as Yukihan in Japanese who thrives on the thrill of committing crimes. They relish the imagined suffering of their victims and feel no remorse, explained Professor Susumu Oda, who's a mental health expert at Tsukuba University in northeastern Tokyo. Soft drink companies have not disclosed any sales figures, but they claim that their sales have not been significantly impacted by the poisonings. Additionally, there are no plans to redesign soda bottles in the way that drug companies in the US created tamper-proof packaging following the Tylenol poisonings. In fact, those soda companies tend to place the blame on the victims, arguing that they should have been more careful. They point out that the seal at the base of the bottle cap must be broken first. If only consumers were more cautious, they would have noticed that the seal had been tampered with, stated Takio Mizuchi, a spokesperson for the Japan Soft Drinks Bottlers Association. In many cases, poisoned drinks were placed directly inside the vending machine's dispenser slots. Victims would insert their coins, see two bottles in the dispenser, and assume they had just gotten lucky, not considering the possibility of tampering. As a result, Mr. Mizuchi's organization Organization has printed 1.3 million stickers to be placed on vending machines, warning customers to be cautious. As time went on, the reports of tampered drinks gradually went down, but one detective was quoted saying, The number of cases may decline from now on, but I don't think this is over. The culprit or culprits responsible for poisoning the beverages was never found. Count Xavier Dupont de Ligones is sought for the murders of his wife Agnes Hodinger, their children Thomas, Anne, and Benoit, as well as his stepson Arthur. The family resided at 55 Schumann Boulevard in an affluent neighborhood in Nantes, located on the Atlantic coast in western France. Their neighbor, Estelle, provided various services for the family, including alterations to their clothing and ironing. She frequently interacted with the family and remembered their home as vibrant and bustling. Xavier was a prosperous businessman and was known for his ease in communicating with people and his quick sense of humor. Agnes was employed at a Catholic school while their 21-year-old stepson, Arthur, attended a private Catholic college. 18-year-old Thomas was a shy individual but he was passionate about music. 16-year-old Anne was a mail-order catalog model who also excelled academically. 13-year-old Benoit also attended the same school as her, while also having a keen interest in music. Around 2 p.m. on Monday, April 11, 2011, Estelle noticed that the family's residence was locked. On their mailbox was also a note that instructed the mailman not to leave any mail. The blinds on their windows were also closed, which was very strange because the family always left them open even during vacations. 
After two days had passed, Estelle grew concerned and contacted the police. On Wednesday, April 13th, local law enforcement arrived to inspect the house. Noticing the locked front door and closed blinds, they enlisted a locksmith to gain entry. Once inside, they discovered that everything in the house appeared to be in order. While some bedrooms lacked sheets and a few closets were opened, the police concluded that the family had likely left voluntarily. No conspicuous signs prompted them to initiate a formal investigation at that time. Estelle was still concerned about the family and noted that all the cars except for one were present. And despite those worries, the police dismissed any wrongdoing. The following day, letters from Xavier and Agnes reached friends and family, explaining Xavier's recruitment by Americans for a covert mission against an international drug ring. Although some found the letters perplexing, the couple's esteemed reputation led many to believe their story. Xavier's brother, Bruno, trusted him based on their long-standing friendship and shared noble backgrounds, which held significant importance to Xavier's prestigious family. Xavier and Agnes, who met in the early 1980s when he was 20 and she was around 17, quickly fell in love. However, Xavier's desire for adventure led to a breakup and he embarked on various travels. Upon his return a year later, he discovered Agnes was pregnant with someone else's child. Surprisingly, Xavier chose to marry Agnes and adopt this child, which greatly defied societal norms in the area. While many of Xavier's friends and family believed the story in the letters, Agnes's family was a bit more skeptical. On April 15th, the police returned to the house for a more thorough investigation. They discovered missing photos, but nothing else suspicious. Despite the findings, or rather lack thereof, Agnes's family persisted in pressing the police, convinced that the family hadn't simply left. On April 18th, the police made their third visit, followed by a fourth the very next day. It wasn't until the sixth visit on April 21st when a police lieutenant discovered something odd under the terrace in the garden. The police dug beneath the terrace and uncovered large plastic trash bags tightly bound with tape. Inside were several bodies wrapped in blankets and duvets, with small religious icons like candles or crosses placed beside each one. The first grave held the bodies of Agnes, Arthur, Benoit, and Anne, along with the family dogs. Thomas's body was found in a separate grave. However, Xavier's body remained missing, making him the prime suspect. An international warrant was issued after he was declared missing, but many friends found it impossible to believe that he could be a murderer, insisting they knew him well enough for such an act to be inconceivable. During the autopsy, officials discovered sleeping pills in the viscera of the children. Agnes, however, did not have any substances in her system. She did have a sleep apnea machine to help her fall asleep, which was shut down at 3 a.m. on either April 3rd or April 4th. Authorities think it's highly likely that she was the first victim. Following her, the children were all killed. All of the victims also died of gunshot wounds. The bullets belonged to a 22 caliber rifle. And surprisingly, when authorities asked the neighbors if they heard anything, they said that they didn't. Investigators believed that they had a highly intelligent killer on their hands. According to police, Xavier was fleeing around this time period. It did not appear that he was going very fast though. He was also not hiding. He withdrew money with his bank card and was recorded on security cameras. He also went to several restaurants and used his credit cards there as well. There was speculation that he was preparing to take his own life as family murderers sometimes do. Police believe that his flight may have been a goodbye to his past life. Some of the areas he visited were places that he and Agnes lived during the first years of their marriage. Other areas were places where their children had been born. All in all, these locations were places where he had spent happier times in his life. The last known stop he made was to Roquebrune sur Argens, and he spent the night of April 14th at a Formula One hotel. Surveillance cameras showed him crossing the hotel parking lot carrying a bag. At the bottom of the bag was a long object. Investigators believed that it was the rifle he used to kill his family. The area where Xavier was last sighted was surrounded by cliffs and mountains, leading some to speculate that he may have walked into them and committed suicide. Initially, police were pretty fond of this theory, but after investigating the location, they found no trace of him. Despite the police's conviction that Xavier took his own life, many others entertained the idea that Xavier may have deceived everyone and managed to escape. 
Megumi Yashiki and Narumi Takumi were both 19 years old when they disappeared in 1996. On May 5th, 1996, during Golden Week, two friends, Yashiki and Takumi, decided to explore the abandoned Hotel Subano in Uozu City. The hotel was located about 37 miles east of Himi City, where the two lived. Over the years, the hotel had fallen into despair and was known as a haunted spot among locals. In the early 1980s, the hotel's manager had disappeared after the hotel filed for bankruptcy. During the asset-inflated bubble economy that followed, the property and buildings were sold at auction for 35 million yen. However, with the bursting of the bubble, the hotel was abandoned and became a hangout for some local gangs and delinquents. Yashiki and Takumi had previously explored the abandoned hotel twice, and this time they came prepared. Yashiki brought a flashlight from her car, while Takumi had grabbed batteries and a pen light from her workplace. On their way to the city, they stopped at a park which was a popular hangout spot for young people near Fushiki Port. Around 10pm, they refilled their car at a gas station within Uozu City. The route to the hotel took them through a mountainous terrain after a stretch of road on National Route 8. Their last communication came in the form of a pager message from Takumi to an acquaintance of hers. It simply said, we are in Uozu. Two days after their last communication, Yashiki and Takumi's families reported them missing. In June 1997, a monthly magazine published an article about their disappearance. The article noted the absence of any personal belongings such as bloodstains or clothes around the abandoned hotel. For years, the disappearance of the two young women remained a mystery with no apparent leads. However, a breakthrough came in late 2014 when investigators learned about three potential witnesses. Police interviewed these subjects who provided a startling account of the events surrounding the disappearance. One witness recalled seeing a car with two women inside plunge from a parking lot into the sea at midnight on a major holiday in 1996. One of the witnesses said that they attempted to approach the vehicle to speak to the occupants, but the car abruptly reversed and plunged into the water. When pressed about their delay in coming forward, all three witnesses admitted to being scared and hesitant to report the incident. Acting on this new information, authorities initiated a search operation involving metal detectors and divers. Their efforts were rewarded when the submerged vehicle was located at a depth of approximately 8 meters. It was successfully retrieved from the seabed on March 4th, 2020. Upon examining the car's contents, investigators discovered a credit card belonging to Yashiki. DNA analysis of the remains found inside the vehicle confirmed the identities of both Yashiki and Takumi, bringing a tragic end to the long unsolved mystery, or at least that's how it may seem initially. While police stated that they did not suspect foul play, many members of the public disagreed. There was speculation that the two young women were raped and murdered, and it was rumored that the three witnesses played a part. Some witnesses even said that these three witnesses were right outside of the abandoned hotel. Yashiki's father grew to distrust the police and said, I don't trust them or the witnesses at all. I don't know who they are. I have asked the police, but they won't tell me. Every year, around 15,000 people disappear in Poland. However, it is rare that a missing person receives such extensive media coverage as Ivona Witzterek. Her smiling face is recognized by essentially everyone in the area. There are numerous photos, CCTV recordings, and maps showing the route she took on the night she vanished circulating online. Hundreds of people are still working on her case, including police officers, friends, personal detectives, and even online sleuths who only know this girl from a photograph. One of the most striking aspects of the case is the sheer volume of information available. Ivona had recently graduated high school and eagerly awaited her university admission while planning a vacation to Spain. On July 16th, 2010, she attended a party with friends before heading to a club in Sopat. Now, it should be mentioned that she had only met these friends that she was with a month before, and at the party, an argument ensued, but the cause of this is still unknown. 
Frustrated with the argument, Ivona left with no money and a dying phone battery. She waited until dawn before embarking on a 3.7 mile journey home. She opted to walk barefoot due to the discomfort from her new heels. During the journey, Ivona texted a few people, including one of her friends named Adria. Adria was one of the friends that Ivona was with at the party and Ivona was a little bit frustrated when Adria didn't choose to join her. A little past 4am, Ivona made her final call to Adria. She mentioned her dying phone battery, shared her location, and she said she was on her way to Adria's house instead. Because she had a bit to drink and likely didn't want to face her mom in that condition, Ivona said she planned to go to Adria's place, especially since Adria's parents were away. At that time, Adria was almost home and assured Ivona she'd leave the keys outside. Interestingly, Adria was standing close to Ivona's apartment, a fact confirmed by Ivona's stepfather who claimed to have overheard Adria talking. Because of this, Ivona's stepfather thought that Adria and Ivona were together. However, Adria clarified that he might have heard Ivona due to the speaker being on during their phone conversation. In the surveillance footage from Yalikovo Beach, it's evident that a man in a plaid shirt carrying a towel on his shoulder is walking at a distance behind the girl. To this day, his identity remains unknown, but investigators are confident that he isn't connected to Ivona's disappearance. In their opinion, the girl likely safely traversed the park and seaside boulevard, reaching her residential area. It's presumed that someone may have been waiting for her there, someone familiar who might have approached her, invited her to a car, or engaged in a conversation. However, what's certain is that she didn't make it home that morning. Her mother believed that she was at Adria's, while Adria assumed that she had gone home since the keys were left untouched. It only dawned on everyone that something had gone wrong on July 17th around 5pm. Investigators didn't take the case too seriously at first, thinking that Ivona had simply gone to a different party, and by the time they did take it seriously, they had already lost a valuable window to investigate. Unfortunately, any articles or sites with information about this case in English were extremely lacking, or at least the ones I found were, so I ended up translating a Japanese site. So there may be some minor details in here that are a tad confusing or worded poorly, but I tried my best to sort of fix those. In 1993, Mayumi Arashi, a 26-year-old married woman, welcomed her first daughter into the world. Soon after, she became pregnant with her second child. At barely over 5 feet tall and only weighing 86 pounds, Mayumi was a very slender woman. To provide the best care for her growing family, she decided to move back to her parents' home along with her children. This new arrangement allowed for her parents to assist her in raising her kids and provide her with the support she needed. Mayumi felt more at ease and secure in her familiar surroundings, and she dedicated the following months to nurturing her body in preparation for the arrival of her second child. Mayumi's family resided in the Sumida district of Tokyo. While living at her mother's house, Mayumi received care not only from her parents, but also from her elder sister, Yoko, who worked as a nurse at a nearby hospital. After the birth of her second child, Mayumi opted to stay with her family for a while to recover from childbirth due to physical limitations. However, she never returned home after venturing out one fateful night. On the evening of September 2nd, 1994, at around 7pm, 27-year-old Mayumi informed her family that she was heading out to meet a former classmate from her school days. She left in a hurry and never told anyone where her exact destination was. The following day, Mayumi's sister Yoko grew concerned when her sister failed to return home overnight. She attempted to reach Mayumi by calling the classmate she mentioned, but the classmate denied having any plans to meet Mayumi the previous night. Yoko's surprise deepened as she tried various means to contact her sister, all to no avail. Mayumi's family made the collective choice to finally call police. Upon receiving the missing person's report, the police immediately initiated an investigation. Based on Yoko's description, Mayumi was last seen wearing a white printed t-shirt and a pair of casual trousers. She left her home carrying a handbag containing her keys, wallet, and credit cards. Since both of her children were at home when she left, it seemed unlikely that Mayumi intended to travel far. Notably, Yoko recalled receiving several phone calls from a man named Mr. A after Mayumi's departure. Each time he called, he asked if Mayumi was home. Yoko, who recognized Mr. A, simply informed him that Mayumi had left the house and was not currently present. 
Yoko later went through Mayumi's wardrobe in search of clues and she found a note that said, I betrayed my husband. I am dating Mr. A, but I was betrayed by Mr. A. This may be my betrayal of my husband. Punish me. I'm very sorry everyone. This Mr. A character quickly turned into a person of interest. Yoko and the police decided to visit him at his residence and confront him directly. He acknowledged having met with Mayumi on the morning of her disappearance, but he claimed that they parted ways shortly after. In a rather unsettling remark, Mr. A said if Mayumi is indeed dead, I will end up in prison. However, when questioned, he didn't elaborate on this statement. In 2011, a show had a segment revolving around Mayumi's disappearance. Yoko was the first to be interviewed, then the father was interviewed in a different area. According to him, they didn't know anything about an affair prior and on the day that Mayumi went missing, it looked as though she was a bit preoccupied. But the most intriguing part was that during the father's interview, there was a piece of paper behind him stuck on a shelf that said, don't believe what Yoko says. It should be stated though that there seems to be some debate on whether or not that note on the shelf is fake. Some people even suggest that this entire case is a hoax. Reason for this is because the story comes across as rather incomplete. Alyoshinka refers to what is believed to be a prematurely born female baby with many deformities. It's said that she was born in May of 1996 in Kalinovi, Russia. However, others believe this to actually be an alien. The remains were lost, but there are photos and video available online. Alyoshinka was a grayish fetus that was about 10 inches in length. Its head was hairless and had a couple of dark spots on it. Its eyes also occupied the majority of its face. Not much is known about how the remains went missing, but some people claim that they were stolen while others state that Alyoshinka's own species stopped by in a UFO and took it. One doctor that claimed to have seen the body said that it looked like a 20 to 25 week old human fetus. A study was later conducted on the Atacama skeleton which is similar to Alyoshinka in appearance. The study showed that there was an extremely high number of bone and muscle mutations. On the night of October 30th, 1982, James Ademski, who was an 18-year-old senior from Depew High School in New York, headed out for a Halloween Eve party at a local bar. He was wearing an American Gigolo costume and the bar was hosting a pay once, drink all night event. After enjoying the party, James left the bar in the early morning hours of Halloween day. He planned to go on a two mile walk back home. During his journey, he walked alongside a girl for a while before parting ways. The last known sighting of James was him walking alone on Transit Road around 3.30 a.m. When James failed to return home the next morning, the police were notified, triggering an extensive search led by Lancaster Town Police and volunteer firefighters. Despite weeks of persistent efforts, no traces of James were found. After two months of searching on December 26, 1982, rabbit hunters stumbled upon James's body in a wooded area, approximately four miles from his last known location. Strangely, he was still in his Halloween costume, buried in a makeshift grave covered with twigs and leaves. The police determined that James had been deliberately bludgeoned to death, sustaining severe blows to the forehead. Laboratory analysis of the twigs found at the scene failed to yield any fingerprints. During the investigation, the girl who had walked with James was interviewed, but she was eventually cleared of suspicion. One of them led to an argument that had occurred earlier at the bar and that James, along with others, was significantly intoxicated. Despite this information, no arrests were made and many leads turned cold, leaving the case unresolved. Despite that earlier argument, the police don't see it as a likely trigger for violence and murder. The prevailing theory is that James might have hitchhiked during his journey and whoever picked him up could be the culprit. Adding to the mystery is the fact that James was described as a friendly and easygoing young man. Friends and family spoke highly of him and doubted that he was able to get into a fight. In 2017, the Lancaster police raised the reward money to $11,000, but only two leads have emerged since then, both leading to inconclusive results. The body in the cylinder refers to a man found sealed in a metal container at an abandoned World War II bombsite in Liverpool, England. 
The container was discovered in 1945 and it's commonly believed that the body was resting there for well over a decade. There is some speculation as to who the man is, but it is unknown why they were in the container. During the summer of 1943, American soldiers were clearing a World War II bomb site in Liverpool, England. While removing debris, a bulldozer unearthed a large metal cylinder partially buried in the rubble. One end of the cylinder was sealed with a steel plate while the other end was opened. The bulldozer accidentally crushed the open end during the operation. The cylinder remained unnoticed for several years, serving as a makeshift seat for locals and a playground for children. On July 13th, 1945, three boys were playing with a cylinder, rolling it through the streets. One decided to see what was inside, and that's when he found part of a human skeleton. The police were called, and they used an oxyacetylene burner to open the cylinder. Inside, they discovered a complete human skeleton along with various items. The police removed the remains and took them to the mortuary. The remains belonged to an adult male approximately 6 feet tall. It's estimated that the man was between 25 and 50 years old at the time of his death, which is just an insane range to give. The left base of the skull was absent, and there was a sort of cut on his left ear, but this doesn't mean there was foul play involved. Both the head and torso were also separated upon discovery. There were also several items with the remains. These items included two diaries, seven corroded keys, and random papers. The diaries were dated 1884 and 1885, but were essentially illegible. There was also a postcard, brooch, handkerchief, a golden ring, and a number of lesser items strewn about. After extensive research, the coroner stated that it was impossible to establish a cause of death due to insufficient info, but when questioned as to when he believed the man died, he said it could date to the 1880s or earlier. Police eventually came upon an identity that may have been the man in the cylinder. This person's name was T.C. Williams. He ran a paint and brush manufacturer in Liverpool, but in March of 1884, he declared bankruptcy. The theory that police came up with was that TC left his family after their financial ruin and was sleeping in that cylinder. At some point, that cylinder was sealed and he died of asphyxiation. Apparently, TC's wife was buried somewhere in Liverpool, but there are no records of TC himself ever being buried. For now, it seems that TC is the most likely identity for the man in the cylinder, but this is not yet confirmed. An interesting photo from Canada, possibly taken in 1894, could be the oldest known image of Bigfoot. The photo, which shows signs of age, including a crease in the upper part, depicts a lying Sasquatch in the snow with its arms outstretched, showing its hairy hands. While the creature's face is covered by fur, some details can be seen. Snowshoes are visible at the left edge of the image, and what appears to be a fence and a building can be seen on the right side, partially hidden by the crease. The Sasquatch's feet are cropped out of the frame on the right side. The authenticity of the photo is still being debated with some questioning its truthfulness and others supporting its legitimacy. The photo was taken by trappers in the wilderness of Western Canada and on the back of it there is the following text. Year 1894, Yalakom River around Liliot, BC Forestry, Hudson Bay Company. Allegedly, this photo was confiscated by Hudson Bay and one of the trappers actually stole it back. This led some to believe that Hudson Bay was trying to conduct some sort of cover-up in regards to Bigfoot. Ireland's Vanishing Triangle is a label referring to a number of different disappearances involving Irish women from the mid to late 1990s. The reason these cases were grouped together is due to the commonalities that they all seem to share. One such detail is that all of the women disappeared in the same general location. This area came to be known as Ireland's Vanishing Triangle. The victims' ages ranged from the late teens to 40 years, and if these were indeed all connected, then whoever was responsible made absolutely sure that they left no evidence behind. The women's names are Annie McCarrick, 26, Ava Brennan, 39, Imelda Keenan, 22, Josephine Dollard, 21, Sierra Breen, 17, Fiona Pender, 25, Fiona Sanat, 19, and Deirdre Jacob, 18. 
This list is considered unofficial, so depending on who is speaking on this topic, there may be more or less names included. Annie McCarrick went missing on March 26, 1993 and was living in Sandy Mount. The last credible sighting of her was when she visited a post office in Enniscary, but there is also a rumored sighting of her at a pub called Johnny Fox's Pub in Glen Colon. The doorman of the business said that Annie was seen with an unknown man. What happened inside of the pub is unknown. Annie planned on having dinner at her apartment the next day with one of her friends, but when they arrived at Annie's apartment, no one answered the door. Her friends began to worry and contacted police. She was declared missing and the investigation went on for half a year with no results. Ava Brennan disappeared on July 25th, 1993 and she was known to have been depressed prior to her disappearance. The last time she was seen was when she had lunch at her parents' home. After leaving, she didn't visit or contact her parents for two whole days. This was enough to warrant a visit from her father, but when he arrived at Ava's, no one came to the door. Ava's jacket was found at a nearby pub, but nobody was able to give any information regarding her when she visited. Rumors began to spread that perhaps Ava was a victim of a man named Michael Bambrick who killed two other women. Imelda Keenan went missing on January 3rd, 1994. She was renting an apartment with her boyfriend Mark Wall and she also attended the Central Technical Institute in Waterford. One day, she left her apartment at 1.30pm and was last seen crossing the road near a doctor's office. The secretary of the office recalled seeing Imelda walking by. As for Josephine, she disappeared on November 9th, 1995. Josephine, also commonly referred to as Jojo, had recently quit a beauty therapy course after realizing that it really hindered her ability to work and go to college. On the day that Jojo went missing, she was preparing to get on a bus back home. However, she missed her ride and had to take a different bus. It is believed that she hitchhiked her way to the location of that second bus. She had several different rides that ended up placing her in Moon, where she was last seen at a payphone calling one of her friends named Mary. Although there was another unconfirmed sighting of Jojo riding in another man's car after leaving Moon, the driver was never identified and Jojo's whereabouts are still a mystery. Sierra Breen is the youngest one on this list. She went missing on February 13th, 1997 and was last seen by her mother Bernadette. Bernadette woke up at 2am in order to use the restroom. When she stepped outside of her room, she noticed that Sierra was missing. And the way the sources were worded, it sounded as though Sierra had voluntarily left the house. She made sure to leave a crack in the window so that she could climb back in. But even if she did leave of her own free will, she never returned home that night. It wasn't until 2014 where a big revelation came for the case. It took nearly two decades for a couple of witnesses to come forward and report their sightings of Sierra on the night she went missing. Then in 2015, with this new info, a 50-year-old man was arrested, but he was later released and never charged for Sierra's disappearance. Fiona Pender disappeared on August 23, 1996 and was last seen by her boyfriend. Fiona was seven months pregnant when she went missing. In 2008, there was a small wooden cross with her name etched onto it. It was discovered on Sleeve Boom Way, which led investigators to believe that she may have been buried in the Sleeve Boom Mountains. Deirdre Jacob disappeared on July 28, 1998 and was living in Twickenham, London at the time. She was studying at St. Mary's University but decided to go back home for the summer. She got off of a bus to walk the rest of the way back and she was just yards away before disappearing. Several witnesses came forward to report that they saw Deirdre right in front of her house but none of them knew why she never made it in. The final disappearance that is often associated with the vanishing circle is that of Fiona Sanat. She went missing on February 8th, 1998, and she was another victim that visited a pub before disappearing. Fiona met up with her ex-boyfriend and father of her child, Sean Carroll. Sean stated that he walked Fiona home after she started complaining about some pains in her upper body and arms. The next morning, Fiona said she was still in pain, so she wanted to see her physician. But at some point on this trip to the doctors, she went missing. 
Now, Fiona did not have a car, so there were rumors that she may have hitchhiked her way to the doctor's office. When investigators looked into Fiona's home, they noticed that it was essentially devoid of all of her belongings. One detective was quoted saying, there was a complete absence of clothing and other personal items, indicating that a teenage girl and her 11-month-old daughter were actually living there. Neighbors later informed police that they saw several suspicious-looking black bags in front of the house. These same black bags were later found found by a local farmer in his fields. Inside were documents and belongings of Fiona's. However, when the farmer found these bags, he had not yet heard of the news that Fiona had gone missing. So he thought it was just somebody dumping their trash on his farm, which was a fairly common occurrence. The farmer burned the bags as a result. In September of 2008, a memorial plaque that was cemented into a wall was stolen. The person responsible was never identified. There was a man that was suspected of possibly being the one responsible for all of these disappearances named Larry Murphy. Larry was a convicted rapist who lived near Annie, Jojo, and Deirdre when they went missing. But there has never been any evidence obtained to convict Larry. It is commonly believed that most, if not all, of these disappearances were the work of a serial killer. Whether they were working solo or with a partner is up for debate. The Coca-Cola murders refers to a series of poisonings in 1977 where at least three people consumed cyanide-laced Coca-Cola. And yes, this is a different case from the Paraquat murders. In fact, this takes place eight years before that. These mysterious deaths occurred in Tokyo and Osaka between January and mid-February 1977. Despite an extensive investigation, the police were never able to identify the culprit, and the statute of limitations for the cases expired in 1992. The first case was on January 3rd, 1977. A male high school student was walking home from his part-time job when he came across a sealed bottle of coke left on top of a public payphone near Shinagawa Station. He took the bottle with him and drank it at around 1am the following morning. Almost immediately, he noticed the drink tasted strange and quickly spit it out and tried to rinse his mouth with water. Unfortunately, he collapsed and was rushed to the hospital where doctors attempted to save him by pumping his stomach. However, their efforts were in vain and the student died shortly thereafter. The cause of death was determined to be cyanide poisoning. Just 600 meters north of where the student had picked up the contaminated coke bottle, the body of a 46-year-old man was discovered at 8.15 a.m. on the same morning. The man was pronounced dead at the hospital and the cause of death was also determined to be cyanide poisoning. A can of coke was found near his body, which tested positive for the deadly substance. A month after the two previous poisonings on February 13, 1977, at 6.20 a.m., a 39-year-old man found an unopened can of coke left on a public payphone at a store where he had stopped by to buy cigarettes. Unaware of the danger, he drank the beverage and immediately fell unconscious. The coke was later found to contain cyanide, the same deadly poison used in the previous cases. The man was rushed to the hospital and survived, but the incident that left him deeply traumatized. Unable to cope with the psychological impact of being targeted in this malicious act, he tragically took his own life shortly after telling his family, I'm too ashamed to face the world after falling victim despite knowing what happened earlier in Tokyo. There are a number of other cases that are sometimes mentioned alongside these three, however, those aren't 100% confirmed to be related. Many people like to believe that whoever was responsible for these poisonings was also responsible for the Paraquat murders and had a role in the group known as the Monster with 21 Faces. The Loveland Frog is a humanoid creature with frog-like features and has captivated Ohio folklore since the 1950s. Standing around 4 feet tall with green, leathery skin, this creature has been sighted near the Little Miami River. While its existence has yet to be proven, the Loveland Frog continues to fascinate. In 1955, a businessman in Loveland, Ohio reported a bizarre encounter that ignited the legend of the Loveland Frog. He claimed to have seen three or four frog-like creatures, each about three feet tall, crouching under a bridge. 
They had a striking appearance with wrinkled heads instead of hair, uneven chests, and wide mouths without lips. One of the creatures was said to be holding a device that emitted sparks. The encounter left behind a lingering scent of alfalfa and almonds. This was the first ever reported sighting of the Loveland Frog. Nicole Louise Morin, born on April 1st, 1977, was the only child of Art and Jeanette Morin. At the time of her disappearance, she lived with her mother on the 20th floor of an apartment building in Toronto. Nicole was described as a cheerful and playful child who often engaged in imaginative games with her friends. On July 30th, 1985, around 11 in the morning, Nicole left her apartment to meet with a friend in the building's lobby, where the two intended to go swimming at the pool located at the back of the complex. Before leaving, she communicated with her friend through the intercom, assuring them she would be right down. However, there is some uncertainty about whether Nicole was last seen entering the elevator or walking down the hallway. Sadly, Nicole disappeared and was never seen again. Fifteen minutes after Nicole left her apartment, her friend buzzed the intercom to ask where she was. Jeanette, who ran a small childcare business from home, said Nicole had already left and might be playing with other kids at the back of the building. Unfortunately, it took Jeanette several hours to realize Nicole was missing, and she called the police around 3 p.m. The police quickly started searching the apartment building and the nearby area. While going door to door in the complex with 429 units, the police talked to a woman who claimed she saw Nicole waiting for or entering the elevator. However, after this point, no one knew where Nicole went. The police set up roadblocks in nearby neighborhoods and some police vehicles announced over speakers asking the city to keep an eye out for Nicole. The local Crime Stoppers group helped make and distribute flyers around Toronto. To this day, there's still a five-figure reward offered. Police also questioned a number of local sex offenders in the area, but none of them appeared to be involved. Nicole's family and family friends were ruled out as well. It felt like the entire city of Toronto was on the lookout for Nicole. However, a peculiar detail emerged after her disappearance, a sentence in Nicole's diary that read, I'm going to disappear. Given Nicole's age of 8 and her vivid imagination, the police were unsure how to interpret it. Kids at that age often make up stories and perhaps Nicole had read something in a book or seen it on TV that influenced her thoughts organized a search for Nicole's remains using cadaver dogs in her neighborhood once again. According to a local news article, Thursday marked the first time PBMH members searched for Morin's body. The focus shifted to a park based on a potential eyewitness, a woman who claimed two years ago to have seen Morin on the morning she disappeared with a man she knew. There is a possibility that the police overlooked someone Nicole knew at the time of her disappearance or her case might be connected to others. If she is still alive today, Nicole would be in her 40s. On June 1st, 1982, Joseph and Peggy Asher made their new home at the Sands Motel in Lake Wales, Florida. Having purchased the motel the previous fall, they had now assumed full control of its operations and moved into the apartment situated behind the main motel lobby. The motel had a history dating back to at least the 1950s, located just about a quarter of a mile south of State Road 60 with an attached restaurant. The Ashers appreciated the tranquility of Lake Wales in contrast to their previous residence in Sarasota. However, their time in the community would take a tragic turn. On the evening of August 10th, 1982, the Ashers rented out nine rooms, expecting another routine night at the motel. However, between 9 p.m. and midnight, an intruder armed with a small caliber handgun entered the living area behind the hotel lobby. Astonishingly, without signs of forced entry or a struggle, the assailant shot Joseph twice in the head and Peggy once at close range. The motive seemed to involve robbery. $100 was stolen from a nearby cash box. Strangely, Joseph's money in his pocket and Peggy's jewelry were left untouched. During this disturbing incident, Joseph's mother, who happened to be visiting, heard a commotion from the bedroom. Due to her hearing impairment, she couldn't discern details or possible conversations. Confused and frightened, she locked herself in the bathroom for at least an hour. Driama Barnett co-owned the restaurant nearby with her husband Bruce and they provided an account of the incident to reporters. 
According to her, Joseph Asher's mother locked herself in the bathroom for an hour before emerging and knocking on motel room doors, desperately seeking help. Surprisingly, the police did not arrive until 12.58 p.m. the following day. An Ohio man staying at the motel had gone to get ice around 11.15. And that's when he noticed Joseph's feet sticking out. At first, he assumed that he had simply fallen asleep there. But after he realized that this was a body of a deceased man, he called police immediately. Investigators believe that the murders happened between 10 p.m. and midnight. To date, only one man has ever been considered a suspect, and his name has never been revealed. Deputies claimed he had been stopped for an undisclosed reason and released a few hours before the killings. He passed a polygraph test during questioning, was released, and as far as available information suggests, no other suspects have emerged. In 1980, a woman pretending to be a social worker abducted an infant named David Ezel Blockett. A photo has been age progressed to show what he might look like at 39 years of age. David went missing from his home on December 11th, 1980. On that fateful day, a woman named Mary Kelly, posing as a social worker, visited his home. She informed David's mother, Vanessa, about a sponsored event for children at Riverside Regional Medical Center. After discussing it, Vanessa agreed to let Mary take both David and his two-year-old brother, Frederick, to the gathering. Unfortunately, David never returned home. Later that day, Frederick was discovered wandering near Old Mallory Road in Hampton. Someone had placed a piece of paper with his name and address in his pocket. Reflecting on the incident as an adult, Frederick remembered being taken in a car driven by an unidentified man. In a subsequent development, a woman believed to be Mary called Vanessa inquiring about the kind of formula David took. Unfortunately, the call ended before it could be traced. It became evident that the Department of Social Services did not employ anyone named Mary, and there was no scheduled event at Riverside Regional Medical Center. Interestingly, a different mother had a similar encounter with a woman posing as a social worker a few days earlier, but she refused to let her take her baby. It is speculated that Mary may have found David through a local newspaper containing recent birth announcements. Mary Kelly was an African-American woman believed to be between 32 and 35 years old. She had a heavy build, large hips, and a medium complexion. She was about 5 foot 4 to 5 foot 8 inches tall and weighed around 145 to 155 pounds. A composite sketch of her has been created. In 2011, David's would-be nephews were abducted. They were later found alive and the woman who took them was determined to have been mentally ill. She was not known to the family before kidnapping the young boys. Authorities hope DNA evidence can be used to identify David's abductor. Several days after David's disappearance, a diaper bag and a leather folder were found near a parkway in Yorktown, Virginia. These items were believed to belong to Mary Kelly and contained some of David's shoes and his blanket. On April 18th, 1924, the day started like any other at Chicago's engine company 107. However, one firefighter, Francis Levy, seemed a little off. He wasn't his usual self. No greetings, no smiles, just quietly focusing on chores around the firehouse. Later, he shared a strange feeling with his colleagues, a sense that he was going to die. However, they just shrugged it off, thinking it was just a passing remark. Around 7 p.m., a fire call came in for Curran Hall, a few blocks away. Everyone, including Levy, rushed to the scene. Engine number 5 and engine 103 were responsible for battling the flames, while on the outside, the crew from truck number 12 worked on ladders. The four-story building showed some weird anomalies. Some witnesses reported that the fires went downstairs almost like a liquid that was flowing and when it had gotten to the boxes on the stairwell, they exploded. Those fighting inside had to take turns running to the windows to breathe fresh air because at the time, they had no breathing apparatuses. 30 minutes of the fire had damaged the structure of the building too far. First, the roof collapsed, which pushed out the outer walls of the structure, causing the whole building to collapse. Those within the building had been hurt or lost their life. Within half an hour, all rescue agencies in Chicago were called in to respond. Rescuing those trapped under the building became challenging as the collapse knocked out power lines, leaving the search and rescue efforts in the dark. 
The tragic incident resulted in 20 firefighters being injured and 8 firefighters who lost their lives. One additional firefighter succumbed to his injuries 8 days later. A civilian named William Bear also tragically lost his life while attempting to help rescue trapped firefighters. Funerals for the fallen took place on the 21st, 22nd, and 23rd, with 125 firefighters officially detailed to serve as honorary escorts for the services. An investigation later revealed that the fire was intentionally set, which made it an act of arson. The fire's rapid spread, resembling flowing liquid, was attributed to the use of wood alcohol spread around the building and ignited. The individuals responsible for starting the fire were the owners of a sporting goods and novelty shop on the second floor. They were convicted of arson and murder. The tragedy unfolded because the owners sought to claim $32,000 from their insurance company. The following day, the other firefighters at the station noticed an odd stain on the half-cleaned window that Levy had been working on. In the middle of the stain was a handprint, and despite their efforts to clean it, the handprint stubbornly remained. They tried scrubbing, scraping with razors, and using various cleaning chemicals and even hired professionals, but nothing could erase the handprint. Replacing the window outright was suggested, but many firefighters declined this idea. They felt as though the window had some sort of paranormal energy with it, and they didn't want to tamper with it. Then on April 18th, 1944, two decades after Levy and his comrades lost their lives, a paper boy inadvertently threw a newspaper, shattering the window and finally obliterating the mysterious handprint. Paula Weldon was born in 1928 and was the eldest among four daughters of a wealthy and renowned industrial engineer. While attending college, she contemplated switching her major to botany. Feeling a lack of connection with her peers, Paula sought to make her friends through various hiking groups. One Sunday afternoon, after finishing her work shift, she decided to hike part of the long trail. Despite attempting to invite friends who were unavailable, she dressed for the afternoon weather and set out with no more than the expectation of being away for a few hours. During her trek, a group of hikers encountered her and answered some of her questions about the trail. After this interaction, she continued north and vanished. The following morning, her classmate informed school authorities, initiating a search on campus. It took a couple of days before investigators realized that she went hiking. They did an extensive search covering 10 miles of the trail and off routes. In the vicinity where Paula disappeared between 1945 and 1950, at least four other puzzling disappearances were reported. The public eventually named this location the Bennington Triangle. A variety of theories mentioned that Paula, who was reportedly in unusually high spirits, might have chosen to run away and start a new life. Some speculated she could have been meeting a secret lover and went off with him. Or perhaps she suffered an injury and experienced amnesia. On a darker note, theories suggested Paula might have been depressed and possibly committed suicide. Or she could have been the victim of kidnapping or murder. During the investigation, it was found that one of the last people to see Paula alive was a man residing along Harbor Road. He had a heated argument with his girlfriend when Paula walked by. It's believed that he either retired to his shack for the evening or drove his truck up the trail where Paula was headed. He misled the police on multiple occasions and became a person of interest in 1946 and again in 1952 when the case was revisited. Allegedly, he informed at least two individuals that he knew the location within a hundred feet where Paula was buried, but he later dismissed this. With no evidence of a committed crime, no discovery of a body, and no identification of forensic clues, this investigation quickly reached a dead end. Between 1917 and 1928, a terrifying illness swept across the globe. The victims, while alive and conscious, were trapped inside of their bodies. The illness was known as encephalitis lethargica or sleeping sickness. It first emerged in Europe before spreading like wildfire. It had an approximate mortality rate of 50%. Among the survivors, nearly half were left utterly paralyzed. Some were able to retain limited ability to speak, move their eyes, or even laugh, but nevertheless, they were essentially living statues. The exact cause of EL remains a mystery. One theory suggests that it's triggered by a mutated strain of Streptococcus bacteria commonly associated with sore throats. This mutated strain may have provoked an immune system attack on the brain, leading to the devastating symptoms of EL. 
Jack Frost was a 32-year-old resident of Dunmore, Pennsylvania who passed away in June 2011. His cause of death was heart arrhythmia. Despite his overall good health, his sudden death left his loved ones shocked and in deep sorrow. As his friends and family eventually came to terms with the loss of Jack and returned to their normal lives, something strange began to happen. Multiple people began to receive messages from Jack's inactive email account in the months that followed. Jack's best friend, Tim Hart, was the first one to report on this. It happened in November 2011. Tim was just chilling on his couch using his laptop when out of nowhere a new email from someone named Jack Frost popped up. Tim opened it and it read, Subject line, I'm watching. Body, did you hear me? I'm at your house. Clean your effing attic. Freaked out, Hart went all over his home thinking someone might be pranking him, but he was the only one there. What made it extra creepy was that the message seemed to refer to a private chat he had with Frost a few days before he passed away. They were in Hart's messy attic and Frost was joking about the clutter. The next email was sent to Jimmy McGraw who was Jack's cousin. It said, subject line, hey Jim, body, how you doing? I knew you were gonna break your ankle, try to warn you, gotta be careful, tell rock for me, great song, huh? You're welcome. Couldn't get through to him, his email didn't work. Nobody really knew what the email's last part meant, but here's the spooky bit. McGraw had busted his ankle two weeks before getting this email, which was months after Frost passed away. Frost's family and friends tried to figure out if there was some logical reason for this, but they ended up closing the case since they couldn't figure anything out. The most obvious theory was that this was all a sick prank. Someone may have gained access to Jack's account. A lot of people who support this theory like to point out something that Jack's mother said in an interview. I saw they made some people happy, they upset some people, but I see it as people were still talking about him. Some seem to think that Jack's mother or someone else chose to fire off these emails in order to revive some attention around Jack. It's very possible that Jack's mother isn't responsible, but the culprit is most likely someone who is very close to Jack's circle. Long ago, a man named John Leary worked as a police officer in Rapid City, South Dakota. One day, he was in a mining accident that took both his arms and one eye. People began to call him Hooky Jack because of the hooks that replaced his arms. Despite his disability, Hooky Jack continued to work as a police officer for over four decades. He was a brave and respected officer. However, he had very bad luck. In 1926, he was killed in a car accident. And ever since, there are rumors saying that he haunts a certain downtown building that is three stories tall. Apparently, at one point, he used to work in this building as a night watchman. His presence was so famous that at one point the restaurant inside of the building named itself Hooky Jack's. Various employees have reported seeing strange things and some even refuse to go to the third floor where Hooky Jack is said to live. Whether or not Hooky Jack's ghost is real, his story is a reminder of a brave man who had a lot of bad luck. Customers and staff claim to witness billiard balls moving autonomously and hear footsteps from the floor above. Furniture appears to shift without explanation and employees working alone at night occasionally report hearing voices. Despite the lack of actual evidence, there are many people who are really creeped out by the possible haunting of Hooky Jack's ghost. If you're like the millions of people around the world that has caffeine in their daily life, check out partner of the channel, Gamersups. They have a wide array of amazing flavors and each serving is less than 40 cents with my code DLAM, which gives you 10% off your order. Some of my personal favorites are Titty Milk and Guacamole Gamer Fart. It also supports the channel, so if you're interested, check out the first link in the description. Now back to the video. Back in 1986, there was a 10-year-old boy named Juan Pedro Martinez. He had dark hair and brown eyes, was about 5 foot 4 inches tall, and weighed around 140 pounds. His parents were named Andres Martinez and Carmen Gomez. Juan Pedro sometimes went on short trips with his dad. Juan was interested in a place called the Basque region in Spain because of something he learned in school. His father was well aware of this interest, so he told him if he did well in school, they could go there together. Juan took these words seriously and he worked extremely hard. He did eventually obtain good grades and then went on an exciting adventure to Spain with his dad. On June 25th, 1986, Andres had a job to deliver 20,000 liters of sulfuric 
acid from Cartagena to Bilbao in the Basque region. The whole family, including Carmen and Juan Pedro, got into the truck all set for the long journey. It was going to be more than 8 hours of driving, covering over 500 miles through steep, narrow mountain passes. When they reached the Somo Sierra mountain pass, something didn't seem right. We may never fully understand what happened inside the truck that day, and many details remain unclear. It's said that Andres was driving in what was described as a strange way. This caused one car to veer off the road, knocking the mirror off another. Even though the roads in the Soma Sierra mountain pass are steep and have sharp turns with cliffs, the truck was going at an exceedingly fast speed, reaching around 90 miles per hour. At one point, while attempting to take a curve too quickly, the truck tipped over. The front part of the truck collapsed when it crashed, causing Andres and Carmen to lose their lives instantly. Sulfuric acid started spilling, leading to small explosions. To prevent the acid from reaching nearby water, large amounts of lime were used to absorb it. Initially, investigators thought the truck's brakes had failed, causing the accident. But the brakes were fine, and it seemed as though this was just a terrible motor accident. But this doesn't explain why Andres was driving so recklessly in the unfavorable conditions of the roads. Much of the information regarding the accident has been kept private, but a few details have become public over time. Another peculiarity alongside Andres' reckless driving was the absence of Juan. Despite extensive searches in the area, there were no clues or signs of where Juan went. Missing posters for him were put up everywhere just in case he had somehow wandered away from the crash site. It didn't take long for a number of tips to be called in. People who claimed to have witnessed the accident or arrived at the scene reported seeing a white Nissan Vanette stop near the crash truck afterward. The driver, a tall man with a mustache, was accompanied by a woman. Both individuals were described as very tall and having a Nordic looking appearance. Onlookers said they approached the damaged truck, took a small package, and then left. It's crucial to note that this information is not confirmed and the accounts may have been exaggerated over time as the story spread online. Moreover, the tachometer, which measures a vehicle's engine revolutions per minute, was found intact on the truck. This device revealed that the truck made 12 unexplained stops during its journey. These were brief stops that didn't align with regular traffic patterns, with the shortest stop lasting only one second. Currently, there's no explanation for these stops, but some speculate that Andres might have been trying to avoid or signal another vehicle on the road, possibly the white Nissan seen at the accident. However, these theories are purely speculative and lack any solid basis. After the accident, there were numerous reports of a boy resembling Juan. The first sighting occurred in Bilbao, which was the intended destination of the family. Most of these sightings lacked verification, and the details provided often didn't link them conclusively to Juan. However, one frequently mentioned sighting had a remarkable resemblance to him. In May of 1987, a blind woman entered a driving school in Madrid, Spain. The owner claimed she was of Iranian descent and sought directions to the U.S. Embassy. A boy around 10 years old appeared to be guiding the woman and spoke Spanish with a local accent. When the school owner inquired more about the boy, the woman abruptly changed the subject. The owner found the boy to be somewhat disoriented and later identified a photo of Juan Pedro as the boy he saw that day. Theories revolving around this case are abundant, one of which suggests that Juan lost his life in the crash with his parents, but his body simply dissolved in the acid leaking from the tanker behind his seat. Now, this particular theory was later debunked, but nevertheless, it is frequently brought up when discussing this case. It's entirely possible for sulfuric acid to dissolve a body, however, it would have taken several days to do so. The crash occurred in front of witnesses, which resulted in the truck being searched immediately. This was not nearly enough time for the acid to work. Other theories suggest that Juan was kidnapped by traffickers and ultimately killed. Supposedly, traces of illegal substances were found in the acid. This paired with the reported sightings of a man and woman carrying some sort of package from the vehicle before fleeing has led to investigators believing that Andres was tied to some sort of illegal substance business. 
A different theory proposes the idea that Juan sustained head trauma and wandered away from the crash after losing some of his memory. According to investigators, there weren't any signs within the vehicle that signified Juan was injured, but since the accident was such a mess, investigators haven't ruled out the possibility that Juan did sustain a head injury. To this day, the fate and whereabouts of Juan are unknown. It was a stormy night on November 23rd, 1953 when an Air Force jet vanished over Lake Superior. U.S. Air Defense Command detected an unidentified object on radar in restricted airspace near the U.S.-Canadian border. The F-89C Scorpion jet from Truax Air Force Base went to investigate. The jet was piloted by First Lieutenant Felix Moncla with Second Lieutenant Robert Wilson observing the radar. Unfortunately, neither man returned from the mission, leading to what Donald Kehoe, a former Marine Corps naval aviator and UFO researcher, called one of the strangest cases on on record. While in the air, Lieutenant Wilson struggled to track the mysterious object that kept changing its course. With ground control guiding them via radio, the Scorpion jet chased the object, flying at 500 miles per hour for 30 minutes, gradually closing the gap. On the ground, the radar operator directed the jet's descent from 25,000 to 7,000 feet, observing the blips on the radar screen as the chase continued. The jet caught up to the unknown object about 70 miles off Keweenaw Point in Upper Michigan, at an altitude of 8,000 feet, approximately 160 miles northwest of Sioux Locks. At this point, the two radar blips merged into one as Donald Kehoe would later describe as locked together. Then, according to an official accident report, the radar return from the F-89 simply disappeared from the GCI station's radar scope. Suddenly, the initial radar signal showing the unidentified object also changed direction and disappeared. The United States Air Force, U.S. Coast Guard, and Canadian Air Force conducted a thorough search and rescue operation. Unfortunately, no wreckage or trace of the pilots was ever discovered. The Air Force initially reported the disappearance to the Associated Press, stating that the vanished jet was quote-unquote followed by radar until it merged with an object 70 miles off Keweenaw Point in Upper Michigan. The news appeared in the Chicago Tribune with the headline, Jet to Aboard Vanishes Over Lake Superior. But later down the line, the Air Force changed its story, retracing the initial statement. According to the new version, the ground control radar operator misread the scope. The F-89 completed the mission by identifying the UFO as a Dakota, a Royal Canadian Air Force C-47 aircraft, which was flying off course. Lieutenant Moncla, possibly affected by vertigo, supposedly crashed into the lake on the way back. Canadian officials disputed this account, stating no flights occurred in the area that night. According to Donald Kehoe, who revisited the Kinross incident in his 1973 book, Aliens from Space, two different Air Force representatives provided contradictory explanations to Lieutenant Moncla's widow. In one version, the pilot crashed into the lake while flying too low, while in the other, the jet exploded at a high altitude. The Project Blue Book file, the Air Force's UFO investigation team, said the jet did its job well and claimed the crash was an accident, likely caused by vertigo. They said strange radar behavior was due to odd atmospheric conditions and not finding the wreckage in the deep water was understandable. But the National Investigations Committee on Aerial Phenomena found that any mention of the mission was removed from official records. The Aerospace Technical Intelligence Center said there was no record in Air Force files of a sighting at Kinross AFB on November 23, 1953, and no similar case. With no satisfying official explanation, groups not affiliated with the military called civilian saucer groups made their own theories. Some thought the jet hit a protective beam like a quote-unquote concrete wall. Others guessed that the jet may have been taken aboard the UFO. In 1968, local newspapers reported finding military jet fragments near Lake Superior, but this discovery was never confirmed. In 2006, a person named Adam Jimenez, who said he represented the Great Lakes Dive Company, told UFO bloggers and the UFO community that they found an airplane wreck and a metallic object resembling part of a flying saucer in the area. However, UFO researchers found issues in Jimenez's story and discovered that the Great Lakes Dive Company was not actually real. Eventually, Adam Jimenez disappeared without a trace. 
You might be familiar with the Dyatlov Pass tragedy where nine experienced hikers died unexpectedly in the Russian Ural Mountains. While that case is well known and doesn't need repeating, there's another semi-less famous but eerily similar incident. In southern Siberia's Buryatia region near Lake Baikal lies the Kamar Daban mountain range. This area also witnessed a number of mysterious hiker deaths. Ludmila Korovina, aged 41, was an expert at surviving in the wild and a hiking teacher who was well respected by her colleagues and students. Despite being tough on her students, they thought that she was a great teacher who boosted their confidence and taught them important hiking skills. In the summer of 1993, Ludmila and six of her students planned to hike in the Kamar Daban mountain range, a popular and widely considered safe spot for summer hikes. Everyone was excited about the trip given Ludmila's knowledge of the area and close relationship with her students. The first person among the six and the one closest to Ludmila was Alexander Creason, a 23 year old who was like a son to her since she had known him for most of his life. The other five students were Tamor Bapanov, 15, Victoria Zalasova, 16, Valentina Yudachenko, 17, Tatiana Filipenko, 24, and Denis Fochkin, 19. On August 2nd, 1993, the seven arrived at Murino Village to start their hike over the Alps, excited about the clear weather forecast. Ludmila's daughter Natalia led one of the three trekking groups in the area. They planned to meet on August 5th when their routes crossed. The six students were eager to show their hiking abilities after months of preparation, and their close bond had developed during this time as well. The first two days of the hike went better than expected. The group worked hard and climbed the retranslator summit quickly. However, on August 4th, when they began to descend, the weather forecast proved wrong, and they encountered heavy rain. The hikers' progress slowed down because of the added weight from their wet supplies. Despite having nearby trees for cover, Ludmila quickly decided to set up camp in an open area due to the exhaustion of the other hikers. That night, they couldn't start a fire, but everyone remained in good spirits. The next morning, they successfully built a campfire, had breakfast together, and set out for the day. They planned to meet Natalia and hoped to surprise the other group, considering how quickly they had climbed the mountain the day before. Later that day, Natalia and her group reached the planned meeting spot, but Ludmila, Natalia's mother, did not show up. Natalia, not too worried, assumed bad weather might have delayed her mother, so the group continued their hike. Unfortunately, something more serious had happened that caused a delay for the hikers. On August 10th, kayakers on the river at the base of the Kamar Daban Mountains noticed something in the trees as they paddled downstream. A lone girl stood there looking at them. Some versions suggest that she was covered in dried blood when the kayakers approached. As they cautiously neared her, the girl began crying, trying to share her story with them. She later identified herself as Valentina Yudachenko. She stated that she had been hiking with six others. Frightened, the kayakers took Valentina to the local police department and filed a report. It took her several days to narrate the story of what happened to the other six, and even then, it was confusing and horrifying. Valentina explained that after having breakfast that morning, the group descended the mountain. However, a short while later, Alexander, who was also referred to as Sacha, who was at the back of the group, began screaming. When everyone turned around to see Sacha, he was frothing at the mouth and bleeding from his eyes and ears. He collapsed, shaking on the ground before becoming completely still. Ludmila rushed over to him, urging the others to continue. Desperate to wake Sacha up, Ludmila was in utter distress. The rest of the group hadn't gone far before hearing her cries. They found her exhibiting the same symptoms as Sacha and hurried to assist. Ludmila was bleeding from her eyes and nose, foaming at the mouth, and shaking violently before falling onto Sacha. Tatiana, the first to reach Ludmila, also fainted fainted, clutching her throat as if struggling to breathe. She cautiously moved to a nearby rock where she repeatedly banged her head until she became limp. Dennis hid behind a rock while Tamura and Victoria ran away. Seeing three friends seemingly die within minutes, Valentina was left frozen. Victoria and Tamura collapsed and died while running, exhibiting the same symptoms as the others. Valentina and Dennis, realizing they were the only survivors, sprinted away. However, Dennis soon collapsed violently as well. In a panic, Valentina left him behind, taking only a tent and the clothes on her back. 
Valentina hurried down the mountain, ensuring she was far away. She set up tent for the night under sufficient tree cover and fell asleep. When she woke up and realized that she was still alive, Valentina knew she needed resources to survive in the woods alone. The problem was, to get these resources, she had to go back to where her friends had died. Valentina climbed back up the mountain, retracing her steps because she felt she had no other choice. When she reached the spot, she found that none of her friends had moved from where they had fallen. Valentina quickly collected the supplies she needed from their bodies, ensuring they were all deceased, and then headed towards the power lines. For four days, she followed the power lines down the mountain, hoping someone would find her before she came across a river. On the fourth day, the kayakers found and rescued her. Even though the police received a report, no formal search took place until August 24th. It took two days for helicopters to find the remains because Valentina hadn't shared her version of what happened yet. According to an autopsy report, all of them except Ludmila, who had a heart attack, were determined to have died from hypothermia. They were all found with bruised lungs, but the cause of death was identified as a protein shortage due to starvation and extreme hypothermia. Ultimately, the deaths were deemed accidental. This decision seems strange in light of Valentina's testimony and is crucial to many arguments made in this case. People have come up with many ideas to explain what happened in this mysterious incident, which is understandable considering how much investigation has been done. These explanations, like those for any surprising events, go from scientific reasons to ideas about extraterrestrial life and the supernatural. Some think the hikers accidentally stumbled into a Russian military experiment in the mountains and got killed, with the police covering it up. But there are issues with this theory. The open visibility of the hiker spot and Valentina's survival. In the summer, many tour groups visit the Kamardaban Mountains, making a secret military experiment during the tourist season unlikely. The area where the hikers died was open and visible, not fitting for a top secret operation. Valentina's survival is also puzzling. And why were only the others killed? Some researchers believe Valentina's symptoms align with the effects of chemical weapons, especially nerve agents, as convulsions and mouth foaming are indicators of a potent nerve toxin. The autopsy findings, including lung bruising, are consistent with death caused by nerve gas, which can also lead to respiratory difficulty. Ludmila's cause of death, cardiac arrest, fits with nerve agents as well. If they were exposed to a nerve toxin, the other hikers might have died from hypothermia as they could have become unconscious or fallen into a coma before succumbing to the cold. Another theory suggests that the rainwater was contaminated. This theory suggests that the hikers might have ingested poisons from rainborne toxins in their water, possibly from Lake Baikal's toxic waste disposal. Even a water-soluble nerve agent could have contaminated it. Valentina's survival might be attributed to consuming less contaminated water. The hikers could have succumbed to the toxin, causing hypothermia before its full effect. The toxin might not show up in regular toxicology tests. However, a flaw in this theory is that each death seems isolated. It's improbable that only one group would be affected by severely contaminated water if the site was popular among many travelers. Unfortunately, this case is still shrouded in immense mystery, and it's tough to believe that we will ever receive a concise explanation in the future. Every year on May 1st, there are these strange cryptic ads in the Daily Wildcat newspaper. People aren't sure where these ads come from or why they're there. These strange ads in the University of Arizona student newspaper have garnered so much attention that it's earned the name The Mayday Mystery. These ads have been showing up every May 1st since at least 1981. They include confusing things like maps, math problems, pictures, and words, along with a drawing of a smirking man. Included with these ads is the mention of a mysterious group known as The Orphanage. Who or what they are is anybody's guess. There is an entire website dedicated to documenting the mystery if you would like to take a look at the ads for yourself. Simply search Made a Mystery into Google and it should pop up. In the mid-1990s, a student named Brian Hance encountered this mystery and got curious and wanted to solve it. Since then, people like Kate Vesely have tried to figure out the messages, but the true reason for the ads is still unknown. 
Many online platforms discussed the mystery and it eventually led to a man named Robert Hungerford who is often linked to the orphanage group. By 1997, Brian Hance, a junior at this point and the paper's webmaster, dug deeper into the mystery. He found ads dating back to 1981. With the rise of the internet, the Mayday mystery continued to intrigue many more people. Enthusiasts worldwide tried solving it through podcasts, videos, and social media. Now back to Kate Vesely. Unlike her friends who ignored the ads in the paper, she checked MaydayMystery.org and came back to campus every May 1st for the paper. Even after finishing school in 2002, her love for history made her dig deeper into the mysterious ads. Kate spent a lot of time on the site looking at the ads and finding similarities. The same pictures and words, usually showing a smiling man, sometimes with four straight lines for hair, sometimes five. When she wasn't busy with schoolwork, she read the texts, searched the internet for clues, or sat in front of a machine at the library. In 2009, about 15 years after Hans first saw a Mayday ad in the Wildcat, Kate emailed him suggesting that they start a Facebook group. She thought that people could work together to solve the mystery. With Hans's approval, she created Mayday Mystery Fans and began sharing theories and questions with a growing community. Later, she joined Reddit for more discussions on unsolved mysteries, hoping for fresh perspectives. Despite gaining new insights into different aspects of the ads, she still felt far from solving the mystery she spent over a decade pondering. However, over the years, she began forming her own theory. In the 1970s, she believes a group of smart individuals at the University of Arizona created an intellectual fraternity. They may have used the newspaper to discuss important subjects amongst themselves. The ads might have begun as a game and evolved into a tradition over the years. Kate has this image in her mind of curious, brainy students eager to discuss science, math, and philosophy. In his last year of college, Brian Hance, feeling stuck in solving the Mayday mystery, sought help on the internet. He reached out through his website asking for assistance in deciphering the puzzle. Surprisingly, he got an email signed by The Orphanage, the same name that caught his attention as a freshman on those ads. The email cryptically said, The day you can see the door, you will be welcomed inside. This mysterious message further intrigued Brian. Instead of leaving Tucson after graduation, he continued working for the university and started a side business. Every May when the ads reappeared, he persisted in researching and sharing clues on his website. His interactions with this group known as the Orphanage included receiving rare coins, news clippings, and letters from different locations. People claiming to be from the Orphanage sometimes called him, informing him about upcoming ads. Other times, he communicated with individuals like himself attempting to solve the mystery. In the early 2000s, he met a person who insisted on an in-person meeting to share her research. He biked to a cafe in downtown Tucson only to find that the researcher was a young girl accompanied by her father from Phoenix. The girl presented her theory that the person behind the Mayday mystery was the Zodiac Killer. She compared images of envelopes from the Zodiac Killer to those that Hans received from the orphanage. Despite the girl's conviction, Hans was understandably skeptical. Ultimately, the girl left, mentioning that she had sent her findings to the FBI. If you recall towards the beginning of the entry, I mentioned the name of a man named Robert Hungerford. Well, down the line, he was confirmed to be the lawyer for this orphanage group, but there was still little information on who this client was. Robert used to be a student at the University of Arizona in the late 1960s. He studied philosophy and later got his law degree there. He was said to speak eight different languages, including Latin, Hebrew, Russian, and Greek. Kate realized that Robert had an office in downtown Tucson and was in his 60s. This wasn't far from where Kate worked for the Pima County criminal justice system. Kate decided to pay him a visit, but when she found his office, there was a business card on the door saying that he was retired. Before leaving, she left a note. It said, I'm a longtime follower of MDM, which stands for Made a Mystery. I was in the neighborhood and wanted to say hello. If you ever keep office hours and wouldn't mind a visit, please let me know." She added her email address and then left. Surprisingly, the very next day, she found a message in her email inbox. Robert communicated that his motivation is for a quote-unquote total social theological transformation, starting on August 30th, 1969. 
When asked about what will happen, he mentioned a dramatic transformation beyond any sea change. Robert said that one would have to experience it firsthand to understand. His occasional role as the lawyer and go-to person for the orphanage is no secret. Brett Farah, who was once a student and later became the director of Arizona Student Media at the university, recalls talking with Robert. Every year, Robert would politely call to discuss advertising in the May 1st issue. He was polite and professional, using just enough words without being rude, maybe reflecting a different time. At some point down the line, Robert actually got into contact with Brian Hance in order to get him to fix his computer. Hans obviously accepted and he tried to talk to Robert about the Mayday mystery, but Robert remained reserved and focused on business. Despite Hans' efforts, Robert didn't reveal much about the mystery. For almost 40 years, if you drove along Route 16 near Fayetteville, West Virginia, there was a billboard featuring pictures of five children. These kids, Maurice 14, Martha 12, Louise 9, Jenny 8, and Betty 5 had dark hair and serious expressions. Below their images were their names and ages along with speculations about their mysterious disappearances. Fayetteville, a small town with a short main street, was filled with rumors overshadowing any concrete evidence. The community couldn't even agree on whether the children were alive or dead. But here's what we do know for sure. On Christmas Eve in 1945, George and Jenny Sauter, along with nine of their ten children, one of whom was away in the army, went to bed. Around 1 a.m., a fire erupted. George, Jenny, and four of the kids managed to escape, but the other five were never found again. George had desperately tried to rescue them, breaking a window to re-enter the burning house and injuring himself in the process. Amidst the smoke and flames that had consumed the downstairs rooms, he couldn't see anything. The fire had spread through the living room, dining room, kitchen, office, and the bedroom shared by George and Jenny. George was rapidly trying to analyze the situation inside of his head. Sylvia, the two-year-old in her crib, was safe outside. 17-year-old Marion and two sons, 23-year-old John and 16-year-old George Jr. had escaped from their upstairs bedroom. But Maurice, Martha, Louis, Jenny, and Betty were likely still in the bedrooms upstairs, separated by a staircase now engulfed in fire. He rushed back outside, hoping to reach his trapped children through the upstairs windows. Strangely, the ladder he always kept against the house was gone. Thinking on his feet, he decided to use one of his coal trucks to access the upper windows. However, despite working perfectly the day before, neither truck would start. In a panic, he searched for another solution. Attempting to scoop water from a rain barrel, he discovered it was frozen solid. Meanwhile, five of his children were still inside the house, surrounded by thick, swirling smoke. Unaware that his arm was covered in blood and his voice strained from shouting their names, he pressed on. His daughter Marion sprinted to a neighbor's house to call the Fayetteville Fire Department, but received no response from the operator. A neighbor who witnessed the fire tried calling from a nearby tavern, yet encountered the same lack of response. Frustrated, the neighbor drove into town and found Fire Chief F.J. Morris. Morris initiated Fayetteville's makeshift fire alarm system, a phone tree where one firefighter called another who then called another. Despite the fire department being only two and a half miles away, they didn't arrive until 8 a.m. At that point, the Sauter's home had already been reduced to a smoldering pile of ash. George and Jenny thought that their five kids might have died in the fire, but when they looked around the area on Christmas Day, they couldn't find any signs of their bodies. Chief Morris guessed that the fire was so hot that it completely burned the kids' bodies. A state police inspector checked the rubble and said the fire happened because of bad wiring. To remember their children, George covered the basement with five feet of dirt. Just before the new year, the coroner's office gave them five death certificates, saying the kids died from fire or suffocation. Even though everyone said the kids were gone, the Sodders started thinking that maybe, just maybe, their children were still alive. George Sauter came to the U.S. in 1908 at the age of 13. His older brother left him, so George worked on Pennsylvania railroads delivering stuff. He moved to Smithers, West Virginia, starting as a driver and later owning a trucking company hauling dirt, freight, and coal. 
In Smithers, he met Jenny Cipriani at a store called The Music Box. They got married, had 10 kids, and settled in Fayetteville, West Virginia, known for its small Italian community. Despite being opinionated, George rarely talked about his past in Italy. After their house burned down, the Sodders planted flowers where it stood and reflected on odd events preceding the fire. A stranger inquired about hauling work months earlier, pointing to fuse boxes predicting a fire. Another man, upset by a declined life insurance offer, warned of the house burning, linking it to George's criticism of Mussolini. Despite George's dislike for the dictator, he didn't take the threat seriously at that time. The older sons also recalled a man parked on US Highway 21, closely watching the younger kids before Christmas. On Christmas morning around 12.30, the peaceful atmosphere was broken by a loud phone ring after the kids unwrapped some presents and everyone went to bed. Jenny quickly answered, hearing a lady asking for someone she didn't know. Politely telling the caller they got the wrong number, Jenny hung up. Going back to bed, she saw all downstairs lights on, curtains open, and the front door unlocked. Assuming the kids were asleep, she turned off the lights, closed curtains, locked the door, and went back to her room. Just as she was falling asleep, a sudden loud bang on the roof and a rolling noise startled her. An hour later, she woke up again, this time because her room was filling up with thick smoke. Jenny couldn't grasp how five kids could die in a fire without leaving any bones or flesh behind. To figure it out, she did her own experiment, burning animal bones like chicken, beef, and pork. She wanted to see if the fire could consume them completely. Every time, she ended up with a pile of charred bones. She also knew that investigators found recognizable parts of household items in the burnt basement. When she talked to someone from a crematorium, they explained that even after bodies are burned for two hours at 2000 degrees, bones still remain. However, their house was destroyed in just 45 minutes. The list of strange occurrences kept growing. A telephone repairman informed the Sodders that their lines seemed cut, not burned. This puzzled them because if the fire had been caused by faulty wiring, as the official report said, the power should have been out. Yet downstairs rooms were still lit. A witness came forward saying he saw a man at the fire scene taking equipment used for removing car engines. Could this have possibly been why George's trucks wouldn't start? During a family visit to the site, Sylvia found a hard rubber object in the yard. Jenny remembered hearing a hard thud on the roof and a rolling sound. George thought that it might have been a pineapple bomb used in warfare. In 1947, George and Jenny contacted the FBI for help with their case. However, their situation was deemed a local matter and therefore not eligible to be investigated by the FBI. However, it is rumored that at some point down the line, the FBI did offer help with local authorities' approval, but the Fayetteville Police and Fire Department said no. The Sodders were determined to get to the bottom of the situation, so they hired a private investigator named C.C. Tinsley. C.C. found a link between the insurance salesman who threatened George and the jury that said the fire was an accident. There's also a strange story from a Fayetteville minister about Fire Chief F.J. Morris. Despite Morris officially saying no remains were found, he supposedly mentioned finding a heart in the ashes. This discovery was rumored to be tucked away in a dynamite box and buried at the site. Tinsley managed to persuade Morris to reveal the location. Together, they unearthed the box and promptly took it to a local funeral director. After examining the supposed heart, the funeral director determined it was actually beef liver and had not been affected by the fire. Shortly after this discovery, rumors circulated that the fire chief had informed others that the box's contents weren't found in the fire. Allegedly, he buried the beef liver in the debris, hoping it would satisfy the family enough to halt the investigation. In the following years, more tips and leads kept pouring in. George, spurred by a newspaper photo of school children in New York City, believed one of them was his daughter Betty. He traveled to Manhattan in search of the child, but her parents refused to engage with him. In August 1949, the Sodders opted for a renewed search at the fire site and enlisted the help of Washington, D.C. pathologist Oscar B. Hunter. The excavation yielded various items, including damaged coins, a partially burned dictionary, and a number of fragments of vertebrae. 
Hunter sent the bones to the Smithsonian Institution, which later issued the following report. The human bones consist of four lumbar vertebrae belonging to one individual. Since the transverse recesses are fused, the age of this individual at death should have been 16 or 17 years. The top limit of age should be about 22 since the centra, which normally fuse at 23, are still unfused. On this basis, the bones show greater skeletal maturation than one would expect for a 14-year-old boy, 14 being the oldest missing solder child. It is however possible, although not probable, for a boy 14 and a half years old to show 16 to 7 year old maturation. The report from the Smithsonian Institution on the vertebrae revealed no signs of exposure to fire. It raised eyebrows at the absence of other bones in what was supposedly a meticulous clearing of the house's basement. Considering the house reportedly burned for only about half an hour, the report found it peculiar that only four vertebrae were discovered instead of the expected complete skeleton of the five children. The conclusion of the report suggested that the bones were probably in the dirt George used to fill the basement, intending to create a memorial for his children. After the Smithsonian report, hearings in Charleston led Governor Patterson and Superintendent Burchett to close the case, deeming the search hopeless. Undeterred, the Sodders set their attention towards that billboard I mentioned at the start. The Sodders were offering a $10,000 reward for any leads or tips that would lead to a concise conclusion to the case. Immediately, tons of leads began flooding in. One of them included a letter from St. Louis suggesting Martha was in a convent. Another tip from Florida mentioned that they saw the children with a relative of Jenny's. George investigated each and every lead he received, but returned home without any answers. In 1968, over 20 years post-fire, Jenny discovered an envelope with no return address in the mail, postmarked in Kentucky and addressed only to her. Inside, a photo of a man in his mid-twenties with a cryptic note on the flip side read, Luis Sauter, I love brother Frankie, A90132 or 35. The resemblance to their son Luis, who was nine during the fire, was striking. Despite hiring a private detective to investigate in Kentucky, they received no further information. The Sodders were apprehensive about revealing the letter's details, fearing harm to their son. Instead, they updated the billboard with Luis's image and hung a larger version in their home. George, expressing the urgency of this revelation, said, Time is running out for us, but we only want to know. If they did die in the fire, we want to be convinced. Otherwise, we want to know what happened to them. A year later, in 1968, George passed away, still hopeful for a breakthrough. Jenny continued the investigation until her death in 1989. The billboard eventually came down as well. However, the investigation persisted through generations with theories suggesting local mafia involvement, extortion attempts, or the children being kidnapped by someone they knew. Born on January 30th, 1989 in Marshall, Minnesota, Brandon Swanson was a 19-year-old college student studying wind turbines at Minnesota West Community and Technical College in Canby. After finishing the spring semester on the night of May 13th, 2008, Brandon went to two parties to celebrate. Though he had some drinks, friends noted that he wasn't very drunk. Instead of his usual route along Minnesota State Highway 68 from Canby to Marshall, which he took every day for classes, Brandon, for unknown reasons, chose back roads on that important night. When Brandon reached the 3900 block of Lyon Lincoln Road, he suddenly swerved off the road into a ditch. Around 2 a.m. on the morning of May 14th, he called his parents from his cell phone, explaining that he had essentially gotten stuck. He assured them that he and the car were fine and just needed a ride. He told his parents he thought he was near the city of Lind and saw lights in the distance. They went there to find him, agreeing to flash their headlights on and off for signals. However, after several unsuccessful attempts to locate Brandon this way, tensions started to rise. Eventually, Swanson decided on a different approach. He made his way through a field toward the lights and asked his parents to meet him in the parking lot of a popular nightclub in Lind. Unfortunately, he never reached this destination. 47 minutes into the call, Swanson suddenly exclaimed, Oh no! Then there was a silence. 
The call didn't end there. It just remained silent as Brian and Annette waited anxiously for their son to explain what was wrong. Sadly, he never did. Uncertain about what else to do, they hung up and tried calling him multiple times, receiving no response each call. Brandon Swanson would never be seen or heard from again. Brian and Annette Swanson reported their son missing at 6.30 a.m. the next morning. However, local police initially didn't take their concerns seriously, stating that it wasn't unusual usual for a young man his age to stay out all night. Deputies advised them to be patient and wait for him to return on his own. One officer reportedly said to the worried parents, it's his right to be missing. Upon reviewing Brandon's cell phone records, the police found that on the night of his disappearance, he had actually been close to Porter, about 25 miles away from where he had informed his parents. Soon after, his car was discovered in a ditch near Taunton. Sheriff Eric Wallen of Lyon County revealed that Brandon's phone remained active well into the next day, with officers persistently attempting to call it, only to be directed to his voicemail. Eric Wallen said, We were able to use the cell phone tower technology to have an idea of where his last communications or phone calls came from, so that put us on a cell tower up in that area. We then focused the search there and the car was located. At the site, no keys or signs of foul play were found. The vehicle simply looked like it was stuck in the ditch or partially in the ditch. There was nothing odd about it. If a person passed by, they would think it was just parked there or broken down and stuck. When they finally started searching, a lot of people joined in. Even dogs and helicopters were deployed in the search. They swept both the land and the Yellow Medicine River because some thought Brandon might have fallen into it and drowned. Dogs sniffed around and found Brandon's scent on a trail near the river. They followed it to the water and then across to the other side, suggesting that Brandon might have been inside of the river. After that, they went north along the riverbank reaching the Yellow Medicine County line, where the trail suddenly stopped. Dogs also smelled something like human remains a few times near Mud Creek, north of Porter, but they didn't find anything important to Brandon's case there. Nearby, the dogs also detected Brandon's scent on some farm equipment. However, the farmer who owned the equipment did not allow investigators to search his property. In fact, there were several pieces of land in the area that investigators thought would have been good places to search. However, due to legal problems revolving around getting permission from landowners, they couldn't. For instance, local cattle farmers didn't want police search dogs on their property. Even after 14 years, investigators were still dealing with this problem. One officer was quoted saying, In at least a couple of circumstances, that problem is still in existence. They will not allow us on their property. We don't dispute the reason why. We try and work out a method that would make it acceptable, and we've not been able to come up with a working compromise. Another complication in the search is that Minnesota specifically has a very limited amount of dogs that are specialized in scent work available. One officer was quoted saying, The problem is that as time goes on, it becomes much more complicated to fulfill the search because you need to have canines that have experience in aged scent. Now, due to an injury in his younger years, Brandon Swanson faced a legal blindness condition in his left eye, causing challenges in judging distances. Due to this, he typically wore glasses, but for reasons unknown on the night he vanished, he left them in his vehicle. The region had numerous unidentified underground water containers and authorities explored the possibility that Brandon might have tumbled into one. Moreover, the temperature that night was slightly below 40 degrees, raising the potential that Brandon might have succumbed to coldness, particularly if he fell into the river. Even with some alcohol consumption that evening, his parents insisted that their son sounded coherent, yet uneasy during their phone conversation. In 2023, Sheriff Wallen shared some info regarding new leads still coming in. However, they seemed to all result in dead ends. He said, It seems that every tip that we receive, we investigate and we run into a dead end. It was either false or the information wasn't accurate. They all seem to run into a dead end. Aside from Brandon's car, no other physical piece of evidence related to Brandon has been found. Not his keys, not his phone, not even his clothing. Tim Molner, a 19-year-old studying aeronautical mechanics in Daytona Beach, Florida, disappeared after leaving for class on January 24, 1984. His last known contact was with his younger brother when he dropped him off at school. Some think he might be a victim of a crime, but his family believes he left to start a new life. 
The night Tim went missing, his family received a strange call with only static on the line, making them believe he tried calling but got nervous and hung up. Two weeks later, they found out he used his parents' credit card to buy gas in Lake City, Florida. The gas station attendant confirmed he was alone. Four months later, a letter from an auto impound company in Atlanta, Georgia revealed he left his car in a parking lot just a block away from the Greyhound bus terminal six days after he disappeared. Tim's family discovered his driver's license, wallet, credit card, and other belongings in his car, hinting that he might have changed his identity. Several valuable items, including a stereo, an expensive tool set, and a bicycle were missing from the car. It's unclear whether he intentionally disappeared or if something else happened to him. Oddly, he left with only the clothes on his back, but just before leaving, he withdrew almost all the money from his savings account, leaving $10 behind perhaps as a sign he might return one day. Now, more than 10 years later, Tim's family believes he is still alive and wants him to return home. If he does, he stands to inherit $50,000 as a relative passed away shortly after he vanished. The case gained a resurgence in attention in January 1996 when a man named Stephen Cole called a telecenter with some shocking information. He was watching TV and there was a segment covering Tim's disappearance and he recognized his clothing. They were found on a frozen body in Wisconsin a decade earlier. The medical examiner, after being contacted, reached out to Tim's family for DNA samples. In November, through DNA testing, the body was confirmed to be Tim's. Keys were also found on him, which matched locks in the Molnar home. Despite the identification, the cause of Tim's death couldn't be determined. There were no signs of trauma, and it remained unclear how or why he traveled to Wisconsin. His family organized a memorial service and laid him to rest in Daytona Beach, Florida. The details of his death continue to be a mystery. Unfortunately, Tim's parents have since passed away, with his mother Helen in 2004 and his father Michael in 2012. Overton Bridge is an old Category B listed structure near Dubberton in Scotland, specifically on Cape Overton. The Category B designation simply means that it is of significant historical or architectural interest. It was built in 1895 from a design by landscape architect H. E. Milner. From the 1950s onward, Overton Bridge in Scotland has been linked to an unusual phenomenon. Dogs, for some reason, either fall or leap off the bridge, earning it the eerie name Dog Bridge. Tragically, many dogs suffer severe injuries or lose their lives as they plummet approximately 15 meters onto the rocks below. Various explanations ranging from accidents to supernatural elements have been put forward to make sense of these strange incidents. The narrative behind the bridge gained more attention in the late 2000s and early 2010s. Since the initial incidents, the bridge has been associated with 50 reported dog fatalities from falls, while surprisingly over 600 dogs have managed to survive the plunge. In 2004, Kenneth Meikle witnessed a strange incident as his family and their golden retriever walked on the bridge. The dog unexpectedly leaped off, surviving but left traumatized. Over the following six months in 2005, at least five more dogs exhibited similar behavior. Alice Trevorrow, a pet owner walking her obedient dog Cassie in 2004, shared her experience. Something eerie is happening on that bridge. Cassie, usually well behaved, jumped in fright, indicating she sensed something unusual. Some people offer a more logical explanation, suggesting that the dogs might react to the scent of small animals below, prompting them to take the plunge. Some people believe that the bridge holds a paranormal connection aligning with what ancient Celts called the Fine Point, which was a mystical place where heaven and earth met. However, a Royal Society for the Protection of Birds investigation revealed nests of mice, squirrels, and minks on one end of the bridge. In a scent experiment with dogs, exposure to mice, squirrels, and mink scents resulted in seven dogs being drawn, particularly to the mink scent. While the Scottish Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals conducted a survey, their findings did not provide conclusive answers to the mysteries surrounding the bridge. Bob and Melissa Hill have been living near the bridge for years and they have observed multiple instances of dogs displaying agitation and leaping off the bridge. Bob attributed this behavior to the presence of mink and pine martens, causing distress in the dogs. He also alluded to a mysterious atmosphere around Evans Land. 
On the other hand, a local teacher named Paula Owens proposed a different viewpoint, suggesting supernatural forces were at play. Owens theorized that dark spirits were enticing dogs to their demise. In an even more disturbing incident from October 1994, Kevin Moy, struggling with paranoid schizophrenia, tragically threw his two-week-old son, Owen, over the bridge. His delusional belief that the infant was a manifestation of Satan, influenced by a birthmark, led to this horrific deed. Moy selected the location due to its association with dark spirits dating back to druidic times. Following this heinous crime, he attempted to by jumping off the bridge and inflicting wrist injuries. Subsequently, he was apprehended and confined to a mental health facility. On February 5th, 1958, a B-47 bomber involved in a collision with another Air Force jet accidentally released a 7,000-pound nuclear bomb into the waters off Tybee Island, Georgia. Remarkably, even after 50 years, the bomb, containing unspecified amounts of radioactive material, remains undiscovered. While the Air Force asserts that the bomb, undisturbed, doesn't pose a threat to the region, persistent search efforts and local residents express skepticism about the potential risk. Risks. The bomb ended up underwater when Air Force Colonel Howard Richardson let it go after a mishap with an F-86 fighter jet. Lieutenant Clarence Stewart's aircraft systems didn't detect Richardson's plane on his radar and descended right onto it. This collision tore off the left wing of the F-86 and seriously damaged the fuel tanks of the B-47. Richardson, with a two-person crew, was worried that the bomb might come loose during landing due to the damage to his plane. Therefore, he decided to drop the bomb into the water before safely landing at Hunter Air Force Base near Savannah. Stewart ejected and landed safely in a swamp. The Navy searched for the bomb for over two months but couldn't locate it. Today, they suggest leaving it where it is. According to a 2001 report on the search, if the bomb remains intact, the risk of heavy metal spread is low. The report emphasizes that the undisturbed bomb doesn't pose a threat. However, attempting recovery could create a serious explosion hazard. Even though the government has officially halted its quest for the bomb, local residents, including retired Air Force pilot Derek Duke, still remember the potentially dangerous weapon resting off their coast. In 2004, Duke identified high radiation levels in shallow waters near Savannah. Government officials looked into it and determined that the radiation readings were typical for the naturally occurring minerals in the region. Since 1950, there have been at least six U.S. nuclear bombs which have gone missing, and their whereabouts remain unknown to this day. On October 5th, 2018, Terrence Woods Jr., a TV producer working on the set of Discovery's Gold Rush in the backcountry of Idaho, went missing. Terrence was a 26-year-old African man with short black hair, brown eyes, and weighed about 130 pounds. He was never seen again after that day. Part of a 12-person group, Terrence joined host Turin on an expedition delving into abandoned mines across the mountainous regions of the western United States. Shortly before his reported disappearance, Terrence shared a photo on his personal Instagram page. The image depicted a dense forest of trees with a river coursing through, beneath an overcast sky. His caption comprised a solitary word, Idaho. Terrence vanished after venturing into a forest in the Oregon area, not too distant from where the aforementioned photo was captured. One evening while finishing the filming, Terrence mentioned to a pair of women helping with the transportation that he needed to use the restroom. Soon after, he accidentally dropped his radio. Following this, Terrence dashed down a steep cliff into the forest, disappearing among the trees. Attempts by locals, including producer Simon Gee, to follow him down the cliff were hindered by the terrain. When they returned, their clothes were torn and they had blood on them. Gee later told Terrence's father that his son ran faster than he had ever seen anyone run before. Terrence vanished and the Idaho County Sheriff's Office was notified at 6.41 p.m. on the same day. A Facebook update mentioned that the search didn't start until the next day due to the late report. Search teams including dogs, ground searchers, all-terrain vehicles, and helicopter teams equipped with body heat detection were deployed. Despite extensive efforts, Terrence couldn't be found and the search was called off after six days. Later on, Terrence's family and friends found the official account of events strange. The original Sheriff's Office report stated that Terrence wasn't doing too well emotionally and thus had a mental break. 
The person who called the police also claimed that Terrence was displaying mental health issues during the shoot. But when Terrence's family pressed the police for more information, they withdrew the statements about his mental health. The family was convinced that someone was hiding the truth. Terrence's family claimed that his employer was responsible or, at the very least, knew more than they were letting on, but they consistently denied withholding any additional information. On Friday, December 15th, 2017, a gardener and housekeeper showed up at the North York house of 75-year-old billionaire Barry Sherman and his 70-year-old wife Honey at 8.30 a.m. as they did every week. They used a new lockbox that had been put in place for the realtor trying to sell the $7 million mansion so they could get inside by themselves. The lower level has an underground garage for six cars, a fun area, and an indoor swimming pool. The rest of the house includes five bedrooms, nine bathrooms, a gym, sauna, and tennis court. The housekeeper and gardener didn't see Barry or Honey Sherman, but it didn't bother them much because they weren't expecting them to be there. At 10.30 a.m., a couple who wanted to buy the mansion showed up with their real estate agent for a tour. The house was up for sale by Judy Gottlieb, who was away in Florida. Inside, the three met with another assistant agent who represented Judy. The group toured different parts of the big house, and after about 30 minutes, they reached the lower floor. The assistant agent wanted to impress the couple with the indoor swimming pool, so she opened the door. Instead of a pleasant surprise, she made a shocking discovery. Barry and Honey Sherman's bodies were hanging from the pool's railings. The agent quickly closed the door and guided the group out, saying that that part of the house was off limits. The agent went to find the housekeeper and called Judy. The housekeeper called 911 at 11.43 and the Toronto police and paramedics were on their way within a minute. The buyer's agent thought it was a scary joke or Halloween decorations. The superstitious couple touring the house were very upset, fearing it was a bad sign. Even though the assistant agent tried to keep them from seeing the bodies, the buyer's agent said the whole group saw through the large glass doors. The deaths obviously raise extreme suspicions. During the autopsies, it was realized that both deaths resulted from ligature neck compression. This type of strangulation is usually different from hanging because it involves a force other than the person's body weight. It was also determined that Barry and Honey had been dead for at least a day. Rigor mortis had passed and their limbs were now relaxed and limp. There were injuries to their wrists and a biopsy was taken to determine if these were recent or old injuries. On that night, the Toronto police made two statements clarifying that they were not looking for any suspects and there was no sign of forced entry into the home. By December 16th, police sources informed the Toronto Star that they were exploring the possibility of a murder-suicide, suspecting that Barry killed Honey before taking his own life. Friends and family of the couple strongly disagreed with this idea, saying it was impossible. They pointed out that the house had nine entrances and both Barry and Honey would have welcomed anyone who needed help regardless of the time of day or if they were a stranger. Their children released a statement urging the police to carry out a thorough criminal investigation and criticized them for making the murder-suicide theory public. The Sherman family was confident that Barry and Honey were murdered. Barry Sherman was the founder and CEO of Apotex Inc., which was Canada's biggest distributor of generic drugs. Throughout his life, he accumulated an estimated net worth of $4.6 billion, making him one of the wealthiest individuals in Canada. Established in 1974, his company was always in a fight against competing companies, government regulators, and anyone who doubted Barry's motives. He sort of saw himself as an underdog fighting against patents, courageously taking on giants like Merck, Pfizer, and Bayer to make affordable generic medication available to patients. He once said, if we're thieves, we're Robin Hood. Winning legal battles was crucial to his success, and he often told employees that they worked for a legal company that happened to sell medication. It's easy to understand how Barry would have made enemies in his field. He also often unknowingly invested portions of his wealth in fraudulent companies. Another potential factor in Barry's death that many people suspect is his ongoing dispute with his cousins led by Carrie Winter and his three siblings. This conflict traces back to the 1960s when the Winter cousins, who lost their parents early on, were under the care of their father, Louise Winter, a pioneer in the generic pharmaceutical business. Barry, in his youth, worked for and learned from his uncle Lou at his company, Empire Laboratories. 
Laboratories. After his uncle's death, Barry eventually bought and sold Empire Laboratories. The dispute, which was initiated by Carrie Winter, began in the 1990s. The cousins argued in court that Barry had a financial obligation to them equivalent to one-fifth of his estimated $5 billion of wealth. They claimed that a part of the purchase agreement Barry made stated that they were entitled to a share of the money. However, Barry's legal team countered that the option had never taken effect. According to the terms, the cousins needed to be 21 and have worked for Empire at the time, but neither condition was met. The Winter cousins faced multiple defeats in their case, with one occurring shortly before the deaths of Barry and Honey, leading to widespread suspicion. So it should be emphasized that that's all this is, suspicion. There is no clear evidence to suggest that they were actually involved. The long-standing dispute concluded in March 2020 when Kerry Winter lost his attempt to bring their final appeal before Canada's highest court. Kerry expressed his disappointment with the outcome. Needless to say, this brief overview only scratches the surface of these complex issues. On December 16th, 2019, two years after their deaths, the Toronto Police and the Sherman family jointly announced the closure of the private investigation overseen by the family's attorney. During a press briefing, the Toronto Police Homicide Unit spoke to the media. It appeared that there was a disagreement between law enforcement and the family. Up until that moment, 38 judicial authorizations were secured, leading to searches of both residential and commercial properties, examination of electronic devices, and the retrieval of 73 individual records. The Center of Forensic Sciences received 150 items for testing, 243 witnesses were interviewed, 4 terabytes of security video footage was obtained, 205 tips were provided directly to the police by the public, and an additional 343 tips were submitted to the police through the private investigative team. The general consensus is that the police mishandled the investigation by initially focusing on the murder angle. This belief stems from the fact that in the early stages, the police appear to consider it a murder concentrating their efforts on that particular scenario. Kevin Donovan from The Star has been actively advocating for the unsealing of records related to the case. According to documents that he obtained, the police regarded Honey as a murder victim for the first six weeks of the investigation, suggesting they initially suspected that Barry killed Honey before taking his own life. Donovan criticized this approach. He said, Police decided it was a murder-suicide and then they go down this tunnel. That's bad for an investigation and bad for investigators. You have to look at all suspects and all possible suspects in the first 48 hours. After all the effort put forth in this investigation, there is little to show for it. The circumstances circling the murders of Barry and Honey remains unsolved. Nineteen-year-old Charles McCuller was an aspiring photographer who went on a trip in 1974 that would change his life. He left his van in Virginia and traveled to Oregon by hitchhiking and taking buses. After staying with a friend, he went to Crater Lake National Park in January 1975 to take pictures of winter. Charles planned to be back at his friend's place in two days, but he never showed up. People around Diamond Lake, which was not far from Crater Lake, said they saw him before he went missing. Even though there was a lot of snow, Charles wanted to walk along the North Road at Crater Lake. A number of skiers said that the snow was extremely soft, and it reached all the way up to their waist. When Charles didn't return on February 1st, the police in Eugene were contacted. The Oregon State Police put up posters in bus stations hoping to find Charles and make sure he was okay. At this point, a number of rumors began to spread, suggesting that Charles may have went somewhere else. The police thought that perhaps Charles might have changed his hiking plans without telling anyone. The investigation into Charles' disappearance didn't turn up any useful information at first. In a letter dated March 15, 1976, sent to then-Senator William L. Scott, a family member of Charles expressed frustration that the FBI wasn't helpful. 
The letter mentioned that the FBI claimed it couldn't get involved in missing persons cases unless there was evidence of kidnapping. Even after searching by air and on the ground for months, there were no signs of Charles. The person who wrote the letter said, After looking at the police reports we have and maps of the searched areas, and considering how hard they looked without finding any signs of Charles or his things, we think he didn't just get caught in bad weather, but might have been a victim of foul play. A year later, on October 13th, 1976, two hikers from Texas got lost while traveling through Crater Lake Park. They ended up in a remote part called the Sphagnum Bog area in a little empty canyon. When they arrived, the hikers discovered an old, dirty backpack in the bog. They called the park rangers and a day later, the rangers searched the area and found the remains of Charles, scattered along Bybee Creek, 12 miles away from where he started his hike. In the backpack, they found the key to Charles' vehicle, which he had left in Virginia. The FBI was called in to finish the investigation as well. Broken off shin bones were found sticking up in his pants. Foot bones were discovered in his socks, but most of his skeleton seemed to be missing, except for the top of his skull, which was found 12 feet away. Charles's camera gear, shirt, boots, and coat were all gone as well. It's believed that Charles might have been experiencing hypothermia. In some cases, people with hypothermia feel very hot and end up taking off their clothes, even though they are actually freezing. This reaction is known as paradoxical undressing. Now, there are many theories about what had happened. How did Charles manage to travel 12 miles from where he started? On the day he went missing, there was 7 feet of snow on the ground, making it seem impossible for Charles to cover such a distance without skis or snowshoes. Some people find it hard to believe that even a snowmobile could make it through 2.6 meters of powdery snow, let alone a person. In 2016, Stephen McCuller wrote an article about his missing brother. He came up with an interesting theory. If only those broken off shin bones could have talked to us, what do you think they'd say? I bet they'd say something like this. I hitched a ride with this creepy guy who stole my camera equipment and money and shot me in the head. Then on a clear day in the dead of winter, he took my body to the remotest part of Crater Lake, removed my shirt and boots, set me up on a log, and left, thinking that the animals would destroy the evidence by spring. And hey, I guess it worked because the cops ruled my death to be from natural causes. My dad doesn't buy it though. Sugar, a beloved racehorse valued at over $15 million, was kidnapped from his stable in Kildare by a group of masked individuals armed with guns. Despite their attempts to ask for money in exchange for Sugar's return, the gentle horse sadly met a tragic end and they never found his body. Sugar became famous as the most renowned and valuable racehorse worldwide. He had a remarkable win in the 1981 Epsom Derby, breaking a record with a huge 10 length victory, the biggest in the race's 202 year history. After that, he won four major races and was given the prestigious title of European Horse of the Year. After Sugar retired from racing, Racing, horse owners eagerly paid substantial amounts of money, up to $120,000, to have foals from him. They wanted to train these young horses for future races because Sugar had an impressive racing record. On the chilly night of February 8th, 1983, Sugar was kidnapped by a group of men wearing masks believed to be linked to the IRA. After a successful first racing season, Sugar was syndicated for $15 million among 34 people, with each share valued at around $382,000. A billionaire spiritual leader known as the Aga Khan retained six of these shares. On the night that Sugar was kidnapped, he was getting ready for his second season as a breeding stallion. Around 8 p.m., Jim Fitzgerald's son, the head groom who lived at the stud, heard a knock at the door. When he opened it, he found two masked men with guns, and one of them said, We have come for Sugar. We want $3 million for him. Jim Fitzgerald, a father of six, was threatened at gunpoint to take the kidnappers to Sugar's stable. There, six more gunmen wearing masks joined them. They loaded Sugar into a horse box brought by the men, and Fitzgerald was then forced into their car with guns still pointed at him. 
The investigation posed a significant challenge for authorities because the kidnappers picked the day just before Ireland's Major Goff's racehorse sale to snatch sugar. This timing meant that numerous horse boxes were traveling on roads throughout Ireland, making it tough to identify sugar among them. I can still vividly recall that night in the car with those lads. Numerous thoughts raced through my mind about what they might do to me. One of them, armed with a revolver, was particularly aggressive. That's what Fitzgerald had to say regarding the kidnappers. After being driven for around three hours, the kidnappers left Fitzgerald alone. He eventually found a telephone and called his brother, setting off a chain of calls among Sugar's shareholders, his vet, racing associates, and several Irish ministers. This process has been criticized as a quote-unquote character of police bungling because the actual police were not alerted until eight hours after Sugar was taken, and by then, the kidnappers had long departed from the area. Using coded phrases, the kidnappers initiated talks with a representative of the Aga Khan over the phone. They were careful to end the call before 90 seconds elapsed to prevent authorities from tracing their location. A collective decision was made not to pay the ransom. The concern was that if they did, it would put every other racehorse in the world at risk, especially since many of them were valued at over a million pounds, and Ireland lacked sufficient security measures as well. The search for sugar turned into a massive media frenzy, with people in the UK and Ireland determined to bring him back. The Dublin police even offered a reward of over 150,000 US dollars for his safe return. The kidnappers agreed to negotiate with Derek Thompson, a man associated with ITV's racing team, who flew to Belfast to engage in talks at the Europa Hotel. He described the scene that awaited him at the Belfast airport as surreal. He said, It felt like being a film star. Cameras were everywhere. Around 100 cameramen and journalists surrounded the Europa Hotel as Thompson and his fellow negotiators arrived. However, an agreement was never reached. The following day, Thompson received a phone call from the kidnappers who conveyed the grim news. They said, The horse has had an accident. He's dead. They promptly ended the call after those words. Various theories circulated regarding Sugar's fate. One of them suggests that the horse might have had an accident during a fit of frenzy and the individuals responsible for his kidnapping killed him due to their inability to manage his agitated state. Kevin Mallon, a prominent IRA leader, was believed to be a possible suspect behind the crime. A convicted killer from Tyrone, Kevin Mallon achieved notoriety for his escape from prison and being acquitted for the murder of a police officer. According to several reliable sources, it is almost certain that the two handlers, one wielding a machine gun, entered the secluded stable where Sugar was held and opened fire. A former IRA member disclosed to the Sunday Telegraph, Sugar was machine gunned to death. The blood was everywhere and the horse even slipped on his own blood. There was lots of cussing and swearing because the horse wouldn't die. It was a very bloody death. It took several minutes before Sugar bled out. There is a common belief that Sugar's kidnappers buried him in a bog in Leitrim, while some speculate that they disposed of him into the sea off Ireland's south coast. Walter Swinburne, Sugar's former jockey who rode him in his renowned race, expressed distress over these discoveries, stating, No horse deserves an ending like that, let alone one as special as Sugar. Despite extensive searches, Sugar's body was never located, and the case continues to be shrouded in mystery. And of course, the IRA has never officially claimed claimed responsibility for the abduction of this horse. In Hexham, England, there was the Pollock family, which consisted of Florence and John Pollock and their two daughters, Joanna and Jacqueline, both of whom were 11 and 6 years old. In May of 1957, a tragic event occurred. The two sisters and their nine-year-old friend Anthony were walking to church when a careless driver hit them. The sisters passed away almost immediately, and Anthony died on the way to the hospital. The person who caused the accident was on a number of substances, and later admitted to purposefully hitting the children because she had to give up her own kids. She was then put in a psychiatric hospital. And obviously, Florence and John were devastated by the loss of their children. A year after this loss, Florence became pregnant. John strongly believed that their daughters would be reborn as twins and they would have their little girls back. However, there was some disagreement with this idea. 
The two were devoted Catholics and had argued about the concept of reincarnation before to the point where their marriage was at risk. Moreover, there was no history of twins in either of their families, and even her doctor said it was unlikely for her to have twins. But despite all of this, in October 1958, the couple was blessed with the birth of twin girls named Jennifer and Gillian. For several years, Florence resisted the idea that the twins were the reincarnated spirits of her two lost daughters, but there are a number of details that make many people believe that this is indeed true. Jennifer had a birthmark on her hip identical to the one that Jacqueline had, but the birthmarks between the twins were different which is supposedly uncommon for twins. The family moved away from Hexham when the twins were very young, but as they grew older, they would recall details about Hexham even though they had never been there. Adding to this, the twins could identify their late sister's toys by their exact names even though Florence had them stored away. They asked for each toy by name, played with them in the same way their previous sisters did, and even knew where the toys came from. Considering all of this, along with the fact that their personalities closely matched their late sisters in many ways, a lot of people are convinced that they are reincarnations. But Florence was still skeptical until the twins began talking about the car accident. It was only then where she began to reconsider her beliefs. One day, she overheard the twins playing a game where they were reenacting the accident. They could point to specific parts of the body that were hurt and bleeding. For instance, Jillian said to Jennifer, the blood coming out of your eyes, that's where the car hit you, as Jennifer held her head on her lap. Additionally, the twins developed a significant fear of cars and when they were younger, they frequently had frightening dreams about being hit by them. Around the age of 5, the memories of their past lives began to fade for the twins. However, Jillian later experienced a few visions related to a sandpit at a home in Wickham. Surprisingly, she accurately described the house and its surroundings even though she had never been to it before. It was a house where Florence had lived when she was younger. Now, some people speculate that the twins' siblings might have told them stories about their sister's past, but to my knowledge, I don't think they ever came out and admitted to this. But even if they had only heard about their past, it still doesn't really explain the mystery of their birthmarks, their personalities, their fear of cars, and other peculiar aspects of them. It will be impossible to ever know if these sisters were really reincarnations, but those that believe in more supernatural forces can't help but believe that this is not simply a coincidence. In 1981, actress Natalie Wood drowned off Catalina Island. Authorities initially considered it an accident, believing the 43-year-old star of West Side Story, who couldn't swim, had been drinking the night before she was found floating face down in the ocean. Over the years, her death has remained a Hollywood mystery, sparking speculation, TV specials, and books exploring the possibility of foul play. In 2011, 30 years after Wood's death, Los Angeles County Sheriff's officials reopened the investigation. Then, in 2013, county coroner's officials changed the cause of death from accidental drowning to drowning and other undetermined factors. The new coroner's report pointed to fresh bruises on Wood's arms and knees, along with a scratch on her neck and a scrape on her forehead, suggesting the possibility of an assault before her drowning. The updated report also highlighted conflicting statements regarding the timing of Natalie Wood's disappearance and whether she had argued with her husband, actor Robert Wagner, and Christopher Walken, her co-star in the film Brainstorm. They were all on the 60-foot yacht where she was last seen alive on November 28, 1981. On the night of her death, the three actors had dinner at Doug's Harbor Reef restaurant in Two Harbors and returned to the yacht afterwards. When they arrived back at the yacht, they started drinking and an argument unfolded between Walken and Wagner. According to the new report, Natalie Wood went missing around midnight and an examination of her stomach contents indicated her death occurred around that time. Wagner reported her missing with a radio call at 1.30 a.m. Roger Smith, the captain of the LA County rescue boat involved in retrieving Natalie Wood's body, stated that he didn't receive a call to search for her until after 5 a.m. Initially, investigators believed Wood's body was bruised from falling off the yacht and struggling to get into a rubber dinghy. The dinghy had scratch marks consistent with the hypothesized scenario. 
However, in the 2013 report, it was highlighted that they did not collect nail clippings from Wood's body to determine if she made the scratch marks, and the dinghy was no longer available for examination. The coroner's belief is that Wood died shortly after entering the water. Following the reopening of the investigation, over 100 individuals reached out to authorities, but it became evident that the new probe did not yield a significant breakthrough in the case. One Friday in April 1994 at Sunset Cliffs in San Diego, California, two surfers saw an unidentifiable mass wash up on the sand. When they looked closer, they found the naked body of 25-year-old Michelle Von Amster lying face down on a bed of kelp. They decided to move her remains to a nearby lifeguard headquarters. The first check by the medical examiner revealed large torn pieces of flesh and a missing right leg. The usual thought in such a situation might be a shark attack, but this case is not as simple as it seems. After a formal autopsy was conducted, this is what the medical examiner had to say. They believe that Michelle was last seen alive at 8pm, got into the water around 12am, and shortly after, she was attacked by a great white shark. Obviously, Michelle couldn't effectively fight against a shark, so it dragged her down to the ocean floor where she broke her neck and ingested an excessive amount of sand and rocks. Michelle eventually died of blood loss and drowning. To most, this may seem like an exceptionally reasonable conclusion, however, there is some disagreement. Despite all the signs that might suggest a shark attack, the coroner at the lifeguard headquarters couldn't determine the cause of death, marking it as unknown. The following day, on April 16, 1994, an official autopsy was conducted by the San Diego Medical Examiner's Office. Along with the torn flesh and missing leg, the victim had other injuries, a broken neck, broken ribs, scrapes, bruises, and contusions on the face. There was also a significant amount of sand in her throat, lungs, and stomach. There are a couple problems that make experts question the official conclusion that Michelle was killed by a shark, starting with concerns about the medical examiner. Here are a number of details that Brian Blackburn, the San Diego medical examiner handling the case, shared. When he examined Michelle's body, he had never dealt with a shark attack victim before. In fact, nobody who looked at the body had any experience with shark attack victims. To his credit, Blackburn did reach out to experts at the nearby Scripps Institute of Oceanography to learn more about shark attack victims. Ralph Collier, a shark expert with 54 years of experience, had the following to say after he took a look at Michelle's leg bone. When a great white shark bites off part of a limb, it usually makes a clean break, like a cut from a table saw. But Michelle's femur, what was left of it, didn't look like that. It looked more like when you take a piece of bamboo and whittle it down to a point with a knife. I've seen almost 100 photos of cases I've looked at over the years, and I've never seen bones that come to a point. The injury would have cut her femoral artery, and she would have bled to death quickly. But for her to have sand in her stomach, she would have had to take a big breath as she touched the sand. There are too many things in this case that don't match how white sharks usually behave. Another expert named Richard Rosenblatt added the following. None of the marks on Michelle's body were caused by a white shark. If she had been bitten by a white shark, they probably would have found a piece of the shark's tooth in her body. If a shark had taken her leg, it could have only been a white shark. So we know that there were no teeth from a great white shark found in Michelle's body, indicated that they had indeed fed on Michelle's body. A pathologist determined that there was no evidence suggesting that these bites occurred before Michelle's death. After 14 years, the case of Michelle von Amster was re-examined in 2008 due to conflicting evidence. This time, medical examiner Glenn Wagner concluded that sharks had scavenged Michelle's body after she died. So if we take a step back and look at everything that has been said by the experts, we get a bit of a better idea of the case. They stated that only a great white could have taken Michelle's leg. But the experts seem to agree that Michelle was not attacked by a great white, so that would mean that most likely Michelle did not die as a result of a shark. Of course, there are many theories regarding this case, one of which says that Michelle von Emster supposedly went for a midnight swim, got caught in a riptide, and her body was banged against rocks, causing most of her injuries. Later, sharks fed on her body in the ocean. However, this theory, especially the idea that Michelle went for a midnight swim, seems unlikely for several reasons. 
The water temperature was 59 degrees, making it too cold for a midnight swim for the vast majority of people. The night air temperature was 57 degrees, further suggesting it was too cold for anyone to be swimming at midnight. We can reasonably assume that Michelle didn't like the cold since when last seen at 8pm, she was wearing a trench coat. And finally, this explanation doesn't account for the missing leg and the changed bone. A different theory suggests that Michelle fell from Sunset Cliffs. The area is well known to have deteriorating sandstone that have actually led to other deaths in the past. Falling may have caused some of her injuries. An alternate version of this theory proposes that a vehicle forced her off the cliff, but a glaring issue with this is that it would not explain what happened to her leg yet again. Obviously, simply colliding with the cliff wouldn't result in that type of injury. And at this point, probably the theory that you've been thinking of the most, murder. Michelle may have been harmed by someone who either left her to die or drowned her. An expert noted that she would have had to take large breaths to ingest so much sand, suggesting this might have occurred at the shoreline as someone drowned her. To most, the murder theory seems to be the most believable for a number of reasons. Michelle lived in a questionable, drug-infested neighborhood known as the War Zone, making it possible for various incidents to occur and her body could have been disposed of at the cliffs. The fact that Michelle's body was found naked lacks a reasonable explanation. How could a victim of a shark attack, cliff fall, or accidental drowning end up naked? It doesn't make any sense. Michelle's purse was discovered in the sand around two and a half miles from her body, in a heavily frequented area. The purse contained keys and money and it's highly improbable that no one noticed it in 24 hours. It raises the possibility that someone may have killed her and then strategically placed the purse to make it look like an accident. If we are to look at this as a murder case, then there are immediately a number of suspects that police can look into, one of which is named Edwin Decker. Edwin, a co-worker of Michelle's, made some peculiar statements when questioned. He mentioned that Michelle had a quote-unquote hippie vibe and enjoyed surfing naked. However, none of her friends confirmed this and lifeguards who were familiar with the area didn't recall ever seeing Michelle surf or swim naked. This unusual claim could be a convenient explanation for why her body was found without clothing. Decker went on to say that he and Michelle had gone out together and flirted for weeks. He claimed to feel an emotional and intellectual connection between the two of them. After learning about Michelle's death, he published the following poem. The report said there was a tattoo, a butterfly on her shoulder, which I remember that night, on my couch when I, like the shark, chewed on her hips and took off her shirt. Needless to say, this is a very strange poem. Michelle used to work at a local coffee shop where she faced constant stalking from an unknown man. This unsettling situation led her to leave her job at the shop, with the stalker riding a motorcycle being the only known detail about him. In an attempt to distance herself from the stalker, Michelle took a job at an office supply store. Denise Knox, Michelle's former boss, shared that shortly after Michelle's death, a peculiar man visited the store and made multiple copies of Michelle's autopsy report. Knox added that the man left the store on a motorcycle. This person was never identified. Then in 2019, we get another pretty significant detail about Michelle's life. Michelle's sister, Teresa, who is a major mental health advocate, revealed details about the abuse Michelle endured from a serial pedophile at a Catholic church. He was a priest named Greg Ingalls. The article also explores Michelle's struggle with lifelong addiction and health problems along with the impact on her and Teresa's family. With this newfound information, many investigators think that Michelle's mental distress may have played a significant role in her death. On October 22, 1986, Bambi Brantley disappeared in Leesville, Louisiana. She was last seen entering a convenience store where she bought a drink and used the payphone. What exactly happened to her after this is a bit unclear, but authorities believe she might have walked home. In 1986, Bambi left her hometown of Bartlett, Tennessee after a tough breakup. She wanted a new beginning and chose to live with her older brother, Roddy, in Leesville specifically at the Tower Trailer Park. Roddy, who was 38 years old, had been in Leesville for a long time and was happy to have Bambi with him. Now, Bambi had spent her entire life in Tennessee, so moving elsewhere was a major change for her. So in an attempt to find some sort of familiarity in this new area, Bambi decided that she'd be more comfortable if she lived with her older brother. 
Bambi quickly got used to life in Louisiana because she was rather friendly and nice, making lots of friends. She got a job at Pines Chrysler, a local car dealership, and also started dating someone from the area. Bambi loved to go to different nightclubs as well with her friends and was overall very happy with her new life. But one night in October 1986, Bambi felt a bit restless. Her brother was out and she was alone in their trailer with no phone or car. Feeling bored around 10pm, she decided to walk to a nearby convenience store not far from the trailer park. At about 10.05pm, Bambi went to Super Sam's store. She got a soda and used the store phone to call the pit grill, where her brother was. She wanted her brother to come back home so she could use the car to see her boyfriend. Bambi asked the person on the phone to tell Roddy this if he was still at the bar. The employee said sure and then hung up. Around 10.30pm, Roddy got the message that Bambi needed the car. Since he didn't want to go home yet, he asked a friend to come with him. He thought that this was going to be the most convenient approach as he could just leave his car with Bambi while his friend drove them back. But when Roddy returned to the trailer, he found it completely empty. He did notice Bambi's soda on the floor, indicating that she did return from the store. However, Bambi herself was nowhere to be seen. Assuming she might be with a neighbor and would be back soon, Roddy left his car keys and headed back to the bar with his friend. Staying at the bar until it closed, Roddy and his friends returned to his trailer just after 2am. His car remained parked where he left it and Bambi's drink was still in its spot in the living room, yet Bambi was still missing. Initially thinking Bambi might have caught a ride with a friend, Roddy became increasingly worried by the next morning when she hadn't returned and missed work. Bambi was well known for her responsibility and had never skipped work before. In a state of panic, Roddy contacted the police to report his sister missing. Detectives found people who witnessed Bambi walking along Louisiana Highway 8 after leaving Super Sam's, but no one spotted her after that. And there was no evidence of anything bad happening within the trailer. Investigators immediately began questioning Bambi's circle of friends. All in all, it didn't seem like Bambi had any enemies. So investigating the case was extremely difficult, especially since concrete leads were very scarce. In 1989, the Vernon Parish Sheriff's Office disclosed their examination into the potential connection between Bambi's vanishing and the mysterious disappearances of two other women in the area. Those two women were subsequently discovered murdered. One of these cases involved the November 1988 disappearance of Karen Hill, a 21-year-old old employed at a Fort Polk convenience store. Karen's lifeless body was recovered the following day, having been subjected to shooting and then bound to a tree approximately 10 miles from her last known location. Fast forward to June 1989 when 23 year old Pamela Miller went missing in Leesville and her remains were uncovered in Fort Polk five months later. Now, a soldier stationed at Fort Polk named Samuel Galbraith was arrested and charged for manslaughter in Karen Hill's case, but both Pamela's murder and Bambi's disappearance are yet to be resolved. But despite Karen's case seemingly having been concluded, many people believe that all three of these are connected. But law enforcement has yet to establish any concrete ties. By 1990, the Vernon Parish Sheriff's Office had abandoned the investigation into Bambi. Up until March of 2018, the case was more or less cold, but several detectives decided to give the case a second glance. The new sets of eyes also believed that there was a chance that Bambi's case was related to other cases involving women who went missing or were murdered. As for Bambi's family, they have come to terms that Bambi is more than likely no longer alive. But nevertheless, they hope that they can obtain some sort of closure as to what had happened to her after she had disappeared. Hey everyone, so very quickly, I wanted to shout out my second channel. I uploaded the first video over there yesterday, the TikTok Creeps Iceberg, and I'm going to be experimenting with some different kind of content over there. Feel free to check it out if it interests you. I'm not going to stick to a hard schedule over there, but you can expect like one video every week or maybe two weeks. So it's linked down below. Now back to the video. Residing in Connersville, Indiana with her parents and a younger sister was 18-year-old Denise Flume. She was a standout athlete and participated in high school track with the goal of obtaining a track scholarship for college. However, her future plans remained unrealized as she mysteriously disappeared in 1986. 
Denise was looking forward to senior prom in just a couple of weeks, despite having just broken up with her boyfriend of three years, Sean McClung. Denise's mother stated that after the breakup, Denise was overall more positive and showed more sociability. Some of Denise's friends also said that the breakup was rather messy. On the 27th of March 1986, Denise joined a bonfire party held on a rural farm in the Glenwood area. What was initially a small gathering eventually grew large as the night progressed. There were at least 200 to 300 students at the party. Denise remained at the party for some time before before heading home. The following day, Denise realized she had left her purse at the party. Around 12.30 p.m., she contacted a few friends, expressing her discomfort about returning to the farm alone and asking for their company. But unfortunately, none of her friends were available to go with her. Despite this, Denise decided to make the trip alone. Before leaving, she had a brief chat with one of her neighbors, marking the last confirmed sighting of her before she disappeared. Denise's parents, David and Judy Flume, grew worried when they noticed her absence during dinner that night. It was unusual for her to miss family meals and they realized that she had been gone for hours. They contacted the local police and reported Denise as missing by 8.30 p.m. Initially, the police didn't view Denise's disappearance as a significant concern. They suggested that the family might be overreacting and they stated that Denise was maybe just doing teenager things. It was clear that the police were not going to help so Denise's family initiated their own search, reaching out to people and asking if anyone had seen her. Not long into the search, Denise's cream-colored 1981 Buick Regal was located. On the day Denise disappeared, her cousin showed up at the Flume residence at 1.30 p.m., returning Denise's purse just an hour after she had left for the farm. The farmer spoke to the police, revealing that Denise's car had been parked in the area from 12.30 p.m. to 1.15 p.m. without moving at all. The farmer initially thought that the car belonged to mushroom hunters. Despite being three miles away from the previous night's bonfire party, the police were uncertain why Denise had been in that area. The police went over to where the party had been held and questioned various people around the area including the farmers, but no one seemed to have seen Denise that day. Later on, Denise's mother Judy received information from one of Denise's friends. According to the friend, she claimed to have seen Denise at the Fashion Bug clothing store on the day that Denise disappeared. The friend provided Judy with a description of what Denise had been wearing that day. However, the description didn't align with what Denise had been wearing before her disappearance, leading the investigators to dismiss the sighting as not credible. Denise's ex-boyfriend, Sean McClung, underwent police questioning. He claimed the last time he saw Denise, she was alive. During the questioning, Sean was never labeled as a suspect. Investigators also made the observation that he did not actively participate in the search for his missing ex-girlfriend, nor did he display any emotional distress over her disappearance. And not long after Denise went missing, Sean McClung moved to Arizona. Leading Denise's case was Detective Lieutenant Ted McQuinley from the Fayette County Sheriff's Department. Now, McQuinley was actually David Flume's cousin, so this case held an extra bit of weight. On an almost daily basis, McQuinley would contact Denise's parents and tell them about any developments in the case, regardless if they were substantial or not. Fast forward to August 10th, 1988, a potential breakthrough occurred. A woman from Norfolk, Virginia reached out to Judy and David claiming to be their daughter. Both parents stated that the voice on the other end sounded extremely similar to Denise's. Additionally, Judy said that the call occurred on the same day where she had a day off. Judy believed that this further cemented that this was Denise on the other end as she wanted to make sure that her phone call would get through to someone, so she decided to call when her mother was off from work. Overall, the Flume family was very excited over this new revelation. Law enforcement spent about two weeks trying to identify the Norfolk phone number. Denise's family even made the trip spanning over 750 miles to Norfolk with hopes of reconnecting with Denise. When they arrived, they collaborated with local police and began a citywide search effort. Eventually, with the assistance of some employees at an apartment complex, they were able to trace the call to a person living in the building. Turned out that the caller was a 19-year-old who previously lived in Connorsville. Initially, the girl heavily denied ever making the call, but eventually, she caved and admitted to orchestrating a hoax. And law enforcement stated that it seemed as though she was ready to do it again. 
The caller would later claim that she did see Denise at a shopping center, which is what prompted the call in the first place. But yet again, she would eventually admit to lying about this account as well. So in the end, this entire investigation into the phone call was nothing more than a wild goose chase. We don't really have any more major announcements until September 7th, 2018. Law enforcement revealed new information pointing towards the possibility of Denise being a murder victim with suspicions of her body being buried in rural Fayette. The Mary Gray Bird Sanctuary became the primary focus of the ensuing police search. This location was given as a tip from the ex-girlfriend of a past person of interest. Various authoritative bodies came together to investigate the location, including the Fayette County Sheriff's Department, the Indiana Audubon Society, and the Indiana Department of Homeland Security. Security. They utilized cadaver dogs as well as ground penetrating radar, but unfortunately, due to heavy rainfall, their search was delayed. When the search did begin, one of the dogs indicated a potential trace of human remains, but ultimately, the search had nothing to show for it. Now, there is one person that the police constantly return to during the investigation throughout the years. This person was Denise's ex-boyfriend, Sean McClung, but each time police looked into him, they deemed him as innocent. But police would make a major discovery during a three-hour interview with Sean in July of 2020. During that interview, Sean confessed to the murder of Denise back in 1986, but he would not reveal the location of her body. According to Sean, the couple had simply gotten into an argument, and with the help of his friends, he was able to hide the body. Up until 2020, John had served jail time for several domestic violence charges unrelated to Denise's case. Now, the only reason Sean decided to confess was because of a pretty good deal in his favor. In exchange for the confession, Sean would get immunity for the crime and also have two other charges dropped. But thankfully, due to his decision of withholding the location of Denise's body, the deal was voided. Sean ultimately died in September 2020 at 56 years old from a term illness. Despite having this confession, police didn't really have any evidence that tied Sean to the crime, and to this day, the whereabouts of Denise's body are still unknown. Since he went missing in 1975, Jimmy Hoffa's disappearance has grown to become one of the more iconic mysteries in American history. Jimmy vanished on July 30th, 1975 in Michigan where he was scheduled for a meeting at the Marcus Red Fox restaurant. That same night, Jimmy made a phone call to his wife where he mentioned being stood up. Afterwards, he mysteriously disappeared. After high school, Jimmy decided to enter the workforce at a Kroger grocery store warehouse. It was during his time there where he developed a passion for improving working conditions and fair treatment, leading him to organize his first successful strike. Subsequently, Jimmy rose to prominence organizing and leading the International Brotherhood of Teamsters, ultimately becoming its elected president in 1957. On July 30th, 1975, James, or Jimmy, came to a crucial turning point in his life. He had scheduled a meeting with reputed Detroit mob enforcer Anthony Jackalone, aka Tony Jack, and alleged New Jersey mob figure Anthony Provenzano, aka Tony Pro. Provenzano held a reputation as a notorious and intimidating capo in a respected crime family. And the location where the trio was supposed to meet up was that restaurant I mentioned at the beginning. Jimmy left his home at 1pm, then met with a friend before arriving at the restaurant at 2pm. Jimmy waited for about 15 minutes without the arrival of either Jacqueline or Provenzano, and that's when he decided to call his wife and tell her that nobody showed up. The 62-year-old leader of the Teamsters was never heard from or seen again. It was recognized that Jimmy Hoffa maintained close ties with the Mafia, particularly when it proved advantageous for the Teamsters Union and its members. Hoffa played a significant role in establishing a pension fund for union workers which accumulated a substantial $2.2 billion, according to the US Department of Justice. Furthermore, Jimmy was known to frequently extend loans from this pension fund to the mob, assisting them in financing their criminal motives. Jimmy's questionable ties with the mob attracted attention, leading to his imprisonment in 1967 on various charges, including attempted bribery, jury tampering, and fraud. 
Despite being sentenced to 13 years, he served nearly five before then-President Richard Nixon commuted his sentence. Following his release, there was a belief that the Mafia did not want Jimmy to lead the unions, especially with control over the pension fund. It is rumored that Jimmy threatened to expose the mob's connections to the unions if they continued to obstruct his efforts to regain control, potentially serving as the trigger for his mysterious disappearance. One theory suggests that Jimmy met his demise at the hands of mobsters following the unsuccessful meeting at the restaurant on July 30th. Some people propose that his body was transported to the Central Sanitation Facility and was incinerated. Investigative reporter Vince Wade said, There's a theory for every day of the week and then twice on Sunday and most of it doesn't add up. If you really look at it in terms of a hit job on somebody, the Mafia has the capability to completely get rid of a body so that it's never found again. If that's what they want to do, of course. The Mafia also on occasions will have a hit guy come by and whack somebody on a sidewalk in front of a restaurant because they want to leave a message. This first theory is the most commonly believed one and Vince thinks that it's also the most reasonable. There are several other theories, including one that suggests that Jimmy's body was transported to New Jersey Jersey and then buried under Giant Stadium in Rutherford, which was also demolished in 2010. But regardless of which theory that you tend to lean towards, the public seems to agree that Jimmy met his end and was secretly hidden. On August 15, 1977, an Ohio State University astronomer using the Big Ear Radio Telescope detected what some believe to be intentional alien signals from the Sagittarius constellation. After seeing the structured signal on the computer printout, Jerry Emmon blurted out, Wow, and that is how this signal got its name. The wow signal initially seemed like it could be from aliens because it was extremely loud, in fact it was much louder than the usual space noise. However, scientists couldn't hear it again, so they figured it was probably just random noise from a star or comet. The signal then just sort of faded into obscurity as time went on. A team led by Columbia University astronomer David Kipping proposed a new attempt to locate the signal. In their peer-reviewed study, they argued that with focused effort and some creative thinking, they should either find the signal or confirm that it's no longer detectable. Kipping said, I think it's worth chasing down for a couple more months to get to the point where we could say with confidence that the field isn't worth pursuing anymore. Either we spend two months on the WOW field and see nothing and can then move on, or we see a recurrence, and that would change the whole story. Now, Kipping did want to highlight that simply finding the signal again was far from proof of alien existence. It was simply a measly step in the right direction. Kaylee Anthony's case is a gut-wrenching one for anybody, but especially so for parents. And while most of the public believes that Kaylee's own mother is to blame, she would never face any consequences. To this day, no one has been charged with the death of two-year-old Kaylee Anthony. Kaylee Marie Anthony came into the world on August 9th, 2005, born to her mother Casey and an unidentified father in Orlando, Florida. Casey, aged 19 during her pregnancy, kept it hidden at first. Despite Casey's somewhat melancholy attitude towards motherhood, Kaylee reportedly enjoyed a positive upbringing living with her grandparents primarily. Their names were Cindy and George. A turning point occurred on June 16, 2008, when Casey got into a heated disagreement with George. This argument escalated to the point where Casey took off with Kaylee. The specific details regarding the arguments are uncertain, but this was the last confirmed sighting of Kaylee alive. Shortly after the argument, Cindy and George were both regretful and hoped that Casey would just come back so they can resolve the conflict. However, weeks ended up passing by and both Kaylee and Casey remained untraceable with no signs or communication. Then on July 15th of the same year, Cindy and George discovered Casey's abandoned and impounded vehicle emitting an unpleasant odor from the trunk. The same day, Cindy, upon finding Casey, grew increasingly furious upon realizing Kaylee was not with her. Again, the family burst into an argument and they ended up calling the cops. 
The initial call was made with the claim that Casey was stealing vehicles and money. Then Cindy made another call and said, There is something amiss. I found my daughter's car today and it reeks as if there's been a deceased body in the darn car. Casey was arrested the very next day after that second call was made, facing charges of lying to the police, interfering with an investigation, and child neglect. And since police had no idea where Casey's child was, they immediately made her the primary suspect. There were several red flags regarding Casey early on. For one, she never reported her two-year-old daughter missing. When Casey's mother asked where Kaylee was, Casey just sort of shrugged her off and ignored her. Eventually, Casey did acknowledge her and said that she left Kaylee with the nanny. Casey told the police the same story and said that her name was Zanny. Casey also told the police where the nanny was supposed to be living. However, upon investigation, nobody could identify Casey from the building, and the specific apartment she identified had actually been vacant for months. Police would eventually identify a woman named Zanita Fernandez Gonzalez, who did in fact work as a nanny and was supposed to be the one that Casey left Kaylee with. Zanita said that sometimes people would call her Zanny, but upon questioning, she would state that she had never taken care of Kaylee before, and she also had not once met anyone from the Anthony family. At some point down the line, investigators also realized that Casey lied about her place of employment. According to Casey, she worked at Universal Studios, but when police paid a visit to the facility, nobody recognized her. As time went on, the public pointed out how Casey seemed like she couldn't care less about her daughter, which again, made a lot of people suspicious. When authorities went to investigate that car, they found maggots and other signs of decomposition in the trunk. There was enough evidence in the vehicle for investigators to charge Casey with capital murder. Or at least that's how it seemed. Casey would plead not guilty, and then on December 11th, 2008, skeletal remains were found in a wooded area near the Anthony home by a utility worker. About a week after this discovery, the remains were identified to be Kaylee Anthony. Along with that initial murder charge, Casey was also charged with lying to police and child abuse. In 2009, prosecutors stated that they were going to seek the death penalty. However, once the trial began, pretty much all of the evidence brought to light was not exactly considered viable. The prosecution attempted to make Casey appear as a rambunctious partygoer that never had any intent on giving her kid a good life. They claimed that Casey was out of town when Kaylee disappeared and was hopping around bars and people's homes. Apparently, around the time when Kaylee went missing, Casey also got a new tattoo that said Bella Vida. However, Casey's defense attempted to shift the blame onto the rest of the family, saying that Casey's father was the mastermind. Then, after the trial, Casey would propose the idea that Kaylee's biological father was actually responsible. Casey's defense also reasoned that she only lied throughout the investigation to the police due to the trauma that she suffered as a child. The trial seemed to be slipping out of Casey's favor, though, when it was revealed that a member in the family had searched for chloroform on the family computer not long before Kaylee disappearance. Investigators hypothesized that chloroform was used to keep Kaylee from causing a commotion. In the end, there was not enough evidence to convict Casey of murder. She was found not guilty on that particular charge, but she was found guilty for lying to police. After her trial, Casey agreed to an interview where she said, I don't give a shit about what anyone thinks about me. I never will. I'm okay with myself. I sleep pretty well at night. On the night of June 11th, 1962, three prisoners escaped from a high-security prison on Alcatraz Island. They built a makeshift boat from stolen raincoats and officially, they were never found. But many, including the families of the escapees, think they got away that night and have been hiding for a very long time. The leader of the group was Frank Morris, a man who led a tough childhood. His parents left him when he was 11 and he got into trouble early on, facing his first criminal charge at the age of 13. As a teenager, he kept getting arrested for robbing and involving himself in illegal substances. Frank was serving a 10-year sentence for robbing a bank when the escape happened. Frank had a number of partners during the escape. The Anglin brothers, John and Clarence, and Alan West. The Anglins grew up in a big family that traveled around the country doing farm work. 
they were extremely poor, and at a young age, they started getting into trouble. Their first run-in with the law was at just 14 years old when they broke into a service station. As they got older, they turned to robbing banks and other businesses. They were sentenced to 35 years for robbing the Columbia Savings Bank in Alabama. After trying to escape multiple times from Atlanta Penitentiary, they were moved to Alcatraz in 1960. The third member, Alan West, was a repeat offender. He had been arrested more than 20 times before finally being put in prison for stealing a car in 1955. After trying to escape from there as well, he ended up in Alcatraz in 1957. When the four men found themselves in Alcatraz together, they already knew each other well from serving time in other prisons. Once they were placed in cells next to each other, they came up with a plan to escape. Frank Morris led the group in a plan to dig through the walls of their cells, make a raft, and get away by sea. They gathered discarded saw blades from the prison workshops and metal spoons from the dining hall. Using the motor from a vacuum cleaner, they created a drill. Their makeshift tools were used to widen the holes around the ventilation ducts under the sinks in their cells. To hide their work from the guards, they covered the holes with painted strips of cardboard. To make the noise of drilling into the unguarded utility corridor behind their cells, Morris played his accordion during the daily music hour in the prison. Once the holes were large enough for them to squeeze through, the men transformed the empty upper level of their cell block into a makeshift workshop. In this space, they crafted the raft for their escape and also fashioned life jackets. These items were ingeniously made from raincoats that were either stolen or donated. The men carefully stitched them together and sealed the seams by melting the rubber using hot pipes in their workshop. To conceal their absence during their workshop sessions, the men came up with a pretty clever plan. They created paper mache replicas of their heads using soap, dust, toilet paper, and toothpaste. To make the heads appear realistic, they used paint from the maintenance workshop and real human hair collected from the prison barbershop floor. Placed on their pillows, these fake heads gave the illusion that the prisoners were sound asleep in their beds. Meanwhile, they were up on the top level constructing a 6 by 14 foot rubber raft and paddles from wooden scraps and stolen screws. Finally, on the night of June 11th, 1962, the raft was ready, and it was time to put the plan into action. Unfortunately for Alan West, his escape hopes were dashed when he realized the cement he had used to reinforce the concrete around the vent had hardened, blocking his passage through the hole that he had created. By the time he managed to widen the hole again, his accomplices had already left. Disheartened, he returned to bed. Meanwhile, Frank and the two Anglin brothers executed their escape by climbing a ventilation shaft to reach the prison roof. Their breakout nearly failed when they made a loud noise while breaking out of the shaft, but fortunately, the guards who heard it chose not to investigate. With a clear path to freedom, the three men used kitchen pipes to descend 50 feet to the ground and climbed over two 12-foot barbed wire perimeter fences. They made their way to a shore on the northeast part of the island, avoiding searchlights. The group brought along a concertina which was stolen from another inmate and modified it so that it could be used to inflate the raft. And just around 10 o'clock, they were ready to set sail. Their plan was to get to Angel Island. Alarms did not go off until the next morning when guards tried to wake the three prisoners but found dummy heads in their cells instead. A massive search operation began involving both civilian and military forces covering land, air, and sea around Alcatraz Island for the next 10 days. On June 14th, the Coast Guard found one of the prisoners' paddles off the south coast of Angel Island. On the same day, workers discovered a wallet with details of the Anglin brothers. Six days later, shredded rubber believed to be from the prisoner's raft washed up near the Golden Gate Bridge. The following day, a deflated life jacket was found floating 50 yards from Alcatraz Island by a prison boat. These scattered remnants were the only things ever found related to the escape. Even though no bodies were recovered, the FBI concluded that the three men had drowned. Ever since the day the prisoners escaped, people have made it known that they do not agree with the FBI saying that they're dead. Back in Christmas 1962, the Anglin family got cards and postcards from the brothers. The mom got flowers every year without knowing who sent them until she passed away in 1973. At her funeral, two tall guys with heavy makeup showed up and the family thinks that it was John and Clarence. In 1989, Robert Anglin, one of the other brothers, said two men came to see their dad's dead body. 
They stayed, cried a bit, and then left. In that same year, two women told Unsolved Mysteries they saw Clarence Anglin and Frank Morris on a farm in Florida, but no one found them later on. Over the years, many people who aren't part of the Anglin family have claimed that they saw or spoke to the three guys who escaped. A day after they disappeared, a local San Francisco police officer said he saw a boat near Alcatraz Island that turned around and went under the Golden Gate Bridge after a few minutes. The FBI checked it out but didn't find it credible. Also in 1962, a guy named Bud White claimed to be Frank Morris's cousin. He claimed that he worked for Frank and even bribed some Alcatraz guards, then met Frank in a park in San Diego a few days after the escape. Bud White's daughter later said she was at that meeting, but there's no proof to support this claim. In 1993, there were additional claims, but this time with fresh evidence. A former inmate from Alcatraz named Thomas Kent told America's Most Wanted that he played a part in planning the escape, but opted out because he couldn't swim. He mentioned that the girlfriend of one of the Anglin brothers picked them up and drove them to Mexico. However, skepticism arose about Kent's account as he had received payment from the TV network for his confession. During the same year, a different individual named John Leroy Kelly asserted that he had taken the prisoners in a boat and then killed them to pocket the $40,000 collected by their families. Kelly disclosed all of this information on his deathbed and even provided a location where he claimed the bodies of the three men were buried. However, subsequent searches yielded no evidence of remains. In 2018, the FBI acknowledged receiving a letter supposedly written by John Anglin. In the letter, John claimed that his brother Clarence as well as Frank Morris had passed away. He expressed willingness to surrender in exchange for medical treatment. However, the FBI couldn't verify if the letter was genuine and they never heard from the writer ever again. The FBI officially closed the case in 1979, but the US Marshal Service plans to keep it open until 2030, when all the men would be over 100 years old. While the idea of buried treasure seems like a child's fantasy, the Oak Island treasure is a real pursuit that many adults are going after. However, nobody really knows what the treasure actually is. All they know is that it is worth potentially millions of dollars. Oak Island had a relatively quiet start to its history. European settlers made their way there in the mid-1700s. The tales of hidden treasure didn't emerge until the 1850s. On August 8, 1857, J.P. Forks penned an article in the Liverpool Transcript. He said, Certain hardworking individuals have buried substantial amounts in attempts to unearth even larger sums believed to be stashed by the famed Captain Kidd. They've put their money into it but have left holes exposed. In the year 1862, J.B. McCauley shared a story suggesting that the legends of Captain Kidd had their roots among the settlers. According to this account, a dying former crew member of Captain Kidd purportedly revealed to the settlers that they had buried around 2 million pounds worth of treasure on Oak Island. Despite limited evidence supporting Kidd's involvement in the region, the tale gained popularity. In 1864, the colonists reported a potential breakthrough in locating the treasure. Towards the end of the 1790s, a teenager named Daniel McGuinness reportedly stumbled upon peculiar carvings on an oak tree and an unusual depression in the ground nearby. Captivated by this discovery, he sought help from his companions, John Smith and Anthony Vaughn. Having heard the tales of Captain Kidd, they decided to embark on an excavation. As they dug, they uncovered a shaft with oak platforms spaced every three meters. The excavation came to a halt at nine meters when they encountered water. Some accounts suggest they stopped due to lingering superstitious fears. This excavation site gained fame as the Money Pit. Various entities including the Oak Island Association, the Truro Company, the Halifax Company, the Old Gold Salvage Group, and many more invested substantial sums of money, labor, and equipment in the pursuit of solving this mystery. Well-known figures such as politicians and celebrities like Franklin D. Roosevelt, Errol Flynn, and John Wayne also contributed to the search efforts. But in the end, the vast majority of these treasure hunters eventually threw in the towel. Various search groups did discover additional shafts and intriguing artifacts, but the sought-after treasure never was found. 
In 2011, the Canadian government enacted the Oak Island Treasure Act, issuing licenses to treasure hunters for excavation. This treasure hunt even resulted in the deaths of several people. In the 1960s, Robert Restall and his son tried to block flood tunnels only to lose consciousness and fall victim to carbon monoxide poisoning, resulting in their deaths. Two others who attempted to escape also died. This incident eventually sparked the belief that Oak Island was cursed. In 1802, a group called the Onslow Company went to Oak Island and found a peculiar rock. It was a pretty big rock weighing in at about 80 kilograms. Now what was interesting about this rock were the strange marks on it that were said to mean 40 feet below 2 million pounds are buried. A historian named Edward Snow said he translated these marks after hearing it from Reverend A.T. Kempton, who got it from a friend. The Onslow Company eventually had to stop digging due to the excessive amount of water. Although there is no official record of what this company actually did on Oak Island. The rock was last seen in 1919 at Creighton's book bindery, but it disappeared when the bindery closed down. Through the years, Oak Island has revealed a fascinating array of objects. Among them is a rhodolite garnet brooch approximately 500 years old with potential connections to Marie Antoinette of the Knights Templar. Additionally, a medieval cross dating about 1200 to 1600 has been uncovered. Over time, treasure hunters have come across silver and gold buttons, a silver Spanish ring, special coins dating back to 15 to 1600, a Knights Templar coin, scissors, gold links, metal spikes, a 17th century axe, a whistle, a stone triangle, a heart-shaped stone, and five large boulders arranged in a cross with images of a human face and sword. There were also bone fragments from individuals with European and Middle Eastern ancestry. Enthusiasts cannot fully explain how these artifacts made their way to the secluded island off the Canadian coast. However, these discoveries fuel their belief that there may be more hidden treasures awaiting exploration. Different people think various figures could have hidden treasure on Oak Island, including Captain Kidd, the Knights Templar, or maybe Spanish or British soldiers during the American Revolution and Seven Years' War. There are many people who just cannot believe that there's no significant treasure in the money pit. On March 10, 1928, 9-year-old Walter Collins asked his mother, Christine, for some money to watch a movie. She gave him a little bit and he set off, only to never come back. When Walter didn't come home from the theater, Los Angeles police initiated a search but it yielded no results. However, five months later, a child claiming to be Walter appeared in Illinois. Despite Christine Collins asserting that the boy wasn't her son, the police insisted he was. They even forced her into a psychiatric ward when she continued to dispute their claims. The imposter eventually confessed that he wasn't Walter Collins. Around the same time, investigators discovered a horrifying crime scene on a ranch in Wineville, 50 miles outside of LA. There, a man named Gordon Stewart Northcott had been abducting, sexually abusing, and murdering young boys with the assistance of his mother, Sarah Northcott. Even though the police couldn't find any physical proof connecting Northcott to Walter's disappearance, the killer admitted to verbally killing the boy at least once. Sarah Northcott also said she was part of it and got a life sentence for her crimes. Regardless, Walter's disappearance continues to intrigue many people across the US. He was one of several boys who disappeared in the area starting in 1926. A month before Walter's disappearance, which again was March of 1928, law enforcement found another child victim nearby the Lincoln Heights movie theater where Walter was supposed to be going to. Then two months later, brothers Nelson and Louis Winslow went missing in LA's Pomona neighborhood. And it should be stated that back then, the city's police got extreme criticism because of corruption problems, and they were embarrassed when they couldn't find Walter quickly. But to be fair, there was very little information for them to work with in the first place. Walter's dad, who was in Folsom State Prison, thought that maybe a former inmate took his son as payback. This was because part of his job in the prison's cafeteria was reporting rule breaking. At the same time, a gas station worker in Glendale said he saw a quote-unquote foreign couple with a dead boy in their car. 
The gas station employee identified the boy as Walter when he saw a picture of him. However, these clues didn't help the detectives and Walter's case went unsolved for a few months. Then in August 1928, a boy claiming to be Walter Collins appeared in Illinois, creating a big problem for the police. Christine Collins endured five painful months anxiously waiting for any news about her son. Unexpectedly, a glimmer of hope appeared from halfway across the country. The boy claiming to be Walter was specifically from DeKalb. Police sent pictures to Christine, but she wasn't entirely sure that this was indeed her son. But surely, no one would be as crazy as to lie about being someone's child. So officers ended up persuading her to quote unquote try out the kid, so they brought him to LA. After about three weeks, Christine went back to the police station with Walter's dental records and signed statements from people who knew her son. She insisted that this boy was not Walter and she wanted nothing to do with him. And once more, police already had a very bad reputation at the time, so they didn't want it to get any worse. So in an attempt to cover up their mistake, the police called Christine crazy and accused her of trying to make them look bad. They added that Christine was just trying to avoid her duties as a mother. They even enforced a policy called Code 12 that put the grieving mother into a mental health facility. Then in a shocking turn of events, when Christine was in the institution, the boy who claimed to be Walter admitted that he wasn't. A handwriting expert was brought in to compare his writing to the real Walters, which proved that they were not a match. This imposter turned out to actually be named Arthur Hutchins. He was 12 years old and decided to be Walter after someone said he looked like the missing boy. His goal was to go to Hollywood to meet his cowboy hero, Tom Mix. So he went along with the false story for as long as he could, which is just such an insane idea for a 12 year old. And it was around the time when this news was unfolding that the police made another shocking discovery on a ranch 50 miles outside of LA. A man named Gordon Northcott had been kidnapping and murdering boys and Walter might have been one of his many victims. Gordon started in 1926. He would kidnap his victims, bring them to his ranch in Wineville, California, then assault them before murdering them. This twisted man would later say he did all of these things because he loved them. His crimes were exposed in September 1928 when his cousin contacted the authorities. She reported that Gordon had kidnapped her teenage brother and was harming him. When detectives went to Gordon's property, they uncovered the horrifying truth about the Wineville chicken coop murders. On the farm, detectives found the scattered remains of the boys and axes with blood and human hair caked on their edges. Apparently, Gordon verbally acknowledged taking the lives of five victims, which included Walter and the Winslow brothers who disappeared around the same time. He admitted to kidnapping the boys for his own degenerate desires, and then taking their lives when he lost interest. Gordon added that he utilized quicklime to dispose of their remains. He also asserted that he carried out all of these actions with the assistance of his mother Sarah with whom he also claimed to have an incestuous relationship with. However, when the moment came for Gordon to formally admit to his crimes, he altered his story. Now he was saying he only killed one person. So now there was no tangible proof that connected Walter to the ranch, making the boy's fate again uncertain. But then Sarah stepped forward with her own story. Sarah admitted to being the one responsible for Walter's death. According to her, she fatally struck him with an axe, then buried him close to the chicken coop. She did end up receiving a life sentence for his murder. As for Gordon, he got the death penalty and was convicted in February 1929 for the murders of the Winslow brothers and an additional unnamed victim. But even though Sarah admitted to taking the life of Walter, there are a lot of people that don't really believe this claim. So to this day, Walter's true fate carries around this shroud of mystery. Authorities were never able to discover any concrete evidence proving that Walter had ever been at the property. Around midnight in Louisville, Kentucky, Andrea Knabel found herself in a bit of an irritating situation. Returning from an ER visit, she encountered locked doors at her family home with no response to her consistent knocks. 
Eventually, Andrea had enough and made the decision to visit her sister Erin's home. At Erin's place, Andrea found her sister on the porch having wine with her friend Michelle. But shockingly, Erin told Andrea that she wasn't allowed to stay over because of the ongoing renovations to the bedrooms. So Erin dropped Andrea back at the family home. But yet again, she couldn't get a response from knocking, so she returned to Erin's house not even 15 minutes later. At this point, Erin was a little frustrated and insisted that Andrea had to find somewhere else to stay. Despite Andrea's clear disappointment, she seemed to accept this outcome, so she left as Erin watched her fade into the night. And this would be the last confirmed sighting of Andrea. And before we continue, it's important to give you a bit more information in regards to Andrea's personal life. Andrea Knabel was a mother to two boys aged 6 and 8 at the time. Amongst her friends and family, she was said to be an amazing mother that put her kids ahead of herself. Andrea was born and raised in Louisville, Kentucky and had an immensely strong bond with all of her family members, including her sister Erin. In the months before her disappearance, Andrea faced a challenging period in her life. Andrea had recently lost her job as an analyst and was struggling in securing stable employment. And ultimately, she lost her home in the summer of 2019. Andrea needed to take a step back and collect herself, so she opted to move back in with her mother. During this time, Andrea sent her sons to stay with their fathers. Andrea was also described as a very friendly and outgoing person that had a lot of friends, but her circle of friends also consisted of some people that her family thought were rather sketchy. Apparently, some of them even had criminal records. It was also rumored that the sketchier friends Andrea made were introduced to her by her ex-boyfriend Brian Downey, who was known to be an illegal substance dealer. Now, back to the day Andrea disappeared. August 12th, 2019. Andrea's mother Cheryl had just returned home after ordering Chinese food for the family to eat together, but not long into the meal, Andrea and Cheryl got into a heated argument. Cheryl was commenting on Andrea's poor choices and it seemed that everyone that was present was in agreement with Cheryl. Andrea felt as though she was being backed into a corner so she left and went to her room. Cheryl also took note of what appeared to be an affected sore on her face so she asked a friend of hers to take Andrea to the hospital. Hospital. She also gave Andrea a Lyft gift card so she had a way home. Andrea checked into the Kentucky Medical Center just before 10pm and left via Lyft at about 11.20pm. The drive took about 10 minutes, but when Andrea got home, no one answered the door, which again is what caused her to visit her sister Erin. Then about a quarter after midnight, Erin drops Andrea back at their mom's place. And around 1.30am, Andrea went back to Erin's since she could not get inside the house. And that was pretty much the last trace of Andrea, besides some cell phone records which placed her in the same area at about 1.45am. Andrea's phone was shut off and turned back on around 6.30am. However, it was only on briefly and investigators were not able to track it down. A search was conducted in the area, but police could not find any trace of where Andrea may have gone. Erin shared that she felt an immense amount of guilt and dread in her heart after refusing to let her sister stay. According to her, she was told to set boundaries around Andrea and to not allow her to do as she pleases freely. Andrea's family seems to believe that she had been abducted. It may have been a person she knew that lured her in with a place to stay or just a complete stranger. The area where Andrea was walking was regarded as a very safe location, but nevertheless, since it was still dark out, she definitely could have been abducted. Another theory suggests that Andrea simply left of her own free will, although some believe this to be impossible since her kids were left behind. Before her disappearance, Andrea told some of her friends how she felt left out from the rest of her family, almost as if she were a black sheep. While it isn't confirmed, there was some speculation that Andrea may have been battling substance addiction or mental health issues. Andrea's father offered to pay for her rehab, but Andrea declined. And one final theory proposes that she was a victim of a larger scheme. You see, Andrea was an investigative volunteer and worked on several cases with private investigator Tracy Leonard and his group. 
One of the larger cases they were investigating at the time involved a sex trafficking ring. Andrea went undercover for the case and was able to locate a missing girl. She also pushed for the investigation into a case where a man had supposedly committed suicide. Some believe that Andrea made some powerful enemies who wanted to take her out. Since the 1940s in Greenock, Scotland, there have been stories circulating about a wild man covered in black suit crawling around the alleyways of the town. So just to be straight, this cat man actually does exist. It's just that his backstory is completely shrouded in mystery. Whenever the cat man is spotted in Greenock, he's said to be hunting rats and wanders through alleyways. There are even some rumors saying that the man can't even stand upright. People have different ideas about the man, suggesting he might be a lost sailor or someone dealing with mental health issues. It wasn't until 2007 that there was proof of the cat man's existence. A video recorded on a cell phone emerged showing a man eating a dead rat while crawling near a dumpster. This renewed interest in the mystery and people started coming up with different ideas about who he might be. There was even a documentary made on him in an attempt to learn more about his story, but the mysterious cat man was never actually located, so the filmmakers couldn't get a actual interview. According to some residents, the Greenock cat man might be a Russian soldier who got lost and stranded in Scotland during the 1970s. Supposedly, he had no way to communicate or get back home, so the story goes, he decided to live beneath the streets of Greenock, adopting a cat-like lifestyle to make it through each day. In a different story, some folks say the cat man used to be in trouble with bad people and got really hurt, making him walk on all fours. Now he hides in the alleys of Greenock, eating scraps and rats to stay away from those who hurt him. There's another proposal that the cat man might be someone who left a place for people with mental health issues and chose to live on the streets instead. People who've seen the cat man think he's not dangerous and they gladly give him food when he accepts it. On September 16th, 1920, there was a bombing on Wall Street in New York City, killing 38 people and injuring many more. The incident known as the Wall Street bombing of 1920 remains unsolved as no group claimed responsibility. Around noon that day, a horse-drawn car exploded in front of the J.P. Morgan & Co. offices at Wall and Broad Streets. The blast caused immediate devastation, resulting in 30 deaths and over 300 injuries. And then another 8 of those 300 would succumb to their injuries. The explosion's impact was felt throughout Lower Manhattan and across the East River in Brooklyn. Streets were filled with smoke, shattered glass, debris, and bodies. Notable casualties included William Joyce, the chief clerk of J.P. Morgan, and Junius Morgan, a son of J.P. Morgan Jr. Despite being such a high-profile event, the perpetrators remain unknown. Investigators revealed that the explosion resulted from a bomb made with TNT and iron window sash weights. The bomb was detonated by a timer after the attackers had left. Since no group claimed responsibility, the NYPD considered various motives. The possibility of assassinating J.P. Morgan Jr. was ruled out because he was in Europe during the incident. Another theory involved an attempted robbery of the nearby sub-treasury building where $900 million in gold bars was being moved that day. Eventually, the bombing was categorized as an act of terrorism carried out by the Reds which was a group aiming to disrupt symbols of American capitalism. This theory gained support from a stack of anarchist flyers found in a mailbox nearby. Despite extensive investigations, which included visits to every sash weight manufacturer and dealer in the United States and 500 stables along the Atlantic coast, the culprits were never found. One person that was under suspicion was named Edwin P. Fisher. He was a lawyer and was known to have some mental health issues. Apparently, he was talking about a Wall Street explosion in mid-September with his friends. However, on the actual day of the bombing, September 16th, he was in Canada, leading investigators to dismiss his prediction as a coincidental delusion. Another person of interest was named Pietro Angelo. He was an Italian who was linked to a 1919 bomb plot, but he did provide a a pretty solid alibi. Eventually, he was deported to Italy. The Secret Service and FBI interviewed and arrested a lot of different people, but they never charged anyone for the crime. The investigation officially ended in 1940. 
In the summer of 1969, farmhands were digging on Egypt Plantation in Kruger, Mississippi when they made an unexpected discovery. The backhoe operator unearthed a remarkably old coffin just three feet below the topsoil. This coffin was made of cast iron and glass. To the operator's surprise, the contents of the coffin were immediately visible. Inside the coffin lay the well-preserved remains of a young woman dressed in a red velvet gown, white gloves, and square-toed boots. And the shocking part was this body was extremely well preserved and there were no signs of decomposition. The reason this was possible was because the coffin was filled with preservative alcohol and was securely sealed. However, the backhoe operator would accidentally later shatter the glass, which obviously exposed the body to the elements. Historians have attempted but failed to identify the woman, but if they had to guess, they believe that it was about a century old. Clues from her clothing and coffin suggests she died before the Civil War. The Lady in Red was reburied in Lexington's Odd Fellow Cemetery with a marker noting her birthday as around 1835 and her death in 1969, which was the same year of her discovery. And just a side note, there are no actual pictures of the Lady in Red, and this is likely because everyone just wants to show her a bit of respect and let her rest in peace. But along with her identity, people aren't entirely sure why her grave was so shallow. Some people seem to think that the coffin may have fallen off of a wagon or some sort of transport with an entirely different intended destination. Late in the evening of March 3rd, 1956, amidst the rain, brothers Billy Howard and Robert Earl Dye, accompanied by their older cousin Dan Brasher, departed a relative's residence in the rural hinterlands of northern Jefferson County. They set off in Billy's 1947 Green Ford and headed towards a small location in Alabama called the Robinwood. And as you can guess from the title of the entry, this group would vanish. It's said that the group was headed towards a party within Robinwood, so some people think that there was potentially foul play at the gathering. At some point, investigators stumbled upon handfuls of hair strands in an abandoned coal shaft, and that has fueled speculation about their potential dumping ground. But no matter who talks about this case, there is one particular detail that everyone mentions, that being the crucial role that Moonshine played here. The rough hills and deep valleys marking the border of Jefferson and Blount counties provided natural cover for many illegal distilleries. Making moonshine wasn't just a way of life for many of these residents, it was a crucial source of income for many local families. It was strictly off limits to mess with anyone's product and supposedly that's where the cousins made a fatal mistake. There were suspicions that they had stolen liquor from at least one of the local bootleggers. When the brothers and cousin didn't come back home after the Robin Wood party, there wasn't much worry even among their families. They were known for drinking heavily, so the assumption was they were probably sleeping off their hangovers, maybe in a holding cell. But as days went by without any word from them, their cousin, Curtis Brasher, and his family checked jails from Morris to Decatur without any success. That's when the family's concern grew exponentially. They reported them missing to the Jefferson County Sheriff's Department. Now, remember when I said amongst the locals you were not supposed to mess with anybody's moonshine? Well, investigators initially faced some struggles during their investigation since this close-knit community didn't really want to talk. Reports of gunshots on the night of the disappearance began surfacing, and one resident near the Robin Wood party saw the trio and mentioned men carrying containers of water from his outdoor faucet in the neighboring house. This occurred in the early hours of March 4th. One peculiar claim involved a Blount County resident witnessing a bulldozer burying a car at a construction site near US Highway 79. There were a number of other stories that investigators came across, but in the end, they couldn't find any evidence to support any of these stories. Curtis Brasher, frustrated by the lack of interest from county officials, initiated a letter writing campaign to engage state officials. He also began his own investigation. He made a commitment to solving the case until he passed away in the 1980s. 
As a result of Brasher's persistent efforts, Sheriff Holt McDowell assigned Deputy Tom Ellison to the case. Around the time Ellison took charge of the case, the Alabama Department of Public Safety began to search US Highway 79 in hopes of finding Billy's 1947 Ford or the bodies. But the search would yield nothing. Despite this, a public fascination with the myth that the three were buried in the Ford beneath the highway endured over time. The families of the three that disappeared attempted attempted to get more attention to the case, but in the end, it did take a backseat to other incidents occurring at the same time. It wasn't until 1972, with the arrival of new commissioner Tom McGlure in Jefferson County, that the case regained front page attention. Tom held the belief that the missing car was still buried beneath the concrete of US-79. He instructed county workers to commence drilling in the area. Three years later, Tom sought the assistance of the US Navy, employing their metal detectors to examine the opposite side of the highway. When the detectors indicated the presence of substantial metal pieces below the site, the county commissioner ordered another excavation. But yet again, this search proved fruitless. Deputy Ellison claimed in a 1970s article that Sheriff McDowell took him off the case because he was on the verge of cracking the disappearance. Then another state investigator who was assigned to the case until 1975 also said that he was confident that the men were buried underneath US-79. An investigator known as O.M. Raines proposed a theory that the brothers were killed at the Robin Wood party and Brasher was murdered a few days later. And just like with Ellison, Raines was convinced that the sheriff hindered the investigation due to ties with local bootleggers, though there was no evidence to back these claims. Before Curtis Brasher's death, he let out a prayer. Lord, please shed a little light on this thing, something that will help us find them boys. They've been pitched out somewhere like animals, in a ditch, an old watery mine or someplace. All I'm asking is that we find them so they can be given a decent burial. Walter Green, aka Curly, was a man who died of a heart attack on April 24th, 1978. By all accounts, he seemed like a recluse. Whenever neighbors greeted him, he'd answer back in a kind manner, but never made an effort to really form any friendships with them. Walter was randomly found lifeless in his yard after his heart attack, and to those who knew him, they were baffled to hear that he had left behind $200,000. However, there were no inheritors or known family members to receive this money. A professional air investigator named Josh Butler was hired to find the family of Walter, and during that process, he found numerous stock certificates as well as an extensive coin collection. Additionally, Walter owned the apartment building that he lived in. Walter's past is virtually unknown aside from some info that stated he took a train to Omaha at the age of 16. He made his way to a tiny farming town called Schuler, where he found housing from a tavern keeper. The keeper offered Walter a seat at dinner, which he accepted, but he didn't really share much about his past. One of the tavern keeper's daughters said he had a very nice way of evading. When he asked if he had any family, he just said, well, I did once, and he changed the subject. That's just how he was and we respected him. The tavern keeper was able to get Walter a job as a mechanic. Walter saved up all of the money he made and got into a boarding house. As he grew closer to the keeper's family, he asked one of his daughters named Jessamine to be his girlfriend. Then in 1917, when the US got involved in World War I, Walter enlisted in the army. When he returned, Jessamine no longer wanted to be with Walter. Jessamine's younger sister shared that Jessamine liked him and he was a gentleman, but she wanted other things out of life and he didn't appear to be educated. His earning capacity wasn't great, I suppose. While Jessamine went on with her life and married a different man, Walter never found love again. The air investigator got in touch with the tavern keeper's daughters post Walter's death, and the younger one named Catherine believed that Walter may have amassed a large portion of his wealth from selling part of his early coin collection. To this day, Walter Curley Green's cash and assets have not been claimed. All that is known is that he was born in Kendall, Montana, and that he later moved to Denver. He also shared that he once had a brother who died in a gunfight, and that his father was from England while his mother was from Latvia. And I just thought that this was pretty funny. There's absolutely no evidence to support this, but someone jokingly said that Walter was actually D.B. Cooper, since the amount of money Walter left behind was the same amount that D.B. stole.
Joe Maloney is the name of a 32-year-old man who killed his wife, June Maloney, in March of 1967. The couple had a rocky relationship even before they got married, but the two eventually came to an informal agreement where they would leave each other. June ended up taking the two kids and Joe was given permission to visit at any time. You could pretty much ask anyone about the turmoil that the couple was facing and they would all say similar things. A friend of the family named Neil Dunkelberg said, June confided in me that Joe had roughed her up a couple of times. He didn't hit her, she wasn't bruised, but he wasn't above jumping around, hollering and yelling and looking very dangerous, and perhaps grabbing hold of you and shaking you. Neil also had some additional strange and slightly disturbing information regarding Joe. You see, Neil was a bit of a chemist. He had an entire lab in his mother's basement that he liked to tinker with as a hobby. About a month after June and Joe split up, Joe contacted Neil and told him that he wanted to poison a neighbor's dog. He said the dog was constantly tipping over his garbage and he was having this thought for a while, but never pulled the trigger since the dog belonged to a cop. Joe expressed significant interest in one particular chemical, one that was clear, odorless, tasteless, and lethal. Neil immediately became suspicious and told everyone that lived in his mother's home to not let anyone into his lab and to keep all doors and windows to it locked. However, about a week after Neil's inquiry, Joe obtained several chemicals from Neil's lab after sweet-talking Neil's sister into letting him in. Fast forward another couple of weeks, Joe had invited June over to his house to celebrate their son's birthday. The trio enjoyed each other's company for several hours, and while June was there, she called a friend of hers named Wanda. Wanda recalled that June sounded a bit out of it, and she asked her how many drinks she had. June said two. Wanda later went to visit her at her apartment when she left Joe's house. June said she felt kind of gross and it needed some sleep, and Wanda insisted that she should stay over and watch her, but June refused. The very next morning, Wanda stopped by June's apartment again and she was a bit stunned to see that Joe and another man were standing outside of her door. This other man was a doctor. June's condition had gotten significantly worse for unknown reasons. The doctor suspected that it was simply food poisoning, but wasn't entirely sure. Wanda recalled that June was acting extremely paranoid and even requested that she stay with her. She said that she didn't want to be alone with Joe. Wanda obliged and stayed by her side, but the next day, June slipped into a coma and was rushed to a hospital. Doctors conducted numerous tests trying to find out what had caused a steep decline in her health, but they just couldn't come to any conclusive results. Meanwhile, Joe showed no concern towards June. He even suggested that June may have attempted suicide as a result of Joe and her splitting up. June ultimately died on June 5th, 1967. Medical officials determined that she died as a result of a lethal dose of the exact chemical that Joe had asked Neil about. Joe was arrested just hours after June's death and charged with first degree murder. Joe requested that he be admitted to the Rochester State Mental Hospital so that his condition could be assessed. A judge granted his request not knowing that Joe used to work at this exact hospital. After being admitted, Joe escaped and was never to be seen again, but this story gets a bit more interesting. Five years after June's death in Dublin, Ireland, there was a home burglary and the homeowner was a man named Michael O'Shea. Authorities went through the home looking for prints and also requested prints from the rest of the family and when they took O'Shea's, they matched it up to Joe Maloney from the US. However, he couldn't be arrested because there were no extradition laws between the US and Ireland at the time. This was only changed in 1986, which allowed for Joe Maloney or Michael O'Shea to be arrested. O'Shea continued to state that he was not Joe Maloney and did not allow for police to take his photo. Luck was on Michael O'Shea's side as the agreement between the US and Ireland was voided and he was freed. He disappeared and never popped up again. Most investigators believe that this was really Joe Maloney and he just slipped through law enforcement's hands yet again. Jian Fang was the name of a wealthy 42-year-old businessman who resided in San Francisco. On December 18, 1993, he was brutally stabbed to death. On the day of Fong's murder, he had a supervisor from work riding with him. Fong only drove down the road for a couple of minutes before getting jumped by a pair of men. It was later shared that both masked men spoke fluent Cantonese. 
They pointed a firearm at Fong's head, demanding cash. The supervisor accompanying Fong, Yi Sung, was panicking and fidgeting in her seat. One of the gunmen smacked her on the back of her head with the pistol, demanding for her to cease her movement. After the two men didn't receive anything, they forced themselves into Fong's van and tore apart the entire vehicle's interior in search of money. Fong didn't think that he and Sung would have got out alive if they just sat there. So when one of the robbers had their back turned, he jumped on him and tried to knock him out. Unfortunately, this decision cost him his life as he was immediately stabbed in his heart. Realizing that the situation had escalated too far, the pair of robbers jumped out of the van, but not before threatening Sung that if she screamed for help, she'd die. Authorities were sort of at a dead end as there weren't exactly significant clues left behind that could identify the two assailants. So what they decided to do was seek the assistance of a forensic science class. This class had actually assisted in solving a different murder case in 1992, but this was sort of an oddball group of people that you'd never suspect are capable of cracking an unsolved murder case. The teacher of the class was named Brooke Stewart and she presented them with Fong's murder a year after his death. Brooke had been meticulously studying Fong's case for nearly one year before showing it to her class. In her findings, she stated that the back window of Fong's van was smashed. The interior of the van was a mess and no fingerprints were obtained. However, the murder weapon, which was a steak knife, had been left behind. This was just a random knife that you could get at a dollar store, but it looked as though it had been used for years. It was extremely worn down. Then, Police Inspector Sanders informed the class that Fong owned two noodle factories and often collected payments from his customers in person. Most days, he would get about $600 to $800 in cash, but sometimes he'd net over $1,000. This was an obvious red flag and many students jumped on it, stating that it's very strange for such a wealthy business person to not hire someone else to collect all of his money for him. Another detail about Fong was that he was a feverish gambler with ties to the illegal underground Chinese gambling ring. This made the students think that perhaps this wasn't some obscure robbery, but instead an attempt to recuperate the debts that Fong owed. An informant told Inspector Sanders that Fong collected over 25 grand in cash on the day he was killed. But even if this was true, Sanders had no way to verify it, nor did he know what to do with this information. At the end of the class, Brooke Stewart assigned all of her students to come back with an analysis and theory regarding Fong's murder in a week. There were several viable theories presented, one of which is probably very obvious. The two assailants knew about the cash that Fong was obtaining that day, and in hopes of stealing it, they jumped him. They did not intend on killing anyone, but were disappointed at not finding any cash, and when Fong fought back, they panicked and stabbed him. But another question remains, why did they use a knife when they had guns? Another theory proposed that the robbery really was an attempt at getting money that was owed by Fong. According to some Chinese residents in the area, there was a deep network of gangs in the community and a large influx of Vietnamese immigrants who were looking to prove themselves to those gangs. So they were given the mission of getting back money from Fong. But regardless if you think one of these theories is true, or if you think that something else was the reason for the attack, we really have no concrete evidence to support any of the theories. An additional informant of Sanders stated that the crime was indeed tied to illegal betting. Sanders believes that this tip is credible, but no new discoveries have been made in the case. To understand the murder of politician Jay Given, we must first look at the inner workings of the city known as East Chicago in the state of Indiana. Essentially, politicians ruled this city, and Jay himself had immense knowledge about the skeletons in other politicians' closets, so to speak. Where this story begins is in the early 1970s. Jay Given was an attorney for the city and assisted in getting Bob Pastrick his position as mayor of East Chicago in 1970. However, in less than two years, Bob and Jay's professional friendship crumbled. Jay Given's son, Jeffrey, said on a number of issues, my father and Mr. Pastrick split. Obviously, my father's intentions were starting to turn towards electing somebody else other than Bob Pastrick as mayor. Jay was well known for being a top fundraiser and a resourceful negotiator with other politicians when it came to leveraging favors. 
So in May of 1981, Jay visited the Elks Club where a Las Vegas-themed fundraiser was being held for Commissioner Addison Spann. Spann was probably the most popular and well-liked black politician at the time and had serious plans to obtain the mayor position, which was still owned by Pastrick. Jay stayed at the event for approximately two to three hours before leaving the club, but in a shocking turn of events, he never even made it out of the building. Right by the front doors, Jay Given was shot in the back of his head. Needless to say, he did not survive this. Despite there being several hundred people at this event, nobody saw the face of the person who shot Jay. But the following investigation had an intriguing development. Police found a shell casing inside of the building and a 45 caliber bullet not too far from the club on the road. But the odd thing about both the casing and the bullet was that they were in essentially immaculate condition. Inspector Paul Dichara took the evidence back to the station and instead of storing it properly, he tucked the evidence away in his desk drawer. Fast forward four days, Paul went to grab the evidence but found that it was heavily tampered with. The shell casing now had a hole and someone attempted to remove parts of it so that it couldn't be identified. So there was now someone inside of the police force that was involved with Jay's murder. Many people in the public even thought that Paul himself messed with the evidence. But despite the tampering done on the casing and the bullet, both of them were able to be used to identify the firearm that killed Jay. It was a pretty rare handgun called the Detonics 1911-style Combat Master. There were less than 60 Detonics that were equipped with a particular ejecting mechanism that matched the casing. So amongst those 60 guns, investigators found out that one of them was owned by an officer of the East Chicago Police Department, that being Deputy Chief John Cardona. And before we proceed, I'd like to add an additional detail. During this time, there were growing tensions behind the scenes amongst local politicians. Mayor Pastrick had the backing of pretty much the entire Hispanic community. Some saw Jay's presence at the fundraiser as an attempt to strengthen the resolve amongst the white and black communities to support Addison Spann. So back to Cardona, he was a member of a Spanish political club which was well known for their distaste of Jay Given. Furthermore, numerous witnesses mentioned that they saw Cardona at the club that night. But the thing is, members from that Hispanic political club I mentioned were prohibited from attending this event, yet Cardona was still there. None of the witnesses reported seeing Cardona anywhere near Given when he was trying to leave the building. But before the gunfire, they stated that Given was talking to someone in the lobby who looked like Cardona. Obviously, Cardona denied being the shooter. He said that he was having a drink at the bar when he heard the gunshots go off, but the witnesses who were at the bar did not remember seeing Cardona there. He was subsequently asked to take a polygraph test, which he failed. The police department requested that he take a second test, but Cardona refused and thus lost his position in the police force. Cardona was basically the perfect suspect. The description of the man talking with Jay matched Cardona and he owned the same Detonics gun which he claimed was stolen from him months before Jay's death. He was also one of the few people who could gain access into Paul's desk drawer which housed the evidence. Eventually, Cardona decided to move out of the states and he was never charged with any crime. Those who believe that Cardona is innocent bring up a group of about five men standing nearby Jay when he was shot. Two of them were identified and interviewed. In the end, they were deemed innocent. But as for those other three, their identities remained unknown and they never came forward to police with any information. It was reported that there were hundreds of witnesses at the club, but nobody volunteered to testify against Cardona. In 1986, a woman named Nancy Heyer was struggling to find her way around a train in Southampton, New York. Nancy's anxiety built up to the point where she was on the brink of tears. That's when 19-year-old Billy Fisher introduced himself to Nancy and offered her directions. The two eventually agreed that it would be best if Billy just accompanied Nancy all the way to her home in Hicksville, Long Island. Less than a month after the two met each other, Billy called Nancy saying that he needed a ride from his dad's house which was located in Southampton. This ride totaled to over 65 miles. Nancy's sister didn't want her to make the drive due to the terrible weather, but Nancy felt like she owed Billy so she accepted his request. Nancy's mother said, as I saw my daughter drive away, I was a little fearful. Just a mother's worry, that's enough. So a bit of background on Billy, when he met Nancy, he had an immense amount of debt and had cystic fibrosis. The only reason he was at his father's house was because he wanted his help. It had been well over a year since Billy last spoke to him. 
Billy's father, William Fisher, worked at a car dealership where he made a very good salary. William invited Billy to his house when he told him about the issues regarding money. Billy then called Nancy for that ride during the second day of his stay at his father's. Nancy never returned to her own home. Her family was distraught and feared that something terrible had happened. They called the police, but since she was gone for less than 24 hours, they couldn't declare her missing just yet. In the meantime, the family searched through Nancy's room and found a phone number. This number belonged to William Fisher. Nancy's mom called it asking if he had seen her daughter and William responded that he had dinner with Nancy and Billy the night before. When they were done eating, the two drove off in Nancy's car. Nancy's mother and sister both believed William, or they did at first anyways. When 24 hours had passed, a missing persons report was finally submitted in regards to Nancy. However, police again couldn't really help since foul play wasn't a clear factor. With no other options, Nancy's mother called William again and this time he was very angsty. She said, he flew off the handle and told me, let the police handle this, I have no idea where these kids went, and he became very very hostile over the phone. About a week and a half since Nancy went missing, a report was made to police about an abandoned car found in a parking lot. This parking lot was located about two miles from William's home. And in the trunk of that vehicle were the lifeless bodies of Billy and Nancy stacked on top of each other. Billy was shot 18 times with the majority of the rounds hitting his head. As for Nancy, she was stabbed twice. Not long before this discovery, several of William's neighbors called police saying William's home had really loud and distracting noises coming from it in the middle of the night. They believed he was remodeling his home or something. This raised suspicion within authorities, so they obtained a search warrant for William's home. Inside, they found that a chunk of a wall had been removed. Furthermore, they found two 22 caliber bullets with one of them being connected to a strand of hair. This hair belonged to Billy. Obviously, this made William look really bad and police suspected that he murdered Billy and Nancy. However, before they could obtain a warrant, William escaped. He had mortgaged his home and gotten $100,000 out of it before disappearing. His vehicle was discovered at JFK Airport and to this day, he has never been found. The motive for the murders is still unknown. At the time of his disappearance, William was 5'11 and weighed between 185 and 210 pounds. He has blue eyes and brown hair with strands of grey. He has a scar on his throat and a tattoo on his right bicep that says Mary. In early September of 1982, a ship known as the Investor caught on fire near Craig, Alaska. Bystanders spotted the vessel and 911 was immediately contacted. After the flames were extinguished, there was a jarring sight lying in wait. Inside of the ship, there were nine lifeless bodies that were burned beyond recognition. It didn't take long for investigators to realize that this was not an accident, but rather a murder case. Eight of the nine victims sustained gunshot wounds. On board were 28-year-old Mark Colthurst, his wife Irene, their 5-year-old daughter Kimberly, their 4-year-old son John, and four additional crew members. Those four were all in their late teens. 8-year-old Chris Heyman, 19-year-old Dean Moon, 19-year-old Jerome Keown, and 19-year-old Michael Stewart. Furthermore, Irene was three months pregnant at the time. The ship was just returning after a long fishing trip. The ship's captain, Mark, anchored in the North Cove dock, in between two other ships. And instead of roping the ship onto the actual dock, Mark tied it to the two other ships. The group on board the Investor all left at different times, with Mark and his immediate family leaving to go to a restaurant around 9pm. But there were rumors that Chris and Mike stayed behind on the ship while everyone else left. Mark and his family finished dinner and returned to the Investor around 10pm. On September 6th at 6.30 a.m., someone aboard one of the neighboring ships took notice of the investor gradually moving further away from the dock, and the guy could barely make out the faint outline of a man in the pilot house steering the ship away while the engine was still off. The two men even waved to each other, but the guy couldn't make out any distinguishing features on his face. At 7.30 a.m., the investor was anchored next to Fish Egg Island, which was no more than a mile from its original location. The ship stayed there till the next morning, September 7th. That same morning, someone in town reported seeing a man acquiring several gallons of gasoline, then returning to the investor. And it was at 4 p.m. on the 7th when the first hints of a fire were being noticed. Several residents of Craig saw smoke coming from Fish Egg Island, specifically from the investor. 
Police were promptly called and they didn't take long to reach the ship. However, firefighters were stuck battling the flames for hours, unable to save a single life. That earlier man that was seen buying gasoline was also cited getting off of the investor yelling for help before making a call then disappearing. This guy was never identified. Again, this initially just looked like an accident, but after authorities found the wounds on the victims, they immediately pivoted on their investigation's approach. This case is quite well known and has many theories, one of the most popular ones being that the culprit was an ex-employee of Marx. The description of the man buying gasoline roughly matched up with the same person. His name was John Peel. Mark fired him about a year before the fire for an unknown reason. John was actually arrested and charged with the crime, however, he was acquitted when insufficient evidence was presented. People that still believe that John was involved suggest that he had an accomplice. Another theory suggests that Chris and Dean were involved. So, there were actually two bodies on board that were so badly burned that they weren't able to be ID'd through DNA testing or anything. Some thought that these two could have been Chris and Dean, while others believe that Chris and Dean were responsible and got away. Both of their age and physical appearances were similar to the person carrying gasoline. One other aspect that needs to be considered for this case is the reason behind it. There were some obscure rumors that Mark was smuggling illegal goods and substances into the US by using his ship. Some people thought that the phone call that was made on Craig was to a buyer or someone, but this theory doesn't really hold much ground. Leonard Peverary led a life of determination and hard work. He spent many decades building out his real estate empire which stretched across several different states including Oregon and Nevada. He even owned property in Mexico. His assets were spread amongst properties, cars, planes, and other goods totaling to nearly $40 million. But right as Leonard decided to finally embrace the rewards of his labor, his life came to a sudden and tragic end. Leonard was shot and killed in the driveway of his home in Bend, Oregon on October 9th, 2022. Authorities remained tight-lipped following Leonard's death, and six months afterwards, there were numerous lingering questions with absolutely no answers. Leonard's children were stricken with grief and fear for their own safety and refrained from making public statements regarding their father's death. His family decided it would be best if they withheld information regarding his funeral and refused to be exposed to the public due to the ongoing investigation. But what they did speak about was the type of man Leonard was. His family and friends described him as a dedicated father and a shrewd businessman. He looked forward to the simple pleasures of life, especially spending time with his grandchildren. Leonard made an effort to attend any and all of his grandchildren's events, including their football and volleyball matches. Leonard's death sparked legal battles over his extensive estate valued at over $7 million. The fight for his assets involved a complex web of claims ranging from unpaid debts to incomplete real estate transactions. Former associates and acquaintances emerged asserting financial stakes, further complicating the aftermath of his passing. There is little public information regarding the gunmen, but police believe the shooter is no longer in the same city. As far as police are aware, nothing was taken from Leonard, so the motivation for the murder is still unknown. Within the state of Virginia, there is a small town called Wytheville, which has played host to several alleged UFO encounters. Most days are mundane for the residents of Wytheville, but on October 7th, 1987, radio reporter Danny Gordon reported on a shocking story. Danny shared that three county sheriff's deputies claimed to have seen a UFO. This piece began a long string of people who also said they had seen a UFO. Danny saw an opportunity and set up a call-in segment on his radio show. While Danny enjoyed hearing everyone's stories, he was still leaning towards the side of skepticism. He believed that the UFOs everyone was seeing were at best experimental aircraft being tested by a nearby Air Force base. However, the military continuously denied testing of any sort in the area. Eventually, the claims of UFOs got out of hand and the Air Force base issued a statement saying that the sightings were planes refueling. Danny did not believe this though. I called the Pentagon and talked to the Air Force General there who told me if they're refueling under 13,000 feet then somebody's butt's in a sling. 
and to this day we don't know if they were refueling at 5,000 feet but at the same time I have asked if it is military then I'll back off the story and leave it alone because I'm a patriot and each time I'm told it's not us we're not doing it and we haven't been doing it. One day Danny and a few friends decided to pay a visit to the location that was seeing the most reports of UFOs. This is what Danny had to say about the trip. We headed home after two hours of fruitless searching, and I just happened to look to my left and saw a very unusual object coming across the horizon. I pulled off to the side of the road in a hurry, jumped out, and I noticed the craft coming at me was very large. It had a dome shape to the top of it, no wings, and had what appeared to be a strobe putting out multicolored lights on the right side of the craft. As I watched the sky, from the left came the red ball. As the big mothership went into a small skiff of clouds, the red ball docked with the craft. We looked at each other and realized no pictures. The camera was not in my hand, and we both knew we blew it. Danny and his friend Roger couldn't live with themselves knowing that they had zero evidence to prove what they just saw, so they returned the next night to take photos. Danny also set up a press conference for October 23rd, 1987 to discuss what he saw. But right as he did this, he received an eerie phone call. Danny said, The night before the press conference, I received a phone call from somebody who refused to identify himself, and he said that I need to be aware that the CIA and the federal government were very much interested in the Wythe County UFOs. I started to wonder what I'd stepped into, and my wife was urging me to back off to leave it alone, and I was receiving some anonymous phone calls saying, It's not for your place to be messing in defense matters. Danny followed through with the press conference, and when he returned home, he noticed that someone had broken into his house. Danny carefully paced through his home and took note that nothing had been taken, but even though all of Danny's possessions were accounted for, he had a feeling that someone was after the photos that he had taken, photos which were still being developed. Less than two months later, Danny had another encounter with a UFO. He was out with his family when he noticed a single massive object which split into four flying discs. When Danny had these photos developed, he noticed that the shapes had changed dramatically in a matter of a second. The discs had gone from a teardrop shape to a ball, back to a disc. The sightings continued for months and additional residents came forward with their own unique encounters with UFOs. Then one day Danny was visited by two men in suits, who claimed that they worked for a newspaper company. They asked to enter Danny's home and he allowed them in. During this time, Danny recalled a disturbing phone call that he received a couple months ago. The person on the other end said that he was a retired military intelligence officer. He requested that Danny record the phone call. The officer said that if something were to happen to him, that he warned him. He told Danny that he was being way too nosy and some powerful people were beginning to get irritated. The officer claimed that his son was attacked as a result of his own UFO investigations, which resulted in him developing leukemia from some sort of virus. Danny was beginning to think that the two men in his house were actually out to get him. The pair stayed in Danny's home for about an hour before leaving. They searched almost every room in his home and took pictures of every single photograph that Danny had developed. At this point, he was confident that the two were not with the newspaper, but fortunately, neither Danny nor his family were harmed. A few weeks passed and Danny went to look at some of his photo negatives, and that's when he noticed that one of the negatives was missing. It was the one where he saw the discs changing shapes. He suspected that it was those two visitors who stole the photo, and it was because they saw something in it that Danny missed. All of the stress that came along with the odd phone calls, break-ins, and odd visitors eventually pushed him over the edge and Danny had a heart attack, but luckily, he survived. The heart attack was a result of immense exhaustion. The doctor warned Danny that he may not survive another attack and that he should give up whatever was causing him that much exhaustion. Danny obliged and gave up his journey for answers regarding UFOs. On Saturday, December 25th, 2010, a man named Jack Wheeler spent Christmas with his wife Catherine in Harlem, New York. Three days later, on the morning of December 28th, John hopped on a train destined for Washington, D.C., which is where he worked. Back home at 11.30 p.m., one of John's neighbors notices some noise coming from John's home. The neighbor noticed the outline of what appeared to be a man near a house that was in the process of being built. Then suddenly, he sees smoke coming from the base of the home. The neighbor called police and they rushed over, but no signs of any damage. However, it did appear that someone was tossing around smoke bombs. After further searching, authorities found a phone which was later determined to belong to John Wheeler. 
Why exactly was his phone here? Was he the same man from earlier? It was well known amongst John's family and friends that he disliked the idea of this three-story house being built here, so he may have attempted to destroy it. The very next day, December 29th, John sends an email to his employer, which specialized in providing engineering and technical guidance for the US Air Force. In the email, he said that his home was robbed last night and the burglar stole his phone, badge, key fob, and briefcase. For whatever reason, John decided to stop by a pharmacist just blocks from his home at 6 p.m. and ask him to drive him to work. The pharmacist obviously refused, but offered to call him a cab. John said no and proceeded to head to a parking garage. He went to the front desk and told the employee that he doesn't know where his car is and that someone took his briefcase. Then on December 30th, another neighbor of John's noticed that one of his home windows was left open. He went over to tell John and Catherine, but when he got closer and peeked through the opening, he noticed all of the furniture tossed around and dishes smashed on the floor. The neighbor had the cell phone numbers of John and Catherine, so he tried to inform them that they were robbed, but nobody answered. A couple days later, John visits an office building in Wilmington, where he asked the front desk for a meeting with an acquaintance of his. His meeting was scheduled for the same day, but John decided to leave shortly after setting it up. Cameras spotted John exiting through the basement of the building. He then walked east into the sketchy part of the city. It's unknown what exactly happened to John past that point. On New Year's Day, some employees at the Cherry Island landfill called police believing that they just found a dead body. Authorities were able to identify the body rather quickly as John Wheeler. It was also determined that his body was picked up by a truck that went through Newark, Delaware which is pretty far from Wilmington where John was last seen. Medical officials determined that John was beaten to death. Investigators believed that he was robbed, yet he still had on his expensive watch and ring. There was also some cash tucked away in his pockets. There aren't exactly any theories out there that are based on concrete evidence, but they range from John falling into a violent episode due to bipolar disorder to the government having a hand in his death due to his classified work. He was a special assistant to the Secretary of the Air Force while also working with the Secretary of Defense. All in all, he was pretty well known within the inner circles of the government. John's behavior leading up to his death was definitely bewildering. If he was the one that tossed a smoke bomb, why did he even do that? And who was responsible for breaking into his home? Catherine was trying to call John throughout the entire day before he disappeared, but she failed to reach him. John's cell phone was never located. Scientists have been intrigued by slime mold for a long time now with its extraordinary abilities. The single-celled organism The case of Katarzyna Zawada is a truly gruesome and disturbing one that took place in 1998. And depending on the person, one may think that this is solved, while others believe that the case is only partially complete. Katarzyna was 23 years old and attended university in Krakow, Poland. Her father passed away two years prior in 1996, and ever since, Katarzyna had been battling depression. She was described as a kind young woman, but could come across as cold at times. Katarzyna had an appointment scheduled on November 12, 1998 at a psychiatric clinic, but failed to show up. Her mother told her ahead of time that she'd meet her there, so when Kat didn't go, her mother grew worried. She called police, but they said that they couldn't do anything since not enough time had passed yet to consider this a missing persons case. When 24 hours had passed and police could finally investigate, they really couldn't find any clues as to what happened to Kat. Then on January 6th, 1999, a tugboat was out sailing in the Vistula River when the crew noticed that the propeller was stuck. The crew immediately stopped to examine the propeller and they believed that it was tree branches at first. They noticed a rubbery material that was wound up in the propeller, but they couldn't tell what it was. One of the crew members went to dislodge it and once it came free, he noticed a human ear. He tossed the rubber-like mass aside out of shock and the crew then realized that this was someone's skin. Police were on the scene to examine the skin and do DNA tests. They stated that the skin belonged to the missing Katarzyna. Investigators initially thought that Katarzyna was in the river and she had actually gotten caught by the propeller. But this theory was quickly ruled out after they noticed that the skin had very precise cuts where the head and limbs would have connected. Police believe that it's likely Katarzyna was skinned alive. 
Another disturbing detail about this was the skin itself was cut in a way that made it appear like a one-piece swimming suit. The public was convinced that this killer was beyond deranged and had a grotesque fascination with wearing other skin. Authorities hypothesized that Katarzyna was tortured for weeks before ultimately dying. Now, this is where the details get a little bit hazy, and most of the information was a bit lacking since this is a foreign topic, and a lot of stuff gets lost in translation. I'm not sure if it was nearby in the river or if it was also caught up in the propeller, but what it sounds like is the body was also found alongside the skin. Authorities shared that Katarzyna had been stabbed countless times and had been raped both before and after her death. Police struggled with the case at first, but later on, they realized there was another murder case that was similar to Kat's. There was a man who murdered his father named Vladimir who lived in the same city where Kat went to school. After murdering his father, Vladimir took his face and wore it just like a mask. It would have been quite the coincidence for two murders to occur in the same city with very similar MOs in such a close window. But the thing was, there was literally zero evidence to charge Vladimir with regards to Katarzyna. In 2017, nearly two decades after Katarzyna was found, authorities arrested a man named Robert Janzewski, who was 52 years old. He was another suspect that police had their eyes on for quite a while, but just like with Vladimir, there was basically no way they could charge him with the death of Kat. That was until a friend of Robert's wrote a letter to police that mentioned Robert may be Katarzyna's killer. A search warrant was obtained and police dug through every nook and cranny of Robert's apartment, and they found tiny but noticeable traces of blood in the bathroom. Robert was questioned by psychologists and they determined that he fit the psychological profile of a man who would do something as messed up as wear someone's skin. And another detail that I think was messed up during translation is that police suspected that the killer was highly trained in martial arts. I have zero idea how they came to this conclusion, so I think this was meant to say something else rather than martial arts. Additionally, Robert was well known for being a misogynist and harassing almost every single woman he met in his life. And something even more incriminating is that he was often found visiting Katarzyna's grave, which is very strange because he had no relation to her. After further digging, authorities also realized that Robert worked in a lab where he dissected humans. He actually lost his job after he allegedly killed all of the rabbits during his shift. Even though police are confident that Robert was involved, they think that it's likely there's another person involved in Kat's murder. But by looking through their list of suspects, they aren't entirely sure who it could be. In September 2001, there was a 32-year-old businessman named Aiden who was on his way to a meeting with a design agency. While making his way there, he noticed a mass floating around in the River Thames. Initially, Aiden thought it was just a barrel or busted up mannequin and paid no mind to it. But as it got closer, it became clear that this was no mannequin but the torso of a real person. When police arrived and retrieved it, they determined that it belonged to a young African American boy and they guessed he was around 6 or 7 years old. His legs, arms, and head were all removed with precision. With no clue as to who the child was, the public simply referred to him as Adam. Medical officials determined that Adam was brutally tortured and beaten before his death. One strange discovery they made during the autopsy was that there were these pellets mixed with clay, gold flakes, crushed bones, cough syrup, and calabar beans in his intestines. A forensics professor named Kenneth was able to deduce that Adam was likely originally from Benin City in Nigeria. Adam also had on these orange shorts when he was discovered and these were able to be traced to a pallet of over 800 shorts from an industry called Kids and Company. These particular shorts were only sold in a store located in Germany called Woolworths. This was a gruesome yet encouraging lead as there was a particular route to Germany that was notorious for being used to transport victims of human trafficking. Investigators believed that Adam was involved with this criminal organization. But as time passed, several other theories regarding Adam's death were proposed. It was said that Benin City, Adam's believed origin, was the birthplace of voodoo. So some investigators thought that it may have been possible that Adam was some sort of sacrifice used in a ritual. Police then got 
in touch with the folks over at IPU, which stands for Investigative Psychology Unit in South Africa, and asked about the possibility that Adam was such a victim. The officials from IPU stated that it's highly likely that Adam was a victim used in some sort of ritual. A doctor in South Africa named Credo Mutwa shared that the injuries sustained by Adam were similar to other ritualistic killings conducted by the Yoruban people who resided in the western parts of Africa. With this newfound information, the London police began aiming their time and resources into finding ritualistic groups in the area, and during the investigation, they realized that there were way more talks about importing miners from other countries for the sake of sacrifices than they had previously thought. Eventually, their efforts led them to a woman named Joyce who claimed she fled from a Yoruban cult from Germany. Joyce added that her husband was the leader of said cult and he killed his son in order to gain status in 1995. Joyce brought along her two daughters, but both of them were taken from her after she was showing signs of not being able to support them. Then fast forward five months to December of 2002, Joyce paid a visit to the social services office and asked a pretty weird question. She asked if she could have her kids back for a ritual that was being held at her house. Obviously, that wasn't going to happen and Joyce was actually arrested. Then just as the police thought that they were getting close to solving the case, Joyce was deported. Some theorists believe that the government officials in Nigeria were attempting to keep Joyce from revealing any crucial information regarding their cults. But this would not be the last time that Joyce runs into the police. She popped up two more times to give police information, but on both occasions, her info was deemed to be fake. Apart from a couple obscure leads, police really didn't have much else to work with and were at a dead end. To this day, authorities have no idea who Adam really is and how exactly he met his end. On January 27th, 1993, a band of children were playing in the woods located next to Wayne Fitzgerald State Park. Depending on the source, this was a group that ranged between two kids and five kids. The children were having a good time exploring the wilderness as there really wasn't much to do in Jefferson County, Illinois. But they were in store for the discovery of a lifetime when several of the kids spotted a human head sticking out of some bushes. The kids started crying and panicking, not sure what they should do. They ran out of the woods and looked for an adult so they could tell them just what they found. Investigators would arrive shortly after being contacted, and after some exploring, the body of the person was nowhere to be found. Police were not entirely sure where to go from here as they had nothing but a portion of the victim. She went on to be known as Ina Jane Doe. Medical officials were able to figure out that she had a condition called torticollis or wry neck syndrome where the neck muscles caused the head to twist to a particular side. Investigators weren't sure if this was a condition that the woman had from a young age or if it was a somewhat recent development after being in a serious car accident. The victim had brown hair that ran down to where her shoulders would have been. At this point, authorities were literally guessing at what may have happened and the case just went cold as no one came forward to say they recognized the woman. Fast forward to 2022, the identity of Ina Jane Doe was found through extensive genealogy testing. Turns out, she was a woman named Susan Lund. On Christmas Eve of 1992, Susan stopped by a grocery store and then just disappeared. She was a mother of three children and lived in Clarksville, Tennessee, which was a long way from where Susan's head was found. Susan had a six-year-old son and two daughters, one was four and the other two at the time of her disappearance. She was also married and her husband was in the military stationed at Fort Campbell. It was also determined that she was pregnant when she went missing. After a public conference announcing the woman's identity, Susan's sister said, Her kids are just so grateful to find out that they weren't abandoned by their mother. She didn't leave her kids, not willingly. For her six-year-old, her only son, it was really important for him to come to grips that his mom didn't abandon him. Susan's son, who was in his 30s when the identification was made, said he harbored deep hatred and anger towards his mother since he thought that she walked out on her family. He said, I thought she left us. I was always thinking she never wanted us anymore, me and my two sisters, but it was never true. One of Susan's daughters also came out to scold the public for spreading false rumors about her father. Rumors that suggested he killed Susan. Was my dad perfect? No, he wasn't. But he's my dad and I know him. He was with us the night my mom was kidnapped. 
There was a search party that went out looking for Susan when she initially went missing, but it only lasted for about two weeks. Investigators dropped the case after people reported seeing Susan in Hopkinsville, Kentucky. Police believe that Susan left of her own free will and thought that it was not their place to interject if so. One detective was quoted saying, she's still out and about. She's over 18, so she can come and go as she pleases, which is pretty baffling. And less than two weeks later, Susan's head was then found in Illinois. But of course, no one knew this was Susan at the time. It's unclear whether or not the sightings were actually of Susan, but Paul recalled someone telling him that his wife was in Louisville wearing the same exact clothing she was in when she left home. She also lost an immense amount of weight and her face had gone pale. After hearing about this, Paul visited a newspaper so that he could issue a statement. Sue, if you read the newspaper, come home real soon. We all miss you and love you. While Susan has now been identified and the family can rest a bit easier knowing that she didn't walk out on them, it is still unknown who killed her. Investigators are still working on the case, attempting to gather clues that will lead them to Susan's killer. The rest of her body is also still missing. Terry Missy Bevers was murdered by an unknown individual on April 18th, 2016 when she was preparing to teach a fitness class at a church. Over half a decade later, her assailant remains unidentified. Missy was a 45-year-old mother of three who grew up in Texas. She was passionate about living an active and healthy lifestyle and wanted to teach others how they could also lead healthier lives by teaching fitness classes. She had no known enemies and was well liked by her community. She taught a gladiator boot camp at the Creekside Church of Christ. It was a little after 4 a.m. when she arrived and prepared the room for her class. Then at 5 a.m., her lifeless body was discovered in the church and emergency officials were immediately contacted. Investigators discovered multiple stab wounds around her chest as well as what appeared to be a head injury. Officials determined that she may have been alive when the paramedics were first contacted but likely passed away while they were still on the road. Not long after the murder, video footage from the church was made public. It showed a person holding a hammer while going through several rooms in the building. The person wore a helmet, gloves, shin guards, and a vest labeled police. Investigators were not certain whether the culprit was male or female. They stood between 5 foot 2 inches and 5 foot 8 inches. Additionally, this person walked with a limp. Due to marks found on the church's back entrance, police initially thought that the murder was a robbery gone wrong, but after further investigation, they realized that nothing was missing. Not even Missy's wedding ring was taken. Investigators were able to access Missy's phone and they uncovered intimate conversations on LinkedIn. Along with these flirtatious words were also creepy messages from an unknown man. Missy was very active on her social media accounts and often made posts talking about her boot camps. But on the night before her death, she suspiciously left a message that said, come rain or shine, the class would still go ahead. Investigators believe that her constant posts on her social media made it easy to track her. Initially, it was thought that Missy's husband, Brandon, may have been responsible or at the very least involved in this crime. But after providing a solid and verified alibi, it was clear that he was not responsible. Brandon informed police that he had no idea who would want to harm his wife. He also told them that Missy owned a gun Gun, which she had left in her car on the day she was killed. Contrary to Brandon's statements, investigators found out that the couple's relationship was in despair and there were many financial issues as well as infidelity. Just four days after Missy's death, Brandon's father, Randy, took a bloody shirt to the dry cleaners. Without even being asked, Randy said that the blood was from breaking up a dogfight. But by now, the entire community knew of the recent murder, so the employee went to contact authorities. Police acquired the shirt and noted that it looked like someone had already tried to clean the blood out. Furthermore, they stated that Randy's build resembled that of the person seen in the camera footage. But Randy was also cleared of any suspicions since he had a verified alibi placing him in California during Missy's death. Even though Randy was basically cleared of all suspicions, in the community's eyes, he was guilty. After several weeks had passed, police made a new discovery. New security footage showed a Nissan Altima driving around a nearby parking lot just hours before Missy's death. But no one came forward to report the vehicle's owner. There was another suspicious dark SUV seen the same morning near the church. But there was also little to no info provided about that one either. 
or at least that's what it seemed at first. It turned out that someone repeatedly contacted authorities with the same lead, but for whatever reason, the police just never got to it. This lead suggested that the owner of the second vehicle may be a former police officer named Bobby Wayne Henry. Bobby was suspended from police work after a sexual assault charge back in 1996. He owned a car that looked similar to the SUV, and he was also said to walk with a limp. A forensic podiatrist was commissioned to analyze the walk of Henry and Missy's murderer from the footage. The results were deemed inconclusive. Another issue with Henry being the culprit is that he was six foot one, way taller than the suspect in the footage. But even though Henry wasn't deemed a murderer, this investigation uncovered child pornography hidden amongst his devices. He was arrested in June of 2017 for the possession of CP. Missy's daughter, Hannah, spoke to several reporters about the horrific events surrounding her mother, and she had the following to say. I've had people on Facebook message me and say, your dad did this, your dad killed your mom. My dad loved my mom, and I know that 100%. Despite having several strong suspects, the true culprit responsible for Terry Bever's death is still unknown. Switzerland is a beautiful country with a tranquil way of life and a population of just 8.5 million. But underneath that stunning appearance were six missing children's cases between 1981 and 1985. Their names were Peter Pergesi, Peter Roth, Salvatore Flavio Marino, Sylvie Beauvais, Sarah Oberson, and Edith Tritton Bass. The oldest of them was 14 and the youngest 4. For Peter Pergesi, he was at practice for table tennis with his father on September 22, 1967. As he was getting ready to leave practice, he just suddenly disappeared. It was around 8pm when practice ended and outside was his locked up bike and his jacket. Peter Roth was the youngest of the children at 4 years old. It was about 12pm on May 12th, 1984 when Peter headed back home from school. He was all alone and a witness shared that they saw him stepping inside a grocery store and coming out with snacks for himself and a friend. During the investigation, there was an empty chip bag that was found about 300 meters from his home, and it's presumed that this was the same bag of chips purchased by Peter. Salvatore Marino was with his father Giuseppe at the Rhone River on June 23, 1984. Giuseppe was fishing with Salvatore playing in the open nearby. It was around 7pm when Giuseppe heard his son screaming out, Papa, Papa. Giuseppe immediately rose up and sprinted towards the voice of his son. He made it out to a road where he saw a white Volkswagen Beetle with two elderly people inside. The vehicle paused for a brief moment before driving off. The search for Salvatore only lasted a day and no useful clues were discovered. Several days after Salvatore went missing, his mother reported that a man and a woman called her and asked, Do you miss your son? The scarring abduction of Salvatore ultimately made his parents return home to Italy. Sylvie Beauvais was the name of a 12-year-old girl with cerebral palsy, and she was also epileptic. It was May 23rd, 1985, when Sylvie went for a walk in the forest with a teacher and a friend. It was about 7.30 to 8 p.m. when the trio were on their way back to a non-profit holiday home. Sylvie decided to venture out about 30 yards ahead of the others. It didn't take long for Sylvie to vanish from the teacher's sight, but she didn't think much of this and thought that Sylvie had returned home. However, when the teacher got back, she realized that Sylvie never made it. Over the next few days, she still failed to show up. And ever since, she's still been missing. Sarah Oberson was only 7 years old when she went missing, and her disappearance occurred just months after Sylvie's. Sarah's disappearance garnered immense media coverage, and it was actually the most famous missing child's case in Switzerland. Sarah left home around 5 p.m. on September 28, 1985 to pay a visit to her grandma. Time passed and Sarah's grandmother found it odd that Sarah had not yet arrived. Her parents were notified and immediately they went out looking for the now missing Sarah. Over a dozen neighbors also assisted in the search. Not long into this mission, Sarah's bike was found near the school gym. Two boys in the area said they saw a girl that resembled Sarah's description hanging around the schoolyard which wasn't far from home. Once it was 9.30pm, Sarah's father Claude called the police. Flyers with her face were placed all over grocery stores and neighborhoods as well as the newspaper. But no matter what was done, nobody came forward with any information. Rumors began to spread that Sarah was spotted in Vienna, Austria with an unidentified man. When Claude caught wind of this news, he got on an Austrian radio and yelled the following, Struggle, fight, scream, do everything you can so that we can find you. 
The final victim we will be talking about is Edith Tritton Bess. She was born on December 18th, 1978. It was May 3rd, 1986 when she left home at 8 a.m. for school, but she would never make it. The teachers and staff contacted her parents to see if Edith was sick or something, but to their horror, they were told that she left for school a while ago. Police and volunteers spent days searching for Edith or at the very least clues to find her, but to no avail. There are so many suspects tied to the disappearance of these children. However, there seems to be a pretty even split of people on either side on whether these kids were abducted by the same or different culprits. One of the more notorious suspects was a man named Werner Ferrari. Werner was a serial killer that took the life of his first victim in 1971. It was a boy named Daniel Schwann. Werner received a 10-year sentence for this crime and only served 8 years of it. Over the course of 1980 to 1989, Werner kidnapped nearly a dozen kids with the youngest being 6 and the oldest being 14. Eight of these children were found dead. The other three kids were never found. Whether Werner Ferrari was actually involved in the disappearance of the kids we discussed is unknown. But many Many people do believe that he is involved. This entry focuses on a radio station in New York called WKCR. In 1995, there was an interruption and I love to play it for you all, but unfortunately, this track that nobody knows who made was taken and used to make another song and that artist copyright claims anyone who uses the original. But if you want to give it a listen, simply search the old tape on YouTube and it will probably be the first thing to pop up. The video starts with some music, but about 17 seconds in, you hear a scream and then a voice begins listing off obituaries, with occasional funeral bells that come into play. Internet sleuths were able to track this back to 4chan. As far as I know, the original post is gone and no one archived it, but a different thread mentioned a part of it. It said, Around 1995, I was about 15 years old. I used to stay up late in my room listening to the radio on a boombox with an integrated tape recorder. I'd dial through the stations, and when I heard something interesting, I'd hit record for a while, then move on. One night, I came across this. I don't think this was the beginning of the broadcast, but I caught a lot of it. Right at the end, an announcer says that the station I was tuned to was WCKR 89.9, New York. There are a bunch of names and dates in there, but I've never run into anything else like this. That could possibly be the very first mention of the audio that appeared on the radio. If you're still here and decided to not give the audio a listen, I'll go ahead and read off part of a shortened transcript of what the interruption said. February 1985, Frank Oppenheimer, brother, husband, father, friend. August 1985, Irene McGillis, sister and mother. May 1987, Henrietta Graham, mother. July 4th, 1987, Peter Dunwell, son, brother, husband. You can pretty much get the idea from there. The interruption went on to list another five people, all of whom died in 1988. The first person mentioned, Frank Oppenheimer, was the brother of J. Robert Oppenheimer. Then another person that was mentioned later on was named Barry Valentino, who was on board Pan Am Flight 103, which, if you don't know, exploded in a bombing in December of 1988. Theories range from the interruption being a hoax to the real thing. Some suggest that the event was a play at getting the radio station in the news, but it seems that most people believe that the entire thing was just a prank. Let me know what you guys think in the comments. So this case is a hotly debated one and there is a decent split of people believing that this case is actually solved. Kendrick Johnson was a 17-year-old boy who was found dead inside a rolled-up wrestling match in the gym of Lowndes High School in Valdosta, Georgia. It was January 11th, 2013 when the young Kendrick was found in the vertically set mat. Initially, his death was deemed accidental, but his parents hired a private pathologist to do an additional autopsy. Contrary to the initial investigation, this new autopsy stated that Kendrick died as a result of blunt force trauma. In 2016, the Department of Justice said that they were not going to be filing any criminal charges in relation to Kendrick's death. In response, Kendrick's family filed a $100 million lawsuit stating that his death was a murder and those that were involved in the investigation were part of a cover-up. They continued and claimed that the two responsible were the sons of FBI agents. However, this lawsuit was withdrawn and the family had to pay nearly $300,000 in legal fees after being accused of fabricating evidence in order to support their claims. 
After the initial investigation, authorities suggested that Kendrick may have fallen headfirst into the mat looking for something and ultimately died when he couldn't get out. Several students from LHS shared that the students commonly stored their shoes and personal items under or near the mat, and Kendrick was actually found not wearing any shoes. Then another student said that Kendrick often tossed his Adidas gym shoes in the hole of the mats after gym. He'd go to the mats, jump up, and toss the shoes inside the middle of the hole. Lieutenant Stride Jones said, We never had credible information that indicated this was anything other than an accident. Following the investigation, there was more drama, this time within the funeral home. The funeral home that was in charge of Kendrick's body stated that those in charge during the autopsy removed his organs and so they stuffed the body with newspapers to fill the void. Despite a subsequent investigation saying that the funeral home did not follow best practice and could have used a more appropriate material other than newspaper, they were cleared of any wrongdoing. There was also camera footage of Kendrick shortly before his death that had some people scratching their heads. An analyst noticed that the tapes from different cameras were missing over an hour of footage. Then another pair was missing over two hours of footage. The absence of the videos were said to be a result of improper synchronization of cameras. The attorneys that Kendrick's family hired feared that the camera footage may have been tampered with as a part of the cover-up, but after inspections from additional analysts, these strange technical issues in the cameras were essentially explained. At this point, the Johnson family attorneys were being accused of not being entirely truthful with their statements. The case was reopened in March of 2021. The sheriff is adamant that the conclusion of an accidental death was correct and that he does not consider the case to be a homicide. Then in January of 2022, a second investigation was closed with no charges filed. Some of the public side with police and say that this was just an accident, while others believe that there was foul play involved. On April 10th, 2010, Polish President Lech Kaczynski and 95 others were killed in an airplane crash in a forest in Russia. There were zero survivors. Obviously, the entirety of Poland was shocked at this event, and being that it involved so many political officials, people began asking themselves, was this an accident or intentional? To this day, there is debate on what truly happened. Kaczynski became president in 2005 and later appointed his brother as prime minister. He spent a lot of time informing people of the crimes that were committed against the Polish by the Soviet Union and Nazi Germany. One of the events that he often spoke about was the Katyn Massacre following the 1939 invasion of Poland. Over 20,000 Polish officers were executed in an attempt to weaken the Polish military in April of 1940. The majority of those victims were buried in a mass grave within the Caton Forest. In 1989, Soviet officials took responsibility for those events. By the time the 2010s rolled around, Poland and Russia were still at odds over the horrific events that had happened decades ago. 2010 also marked the 70th anniversary of the massacre. Russian President Dmitry Medvedev and Prime Minister Vladimir Putin tried to make amends and Putin invited Polish officials to join him in a memorial service that was being held at the site of the massacre. Tons of various elites were invited, including Polish President Kaczynski. However, due to some political infighting, he was unable to attend and instead participated in a different ceremony. In order to make that event, Polish officials had to travel to a city populated with over 300,000 people. The city was called Smolensk. It had only one commercial airport and it was much too small to land anything larger than a regional jet. Needless to say, it was less than adequate to handle the presidential aircraft. The only other option was to land the plane at another airport which was once a military airfield. But the thing was, the area around this airport was sketchy to say the least. With no other choices, they went ahead with the second method. Tasked with the duty of safely transporting the president was the 36th Special Aviation Regiment of the Polish Air Force, and judging from that title, you may have expected for the crew to be quite experienced and accomplished, but apparently this was not the case. Some people even went as far as to say that their training was worse than the training at a commercial airline. They had absolutely zero simulator training and had no training in crew resource management. To make matters worse, the weather on the day of the flight became violent, and in order to keep this entry from dragging out too long, the flight was just very messy. There were tons of mistakes, and there was only one person on the flight that spoke Russian. Towards the latter half of the flight, the aircraft was getting really close to some terrain. 
It was just 91 meters above ground. The radio and everyone on board were desperately yelling out, pull up, pull up, pull up. Then at just about 25 meters above ground, trees began emerging out of the fog. The plane barely clipped a tree and rammed into a large birch which sliced through the left wing. The employee on the radio shouted over and over calling out for someone but nobody responded. The assistant chief then said, well fuck. To most, this probably doesn't seem like a mystery at all. It was just poor planning and preparation, especially when it came to choosing the proper crew. But nevertheless, there are real talks about the plane possibly being tampered with amongst other theories. In the world of true crime, there is one outcome that is arguably much worse than never finding the culprit, that being finding and charging an innocent person. In the case of Latricia White, Lee Wackerhagen, and his son Chance, Lee was deemed a murderer for over two decades. Latricia was known to be a dedicated mother and diligent employee, having two kids and being a nurse. For all intents and purposes, she seemed like a person that nobody would dislike. She was well known through her community as being a kind and warm-hearted woman. In 1993, 38-year-old Latricia was dating a man named Lee Wackerhagen, who was 40 years old. Lee and Latricia had known each other for quite a while, and they even went to the same school. One commonality the two shared was that they were both going through or had already gone through a divorce with Lee's prior relationship lasting almost a decade. Lee's ex-wife, Gay Walshack, shared that while Lee never physically attacked her or Chance, he was frequently lashing out verbally and mentally abusing her. In court, Gay was given custody of Chance and Lee was given permission to watch over him on the weekends. On December 27, 1993, Latricia's father, Jack, decided to visit her home after she failed to answer or return his phone calls. Jack said everyone was concerned about Latricia because she just hadn't gone to work Monday, and she never fails to go to work or at least call. When Jack arrived at the house and entered it, he called out to Latricia but got no response. He looked around the first floor before heading upstairs and inside Latricia's bedroom. And inside it was Latricia just lying there lifeless. Jack told authorities, I just called her name and then I went over and felt her and I knew she was dead. Investigators determined that Latricia had been shot six times in the head with a 22 caliber firearm. Nothing in her house was touched and there didn't seem to be any signs of a struggle. And at this time, Latricia was allowing Lee to live with her, but he was nowhere to be found. This raised immediate suspicion within the police force. Furthermore, Chance was handed over to Lee during this time so that he could celebrate the holidays with his father. Sheriff Mike Bating stated that there were only two scenarios that could have played out. The fact that her boyfriend could not be found led us to several different areas to investigate. Number one, is he a suspect? Could he have committed this crime? The other one, is he a victim? Has he also been injured? Lee's pickup truck was discovered abandoned in Austin, Texas, three days after Latricia's body was discovered. This was about 30 miles from the crime scene. It didn't take long for authorities to realize that something terrible had also happened involving Lee. Inside the vehicle was Lee's hunting rifle, checkbook, wallet, toolbox, and Christmas presents. All of the presents had blood smeared across them. It was initially believed that the blood was Latricia's, but this was soon ruled out. The following blood test yielded inconclusive results and authorities could not determine whether it belonged to Lee, Chance, or someone else entirely. The initial hypothesis was that Lee became irritated for whatever reason and snapped. He then went on a murderous rampage that resulted in Latricia's death. Police later believed that jealousy may have been the driving factor, but Lee's family and friends did not believe that he was capable of such violence. Instead, they thought that it was much more likely that he was also a victim. Barbara, Lee's sister, said, We haven't heard anything from him at all, and that tells me he's got to be dead. One of his friends said, I don't know who did it, I just know that he couldn't have done it and then just disappear off the face of the earth. Contrary to Lee's family and friends' belief, police thought that the most obvious suspect was still him. According to Latricia's family, Lee was an extremely jealous and cautious man. Chance's mother said that at first, Lee may seem like a good person, but he had a bad temper and he will just as quickly treat anyone terribly. Family members informed investigators that most of the arguments revolved around Chance. Just days before Christmas, Lee packed his bags and threatened Latricia that he was going to leave. Eventually, the three were able to reconcile and go out for a dinner at a local restaurant. However, the next day was when Latricia was found dead. 
but as the months went by, he was still nowhere to be found. After about six months of no updates, Chance's grandfather claimed that he received an anonymous phone call. All he said was, help me, and then the phone was jerked out of his hand and slammed down. I look over at my wife and I said, that was Chance. This call may have been a cry for help from the boy, but it seems that Lee's family believes that it's much more likely that this was a prank slash hoax. They were adamant that the most likely outcome is that Lee and Chance were murdered. During this time, Latricia's family still argued that Lee was the culprit. As the years passed, authorities did gather new evidence that supports the idea that both Lee and Chance were indeed victims. Lee was not the culprit by any means. Police now believe that the true culprit was someone else that had close ties to both families. The Milwaukee PD bombing resulted in the deaths of two officers and two civilians. A 20-pound explosive was hidden in a passageway between a house and the Italian Evangelical Church. A 10-year-old girl was roaming around when she discovered the suspicious device and told her mom about it. The same evening, a member of the church named Sam Mazzone and another man brought the item to the police station. Authorities took it and several experts began examining it when suddenly it burst into a hellfire of fury. There were 10 officers in the assembly room when the bomb went off and 8 of them lost their lives that day, while 2 others were seriously injured. But there were several more fatalities above the assembly room and near the entrance. In the operating room above the assembly room, operator Edward Spindler was killed by shrapnel that ripped through the floor. Then at the entrance of the facility was an unidentified man and a woman named Catherine Walker. Both of them also lost their lives. It's generally believed that the bomb was not intended to go to the police station at first as it was hand delivered by unsuspecting individuals that were part of the church. Instead, it's thought that the bomb may have been placed by people who wanted to assist with anarchists who were rioting in the area. There was an Italian gang that was trying to stop a patriotic rally that the church was leading. One member of the group pulled out a gun and shot a detective which then resulted in the death of the shooter by the hands of other nearby officers. This was subsequently followed with more gunfire from other gang members. But to this day, there's no confirmation that this gang was responsible for the creation of the explosive. On April 25th, 1987, in California, 16-year-old Jenny Pratt went out with her boyfriend, Curtis. Jenny's parents didn't particularly like Curtis and just had a bad feeling about the guy. These instincts would turn out to be correct. Diane, Jenny's mother, later came out and said, Curtis looked 17. Further on down the road, I found out he had been in jail for substances and that he was 24 years old. Just bad news for a 16-year-old kid. But on the night of April 15th, Curtis took Jenny for a ride on a motorcycle that he borrowed from a friend. Curtis promised Jenny's parents that they'd be back no later than midnight. But Jenny didn't make it home that night. It was later revealed that Jenny had been smacked in the back of her head with a dense wooden board by someone in a passing vehicle. Jenny's parents received a phone call from the police that Jenny had been airlifted to a hospital and was in critical condition. Diane recounted, They said our daughter had been in an accident. I said, Is she okay? They wouldn't tell me anything, only that we'd have to come down. When Jenny's parents arrived at Scripps Medical Center in La Jolla, they were greeted by a doctor who had terrible news. He said the blow from the board that struck her was great enough to actually crush the skull and that caused immediate shutdown of her brain. Jenny was brain dead and medical officials believed that she had at most a few hours left to live. Diane said that when she saw Jenny, Jenny's hair was completely red and she had blood streaming out of her nose, ears, and mouth. But somehow, against all odds, Jenny survived. However, she did slip into a coma later on. Sergeant Jim Byler said the following during an interview. Our first involvement in the case was to examine the evidence that was found at the crime scene, which consisted of the 2x4 that was used to hit Jenny and Curtis. So we examined that for physical evidence and it didn't find any fingerprints. There were some blood stains on it which were determined to be Jenny's. Curtis was interviewed that same day. His account of what happened basically was that he was giving Jennifer a ride home and they were driving down Rancho Santa Fe Road, getting ready to make a left turn. Curtis said, We were just approaching the intersection, going pretty slowly, and all of a sudden, something struck me and I just went, Ow, what was that? 
It hurt really bad and then the car zoomed by. I turned around to tell Jenny that someone threw something at me or something. I didn't know what happened. She was out of it and so I just thought, oh my god, what's happening? Jim Byler believed that the culprits were no older than Jenny and Curtis and they may have even been classmates of Jenny. Curtis shared that the vehicle the people were in was a white pickup truck and there was a large group of males in the back. Jenny's family commissioned a private investigator who interviewed several students at Jenny's high school. This investigator, named Louis Kersoffi, stated that he believed Curtis was the primary target and not Jenny. Why? Well, Louis found out that several years before this incident, Curtis was caught selling illegal substances, including cocaine, and after being caught by police, he snitched to get a lighter sentence. Police interviewed people that they believed may have harbored ill will against Curtis and it turned out that Curtis had actually confronted an enemy of his the day before Jenny was struck. This may have been the person responsible. Curtis kept insisting that he did not get a good look at the people in the back of the truck since it was traveling at over 55 miles per hour. Investigators had their doubts though. They reconstructed the events as described by Curtis and reenacted it at both 55 miles per hour and 10 miles per hour. They concluded that the results of the 10 mile reenactment were much closer if not identical to what happened in reality. The 55 mile reenactment had dramatically different results. Private investigator Krasafi believed that Curtis did see the people in the truck, and after consistent pressure, Curtis caved. He provided several names, one of which was the guy that Curtis had confronted the day before. Now as far as I know, nobody was arrested or charged for this assault. Three more months after the event, Jenny woke from her coma. She couldn't move at all at first, but after the 7 month mark, she was able to speak. After an additional year, she was able to walk again. To this day, a name still hasn't been tied to the attack. In the waters of Lake Michigan is a tiny mass of land known as Poverty Island. Due to the terrible weather that is often associated with the area, numerous ships are rumored to have sunk near the island. Over the decades, enigmatic tales were spread about possible lost treasure. For example, one tale claims that there are five chests stuffed with gold worth more than $400 million today. One professional diver named Richard Bennett spent over two decades and six figures searching the area for the treasure. When asked why he keeps going after years of failure, Richard said, any story that survives 100 years has to have some validity to it. If they survive 100 years, they probably have an 80 to 85% chance of being true. The story of lost treasure dates back to the 1860s. French Emperor Napoleon Bonaparte III secretly issued a shipment of gold to Canada that had to travel across the Atlantic. The gold never reached its destination. Different versions of the story suggest that the ship was lost slash attacked near Lake Michigan. A historian named Chuck Feltner thinks that the tales are nothing but mere fiction. Records of shipwrecks on the Great Lakes in the year 1863 are extremely good. We've not been able to find any evidence that any of these vessels that were recorded to have been lost were sunk in the vicinity of Poverty Island, or that they were French vessels, as the legend would have it be. Another rumor made its routes in 1929 when a group of sailors allegedly uncovered the chests after their anchor snagged onto them. The crew retrieved the anchor and right as their eyes could catch a glimpse of the treasure, the chain snapped and all of the chests plummeted back to the bottom of the waters. At one point, a group of investors from Chicago put together over $50,000 in an attempt to search Poverty Island. A local lighthouse keeper in the area said that one day he saw the crewman in charge of the search rejoicing and celebrating, almost as if he found the treasure. But on that same night, a massive storm hit which sank the ship with all of the men on board. Will anyone ever find this lost treasure, or is this all a false tale? It was Saturday, March 2nd, 1996 when Alicia Showalter left her husband and home to begin a 150 mile trip to visit her mother in Charlottesville, Virginia. Alicia was coming out of Baltimore, Maryland and planned to spend the entire day shopping with her mom. Alicia departed at 7.30am and planned to be at the mall by 10.30. Alicia's mother, Sadie, arrived at the location first and sat at a table expecting her daughter to appear at any minute, but as an hour slowly crept by, she began to worry. It wasn't like Alicia to be late, so Sadie called Alicia's husband, Mark. Mark was also a bit confused, but said that the weather may have been what's delaying her. Mark said that if Alicia still hasn't shown up in the next half an hour to give him a call back. Alicia never showed up. 
At 6 p.m. that same day, a Virginia state trooper was patrolling a highway when he noticed a vehicle parked on the side of the road. He pulled over to see that no one was inside. This car was Alicia's, parked about 50 miles away from the mall. The trooper took note of a small white napkin placed underneath the windshield wiper, a signal often used to signal car issues. But after further inspection, the car was in perfect working order. Investigators were able to get in touch with Alicia's family and notify her that she was nowhere to be found. The local news spread the word the following morning and police shut down several highways and blocked the roads, believing that Alicia may have been abducted. Several people came forward reporting that they saw Alicia conversing with a Caucasian male driving what appeared to be a black pickup truck. Additionally, almost two dozen women informed police that they had been approached by a man in the area that fit the description. Special Agent Thomas Carter said most of the witnesses talked about a man who would come up behind them or beside them in a dark small pickup truck flashing his headlights, honking his horn, doing everything he could to attract their attention. Most of the women that did have some concern for their vehicle did manage to pull off to the side of the road. He immediately jumps underneath the vehicle, conducts an examination, comes out, and then engages them in a very polite conversation about the mechanical difficulties that he allegedly uncovered. The guy would then offer to drive the woman to a phone. Some of the women didn't pull over for the man, and they stated that he angrily bashed his steering wheel or yelled profanities at them. A woman who chose to remain anonymous said that she came into contact with the same man about a week before Alicia disappeared. The man also approached her in the same manner and offered to drive her to a phone after telling her that her car needed repairs. The woman accepted the offer. She claimed that the man would slow down and pull off to some off-road areas and say that he couldn't see. Eventually, the woman became extremely uncomfortable and asked to leave the vehicle. The man did not allow this, so she had to fight her way out. At first, he did put up a bit of a struggle, but he ultimately just shoved her out, thinking that this was no longer worth the hassle. Unlike the previous woman, Alicia was not as fortunate. About two months after her disappearance, her body was discovered in the woods 15 miles from Culpeper. It was clear that she had been murdered, and medical officials estimated that it was around the same day, if not the exact same day, when she went missing. Several officers believe the culprit is now in some other state doing the exact same thing. The investigation is ongoing, with no new suspects to date. In June of 1990, an armored car was transporting $11 million in cash. The driver was named Albert Ranieri, and he decided to make a stop at a convenience store around 7 a.m. on the 26th. A guard known as Mary, who accompanied Albert that day, stepped out of the truck for a routine stop at a convenience store. In the brief moment where Mary was buying some donuts and coffee, Albert's truck was raided. An unidentified man in a Halloween mask pointed a firearm at Albert, while someone else stole a key from him and got into the back of the truck. Albert opened the door and stepped out before having his hands and feet tied together with plastic cuffs. After the gunmen were situated, they ordered Albert back into the vehicle and tied up Mary as well when she came out of the store. The two were held at gunpoint and threatened into driving to an isolated area that was about a mile and a half from the convenience store. Meanwhile, there was a gray van tailing the truck. Captain Neil Flood of Monroe County said one couldn't have picked a better location. It was about 75 to 100 yards off the road and it completely disappeared from sight behind a small hill. And we know that the site had been prepared prior to the robbery. There were several tree branches that had been freshly cut to make sure that this large vehicle would fit. Investigators speculated that the two gunmen were met by several other accomplices at the location. Mary said that the culprits didn't speak much to each other. I sat there quietly, making sure I didn't hear any more voices. I was scared for my life. I kept thinking about my son, and I just thought I was going to die. After arriving at the location, Mary and Albert were just tossed out there and left alone. It took Mary a grueling 15 minutes to break open the cuffs. She was unable to free Albert, so she drove the armored truck, which was now completely empty, back to the company's facility and reported the crime. The entire heist went down in under an hour. The very next day, police found the gray van that was said to be tailing the truck, but it had been abandoned. The back of the van had nearly $15,000 in cash strewn about. By all accounts, the heist appeared to be an inside job. Both gunmen were even said to have worn clothing that resembled the employees of the company. The route and amount of cash being transported that day was also only known by a handful of people. 
Down the line, it was confirmed that the heist was an inside job. Albert Ranieri was tried and convicted of racketeering. While the racketeering charges were unrelated to the heist, he did also plead guilty to being involved with that robbery. However, he would not name any of the others that were part of the heist. This was the largest on-road armored car robbery in the history of the US and none of the $11 million besides the 15000 was ever recovered. Oregon has many strange and disturbing tales, and at the center of the story we're going to be talking about today are the infamous hanging trees of Lafayette, Salem, and Dallas. These trees have a somber history of justice, grief, and vengeance. Lafayette's tree was commonly used for executions from 1863 to 1887, with its final one involving a convicted murderer named Richard Marple. Salem's tree was also the focal point of many executions that have been obscured with time. But the intriguing part of Dallas's tree is that it comes with a twisted mystery. There was a man named Oscar Kelty who, consumed with rage, killed his wife. Oscar married Clara Glandon in 1884 and almost immediately the couple had marital problems. In 1887, Clara left Oscar and moved back home with her parents, claiming that Oscar was abusing her. In June of the same year, Oscar visited a railroad depot that doubled as a gun storage. Oscar told the station employee, Thomas Groves, that he wanted to withdraw his firearm so that he could go on a hunting trip. Thomas saw no issue and complied. With the gun, Oscar headed towards Clara's location. When he got there, he knocked on the door, and when Clara came out, he begged her to come back to him and that he was sorry for how he treated her. But Clara had already told herself that she'd never go back to Oscar and turned him down. Oscar was boiling at this point. He grabbed his gun and took Clara's life. Right after Clara hit the ground, Oscar attempted to take his own life but was only able to wound himself. Authorities were contacted and promptly arrested Oscar. County officials delayed Oscar's trial due to his injuries, but there were several members of the public that disagreed with this break and sought to expedite the situation. In the early morning of July 7th, 1887, a group of men drove over to the county jail where Oscar is being held, broke in, and abducted him. The lone guard, Harry Depew, tried to stop the group from entering but was easily overwhelmed. The group of men took Oscar to an oak tree next to the courthouse and hung him. The county sheriff promptly initiated an investigation to identify the men responsible. The sheriff also commissioned an additional detective. Together, they suspected that the mob that was responsible was primarily comprised of friends and neighbors of Clara's family. The investigators were confident that the mob was led by a man named Abraham Blackburn who was a farmer that lived in the same county as Clara. Blackburn was arrested but was kept at a different jail which was located in Salem to dissuade any attempt at rescuing him. Blackburn's preliminary hearing was held on July 26, 1887, and the detective that claimed he could identify Blackburn as the leader froze up and was now not as confident. Ultimately, Blackburn was acquitted and released. From here, interest in the case quickly faded into obscurity. No one knows who was really responsible for the death of Oscar Kelty. Some people suggest that it was actually the KKK who got involved. Almost every year, Arizona's Tonto National Forest plays host for dozens of families looking for a tranquil getaway during Memorial Day weekend. For the families that return to the park every year, they have a routine procedure for getting ready. So you can imagine the looks on their faces when a 10-ton semi-truck comes out of nowhere and rams through the trees. A group of campers were so close to the truck that if they reached out to it, their arm would have been taken off. One member of this group got a brief look at the driver and said there was no expression on his face at all. He didn't even attempt to slow down or look over to see if we needed help or anything. He just kept going. This driver was a 29-year-old father of three named Devin Williams. On Sunday of Memorial Day weekend, Deputy Dean Wells received a report that there was a 48-foot semi-truck randomly parked in the woods. Wells went to the woods to investigate and couldn't locate the driver anywhere. Other than being parked in an odd location, the truck appeared normal. There was no damage to the interior or exterior of the truck. The deputy was able to trace the truck back to Devin and found out that he was on a routine route starting in Kansas. From there, he headed towards California where he dropped off the truck's contents. While there, Devin called his boss, Tom Wilson. 
Authorities contacted Tom to see if Devin was acting strange, but Tom said that Devin seemed perfectly fine. Furthermore, a woman that picked up the loads in California also said that Devin did not act any different than normal. The day before Devin abandoned his truck in the woods, he contacted his workplace complaining about how he couldn't sleep. But the next morning, on Sunday, he was seen speeding through the Tonto National Forest. Nobody has a reasonable answer as for why Devin did what he did. Most investigators said that it was most likely drugs. Devin's wife grew anxious as she knew something was wrong. The couple had recently purchased a new home and according to her, they were the happiest that they had ever been. Police utilized canine rescue teams and off-road vehicles to try and track down Devin, but they couldn't find a single trace of him. As the months passed, police were hopeful that hikers would at least find bone fragments or pieces of Devin's clothing. When there was still nothing, people began to suggest that maybe aliens had abducted Devin. Deputy Wells shared that he has never come up empty-handed when it comes to his searches over the years. At the very least, his searches resulted in a confirmation that the person was dead. It would take almost two years until hikers finally found a human skull in the woods, and shockingly, the skull was confirmed to belong to Devin. Medical officials were able to use his dental records to confirm this. However, they still have no idea how he died or what even caused his erratic behavior. Harvey McLeod is the name of a 65-year-old cab driver from Modesto, California, and over the decade of driving different people, he has seen quite the array of clients. But the strangest and most dangerous moment was when a man in a turban and a fake beard waved him down for a ride. Harvey greeted the man and the passenger responded with a rugged whisper. The man said he didn't have enough cash on him to cover the entire fare, but his brother could pay the difference once he got to his destination. Harvey said no problem and drove a couple of blocks down the road, but then the passenger told him to stop and got right up into Harvey's face with a gun pointed right at him. At first, he thought it was a robbery, but in reality, Harvey was going to be turned into a live bomb. The passenger strapped a metal box to his waist with a keypad and sealed it shut. The gunman requested that Harvey drive them back to Modesto. During that drive, he kept reminding Harvey that he could set the bomb off at any given moment with just his cell phone. Harvey was ordered to park nearby a bank and go inside. He approached the bank manager and handed her a note. The manager, named Denise, said, I thought I was dealing with an irate customer because he was agitated. I proceeded to read the letter and about midway through, it shocked me and it upset me. I looked around the lobby and it was very scary that if I didn't do the right thing that all of us could be blown up as a result of that. Denise didn't want to take any risk, so she went along with the orders given to her. Denise called an employee over and together they filled up a briefcase with cash. Harvey took it and quickly went back to his vehicle. Inside was a set of instructions from the gunman. At this point, the passenger had fled the scene. Harvey drove to a hardware store that was about 15 minutes from the bank. Afterwards, he left behind the briefcase of cash and his car keys inside the vehicle. The final step instructed Harvey to wait by a payphone that was about a half mile from the hardware store. The gunman was supposed to call Harvey with instructions on how to dismantle the bomb. Harvey waited 5 minutes with no phone call, then 10 minutes and 20 minutes. Nobody called. That's when Harvey decided to contact the police. In just a few minutes, police sealed off the area and evacuated all the civilians. At this point, Harvey was experiencing a flurry of different emotions and his stomach was rolling. He struggled to stay on his feet. Ultimately, the bomb squad was able to safely remove the device from Harvey's body. This random passenger just got away with a perfect robbery. Or at least he almost did. Unknown to him, some people did spot him outside of the bank. Once the event hit the news, police were contacted by two witnesses that reported an oddly dressed man standing outside of the bank Harvey was at during the robbery. The man was about 6 feet tall and 160 pounds with short cropped hair and no facial hair. To this day, nobody knows who he really was. Catherine Hobbs was a girl who seemingly predicted her own death. Catherine had a stressful childhood, with her parents divorcing when she was 8 years old and losing her best friend in 7th grade from a heart condition. At some point in her life, she began to tell her parents and friends that she wouldn't live past 16 years of age. 
Catherine's mom recounted one night years ago saying she got very teary eyed one night and told me, Mom, I don't want to get any older. I want to be a little girl. Her mom replied, Kathy, we all have to grow up. It's not the easiest thing in the world to do, but we all do it. To this, Kathy said, but I'm not going to. Kathy's paranoia drove her to living an isolated lifestyle where she barely ever left the house, fearing that any day she'd meet her end. This mindset would last up until her 16th birthday, when she finally began to feel that maybe she was being fearful for no reason. On the morning of her 16th birthday, Kathy jumped out of bed with joy and ran to her mother saying, I made it mom, I made it, I'm 16, I did it, I'm alive. For a brief stint, Kathy finally lived her life and enrolled as a beauty student. She was filled with nothing but joy. Then on July 23rd, 1987, only months after her 16th birthday, Kathy went on a trip to a convenience store nearby. She purchased a book at 11.17pm and never returned home. Kathy's mother had already checked out for the day and was asleep, so Kathy's absence wasn't reported to the police until the next morning. Kathy's mother informed authorities that Kathy was being oddly stubborn when it came to getting a kiss goodbye before she left. She also informed news reporters that she had a bad feeling. She woke up that same morning at 3am from a nightmare. She said, I woke up out of a sound sleep. I felt like I had been hit on the head, and all of a sudden I got a very peaceful feeling and I thought, well, it's over now, and I fell back asleep. Zero witnesses came forward to provide information on Kathy's disappearance. Authorities got their first break in the case about a week later. A geologist studying rock formations discovered the lifeless body of Kathy lying on the ground near two large boulders. Stained across them was dried up blood. Medical officials determined that she died from blunt force trauma. This creeped out a lot of people since if you remember, in Kathy's mother's dream, she said she awoke after being hit or bumped in the head. In that general area where Kathy was found, investigators found tire tracks which could be traced to where the vehicle had pulled in from. Kathy's room was searched and police found letters that she had written about a month before her 16th birthday. The letters spoke about how grateful she was to have a loving family and that when she died, they shouldn't be sad. About another month down the line, authorities received a tip, but this tip included details that no normal witness could have ever known. It included the exact location where Kathy was abducted, every piece of clothing that she was wearing, and the precise location where her body was left. Furthermore, the anonymous individual went on to describe the vehicle that the culprit drove. They even provided a name, Robbie. Police eagerly searched the license plate number given to them and the name, but no results popped up. The car didn't seem to exist. When news of this information came out, the public and the police force were begging the person to come forward and reveal themselves or at the very least give more information to the authorities. But they never did. Some people think that the person who phoned in was actually the murderer themselves, and that this call was made just to toy with the family and investigators involved. They just wanted to give them a false feeling that they might be close to solving the case when in reality they're exactly where they started. One of the more likely suspects was named Michael Lee Lockhart. At the time, he was in the process of being convicted for four other murders. There were reports that Michael had stolen a vehicle that had fibers that matched some material found at the location of Kathy's body. Now, the most damning piece of evidence is probably the receipts found in Michael's possession. They matched up with the time and location of the store that Kathy visited. So to some, perhaps that's enough evidence to convince you that Michael Lockhart was the culprit. However, he never confessed and denied being involved. And since he was being sentenced to death, police decided not to pursue this case. And yes, it's as dumb as it sounds, but it happens more often than you would think. So to this day, there is no official culprit ever identified in Kathy's death. There is an old legend that suggests there is a wealth of gold hidden somewhere in the Superstition Mountains in Arizona. These mountains cover over 160,000 acres of dry, rugged terrain and allegedly somewhere in there are the largest gold deposits in America. This legend has come to be known as the Lost Dutchman's Gold Mine. In 1876, there were claims that the gold was initially discovered by a German man named Jacob Waltz. When Jacob was 80 years old, he hid his mine to keep others from discovering it. At the entrance, he dug a hole that was nearly 7 feet deep, then placed logs, dirt, and stones on top of it. Jacob claimed that an entire pack train could be sent over the entrance and nobody would ever notice it. 
Over the course of time, he was given the nickname The Dutchman. Only months after discovering the mine, Jacob got pneumonia and had to leave the area. He would never return to his treasure. A member of the Superstition Mountain Historical Society named Clay Wurst shared that Jacob revealed his gold mine on his deathbed. Jacob said he had been living off of the money that the gold sold for since he found it. According to him, there was enough gold to make millionaires out of 20 plus men. Rumors suggest that the gold is now worth well over 200 million USD today. Jacob Waltz left behind several clues to one of his close friends and another miner that led to the gold. He wanted to leave them a detailed map with the precise location of the mine, but he died just before he could complete it. The only clues that they received were verbal. He said, the setting sun shines into the entrance to my mine and glitters on the gold, so it must have faced to the west. He said, you take the first gorge on the south side from the west end of the range. He said that you can see Weaver's Needle to the south from above my mine. Jacob's friend and the miner came together and invested every single penny they had in search of the mine, but ultimately they came out empty handed. Eventually, this friend stepped away and gave up after several years. The miner, on the other hand, just kept going, but even he had a breaking point. After an additional 50 plus years of searching for the mine, he committed suicide, realizing that he'd never find it. About 100 years later, a treasure hunter named Walt Gazier decided to try his hand at finding the gold. He used the clues that had been handed down from Jacob's deathbed, but after falling ill, he had to obtain outside help. He contacted an attorney and a historian and gave them the clues and information he had of the places he had already searched. Then one day, Walst asked his wife to drop him off at the trailhead. From there, he hiked alone into the mountains. This was the last time Walst was ever seen alive. His body was discovered about three days later by a ranch hand named Don Shade. Medical officials determined that Walst died of a heart attack. But this story is far from over. That historian that Walst hired got a surprising visitor one month after his death, Walst's son, Roland. Roland said that his father had found the lost Dutchman mine and pulled out some gold that was supposedly taken from it. Upon further analysis, the gold was determined to be genuine and from the same location as some other gold that Jacob had passed down. Roland wanted to retrace his father's steps and find the mine himself. The historian said that's fine and handed Roland all of the papers and maps that Walst had left behind. Roland said thanks and set off on his own journey. But something else happens later on. Just a couple months later, a stranger approached that historian, and do you have a guess as to who he introduced himself as? Roland Gossier, Walst's son. The historian's jaw dropped to the ground. He immediately asked the man for an ID, and when he forked it out to show the historian, it did in fact confirm that this guy was Roland. The historian had just been finessed out of all of the work and research that had been done by Roland's father in finding the Lost Dutchman's gold mine. But this begs the question, where did the imposter get that gold? Well, you see, when Walt died, he had on a backpack. The sheriff's office had planned to send the backpack off to Walt's son, but Roland never got such an item. The sheriff's office didn't bother looking inside of the backpack, but they said the weight could have been gold. The sheriff and historian recounted the events and the sheriff mentioned seeing a man in the area where Walt's body was found. The description of this man matched up with the imposter that the historian met. To this day, no one knows for sure where this mine is or if it's even real. The Superstition Mountains have now been classified as a government-owned area and any gold found would belong to the government. But nevertheless, there are hikers and modern prospectors that venture into the mountains in search of the Lost Dutchman's gold mine. Back in March of 1945, in the latter end of World War II, a little boy named Siegfried Leier of Merlinbach, Germany had befriended an American soldier. Siegfried's neighborhood had been completely demolished by Allied bombers. His mother took the three youngest children and fled the area. They walked over 125 miles to group with relatives in Merlinbach. Siegfried said, It was very bad. I was four when the war ended. There was very little food to be had. We had to go with meal vouchers and buy food, but there wasn't much around. 
Not long after their arrival, a band of American soldiers rolled in. At first, the German civilians were fearful, thinking that the soldiers were looking for revenge. However, they had nothing to fear as the soldiers were only there to provide food, water, and new clothing as well as medical supplies. Amongst those soldiers was one named Alexander. Siegfried described him as sympathetic and friendly. He even went as far as to call him a guardian angel, and that without him, he may not be alive today. Alexander grew very close with the Lyer family and made daily trips to visit them over the next few months. That family saw him as one of their own. Siegfried said that he had no idea what Alexander was saying to him and he didn't believe that Alexander knew any German either. But despite that, they were still able to communicate and develop a friendship that transcended race or nationality. Alexander even took Siegfried on trips to show him around. The two spent most of their days together. But the time ultimately came where Alexander had to leave. Siegfried said, I was sad, perhaps I would never see him again, as I think about it today, I was really sad. I have always thought about how he helped us and that I should have helped other people. He was not obliged to us in any way, but he did it as a human being out of human love. The only item Siegfried owns that commemorates the time he spent with Alexander is a photo taken in 1945. Alexander was estimated to be about 20 years old when the photo was taken. Siegfried has no idea what Alexander's last name is, nor does he have any other information about the soldier. This case is one that has many people scratching their heads as it seems that an alleged psychic was the main catalyst in solving it. During the winter of 1993 in Brooksville, Florida, there was an investigation on a particularly tough murder case. In February of the same year, a 12-year-old girl by the name of Jennifer Odom went missing after getting off a school bus. After days of searching, her body was found with clear signs that she had been mercilessly murdered. Authorities spent over a year investigating her case, but no matter what leads were provided and what resources were allocated, they just couldn't seem to solve it. That's when psychic Nancy Meyer comes in. Nancy had been working with police for decades and had been consulted on several investigations. Eight times out of ten, she was able to provide critical information that either solved the case or resulted in vital revelations. Nancy was not permitted to view the classified photographs, so instead, authorities placed them upside down, and Nancy was able to visualize several killers. I want to say that one is almost wiry looking in the arms. His arms are not like powerful in the sense of muscle, but powerful in the sense of someone who works and lifts or has lifted heavy things. Nancy requested to be taken to the site of Jennifer's abduction the next day, and she pointed out where the killers were lurking. According to her, they approached Jennifer inquiring about directions. It's like a movie in my head, and I stand beside the victim and I try to describe everything that I'm seeing as it unfolds. And a lot of times, that's really helpful to the police officers because sometimes they have odd pieces of evidence at the scene that they don't understand the significance of. And when I describe the sequence of events, it sometimes makes sense out of odd little pieces that they couldn't make any sense out of. Nancy walked around the area and touched the ground, taking note of the flowers that had been placed there in Jennifer's memory. She asked the police if any jewelry had been found, and police confirmed that they did indeed pick up jewelry as evidence. Additionally, Nancy asked about a small case with letters stamped on it. Investigators were kind of shocked that Nancy asked this as Nancy was referring to a clarinet case that Jennifer was said to be holding with the letter L and O on it. It took two more years, but authorities found Jennifer's backpack and inside was that same clarinet case with the letters L and O. Both the case and the backpack had prints on them, but unfortunately, they weren't able to match them to any of their suspects. According to Nancy, this was the work of not one, but two killers. She also states that they both are slash were mechanics and one of them has a bad cough due to years of smoking. And something pretty crazy, the murderer was found earlier this year. In July of 2023, a man named Jeffrey Norman Crum Sr. was charged with the murder and rape of 12-year-old Jennifer Odom. Jeffrey had prior convictions of both kidnapping and sexual assault dating back to 1987. In a press release, police said that Jeffrey was a person of interest since 2015 and they had been building a case against him all this time. So great news that the monster responsible for Jennifer's death was found, but nevertheless, it's so strange that Nancy was able to provide such accurate information in regards to helping the case.
At the pinnacle of the Civil War, there were over 50,000 casualties between the Union and the Confederacy, and according to many, the ghosts of these soldiers haunt Gettysburg to this day. A historian by the name of Mark Nesbitt said, At Gettysburg, there was so much emotional energy expended in a short period of time. From the 15-year-old kid who was scared to death that he'd never make it home, to the 40-year-old man who'd just been shot through the lungs and was dying and thinking about his family. You have to think that some of it must remain. Over the years, many people have reported having paranormal experiences in the area, most of which were reported by Civil War reenactors. On one occasion, a pair of reenactors said that they were confronted by a large, rough-looking man. One of the men said, I think I seen a ghost. I think this guy had original equipment on, original coat. Everything, to me, points out that it was original. Where this story gets a bit wobbly is when one of the men claims that he was handed authentic ammunition. This ammunition was later confirmed to be authentic by a university history professor. On another occasion, a group of friends set out for Gettysburg in the summer of 1993. When they reached a creek called Bloody Run, they claimed to have stumbled upon a man laying in the bushes. He appeared to be a man laying there, but he wasn't solid like you and I are. I mean, he was more of a hazy mist. He was shivering because it looked like he was in a lot of pain. I couldn't go any further. Emotionally, I broke down and cried. I was shaking. I had to actually have somebody come back and lead me out of the trail. There are tons of additional reported ghost sightings in Gettysburg, but nothing with definitive proof. Are these sightings real or just a figment of people's imagination? Jacqueline Castaneda is the name of a baby girl born on January 14th, 2001. Only four months after her birth, she was kidnapped at a Phoenix swap meet. The mother, Olivia, was dropped off at the swap meet by her husband. Olivia brought along her two children and her mother. When she arrived, she had to use the restroom as the drive was a bit long. She walked around the swap meet looking for one and she finally found a porta potty. Olivia thought it was too cramped and way too dirty, so she decided to leave Jacqueline outside while she stepped in. She later told police, Jacqueline couldn't fit inside, so I just took my two-year-old Anaili inside the restroom because she could have walked away if I left her outside. I was in the restroom for like a minute. When I came out, Jacqueline wasn't there anymore. When Olivia stepped out and realized that her four-month-old was gone, she thought that her mother had simply taken her elsewhere. So she made her way back into the heart of the swap meet, but she realized that Jacqueline was not with her mother, but was instead missing entirely. After nearly 30 minutes of searching, Olivia contacted 911. Police immediately sealed off the swap meet upon arrival and stationed an officer at each exit, and every car that was leaving was searched. To this day, nobody has found Jacqueline and not a single person has any idea who took her or what happened to her afterwards. This ruling came as a result of the man's audacious attempt to stow away on a China Airlines flight destined for Palau. The mystery surrounding the suspect's identity persists as he adamantly refuses to speak or furnish any form of ID. This presents a formidable challenge for authorities tasked with determining his nationality, a crucial factor in getting the man home following the completion of his jail term. The court's decision to impose a five-month sentence takes into account the four months that the suspect has already spent in detention. As such, he may be required to serve only one additional month before his release. During the investigation into the November 2nd incident, Incident, the suspect received assistance from an Orthodox priest who acted as an intermediary. The suspect's mode of communication during this period was primarily through drawings. These shed light on his unwavering determination to reach Palau, the ultimate destination of the China Airlines flight he attempted to board. The stowaway incident was brought to the forefront when the suspect boldly decided to ascend the landing gear of an aircraft. Fortunately, the vigilant pilot of a South Korean Asian Airlines plane, which was behind the China Airlines plane, spotted the suspect and promptly alerted airport authorities. Swift and efficient action by the authorities culminated in the suspect's arrest before he could successfully gain entry into the aircraft. As this singular case continues to evolve, the identity of this man remains elusive, but the court's recent sentencing decision marks a significant milestone in resolving the incident. <laughs> 